بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الأخوة المشاركين والمتحدثين في المؤتمر الافتراضي العالمي لعام 2020 لدعم منظومة الابتكار وريادة الأعمال السادة الحضور السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته يطيب لي الترحيب بمعالي الشيوخ والوزراء والقياديين ممن يحملون على عاتقهم السعي الدائم لتحقيق أعلى طموحات أوطاننا الخليجية والعربية والعالمية نبدأ بكلمة معالي وزير المالية السيد براك علي الشيطان وتقدمها سعادة الأخت أسيل سليمان البنيفي وكيلة وزارة المالية بالوكالة فلتفضل يسعدني أن أرحب بكم جميعا وأحييكم أطيب تحية كما يسرني أن أنقل لكم تحيات معالي وزير المالية السيد براك الشيطان وزير المالية الكويتي متمنيا لهذا الجمع التوفيق والنجاح كما أرحب بالضيوف الخليجية والإقليمية والعالمية الكرام أجمل ترحيب في بداية أعمال المؤتمر الافتراضي العالمي لدعم منظومة الابتكار وريادة الأعمال والإبداع والذي يهدف إلى تمكين مناخ الابتكار والإبداع وريادة الأعمال عبر التطوير المؤسسي وخلق بيئة ابتكارية وإبداعية وكذلك تفعيل دور المجتمع بأنشطة الابتكار وريادة الأعمال يمر العالم بتحديات إقليمية ودولية كبيرة ومتزايدة من النواحي الاقتصادية والصحية والاجتماعية من جراء جائحة كورونا وأصبحت مخرجات برامج الابتكار وريادة الأعمال ذات أهمية إيجابية كبيرة من خلال استخدام التقنيات الجديدة وتسريع الابتكارات الطبية والتكنولوجية والرقمنة والعمل عن بعد على جميع المستويات تكمن أهمية تطوير منظومة الابتكار وريادة الأعمال في خلق فرص العمل وقطاعات التكنولوجية الجديدة وزيادة الانتاجية وعدد الاختراعات وحقوق الملكية الفكرية وأيضا زيادة عدد مراكز الابتكار وريادة الأعمال والموهبة وتفعيل المسرعات والأعمال ذات الكفاءة العالية التي تعجل الربح والنمو كما تعجل عملية تأسيس الشركات الناشئة وتعزز التنويع الاقتصادي عن طريق خلق تنمية مستدامة شاملة ذكية يعد عقد هذا المؤتمر العالمي فرصة لتواصل العالم والخليج والدول العربية لتبادل الخبرات والتجارب الناجحة والرؤى المستقبلية في مجال تطوير ودعم منظومة الابتكار وريادة الأعمال في القطاعين الحكومي والخاص وإني لا أدعو الله تعالى أن يحقق هذا المؤتمر أهدافه والنجاح والتقدم لجميع الجهود الخليجية والعالمية والإقليمية والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته مشكورة أسيل ما قصرتي بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم معكم دكتورة هنادي المباركي راح أبتدي في الكلمة مالتي على أساس ما نأثر الحضور بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Distinguished practitioner from different countries of the world Ladies and gentlemen I'm very much delighted to be here today to see more than 80 practitioners from 20 countries in, the, in, in this international conference Uh, it is our great pleasure, it is our great honor for me to deliver this speech at this very important conference organized by Ecosystem Consultant. I would like to first thank the distinguished excellencies, Excellencies Barak al Shaitan, Minister of Finance, Excellencies Dr. Ramud al Hamoud, Minister of Education, Highness Sheikh Engineer Salem bin Sultan al Qasimi, Highness. Sheikh Dr. Thani bin Al Thani, and Excellencies Engineer Majid Al Haysuni, and Excellencies Dr. Al Fadl Al Hanai, and Excellencies uh, Hussein Al Mahmoudi, and Honorable uh, Dr. Kouthar Al Yohan. Today, today the COVID 19 pandemic has created the worst health, economic, and social crisis in our lifetime. This pandemic has been a major accelerator virtual services for innovation, entrepreneurship, and technology program, 
which have helped our economies and society toward digitalization of the economy. In the recent decade, developed and developing countries have targeted the diversification of their economy at sustainable, smart, and inclusive growth. Innovation have contributed positively to technology-based company, fostering a climate of entrepreneurship, technology transfer and commercialization, economic growth and job creation as a vital component of the entrepreneurial infrastructures. Globalization and technology transformation have triggered novel changes in developed and developing countries. It has been widely acknowledged by practitioners that innovation, technology, and entrepreneurship are long-term investment, as well as a vital powerful tool to shape knowledge-based economy for 21st century and the future growth. The importance of our gathering today is to demonstrate and share best practices, policy, listen, learn, successful implementation, and strategic vision 2030 for sustainable and inclusive growth. This required multilateral collaboration to deliver at the level of our country's ambitions to enable better roadmap for the better life. Therefore, in conclusion, we can say that most countries step up uh, to the challenges uh, to advance and sustain economic growth through innovative tool, method, strategy to accelerate the social and economic impact of innovation at international and regional level. And last but not least, it is my pleasure to launch the, the Dr. Al Mubaraki 2020 GCC initiative aimed leading innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem in the GCC, which includes three elements. First, the GCC Smart Virtual Accelerator. Second, the GCC Techno Park Journal. And finally, an annual practitioner event on November in next November 19 and 20. Thank you so much. Looking forward to meeting you in 2021. نشكر الدكتورة هنادي على كلمتها ومعنا سعادة الشيخ المهندس سالم. الدكتورة موجود سعادة الشيخ سالم بن سلطان. فيصل نقدم الشيخ الدكتور ثاني بعد إذنك يا الشيخ الشيخ مسعود. <تصفيق> لأن شوية عنده مشكلة فنية الشيخ سالم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله عليكم السلام شرفنا بوجودك معنا أبو سعود تفضل سعادة الشيخ تفضل بس كان عند التكنيكال سبورت شغلة فنية تفضل الشيخ سالم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين الحضور الكريم بداية نشكر معالي وزير المالية بدولة الكويت الشقيقة على تشرفه برعاية هذا المؤتمر الهام ونشكر القائمين على هذا المؤتمر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته يسرني في البداية أن أتوجه بخالص الشكر والعرفان إلى شركة أيكو سيستم للاستشارات الإدارية الجهة المنظمة على دعوتها الكريمة لنا لمخاطبة الجلسة الافتتاحية لهذا المؤتمر والذي يتناول موضوعا مهما وهو دعم منظومة الابتكار وريادة الأعمال يكتسب هذا المؤتمر أهمية كبيرة كونه يعقد للمرة الأولى حيث يتطلع المشاركون إلى نتائج وتوصيات المؤتمر للاسترشاد بها في ظل الظروف الحالية حيث أننا في أحوج ما نكون إلى توصيات تساعد رواد الأعمال على مواجهة النتائج السلبية التي خلفتها جائحة كورونا كوفيد 19 على الاقتصاد في مختلف دول العالم الحضور الكرام وفقا لتقرير حديث نشر نشره الاتحاد الدولي للاتصالات فان ما يزيد عن 90% من حجم الاقتصاد العالمي يحركه رواد الاعمال والشركات الناشئه او الصغيره والمتوسطه الحجم حيث تعد هذه الشركات القوه الدافعه للاستقرار الاقتصادي وخلق فرص العمل والابتكار في مجال الأعمال التجارية والصديقة للبيئة 
وتقوم هذه الشركات بتوظيف الغالبية العظمى من العاملين على مستوى العالم لذلك فإننا لذلك فإننا نرى أنها هذه تلعب دورا مهما في تلبية البعد الاقتصادي للتنمية المستدامة وفقا لقواعد الأمم المتحدة وعندما نتحدث عن منطقتنا العربية أو الخليجية تحديدا فإننا نرى من الضروري أن أن تنتبه دول مجلس التعاون الخليجي إلى موضوع تنوع الاقتصاد وتقليل الاعتماد على عائدات الهيدروكربونات المتقلبة حيث سيخلق هذا التنوع المزيد من فرص العمل في القطاع الخاص للمواطنين وخاصة الوظائف ذات القيمة المضافة الكبيرة في الصناعات والخدمات وأعتقد أن الاستراتيجيات التي يجب اتباعها للوصول إلى هذا الهدف تعتمد أساسا على تشجيع الابتكار وتحفيز ريادة الأعمال ومن ناحية أخرى يلعب الابتكار دورا رئيسيا في تحقيق النمو الاقتصادي ففي كثير من الحالات يكون رواد الأعمال هم من يمتلكون الإمكانيات لإدخال التقنيات الجديدة التي تساعد على تحسين نشاط الشركات وتحقيق أعلى مستوى من الأرباح فالابتكار يكون متواجدا عندما تقوم شركة ما بتنفيذ عمليات أو أفكار أو خدمات أو منتجات جديدة بهدف تعزيز مركزها المالي فقد تقوم هذه الشركة على سبيل المثال للحصر بإطلاق منتج جديد أو جعل الطريق الحالية للعمل أكثر كفاءة فالعامل الأساسي للابتكار هو أن أنه يزيد من إيرادات الشركة وللابتكار أهمية كبيرة في زيادة القدرة التنافسية للشركات المبتكرة حيث يدعم الابتكار مساعي الشركة في تحقيق ما يسمى بقيادة الأسعار وذلك من خلال سيطرتها على السوق حيث تقوم هي بتحديد أسعار منتجاتها وتلحق بها الشركات المنافسة كما يدعم الابتكار تحقيق الشركة للاستراتيجية التمايز والتي تعني تقديم الشركة منتجات أو خدمات فريدة لا مثيل لها في السوق ويمكن القول بأن قيادة الأسعار وذلك من خلال سيطرتها على السوق حيث تقوم هي بتحديد أسعار منتجاتها وتلحق بها الشركات المنافسة كما يدعم الابتكار تحقيق الشركة الاستراتيجية التمايز والتي تعني تقديم الشركة منتجات أو خدمات فريدة لا مثيل لها في السوق ويمكن القول بأن تقييد الأسعار ويمكن القول بأن الابتكار يساعد على تحسين الإنتاجية وخفض التكاليف وتعزيز القدرة على المنافسة مثل ما يساعد أيضا على إقامة شراكات وعلاقات جديدة وزيادة حجم الأعمال وتحسين الربحية وفي المقابل فإن الشركات البعيدة عن الابتكار تكون معرضة لأن تفقد الحصة السوقية الخاصة بها لمصلحة منافسيها الذين يأتون بابتكارات جديدة وقد تضطر في نهاية المطاف إلى الخروج من السوق الحضور الكريم تساعد قوانين الملكية الفكرية في حماية رواد الأعمال عن طريق حماية ابتكاراتهم المتعددة فهي تساعدهم على تحويل إمكان إمكاناتهم الابتكارية وإبداعاتهم إلى قيمة سوقية وقدرة تنافسية فالحقوق التي تقررها هذه القوانين لهؤلاء الرواد المبتكرين بحماية ابتكاراتهم واختراعاتهم تعطيهم حقوق استثنائية تمكنهم من الدخول إلى الأسواق وتمنع المنافسين من استخدام هذه الابتكارات المحمية بدون ترخيص منهم وتشير العديد من الدراسات إلى العلاقة الإيجابية بين الحماية المقدمة من براءات الاختراق الاختراع ونمو المشاريع الجديدة فالتسجيل الفوري لبراءة لبراءات الاختراع يمنع الغير من استعمال الاختراعات المحمية وفي نفس الوقت تمنح مالكها الفرصة أما باستغلالها بنفسه أو عن طريق منح الغير فرصة استعمالها بطريقة الترخيص الذي يتم بمقابل فقوانين الملكية الفكرية التي تعمل بطريقة فعالة يمكن لها تسهيل الوصول إلى التمويل والتطوير أسواق التقنية وكلاهما يساعد رياد الأعمال ريادة الأعمال المبتكرة كما توفر هذه القوانين أيضا حوافز للاستثمار في البحث والتطوير والابتكار ويمكن لهذه القوانين أن تشجع التعاون التقني بين الشركات والجامعات ومؤسسات البحث وبناء على ذلك يتعين على رواد الأعمال حماية ابتكاراتهم عن طريق 
الوان الانواع المختلفه من الملكيه الفكريه فالاختراعات تح قد تحمى عن طريق براءات الاختراع او الاسرار التجاريه اما العلامات المميزه لمنتجاتهم او خدماتهم فتتم حمايتها عن طريق قوانين العلامات التجاريه في حين تتم حمايه المظهر الخارجي المميز للمنتج او الشكل المميز له عن طريق قوانين الرسم والنماذج الصناعيه وفي حال نشوء منازعه حول العقود والتراخيص المتعلقه بحقوق ومعاملات الملكيه الفكريه فقد يلجا اطراف النزاع الى المحاكم لتسويه هذه المنازعات ولكن في الاونه الاخيره بدا الكثير من الاطراف سواء كانوا اصحاب الملكيه الفكريه او من المرخص لهم استقلال هذه الحقوق باللجوء الى اليات اخرى لفض هذه المنازعات وهذه الوسائل يطلق عليها الاليات البديله لفض المنازعات وهي تشمل بصفه اساسيه التحكيم والوساطة وللتوضيح أكثر فإن اللجوء إلى هذه الآليات يأتي لعدة عوامل أولها السرعة وثانيها الخبرة وثالثها السرية وفي الختام أشكر لكم حسن استماعكم ونتمنى التوفيق لأعمال المؤتمر وإن شاء الله يخرج هذا المؤتمر بتوصيات يستفيد منها الجميع ونتمنى كذلك تدوين هذه الأوراق العمل المقدمة حتى يطلع عليها الجميع ويستفيد منها والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته عليكم. نشكر الشيخ الدكتور ثاني بن عال ثاني على كلمته ونتمنى أن يكون بيننا بإذن الله إن شاء الله تعاون مشترك ونشكر تشريفك لنا تفضل سعادة الشيخ المهندس سالم السلطان القاسمي رئيس الطيران المدني في رأس الخيمة إلقاء كلمة الافتتاح بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته سمحون على التأخير كان في خلل فني في الرابط وتم إن شاء الله ارتباطنا بالمؤتمر وبنجاح بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يشرفني أن أشارك في هذا المؤتمر المتميز الذي ينعقد بعنوان المؤتمر الافتراضي العالمي لدعم بيئة الابتكار والإبداع وريادة الأعمال ونحن نمر في ظروف عالمية دقيقة فمن جهة هناك جائحة كوفيد-19 الذي أثرت على الجميع وتسببت في خسائر هائلة وأضرار بالغة ولكن من جهة أخرى في المقابل هناك تطورات سريعة في مجال التكنولوجيا والتواصل البشري والذكاء الاصطناعي ومن هنا تتجلى أهمية مؤتمرنا هذا وأهمية توقيته وعنوانه والمشاركين فيه ولهذا أريد أن أشكر كل من خطط أو نفذ أو ساهم في هذا المؤتمر منذ بداية القرن الواحد والعشرين أصبح الابتكار هو الثروة المستدامة وأساس تطور الشعوب والأمم وبوابة المستقبل القريب والبعيد وأصبحت الدول تتنافس فيما بينها في هذا المجال تحديدا نظرا لأهميته وتأثيره الحاسم على مختلف المجالات الأخرى إن الابتكار هو الوسيلة الرئيسية لبناء القدرات المعرفية للمجتمعات المختلفة وهو أساس نجاح الأعمال والتجارة والاقتصادات في كل مكان وسط المنافسة الشرسة في هذا العالم الذي أضحى قرية صغيرة السيدات والسادة حضورنا الكريم اسمحوا لي في عجالة أن أضع أمامكم تجربة دولة الإمارات العربية المتحدة في مجالات الابتكار والإبداع والتكنولوجيا والأعمال وكيف تعاملت قيادة الدولة مع هذه المجالات في ظل التحولات الإقليمية والعالمية وسألخص ذلك في نقطتين جعلت دولة الإمارات هذه المواضيع وخاصة الابتكار أولوية رئيسية في كافة أنشطتها وسياساتها وترأس صاحب السمو الشيخ محمد بن راشد آل مكتوم نائب رئيس الدولة رئيس مجلس الوزراء حاكم دبي حفظه الله بنفسه العمل المباشر بذلك وأكد على أن الإمارات تنتهج الابتكار ثقافة ثقافة عمل وأسلوب حياة وفي هذا الإطار أطلقت الدولة أكثر من 2500 فعالية ونشاط مؤسسي خلال العامين 2019 و2020 وشكلت لجنة عليا على مستوى الإمارات ولجنة على مستوى كل إمارة يشترك فيها كافة الفعاليات الحكومية والمجتمعية لضمان التكامل والشراكة الحقيقية في هذا المجال ووفرت دولة الإمارات تسهيلات كبيرة وغير مسبوقة 
لتوطين الابتكار والمعرفة والأعمال في الدولة واستقطاب الكفاءات العربية والعالمية للمشاركة في نهضة الدولة وريادتها ومن ذلك ومن خلال ذلك إطلاق العشرات من الجوائز في مجالات المعرفة والابتكار والتكنولوجيا والأعمال وإطلاق المئات من البرامج التعليمية والمواقع الذكية المجانية بهدف توفير المناخ الملائم للإبداع والعمل ومنح إعفاءات كثيرة وتسهيلات متنوعة لرواد الأعمال بهدف المساهمة في نجاحهم واستقرارهم سيدات والسادة حضورنا الكريم إننا جميعا أسرة واحدة في عالم واحد مترابط والابتكار ضروري للجميع وريادة الأعمال هي المحرك الأساسي للاقتصادات المختلفة وهذا المؤتمر المتميز والمهم حلقة أساسية في هذا النهج الرائد يسعدني أن أستمع لكم وأطلع معكم على أفضل الممارسات والتجارب وأن يكون هدفنا جميعا المساهمة في التحسين والتطوير لمصلحة الجميع أشكركم مرة أخرى وأتمنى التوفيق للجميع والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته نشكر الشيخ سالم القاسمي على الكلمة البناءة ونقدم الآن سعادة المهندس ماجد الحيسوني الرئيس التنفيذي لشركة الشركة السعودية أرامكو توتال يتفضل المهندس ماجد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وعليكم السلام حياك الله مهندس تفضل آه للتصحيح آه معكم آه المهندس ماجد الحيسوني الرئيس التنفيذي لشركة آه تراث المسيو الاجتماعية آه المملوكة لشركة أرامكو السعودية توتال للتكرير والتركيمات سيطر تفضل مهندس ماجد. First of all, I'd like to extend my thanks and appreciation uh, to the team who's uh, work on this uh, uh, international uh, conference, and I'd like to extend my thanks to uh, ecosystem company, uh, the sponsor of this uh, conference, and. Uh, Uh, my special thanks and appreciation to uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Anadi for uh, her effort to uh, engage on uh, the companies and uh, the famous peace people in, in this uh, conference. Um, actually, I'm honored to be here today to discuss innovation and entrepreneurship uh, topics that uh, cultures of economy and social development. This is especially uh, true for uh, experience of Saudi Arabia, one of the fastest growing country uh, uh, in the Middle East, but uh, still relies heavily on oil as uh, the main source and financial services and construction and of the key of the world of the national, national uh, economy. Um, honestly, I will be uh, clear to saying nobody can debate how oil extracting and processing have uh, positively uh, shaped and modernized of Saudi Arabia and JCC country. Uh, it is uh, equal debate that Saudi Arabia uh, uh, future test futures uh, uh, sky scrubbers uh, leave all of our nose uh, up and uh, uh, memorize that uh, when wondering about every meaning of the world development and uh, yet sustain the uh, economical uh, development Uh, and required uh, entrepreneur and authorization, which is especially where entrepreneurship and innovation play the roles here. And contributing to economy and positively and uh, social, uh, social uh, quotients. I uh, would like to share uh, the Kingdom uh, uh, Vision 2030, which is focused on the important of carrying and uh, responsibility to the uh, entrepreneur, uh, uh, the entrepreneurs and uh, uh, care, caring about innovation and uh, entrepreneurship and providing uh, the right environment to the young people with uh, the knowledge and the skills. 
and supporting the talent and innovation while taking care to support the small and intermediate price uh, and the small and medium and intermediate uh, enterprise businesses. In response to this trends, innovation and entrepreneurship centers have been established to be uh, entrepreneur gateway and uh, resource to spread the culture and creativity in aviation and entrepreneurship uh, among young people. And uh, that's to provide an uh, incubating environment for creativ creativity and innovation and development and entrepreneurship uh, and reaching the quality of life, also engaged in society and strengthening uh, entrepreneurship in the governmental and the private sector as well. Uh, this is will promote, by the way, uh, um, promote, promote the, the uh, entrepreneurial culture of the national uh, development. Uh, actually, in this speech, I would like uh, to summarize the inter uh, entrepreneurial uh, efforts and uh, also would like to summarize the important of, of an aviation and entrepreneurship that they are the main pillars uh, of uh, a progress of society. Uh, this is a need. Uh, uh, this is needed in the main purpose of the conference, which is very much welcome. And I would like to forward uh, some of uh, interesting discussion uh, and insert uh, in this important field. Thank you so much. Nashkir al Muhandis Majid al Haysuni ala kalimata. ويتفضل معنا سعادة السيد حسين المحمودي الرئيس التنفيذي لمجمع الشارجة الأبحاث والتكنولوجيا والابتكار تفضل أستاذ حسين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم شكرا دكتورة هنادي على الدعوة Ladies and gentlemen thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this exciting conference and I'm really delighted to be part of this distinguished group as well and share with you our story here in Sharjah. The Sharjah Research and Technology Park is part of an overall UAE government uh, agenda to promote uh, innovation and research and entrepreneurship. Uh, as Sheikh Sultan uh, shared with us, the UAE has a federal innovation agenda and each Emirates has its own approach to uh, innovation. Here in Sharjah, what we are trying to do with the Sharjah Research and Technology Park is to do three things. First of all, we are uh, aiming at developing talents that are capable of developing innovation and uh, research and development activities. Two, we try to develop technologies here by doing technology transfer and by also developing our own technologies. And three, we try to develop and create ventures and design new ventures that support innovation. Uh, we believe that uh, uh, in having a global vision with a regional mission, we believe while there are best practices in different parts of the world, in America, in China, in Europe, in Asia, we believe in the Middle East and specifically in the Gulf, we should have our own model of doing business because our environment is different from any other environment. And this is while it sounds easy, I think it's very challenging because the innovation ecosystem require different uh, pillars or different to topics. So one of the uh, topics that is very important to develop is this, the right cluster and the right synergy between private sector, government sector, and academia. We still have a big way or a long way to go in our part of the world of building synergies and the right language between those three entities. And I think the more that we develop the synergy, we will have better results. The second thing is really, we have to have a focus. I believe for us to be able to really produce innovation, we have to focus on specific topics. We cannot do everything. Uh, so this region, for example, is a, a region where we have a lot of hydrocarbon and we are very big in oil and gas. I cannot believe that with all the resources we have, we still have, we don't have real program research on oil and gas that really produce concrete results that can advance and change the landscape of the industry, for example. And last and but not least, we need the right regulatory framework. Still, 
for innovators and researchers and even entrepreneurship to venture into this field, our regulation is still difficult and it still creates a lot of hassle for them to uh, venture into these things. Now I move to the entrepreneurship ecosystem. The entrepreneurship ecosystem, I believe, in our part of the world, it needs to be more integrated, more integrated with the key stakeholder, whether they are academia or government or businesses. Entrepreneurs have to learn how to deal with those stakeholders and make sure that they live up to the expectation and inspiration of these stakeholders. The second point, of course, is we need to develop also, again, uh, a common language for our part of the world, because today still the entrepreneur speaks one language and the investor community speak another one. And I think this creates a lot of disappointment in the entrepreneurship and also the investors as well. Uh, I believe that the virtual services and the virtual uh, world brings a lot of value. I think we need to evaluate, learn, and iterate what we do. I think COVID-19 brought a lot of positive uh, elements to the way that we conduct businesses. And I think this is a source of power in our part of the world. I uh, again believe that in our region for us to be able to uh, really uh, score and create tangible economic impact when it comes to innovation, we need to have the proper regulatory framework that can support innovation, and this includes also funding and includes the right policies as well. We need also to take advantage of the virtual world and create a hybrid uh, uh, <clears throat> solution that can really maximize our work and can make us more competitive, not only locally, but regionally and globally. I believe we need to create an environment that also match both the virtual world and the real world. And we can also create an ecosystem for investors and investment community. So uh, here in the Charger Research and Technology Park, we are trying to bring the pieces together. And today we are very proud to really develop a significant uh, progress when it comes to transport and logistics. We are very proud to have one of the biggest transport and logistics innovation center in the world. We are developing and trying next generation train solutions. We also have significant progress in the field of additive manufacturing. We print plastic, we print metal, we print concrete all under one roof. We have made uh, progress in the field of agriculture technologies. We have R&D uh, center that does um, hydroponics, aquaponics, uh, uh, vertical farming, as well as centers that promotes artificial intelligence. So we believe our story is a regional story that worth looking at and learning with. As I said, we believe in partnership and we believe in a global vision, but with a local mission. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for inviting me again. And I look forward to collaborate with all of you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you very much for the Mr. Hussain Al-Mahmoudi on the word of the Bannaa. And now we are now the Dr. Kouthar Al-Yu'an, the President of the Women's Movement for the Development and the Peace of the Word. شكرا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أعتذر أولا شوية أيضا خلل لأول مرة في النت فالحمد لله على الأموم شكرا جزيلا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم معالي وزير المالية راعي المؤتمر السيد براك الشيتان سعادة الشيخ المهندس سالم سلطان القاسمي الأخت الفاضلة الدكتورة هنادي المباركي رئيسة المؤتمر أيها السادة والسيدات الكرام يأتي هذا المؤتمر في ظروف شديدة الحساسية وأهمها ظروف جائحة كورونا التي اعترضت وبشدة أن يعقد هذا المؤتمر الهام على أرض الواقع لكن التحدي والتصميم بمبادرة ريادية أبدعت في ابتكارها أختنا العزيزة الدكتورة هنادي المبارك رئيسة المؤتمر وتحدت الكثير من الصعاب في مثل هذه الظروف لتجمع هذه النخبة الرائدة في مؤتمر افتراضي ينطلق من الكويت أرض السلام 
بلك مني ومن أسرة معهد المرأة للتنمية والسلام كل التقدير والتوفيق مع فريقك الرائد أيها الحضور الكريم إن ريادة الأعمال تهدف في الأساس إلى مواجهة المشكلات والمعوقات وتحديات المجتمع من خلال المبادرات والأساليب الحديثة والمبتكرة وإذا كان شعار المرحلة التي نعيشها هو التنمية المستدامة فإن أدواتها هي الإنسان وإمكانيات إنسان إنسان هذه الأرض وإذا كانت غالبية شعوبنا العربية أصبح الشباب فيها يمثل ثلثي سكانها فأطلق عليها شعوب شبابية وعلينا تمكين هذه الطاقات إذا أردنا تحقيق التنمية المنشودة ومن خلال سعيكم الحثيث في هذا المضمار إن كثيرا من التجارب تسعى إلى المضمار التنموي لشعوبها ومنها تجربة بلد الكويت التي نظمت عدة مؤتمرات خليجية احتضنت فيها ريادة الأعمال لمناقشة التحديات والفرص التي يواجهها رواد الأعمال الجدد والبيئة الملائمة لمشروعاتهم الرقمية ومواضيع أخرى منها الاتجاهات والفرص في التجارة الإلكترونية والخدمات المصرفية الرقمية وغيرها ولعل مركز صباح الأحمد للموهبة والإبداع خير شاهد على هذا الاهتمام وأترك للجهات المعنية تفاصيل ذلك أيها الحضور الكريم هناك نسبة كبيرة من السكان من المتوقع تزايد أعدادهم بين عامي 2015 و 2030 ومن خلال تزويدهم بالمهارات والفرص الضرورية اللازمة لتفجير طاقاتهم يمكن أن يكون الشباب قوة دافعة لدعم التنمية وتحقيق الاستقرار والرفاهية المجتمعية وهذا يحتاج إلى التشجيع والتمكين والمشاركة الصوت واضح؟ عفوا الصوت واضح؟ ألو؟ أي نعم أي نعم حبيبتي وهذا يحتاج إلى التشجيع والتمكين والمشاركة في ترجمة خطة 2030 إلى سياسات محلية ووطنية وإقليمية إنهم يلعبون دورا هاما في تنفيذ الخطة ورصدها وكذلك في مساءلة الحكومات وبفضل الالتزام السياسي والموارد الكافية يكون لدى الشباب القدرة على تحويل العالم بأكبر قدر من الفعالية إلى ما إلى مكان أفضل للجميع أيها الحضور الكريم وإذا كانت فلسفة التنمية المستدامة تعتمد على التنسيق الكامل بين الأجهزة وبعضها وتصور السياسات المستقبلية للدولة فإن المرأة تشكل عمود التنمية لأن تمكين المرأة في المجتمع وريادة الأحمال حق أصيل لها وليس مكسبا وهي جديرة به ومن مؤتمركم هذا أشدد على الدول أن تمد يد العون أكثر من خلال إصدار تشريعات وقوانين للتيسير على صغار رجال وسيدات الأعمال من الشباب التي تتيح آليات تمكنهم من نجاح مشروعاتهم وتحقيق أهدافهم لتفادي الفجوة التي تعرضت لها شعوبنا في تمكين الشباب والمرأة ومشروعاتهم التي تساهم في التنمية الاقتصادية وتحقيق النمو المنشود والعدالة الاجتماعية وكل ثقة في أن هذا الجهد سيتواصل لتفعيل أدوارنا للاستجابة والتنسيق فيما بيننا حتى يكتمل الدور بوجود آليات تعزيز التعاون وهو المحفز لنا لنواصل السعي لعمل عربي ودولي فاصل يعزز القدرات أمام التحديات التي تواجه الجميع وفي الختام وكلمة أعتقد مسك الختام كما هي واردة في الجدول إن شاء الله أتمنى لمؤتمركم النتائج الطيبة والنجاح والتوفيق ومع السلام السلام عليكم شكرا لكم مشكورة دكتورة كوثر على كلمتك البناءة ونتمنى بإذن الله مزيدا من التعاون والتمكين والعطاء شكرا دكتورة كوثر نشكر الجميع للمشاركة في في بداية المؤتمر الأوبنينج سيرموني وسيبدأ فعاليات المؤتمر بعد قليل ونشكر سعادة الشيخ سالم بن سالم بن سلطان القاسمي ونشكر الشيخ الدكتور ثاني آل ثاني على تشريفهم لنا وكذلك جميع الحضور والمهندس ماجد الحيسوني والأخ الأستاذ حسين المحمدي على إلقاء كلمات الافتتاح التي 
تمثل دولهم وعطاء وعطاءات هذه الدول الخليجيه تشرف فيكم اليوم في هذا المؤتمر العالمي باعتباره اكبر تجمع عالمي لخبراء الابتكار ورياده الاعمال يجتمع اليوم اليوم وغدا باذن الله اكثر من 80 خبير أو براكتشنرز نسميها وبإذن الله سنخرج بالتوصيات وبالخطوات الجادة للسنوات القادمة بعد انتهاء عام 2020 وتركيزا منا لخطة 2030 جميع الدول حاليا تأخذ خطوات بناءة وخطوات واسعة مضيا نحو 2030 نشكر تواجدكم معنا مرة أخرى وباذن الله ان شاء الله على ان نلقاكم باذن الله في نفس الموعد وبنفس التاريخ سنه 2021 باعتبار هذا المؤتمر راح يتكرر كل سنه كاحد مبادرات الخليجيه لدعم منظومه الابتكار ورياده الاعمال. شكرا جميعا ونبتدئ الان المحاضرات الاولى للسيشن الاولى اللي خاصه في البيست براكتسز اوف انوفيشن ايكو سيستم. شكرا. يتقدم الـ الـ الاستاذ المهندس عبد الله المزروع السلام عليكم السلام يا هلا استاذ عبد الله شلونك؟ مساك الله يمسك بالخير دكتوره مساء الخيرات مساء الخيرات جاهزين؟ والله بخير عندك الحين المايك يعني والسبيكر كلهم متواجدين اونلاين عشان تبتدي تقدمهم وتبتدون باذن الله فعاليات المؤتمر بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أه Welcome everyone. It's, uh, it's my pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, we are on the International Virtual Conference on the uh, Innovation, Entrepreneur, and uh, Ecosystem. Uh, our first session at this uh, very important conference is talking about the best practice of the innovation ecosystem. Uh, at this session, we have uh, uh, three speakers, uh, in addition to me, I'm the fourth one will be on this session. The first speaker in our session will be Mr. Uh, Peter Taylor. It, Mr. Peter is a professor at Urban and Regional Economist, University of Cambridge. And the second speaker in our session will be uh, Dr. Hassam Osman. He is the ICT uh, Minister Advisor for the Innovation. And also the third speaker in our uh, session will be Ms. Abir Al-Hamadi. She is the Director of Innovation and Economic Development at the Qatar Foundation. And now we will move to Mr. Peter uh, for the first presentation. And I will uh, highlight some points about Mr. Peter. Mr. Peter is, he is an extensive track record. He has an extensive track record in undertaking research on the evaluation of policy, of public policy. Also, he has been a project director for over 70 major research projects. Mr. Peter has also undertaken research for the European Commission, and he was the UK expert on the EU assessment of the performance of the EU cohesion policy from 2007 to 2013. And currently, he is the UK and Irish expert responsible for the EU evaluation held up. Please welcome Mr. Peter, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Abdullah. Um, it's a great pleasure to be part of this conference today, and I'd like to congratulate the organizers. Uh, I'd like to talk about the Cambridge High Technology Cluster and some aspects of it. Um, the technology cluster now is, is around about 60 years old. And I'd like to mention some of its key features as an innovation system. Much has been learned about what helps to make it a successful system, but I'd like to consider one very important aspect of it today, which is namely the extent to which both the public and the private sector come together to enhance its effectiveness. Um, I show an example of this by focusing in the latter part of the brief time we have this morning, uh, just at looking at the results of some recent research uh, into the Babraham Research Campus, which is one of the bioscience campuses in the Cambridge Cluster. All of the research I discussed with you today is available through the link shown in the PowerPoint that accompanies my talk, and I do hope colleagues will be able to look at those. 
So if I could just share my screen for the moment. There's the old Cambridge, which uh, many people may be familiar of uh, with, which is um, the old Cambridge colleges. And this sort of picture shows it. There's then the new Cambridge, which is here. This is the laboratory of molecular biology. And of course, the new Cambridge uh, is very much about high tech. So um, there's over 5,000 knowledge intensive businesses now in the area, uh, employing a lot of people with quite a, a large amount of turnover. And of course, the University of Cambridge uh, is a, a university which has a lot of research going on and lots of very research active students. So the old Cambridge uh, has often been running alongside now for 60 years or so with the new Cambridge. And the Cambridge has become quite a successful place for uh, innovation. This shows you just for a recent uh, picture of the buildup of patent activity which is only one measure of innovation, as colleagues will know, but it certainly gives an indication of Cambridge's success as being the, the, the top city in the UK. Um, in the Cambridge uh, cluster, as it's evolved, represents the evolution of three main technology platforms that have been converging. There's the biotechnology, the information technology, and nanotechnology. And of course, this is a very open innovation system with the transfer of tacit knowledge, really helping to integrate the activities. And in general, they built businesses and the ecosystem, the entrepreneurial ecosystem that I was referred to earlier by Hanedi, uh, basically has evolved considerably over the last 60 years. Uh, and as you can see from early beginnings, it's gradually developed through time building on different aspects and organizations and new businesses that have come. And actually therefore that's built quite a powerful system now of businesses and knowledge institutions and other organizations interacting together uh, in the system. Um, many companies here now, so from very small um, academic startups to uh, considerably large uh, uh, companies coming now, foreign direct investment. And so from small beginnings to bigger companies, um, now, the innovation system um, is obviously made up of many different components, but I see the innovation system really being about the integration of knowledge, finance and business, and all crucially in the place. And I think our colleagues today um, are all experts and uh, researchers, of course, thinking about the boundaries of interaction between these different components. To me, successful innovation systems are the ones that integrate these boundaries particularly successfully. And just so much has been learned in recent years. And these conferences like today just help to us to understand more about the key interactions that are so important in the system. Now, I obviously don't have a lot of time today, but I have spent quite a bit of time in my career with others looking at what makes for a successful innovation system. And in the PowerPoint for today, I mentioned a few things I don't have time now in this session to talk about them, but they're there for colleagues to consider and perhaps uh, we could discuss later. And so I mentioned some of the things that I think have helped to make the Cambridge Innovation System successful. And um, they reflect very much the sort of things that have already been mentioned in the earlier sessions today. Um, and there's my checklist for success, which perhaps during the course of the next two days, things will be discussed on each of these. But moving on now, um, I'd like to look more at the bioscience cluster in Cambridge, um, because I think the bioscience system has been one that's developed very, very powerfully uh, in recent year years. Uh, if you look at the sort of level of patent activity again in Cambridge, you can see that um, if you compare it with some of the other world locations, that have got very high levels, then of course America dominates the actual volumes of life science patents. 
But actually, if you standardise these areas for the population, then you see that Cambridge has been uh, punching pretty much uh, with its weight, really. And so um, it's certainly generating a substantial amount of bioscience activity and patent activity. Um, this is, I don't know if colleagues are familiar with the Cambridge bioscience system, but uh, this shows you a map of the uh, bioscience centres uh, that are all the way around the centre core of Cambridge. Uh, now, each one of these centres varies quite in the sorts of things they do and how they actually plug into the ecosystem. So some of them are very much populated by private sector firms. Others are based around one or two more institutes like the Wellcome Trust Genome Campus. And the one I'm gonna talk more about briefly today is the Babyram Research Campus, which has a more mixed composition. Now, it's been quite interesting to look at the evolution of this ecosystem around bioscience. In fact, it's the strong integration, a close synergy between uh, university industry, government and charitable foundations. And this would be the same, I suppose, the world over. But through the years, uh, it's been very uh, interesting to see how the boundaries of interaction have come together uh, following the Venn diagram I mentioned earlier. In fact, the role of the Medical Research Council and other charitable and uh, research funding bodies has been very important. And I think the Cambridge Regional Innovation System now, and I refer to this in the PowerPoint and in the research that backs it up, is very much a, what we would call a quadruple helix. And um, it's, there's a lot of mutually reinforcing links that make that system up with the university supplying, of course, graduates and scientists that produce a large skilled labor pool, the public funds that uh, originate from healthcare, um, helping to encourage research. Much to discuss about this, uh, not much time to, to digest in this session, but a lot to say. And really, I think what we've seen and what has happened over the last 60 years, but the last 20 years particularly, is that the interactions have formed a, a sort of place-based circular and cumulative causative flow. And this diagram, uh, perhaps which we could discuss later, gives you some indication of how the ecosystem sort of works to in, uh, bring the different components together and enable effective exchange of knowledge and uh, entrepreneurialism as well, um, to facilitate the commercialization uh, of the research, uh, as well as, of course, ensuring that it's meeting some of the most important needs of our age in medical science. And I'm now going to just focus in the second part of my talk today uh, and look at one particular feature, which I think has been particularly important in the Cambridge Innovation System. And I'm going to look at the Babraham Research Campus, which was one of the, uh, one of the campuses I mentioned earlier. So this uh, is an example, I think, of where I, the private and the public sector in the British um, bioscience ecosystems at the local level. This is an example of where those two sectors, the public and the private sector, have been able to come together effectively. The campus is uh, made up of about 430 acres. It's a freehold site and the land is owned by the British government. Uh, and was secured about 70 years ago. Uh, it's a highly integrated community of more than 60 bioscience organizations located around the Babraham Institute, which is a center of research and excellence. It's managed by Babraham Bioscience Technologies. And there'll be many colleagues today, of course, I see who are responsible for managing campuses. And um, there's a lot of, um, obviously, um, expertise and uh, to be shared across the, around the world. The campus supports bioscience by advancing discovery and providing facilities and cap capabilities very much for early stage and, and then accelerating commercial life science organizations. Um, the research I'm pointing to today um, is available to colleagues through the link in the PowerPoint. And we've just completed this bit of work looking at the economic impact of the Babraham Research Campus and uh, much of what I, uh, I'm referring to, obviously, is explored in de detail in this report available at the link. Um, the thing about this particular research campus, which I, I feel it serves a niche in the innovation system, 
is that it helps to um, facilitate the development of companies in the life science sector that are typically underserved in the UK and in fact many countries I think. They're at the early stage of incubation and they have an ambition to scale up to an initial public offering. But many of these companies, in my experience, uh, and I think it's true in many countries, they find it difficult to get good um, premises and property and a good startup location. Um, and their um, uncertain viability and relatively high risk profile means they're not attractive to many more commercially orientated science parks. Therefore, by offering um, a relatively uh, a degree of um, acceptance that enables these smaller businesses to get off early through the offer, this, this encourages them to develop and it overcomes a market failure. And the public state supported innovation campus like Abraham, by providing uh, accessible premises, it enables these companies to start up and to progress quickly. In fact, it's important to have very flexible and affordable space on research campuses for this particular type of company. And this just shows you how much the companies on the Babraham campus appreciate that. Um, so what the evidence tends to suggest is that this particular type of campus, which uh, facilitates the early stage startup and allows bioscience businesses to scale up, it's particularly uh, welcome and important in developing the business and, and the wider ecosystem. And the Babraham Research Campus uh, enables the provision of um, facilities as well, uh, all of it on terms which enable the, the businesses to, to flourish and develop. Um, one of the interesting points is the way in which the interaction um, facilitates businesses to come together with the uh, research um, in a sort of neutral space for interaction. And of course, um, in the, not, not at the present times, but normally um, post COVID, the campus would be a hive of activity of lots of folk coming together, people coming together and interacting and exchanging ideas and, and knowledge and deals to facilitate commercialization and entrepreneurial development. Um, the evidence um, in the report, which I allude to, shows that the sort of support structure that can be put in place into this sort of ecosystem can have powerful impacts. And obviously I, I, the evidence is in the report, which I can't go through too much detail now. Um, what we were able to do in the research, and I think this is an important feature of where you get public and private sector funding come together, is we were able to look at how the uh, companies were able to grow what sort of value they were able to create. And interestingly, they created a very substantial return for their investors, as you can see. We're also able to look at how this sort of campus enabled the attraction of commercial investment. And the evidence points to quite substantial impacts from this way of working. Um, it did seem as though the businesses on the science campus uh, the bioscience campus, they were able to accelerate discovery and fundraising and that translated into economic success and the entrepreneurial outcomes that were alluded to earlier. Um, I won't go into much more detail now because I'm running out of time, but what the evidence from this particular study shows is that well-targeted public long-term sector support over a period of time could really enhance the creation of knowledge and drive innovation and enable the entrepreneurial life science businesses to flourish. And this combination of um, research, commercialization and entrepreneurialism seems to be particularly successful in these sorts of campuses and these vehicles. We were able to, um, just to finish up today, we were able to, in the research, look at the value for money that the state, the public sector gets by investing through land related activities of the sort I've referred to what value they were able to get from the investment. And it does look as though there's real additional economic gain from this sort of intervention. Every one pound that the public sector, the state puts in, they get a healthy return to the, to, to the economy of at least three pounds worth of economic gain, a sort of three to one payback, which is a pretty good payback from this sort of uh, system. So lots to discuss today, I'm running out of time, uh, there are the links to the research for those who may wish to look at it. Um, be great to get any uh, questions later on. And thank you for listening. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Peter, for this uh, 
informative presentation and uh, I now move to uh, Dr. Uh, Hussam Usman. Dr. Hussam is the, uh, the ICT Minister Advisor for Technology and Innovation and also works as Vice President of Managing the, te the Technology Innovation and the Entrepreneurship Center. Dr. Usman has over 30 years experience divided between the industries and academia, private and government organization. He was selected, Dr. Usman was selected as the Ontario's, Ontario's best postgraduate student in computing in 1996. Please welcome Mr. Uh, Dr. Usman. The floor is yours. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Shukran, shukran uh, Greetings uh, to all. Uh, conference chair, uh, roundtable chair, uh, distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, uh, great pleasure to join such an important event. Uh, so, uh, uh, like, it's a very kind invitation of you. Uh, so, if you allow me to share my, uh, my screen and uh, show you my presentation. So uh, uh, I will share with you some of the uh, some of the insights based on my, my own experience, some of the insights regarding best practices of uh, innovation ecosystem. Uh, of course, like as a government, we and in Egypt we are uh, a large young population. <laughs> the first step we always talk about is increasing awareness among youngsters about innovation and entrepreneurship. And one important best practice is to ensure that you have a clear, uh, sound, and well-defined uh, uh, definitions for these terms. So uh, you need to emphasize uh, stages. You need to emphasize tangible impact. And as I, I, I engineer myself, you can see that I'm using the multiplication symbol to ensure staging and to ensure the tangible impact of uh, innovation or entrepreneurship. This is so important that if you are really need to uh, promote the good understanding of innovation and entrepreneurship, uh, definitions and applicability and actual implementation need to be emphasized in the term definition. Of course, you have to, uh, again, I'm talking from the government perspective, you have to ensure that the four key uh, innovation drivers are in place. Uh, building capacity in Industry 4.0. Of course, Industry 4.0 is a basket term for many technologies. You need to ensure that you have programs for building capacity along this direction. You have labs as resources for piloting and prototyping and experimentation. You need programs to foster collaboration between uh, academia and industry. And last but not least, you need to have a, a healthy uh, startup scene. Of course, we all know the five uh, key players of the innovation ecosystem and the importance of uh, uh, perfect alignment and organic, we can say organic alignment uh, and collaboration, cooperation between each one of them. This is a very important, uh, uh, like, uh, based on the experience working with entrepreneurs and innovators in Egypt for so many years, uh, whether you are a government official, whether you are an entrepreneur, you have to think of the innovation process as uh, composed of three uh, uh, main components. You have three main components, one related to all the new technology, uh, one component related to market, about personas, about uh, uh, revenues, about uh, competition, 
and one relate to uh, production and implementation, <laughs> to business models, uh, uh, funding, uh, partnership, industry structure, uh, uh, and of course, cost structure, so that you know how you, you help and you support the ecosystem in the right way. It's very important that you link, or let me say it another way, it's important that you de-link and relink the three components together in an iterative way. Uh, linking or de-linking and relinking will give you a better holistic overview of what's happening for inside each component. So maybe if you de-link technology, you see a better market or a bigger market for this technology. So we always, when we do capacity building for entrepreneurs and innovators, it's very important that they take a full benefit of the technology at hand. So delinking and relinking in an iterative way usually will get you very good results, whether you are designing programs to foster innovation and entrepreneurship, or whether you are even an entrepreneur or innovator working on your own startup and idea. Uh, as you can see, uh, like on the same slide, uh, when I talk about the technology, the technology component, uh, it's very important to, in this case, it's crucial to have the alignment between the academia and the industry. Uh, this is a very, like uh, here, if we are talking about collaboration and alignment, alignment between academia and industry is very important for the technology component. When talking about the market, in this case, it's very important and it's crucial to have the alignment and collaboration between the government and between industry. Similarly, if we are talking about the production where you have laws and funding and cost and business models and so on, the perfect alignment between the funding mechanism and the government is very important as well. So uh, like you, you see here how the definition of the innovation, whether it's uh, uh, invention times commercialization, how it's aligned with the three components of the innovation process. So uh, you like uh, you are designing a program to help entrepreneurs, to help innovators. So you have the three components. You do the delinking and the relinking iteratively, uh, uh, filtering out uh, inappropriate technologies, inappropriate uh, uh, markets, inappropriate business models, and uh, and uh, uh, cost structure or industry structures. So as they say, uh, uh, you either fail uh, fast or you converge and you come up with an innovative solution that you are looking for. So again, as you see the, on the slide, starting like if, I, if, if you are designing innovation program to foster innovation, you start with generating so many ideas and you target implementation. But meanwhile, in between, you do this iteration, uh, delinking and relinking, filtering out inappropriate components until you converge and you come up with the target innovative uh, solution or the target innovative uh, program uh, for the ecosystem. One thing from, again, uh, from like uh, dealing with so many, like over 300 startups in our uh, uh, incubation in, in, uh, in Egypt, in the Ministry of Communication and Information Technology, the idea of having a program in place to help startups uh, 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 cross the, uh, the uh, uh, chasm of uh, being between the early stage and the late stage, between the seeding uh, stage and the growth stage. This is very important that you have all the resources and all the uh, infrastructure and capability to help startups uh, cross this chasm and the border between these two stages. Uh, otherwise, they will end up being zombie startups uh, uh, cannot be sustained or cannot be growth, grow in the, uh, in the ecosystem. Having different uh, funding sources in place, you can see on the slide, we don't have much time to talk about how uh, uh, in Egypt we see different foreign investors in our own startups. But what I'm saying in this slide that you need to have the uh, enough and the needed uh, uh, funding uh, uh, sources. And of course, crowd, so crowdfunding from the legal uh, uh, view of the legal perspective is still an issue. 
But again, it's a very important mechanism that you need to work on and avail in your ecosystem as well. So uh, startups have to be trained. They have to learn how to take advantage of the different funding mechanism and uh, how to effectively and efficiently use the fund so that they smoothly can move from one stage to the other. I'm just giving you some a, a quick uh, snapshots about the situation in Egypt. Uh, we were doing fine, like, uh, uh, I mean, the data I have till the first uh, half of uh, 2020 and in 2019, when it comes to the number of investment deals and the ticket size, Egypt was leading, whether on the level of Africa or the Middle East, and of course, uh, uh, in view of the pandemic that, uh, inshallah, we are going to pass uh, very quickly, uh, some challenges are there for the startups and uh, some tailoring were needed in the, the way we support startups and entrepreneurs in Egypt. This is an important slide related to the business model. Uh, most of the startups nowadays, we see that the platform business model is trending, it's growing, but uh, we see some lack of uh, uh, utilizing uh, technologies in the right way. You need, uh, like, if you are going to apply, and that's what we give to our startups, uh, a bit of advice to them. If you need to effectively utilize and use a platform strategy for your solution, you need to better use technologies as like data, big data, data uh, analytics, and uh, AI, and so on so that you make a good uh, uh, like uh, advantage or take benefit of these technologies to uh, implement the business model strategy in the right way. Even for us as a government, we are using a platform strategy to foster innovation and entrepreneurship. As you can see, of course, you need the international and cross-border collaboration to be able to foster uh, and transfer knowledge and foster innovation. As I mentioned, you have to work with different funding sources. You need to foster the establishment of clusters where you have like academia and industry working together. And you need to uh, 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 sub platforms. One platform is a hybrid platform, which is uh, physical in the uh, sense of having a network of innovation hubs nationwide across Egypt. The other one is virtual online platform as an, an online first point of contact when it comes to talking about innovation and entrepreneurship in Egypt. Similarly, in addition, like uh, in addition to having like training centers and academia and so on, it's very important to have a virtual uh, platform for capacity building uh, and you help uh, like uh, students and uh, entrepreneurs and the young population in Egypt learn and build the capacity as we talked about industry 4.0 technologies. Mm -hmm. So you work with the private sector to avail a full portfolio of services, capacity building in schools and universities, looking for innovators through competitions, pre-incubation to help them build their own business models, incubate to turn into startups, and postgraduate services to help them thrive and be sustainable in the economy. So you convert uh, potential, or let me say, aspiring uh, entrepreneurs to potential entrepreneurs to real entrepreneurs, and you have the full value chain and value network in place. So in Egypt, when we talk about the virtual platform to help and to foster innovation, we have Egypt Innovate Platform, Open Data, Open Source Platform, availing different tools and different success stories, ideas bank, and all of these like uh, necessary component to foster innovation among the young population. And as I mentioned, this is augmented with a network of physical innovation hubs in universities nationwide. This is again another very important component of the role that we do when adopting a platform strategy. This is a platform in Egypt we use to build capacity in disruptive technology. It's kind of a nationwide virtual university crowdsourcing uh, uh, the best uh, online MOOCs through the best providers and availing this to Egyptians everywhere for them to learn online, enhance their capacity, work as freelancers, 
and work on their ideas and establish your own startups. As you can see, you can see uh, in the just one slide how things are moving. We started this uh, two years ago. You can see numbers, you can see in different Egyptian governorates, and you see uh, the focus. And uh, of course, we try to do our best for the far governorates to take advantage of this program to learn about new technologies as AI, Internet of Things, cloud computing, blockchain, and so on. So again, this is part of the platform strategy we use as a government to foster the whole ecosystem of innovation and entrepreneurship. So that's all, I'm pleased that it's a pleasure if you visit the teak.gov.eg website and have a better insights about our numbers, about our data, and how we kind, what kind of programs in detail that we are running to help uh, the youngsters in Egypt innovate and build their own startups. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Dr. Osman, for this uh, insightful presentation. Uh, and now we are moving to, uh, to Ms. Abir Al-Hamadi. Uh, she is the Director of Innovation and Economic Development in Qatar Foundation. Uh, Dr. Abir is the Director of Innovation and Economic Development from June 2018 to the present, and she was uh, the IP Commercializing Manager from October 2013 to June 2018, and also she was the Manager of the IP and Technology Transfer from November 2011 to October 2013. Uh, please, Mr. Abir, the floor is yours. Um, yes, thank you, uh, Dr. Abdullah, for the uh, introduction. I would like also to thank um, um, the Dr. Dr. Hanadi and the organizer for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today about uh, the Qatar Foundation um, um, uh, experience and best practices uh, uh, in creating innovation ecosystems. Um, um, I would also uh, like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Peter and uh, Mr. Uh, uh, the, the speakers uh, that uh, spoke about the, uh, their um, um, experience uh, uh, in Egypt and, and, and UK. Um, uh, without uh, further delay, I would like to uh, uh, share my screen with you and Okay, um, so um, I don't know if you can confirm, you can see the presentation. Yes, Habir, yeah. Okay. For some reason, uh, okay. So um, first, I will introduce briefly the Qatar Foundation for those who uh, is not aware of uh, 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 of, the, of the foundation. Then I will speak about uh, the uh, research, development, and innovation pillar within uh, QF. Uh, I will zoom in to talk about the knowledge transfer and industry development office within the foundation. And then I will share some best practices and tools uh, to enhance the innovation ecosystem within the foundation. And uh, I will conclude with some uh, uh, summary point. Um, the foundation have been established uh, in 1995. There are, um, it is one of the largest private nonprofit uh, in the world. We have four main uh, pillars within the foundation. Um, uh, K-12 educations and the school is one pillar. We have higher education uh, as a second pillar. We have uh, Hamad bin Khalifa University, our uh, local um, um, uh, university, but we have a branches, a branch, 
um, branches of uh, U.S. Um, and Western um, uh, universities, such as uh, Texas A&M, um, uh, Will Cornell uh, Medical College, uh, Northwestern University, UCL, HAC Paris, and, and VCU, and others. Um, 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 the third pillar of the foundation is um, um, uh, research, development, and innovation. And I will talk ex extensively about this pillar uh, in my presentation. And the last pillar is community development, where um, uh, the, the, this pillar uh, include, you know, some initiatives such as the Qatar National uh, Library, uh, 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 um, you know, uh, Q, uh, QNCC and uh, other initi initiatives. So, in short, we can say that the foundation is all about uh, uh, empower, empowering uh, human resources, and uh, it, it does so uh, by, um, you know, um, uh, uh, tapping into th those <laughs> four main. Uh, so, um, uh, uh, talking about uh, the uh, research development and innovation um, uh, in Qatar Foundation, the journey really started in 2006 by creating the Qatar National Research Fund. It's a, uh, it's a fund program that uh, fund uh, uh, um, researcher-led um, um, uh, 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 projects uh, competitively. Um, it, 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 uh, since the start, uh, maybe now 14 years ago, the fund um, have enabled uh, uh, a very strong uh, creation, uh, creation of research capability within Qatar. Um, the, um, uh, after 2006, um, the foundation also have created the Qatar um, um, uh, Science and Technology Park which is uh, the first integrated pre-zone accelerator incubator uh, because it was established in 2009. Um, 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 then in 2010, uh, the Qatar, Qatar Foundation also created a biobank, uh, which co collect a, compre a comprehensive sp spectrum, of, uh, spectrum of the Qatari uh, biomarkers, um, um, and those are available for researchers to research on. Uh, since 2009 as well, the foundation have created uh, three uh, research institutes, one uh, for the area of bi biomedical research, one for the energy and environment, one for um, uh, computing research. Um, and in 2012, the foundation also have created the Qatar Genome Project, um, a a project dedicated uh, to do whole genome sequences, sequencing of the Qatari genome. Um, um, uh, um, I think this year uh, we are at the milestone of sequencing about 22,000 uh, genes so far for the Qatari population. So all the uh, research institutes that has been created, all the fund and input that um, um, the, the foundation uh, have pushed uh, in the country really um, uh, have created a strong research platform uh, um, uh, in the country. Uh, it's a life research uh, ecosystem. Um, the, uh, this led to uh, making, uh, you know, um, uh, part, uh, partnering with the global universities around the world uh, much easier. Uh, it's made it easy to attract talents to, uh, to Qatar. Uh, um, it had uh, increased the, uh, the number of PhD students uh, about um, uh, 20 times since the start of the foundation. Um, uh, we can say now that the research quality uh, that is produced within education uh, city is really top tier, you know, uh, especially in the area of medicine, engineering and computing. So, uh, you know, creating such a platform, platform for knowledge creation, um, there was, you know, by 2013, a real need to create tools to manage such knowledge that uh, and commercialize such knowledge that has been created. So, um, uh, in 2013, uh, as I said, 
the uh, Office of Industrial Development and Knowledge Transfer has been created, and some um, initiatives, um, new initiatives within the uh, Qatar Science and Technology Park also has been created, and I will talk more about uh, those. So um, the Office of Industrial Development and Knowledge Transfer, it is man it's a technology transfer office. It is mandated to um, uh, manage the intellectual property portfolio for the foundation um, uh, to commercialize and license such technologies created within uh, to create bridges within the in, uh, local industry and uh, um, um, uh, to, to, to develop uh, such uh, technologies, but uh, also to recognize and incentivize uh, our researcher, you know, um, and the student uh, uh, to, to um, uh, keep innovating and uh, uh, creating new ideas. The office does not only manage the uh, intellectual property for the foundation, but it also uh, collaborate with many entities locally. Uh, it provides services for local entrepreneurs as well. We have a Khabir uh, program, which we provide uh, free of charge IP consultancy for, uh, for local entrepreneurs. Uh, we manage the IP portfolio for a number of entities outside the foundation as well. So just to give you an idea about um, the size uh, of the uh, QF uh, IP portfolio, this is the number of uh, invention disclosure that we receive from either our own researchers or research that has been funded by the foundation, um, how much protection we did. So we do protect, uh, protect any idea where we think uh, where, is, uh, where the market is for this idea. So we have a growing portfolio of uh, patent applications. Um, um, uh, we do trademark protection, copyright protection, patent protection, whatever we see uh, suitable for the idea. And um, I can say so far that we have around 90 uh, granted patents uh, uh, globally that is owned by the foundation. I think uh, we can kind of see uh, the other slides that you are talking about. We only see the first slide. Uh, at least, um, really? Um, yeah, yeah. Because this is looking to me. This is what is looking to me. But it's clear from your presentation. Everything is clear. But I think we didn't see the slides itself. Uh, I'm really, I'm, <laughs> I'm not sure where is, uh, because it says to me. Uh, wait, wait. And by the way, you still have three or four minutes to. Uh... Okay, so um, I will continue anyway. Yeah. Okay. And um, um, I will, uh, as as explained before by the speakers, you know, um, 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 in this uh, conference, there are three main pillars to uh, a successful uh, uh, to a successful uh, innovation ecosystem it's the technology itself it's the people that develop this technology and get it to the market and uh, of course uh, fund is always uh, always uh, important uh, uh, to push innovation so i will share uh, with you some examples of um, um, yani how we create uh, how we manage the technology part of it first Let's say, first of, uh, we we do it by uh, by partner, uh, uh, getting into partnership with a leading institute. Uh, one example um, is the Qatar uh, Computing Research Institute. They have a, a number of partnership with MIT, Boeing, uh, with the local industry like uh, Qatar Airways, uh, uh, with uh, every ministry, and those collaboration have really resulted in a good um, state-of-the-art technology that get licensed uh, to a startups, and uh, those innovation is now being developed to uh, be in the market. Um, 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 another uh, very important is 
for the intellectual property to be um, vetted carefully. Every disclosure that received by the office uh, get uh, ev evaluated carefully. Uh, it get funding uh, to uh, uh, to uh, further mature the idea, and and uh, we look at uh, full intellectual asset portfolio, uh, not the IP itself. We sit with the researcher to make sure that they understand what is valuable and it is uh, protected. We have licensed data to a local uh, companies because data were very important for the company to develop their uh, 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 technologies. Um, when it comes to um, you know uh, 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 training and and uh, getting the people ready, uh, the HR component of innovation, uh, we have created the special tools for our researcher, such as the innovation fellowship, which is. Uh, um, uh, a position that free the researcher time only to uh, do commercialization and uh, uh, you know further de-risk their technologies in order to prepare them to be launched in the market. Um, uh, we have uh, also now one test where we allow the um, uh, researcher that develop a specific technology to take entrepreneurial leave. This is fully paid leave by the foundation in order to, for, for him to support the startup that licensed this technology um, and transfer um, the, the knowledge how into the uh, people that work on those um, uh, technology from the startup side. Um, um, another uh, special program is the research to startup program in QSTP, which is, um, uh, you know, uh, um, we bring the entrepreneur from um, uh, around the globe to look at our technologies and license them to them so they can create startups. Uh, we have created culture within education city, uh, many uh, challenges and, um, uh, you know, um, uh, programs that uh, uh, also uh, foster uh, innovation for, for, for a student. And uh, finally, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, funding is important. We have uh, a plenty of uh, funding programs for the innovation. I know that I took longer than um, excluded. Uh, longer than expected, but uh, uh, to conclude, I mean, uh, the, the foundation is, is working uh, really uh, um, hard to push innovations from their side to the, to, to the local community. I'm sorry for taking longer. Uh, thank, you, Ms. Abir. thank you, Ms. Abir, for this uh, interesting presentation and uh, a lot of information that we learned from it. And now it's, uh, I think it's my turn to present my uh, presentation. Uh, I will not be uh, that long. Uh, um, since I forget to present my, to introduce myself at the beginning, I'm the Abdullah al Mizrou, the Director General of the GCC Patent Office. I work in, in the field of the IP since 2012. Uh, so uh, now I will share my presentation with you. Okay, so uh, I will talk. Uh, is everything clear for, for you also? Yeah. Yes, it's clear. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I will. I will talk about the innovation ecosystem, the this practice of it, and uh, in this regard, uh, I will highlight some information about the innovation ecosystem itself, and then. At the final, I will uh, go through to the best practice of this innovation uh, ecosystem. So before, uh, at the beginning, we will uh, see now uh, why do we need to, uh, to talk about the ecosystem. The ecosystem itself, we can define it as the players uh, and stakeholders and community members that are critical for innovation. And uh, in this regard, I will talk about the statement of the problem and then we'll move to the players and some, uh, we'll highlight some information about uh, the models of the innovation ecosystem. So why do we need to define the problem uh, to be able to build our success, successful innovation ecosystem? 
and uh, this is uh, from that we can uh, we can gain some benefits uh, from building that uh, the right ecosystem in our region. So those benefits we uh, may highlight on it. It's uh, we can by by that we can solve real uh, problems and also diver, diversify the economy and then creating jobs. And this is the final goal for any innovation ecosystem in the economy. In the economy. Uh, the innovation uh, ecosystem sometimes faces some challenges uh, when we go going to build, build it for our region or for our nation. These challenges uh, uh, could be uh, that we are going to uh, face several players and also there are several innovation ecosystem models we have to choose from. And finally, how to design the KPI uh, for the innovation ecosystem because the KPI is a very important part of these challenges we have to deal with it in order to, to get to the right uh, innovation ecosystem in our region or for our region. Uh, also by this, I will highlight some uh, obstacles that facing the GCC, GCC innovation those obstacles in general is the low of spending on R&D. Uh, unfortunately, uh, most of the GCC countries, uh, their spending on innovation is less than or about 0.5% of its uh, annual GDP. Uh, some GCC uh, members on GCC states are above that, but uh, most of those countries are around this number. And they are going, they are moving to where to increase their spending uh, because the, the benefits uh, from the innovation ecosystem, especially and the innovation in, uh, in abroad. And the other uh, obstacles that we face in our region is how to transform or transfer, uh, transfer from uh, transition from. Uh, uh, oil-based economy into the knowledge-based economy. There is some uh, uh, work should be done, do in this regard to be to move smoothly from uh, the previous uh, uh, area into the new area. Uh, one of the other uh, challenges also we're facing are the budget, uh, how to uh, uh, get uh, access to funding for those uh, innovation projects. The third one of our obstacles that we may face is the low percentage of the workforce employed in the knowledge intensive sectors. Also, we can find the limited incentive measures and this ambiguity in our region. Sometimes it's, it's not clear uh, the incentive measures itself. Also, the lack of comprehensive strategy to support uh, micro and small medium enterprises. Our previous speaker is talking about the small and medium enterprises uh, is important in the innovation process. And finally, I will mention that here the low of uh, the, the low number of scientific researchers and the lack of highly skilled human resources. Uh, by the way, those uh, obstacles are not equal in all the GCC member states. Some of the GCC member states face some of the part of these challenges and the others uh, may face a little more or, or lower than these uh, challenges. And now we are going to the players of the ecosystem or the innovation ecosystem. Uh, these players are different by different national ecosystems. And in one uh, innovation ecosystem, we may find those players or may define those players as the government and universities, entrepreneurs and innovation labs and research institutes and also the, big, uh, the business foundation. What the government can do in this regard, the government can play its very important roles, uh, and also the government can play its roles from 
uh, abroad to downward, uh, upwards to the downward, uh, like most of our countries. And uh, I think in the U.S., there uh, the government rule uh, starts from downward to upward. So what the government can do in, uh, in, to the, uh, in respect to the universities, it can establish university and also can promoting inter university co collaboration. Also, the government can funding the research institute and also promoting collaboration between the research institute and its region. And also, the government can providing the industry with the platform uh, for the knowledge sharing. Uh, the government also uh, it can uh, what you call the governing the IP protection and services. The IP protection can be done through the IP offices, even if it's uh, uh, regional or national IP offices. Uh, now I will go to highlight some uh, on only three uh, models or three framework of innovation ecosystem. The first model is the 7i framework. And this uh, type or this kind of framework is suitable for the early stage countries. And the other two uh, framework or models are suitable for developed countries. Most of the GCC uh, countries is familiar with the SRI framework. The SRI industry cluster models comprising in three areas. The first area is the economic foundation and the related and supported industries, and then go up to the knowledge-based industries. The economic foundation, there is five elements uh, at this uh, area. Those elements are the human resources, which is the skills force, workforce, and the policy framework also, capacity and financing so to, to get to the, to the funding, and also the innovation system and the infrastructure. Uh, the infrastructure, we have two, uh, maybe two kinds of infrastructure, the digital and uh, legal infrastructure that support the innovation. The interaction between the eco economic foundation elements and the related and supported industries uh, is taking us to the, uh, to the goal, to our goal is to get to the knowledge-based industries. And as we can see now, uh, I will move to the the third uh, type or the third models of our uh, innovation ecosystem, it's uh, the open innovation. The open innovation uh, focused uh, itself in, on uh, five elements. Those elements are uh, as follows, the networking. Networking is very important to uh, be able to make partnership with others. And also through, the color, uh, through collaboration, we can save risks and costs. Uh, also, uh, by the IP management, we can uh, licensing uh, our internal IP and also looking for more external IP. These are the five elements of the open innovation. Now, uh, I can see the open innovation and in, uh, our area is getting uh, more and more uh, because it's uh, as we know, as we know, as we all know that no one company or no one institute has the all answers for each problem. Now, now, what is the relationship between the open innovation and the IP rights? As we can mention, as you can see, the open innovation is based on sharing the ideas and the research between uh, the parties or between the institute, while the uh, IB rights itself is uh, it's, uh, dealing with or it's talking about the excluded others from using firms, ideas, and invention. Uh, from the uh, concept, we see that there is a contradiction, but I think from my point of view, in reality, uh, through the IPR, we can also enhance the innovation, and through uh, the uh, IPR, also 
uh, by using the open innovation, we can have uh, IP rights. So these IP rights are shared by those players or those uh, party uh, that share to the open innovation project. Now, uh, it's very interesting to uh, also to read what the Philips company said about the open innovation here. Uh, she writes uh, that this innovation research is based uh, often uh, is often best carried out through partnerships. Uh, the days of innovation is in isolating isolation are over. No one company can be expected to know all the answers. This is right, and this is very important uh, and interesting also uh, announcement or. And we can move right now to the to the best practice uh, of this uh, innovation ecosystem. It's not easy actually to to get to the best practice of uh, each uh, innovation ecosystem in for each countries or each regions, uh, because as you know, it took uh, Boston and Silicon Valley years, if not decades, to build their ecosystem ecosystems. And uh, by this, I can also suggest that the best models uh, for our regions uh, is the SRI uh, innovation ecosystem. Uh, the SRI innovation ecosystem is uh, focused on the five uh, following elements. It's focused on human resources, infrastructure, especially regarding to the institution and facilities, and also uh, to the government innovation system and finance. Uh, once we, uh, once we uh, have these elements, we can reach to the successful innovation ecosystem. And by this slide, I think I reach to the end of my presentation, and also I still have uh, less than one minute, uh, so, uh, Thank you so much for listening, and uh, I can now, uh, Dr. Al Hanadi. Well, now we can move uh, to the round table if it's uh, if it's possible. Okay, I think uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Peter is with us now. Yes, we're waiting for, yeah, 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 we're waiting for, uh, yeah, Peter is now with us, and Dr. Asman is also, and Mrs. Abir, uh, I can see Ms. Abir. Are you around, Ms. Abir? Yes. Yeah, thank you so much. So uh, now we will go to the round table, and uh, I have some questions for Mr. Peter, if you don't mind. Uh, it's... Uh, Mr. Peter, uh, in developed and developing countries, uh, the importance of innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem leading for economic diversification. From your point of view, uh, what is the shortcut pathway for successful implementation? So, I, I, I mean, I, I, th I think as I, I tried to uh, just briefly mention in my presentation, uh, as, as we've been saying this morning, uh, the, the crucial uh, thing to do is to integrate the boundaries of interaction between all the different sectors that you and, and our other colleagues have been talking about. And to me, those boundaries sometimes can be very hard to um, make more permeable. And so we've learned a lot over the many years about how different uh, approaches, different ways of working and projects, and sometimes different vehicles, institutions can help to broker those boundaries. And um, my advice to, to in any, uh, you know, any country, uh, any part of the world that's seeking to build their ecosystem is that they obviously look at best practice over the years in where other places have developed from. And it's often very hard to break some of these barriers down. So sometimes university professors are reluctant to commercialize. That's less so these days. Sometimes it's quite difficult to make people be incentivized to see the opportunities to interact. 
So I, I, my advice really is to, uh, is to look at the evidence and to understand how best to incentivize the interactions. And then uh, as we're discussing in general, once the thing begins to move, it gradually builds that momentum. Uh, and it's a bit like starting uh, the, the first phase is the hardest to build the, remove the inertia. And once one understands the, the merits and the gains from interaction, it seems to move a lot quicker to me. So sharing best practice like we're doing today is, is a way forward that which brings rich dividends. And when I look at how, we, how advanced our interactions are now compared to say 30 years ago, 20 years ago, it really is a massive change. I mean, obviously many things to say, <laughs> sorry. Uh, th thank you, Professor uh, Peter. That's very useful uh, answer. So uh, I think uh, I will move now to Mr. Uh, Dr. Osman. Uh, Dr. Osman, I have a question for you, if it's possible. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, my question is, uh, through collaboration between developed and developing countries, from your opinion, what is the best practice of, the, of practitioners to be taken uh, to fostering the inter integration process between countries. Yeah, like uh, I feel like from from our own uh, experience in, in experience in Egypt, uh, a cross border collaboration between uh, uh, different countries uh, under the umbrella of different instruments, like uh, the uh, European programs and so on. Uh, like uh, what we do in Egypt, for instance, that we uh, keen to partner with different uh, uh, like uh, uh, countries uh, worldwide through a program where we foster R&D between different parties. So we do matchmaking between the uh, uh, ecosystem players in Egypt, for instance, with the ecosystem players in another uh, European or uh, uh, the US or another country. And we as a government, we give some incentives to the local players who will participate in such an engagement and the other partner will do the same for their own uh, counterparts. So at the end of the day, we have like an umbrella and we do the matchmaking between the parties, between universities, industry and the counterparts uh, uh, worldwide. And we give them incentives how they work together to address a challenge that's needed by both. We are successfully doing this with many uh, European countries so far, and we have many uh, running R&D projects in Egypt under our own umbrella uh, for this scenario, where they work together and we uh, kind of pay and handle our own locals to do the same for their own locals. And similar, we do this for the capacity building as well, like for capacity building of uh, students and of graduates take advantage of the new disruptive technology. Again, it's very important to do cross-border collaboration with others so that we transfer knowledge and we build capacity of our young population. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Osman, for this uh, information and your uh, uh, kind reply to my questions. And uh, uh, Ms. Abira, are you ready for my question? Yes, ready. Okay. Uh, let me ask you almost the same question that I asked Mr. Uh, uh, Peter, that uh, I want to uh, learn your opinion about the, uh, in case of the in developed and developing countries, the importance of uh, innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem leading for economic diversification. From your point of view, what is the shortcut, the best way for successful uh, implantation? In this regard, I appreciate your answer. Uh, thank you. First, uh, in my opinion, there is a, no shortcut to, uh, to innovation. I think the process of uh, uh, creating knowledge is, is a long-term process. I mean, when I look at, uh, you know, a researcher, I ask them how many years you are researching on this field. If it's uh, 10 years at last, then I think he has something uh, that may be ready for commercialization. Um, um, I think this is a key aspect in, in managing the expectations um, uh, uh, on what outcome uh, that need to be uh, made, uh, you know, uh, 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 from from research based uh, entities. And and second point I want to to emphasize on is like 
I believe with COVID, especially this year, there is no no option, you know, but to create an innovation ecosystem. You cannot survive uh, given the huge challenges globally without, uh, you know, uh, having a, a system that could innovate and, uh, you know, uh, g get such uh, innovation into the marketplace and capitalize on them. And the most important thing I always say is the people. You know, you invest in education, uh, you invest in, um, you know, um, uh, 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 in the experience. Like uh, uh, for me, you know, um, um, it's not about the technology. I said there is three, three components. There is the technology, the fund and the people. But the, what is really important is the people, because if the person is, ca uh, is, is uh, capable, he will get the money needed and he will create the technology needed for the innovation ecosystem. And, and, and this is my answer. And thank you, uh, Mr. Abir, for this uh, direct answer to my questions. And uh, I think by this, uh, Dr. Al-Hanadi and uh, uh, our uh, speakers, I thank all of you. I thank Mr. Peter and also uh, Mr. Hassan and uh, Mrs. Abir for uh, being with us today and uh, hope that we can uh, see you next time. Uh, uh, we really benefit from each of other and learn a lot from each of other. And my thanks, and my extent, I, I could also extend my thanks to Dr. Uh, uh, Hanadi for um, organizing this important event and invite us to be part of it. Thank you so much for all of you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Abdullah for your chairing uh, round table and chairing the sessions. And now uh, I think Peter, you take uh, the sessions, next sessions. More than welcome Peter to join. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. Anita. Yes, yeah, so I'd basically uh, like to begin by uh, introducing our four speakers in this next session. Um, we, we have uh, Ashley Bretner, who is the Associate Director of Economic Growth at the Institute University of Michigan. Um, then we also move on after that to uh, Ali Malaki, uh, who's a founder and CEO at Traxon in the USA. And then we'll be hearing from um, uh, Carmen Quam Quig, who's project manager at the Economic Growth Institute in the University of Michigan. And then Jim Baker, who's also at the University of Michigan. So uh, perhaps we might begin now uh, with Ashley, if you could take us through your presentation, please. Good morning, everyone. Let me just share my, in good, after, good afternoon also. Uh, let me share my screen here real quick. One second. Okay. Should be able to see my screen now, Peter. Are you able to? Yeah, it's clear. Thank you. Okay, great. Okay. Hello everyone, uh, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Ashley Breitner, and uh, as Peter mentioned, I'm the Associate Director for the Economic Growth Institute at the University of Michigan. Um, I'm here with an esteemed panel of professionals to speak about how universities support uh, the you know, innovation ecosystem, particularly a few universities um, out of the United States. Today, I'm going to start off by telling you about the Economic Growth Institute, um, our mission, and how we, in particular, support the innovation ecosystem. The Economic Growth Institute has been in existence for almost 40 years now at the University of Michigan, uh, providing economic development programming and essentially applied research to build more resilient businesses and communities. Uh, to also to connect university innovations with small to medium sized enterprises and to provide student learning experiences for the next generation of community and business leaders. Our professional staff 
has been actively engaged with small to medium sized businesses and communities across the state of Michigan. And I'll show you where that's at here in just a minute. Uh, throughout all of our history, so we really focused in on those small to medium sized companies and really engaging with them. We draw on, on the resources of the university and the Institute to, to additionally conduct applied research. However, we're not a traditional academic group. Um, our staff has extensive professional experience, um, many working in the manufacturing environment um, in, in a variety of different industries. Uh, and we also understand the needs of businesses. So our work includes both support for both businesses and communities. Um, and EGI, as we're referred to often, also has a well-established network across the University of Michigan, but not only there, across all of the public universities in our state, and there is 15 of them. Uh, we also have an extensive network with small to medium size enterprises across our state, hundreds of service providers in numerous communities that Carmen's gonna tell you about here soon. For those of you that are not familiar with where Michigan is, um, as you can see here, as indicated on the map by the red arrow, we're in the northeast side of the United States. The heat map on the right there um, is, it covers three states, so Michigan, Ohio, and Indiana. The one that's shaped like a mitten there is Michigan. Uh, that's where we are located in the southeast corner. Uh, this is the region that really represents the majority of companies and communities that we have supported throughout our programs and with our research and throughout our four year history. I'm gonna start off by telling you about some of our industry and innovation programs. Uh, then I'll talk briefly about our research and here in a few minutes, you'll get that chance to hear from Carmen about our community, the community aspect of our work. <clears throat> in the Venn diagram you just saw on the first slide that describes our areas of focus um, between industry and tech innovation, we see going to market as a key focus area for the Economic Growth Institute. Through uh, one of our many successful programs uh, called the small, or excuse me, called the First Customer Program, uh, we co-fund projects with service providers to address the challenges that clients face in acquiring their first customer. So first customer program is focused on advanced technology startups, startup companies, as well as established technology companies that are facing similar challenges to those just getting off the ground um, as they're diversifying into new markets. The Institute really helps these companies to make the challenging leap from product development into revenue generating sales. Another successful innovation program operated by the Institute is called the Small Company Innovation Program. Uh, this is funded through the, our state of Michigan um, and Small Company Innovation Program provides matching funds to businesses to conduct research, um, research projects at any public university throughout the state of Michigan. Small businesses uh, trying to navigate the university ecosystem for one university can be challenging enough for them um, and the many other things they're trying to do to operate their business, uh, let alone trying to find the best resource across 15 public universities. So that's really where we come in and providing the most value, um, helping them to connect to the resources that are going to be most beneficial for getting their product to market um, and helping to do so at an affordable cost. We always like to highlight some of the client case studies that have went through our programs. Um, here you'll see on the screen Alchemy Solutions. They're a Troy, Michigan based firm uh, focused in education and tech. They're an education and technology firm uh, that develops innovative applications to help students learn. Um, they have participated in our small company innovation program. The founder really had an in depth understanding about how students learn in, in particular topic areas, and they saw an opportunity to use technology to improve learning outcomes and assessments. Uh, the, the company applied design principles from the entertainment focused game.
they wanted to make it fun for the user experience um, and the user interfaces to create intuitive learning applications tied to a detailed assessment platform. But while the company had developed an innovative product, they really faced new challenges in scaling their business and growing their sales. So recognizing that this was a big hurdle for them in particular, the company sought assistance from our first customer program first. Um, the program staff at the Economic Growth Institute really helped Alchemy to complete a market assessment. And then they helped them to develop a clearly scoped project that could help the organization get really detailed sales traction. Uh, the program in particular helped Alchemy identify a, a, a particular consultant uh, with significant experience in high, higher education technology sales uh, that helped them to ultimately build a solid pipeline of hundreds of faculty throughout a staged email marketing campaign. Uh, with its sales growing, then uh, Alchemy still had product development goals to attain. And uh, so customers and investors wanted to see research validating the effectiveness of their application that they were developing. So they started in our first customer program. Uh, once that went successful, then we were able to help them through our small company innovation program. Um, so Skip was able to actually identify um, and helped fund a project with a researcher, particularly this one happened to be at the University of Michigan, which many of our projects don't necessarily land here at the end of the day. They're in those other public universities I mentioned. Um, and this program sponsored a longitudinal study of the effectiveness of Alchemy's mechanisms uh, learning platform and application with chemistry, chemistry students at the University of Michigan. I'm not going to uh, steal his thunder in telling you now about Traxon, uh, but we are also very thankful today that we have one of our small businesses that have went through our program here to speak with you next after I'm done speaking here soon um, and to tell you their real world perspective of engaging with universities throughout the ecosystem. So before we get to that though, I wanna tell you a little bit more um, about some other areas at the Institute that, that we, we foster innovation. <clears throat> so uh, broadening our innovation reach with companies, the Institute also is working in collaboration with an organization called Global Detroit uh, to host the University of Michigan Entre Global Entrepreneur in Residence Program. Our global entrepreneurs work part-time at the Institute uh, in our innovation programs, two of which I just spoke to you about, providing their entrepreneurial experience and expertise to assist local companies in Michigan that are on similar growth trajectories that, as they are in their own company. Uh, these innovative global entrepreneur and residents are not only supporting the local entrepreneur communities, but they're continuing to grow their business um, as, they're, as they're supporting local companies. They're contributing to the local region's economy with, um, as entrepreneurs. Um, and some of them are actually even starting uh, initially here to export their products and services to international markets, really helping to boost not only our local economy, but also the nation's. Moving on to research now. So the, our institute offers uh, rigorous research capabilities while remaining close to the application necessary of research that translates into meaningful economic impacts. <clears throat> You'll see from the graphic here um, how our intelligent, we see that our intelligence gathering from the industry experience staff that we have coupled with our traditional academic research of benchmarking emerging best practices and strategic issues in businesses and communities really feeds into operating our effective programs and providing technical assistance um, in innovation and economic development. I have just a couple examples here of our research um, over the past few years. One example um, of our recent research is actually a study we conducted on lab to market best practices of organizations 
across research universities and the public sector. So this was a national study on successful technology commercialization practices at public doctoral universities in particular. The study was supported by the US Commerce Department's National Institute for Science Standards and Technology or NIST. Um, and it explored the technology partnerships in universities that have received the Association of Public and Land Grant Univer Universities Innovation and Economic Prosperity designations. Another example of the Institute's research was a partnership with the New Economy Initiative. Together, we undertook a comprehensive regional study to better understand philanthropy's role in establishing and supporting an inclusive network of entrepreneurs, um, entrepreneurial support organizations. <clears throat> the Institute helped NEI to reach individuals across the state uh, through a structured outreach and surveying program. We obviously know in this space that funders are vital to the region's entrepreneurial ecosystem. Um, and they can really be more effective when they understand the structures and resources that create success, which was the outcome of this particular research study. Um, our most recent research study though, just conducted this year, looked at workforces within the innov innovation ecosystem local to the Michigan region um, and, and near and dear to our hearts from the automotive industry. Uh, we specifically focused on middle skilled jobs within the connected and automated vehicle sectors and identified knowledge, skills, and abilities, as well as gaps in the workforce now and looking into the future. So beyond our programs um, and our research, we now actually also teach what we do at the Institute. So the Institute offers two courses in collaboration with the Center for Entrepreneurship at the College of Engineering here at the university. We teach technology commercialization is, is one of our courses. Um, as we know from this session's presentations and throughout uh, the day here, um, universities are a major source of new technology and the University of Michigan in particular hosts the largest research enterprise in the country. The potential of moving new discoveries into lab and applications significant, but the process sometimes does obviously pose challenges for researchers and industry. So the Institute developed and launched this course, um, in particular drawing on cutting edge methods in technology commercialization. And the class challenged students to evaluate technologies developed by university researchers and proposed commercial, commercial applications. So they learn and, the, and they, they convert that over to um, brainstorming and coming up with I, lots of different ideas as to how uh, they could commercialize that particular uh, that application. So after many rounds of evaluation, the, team, uh, the teams within the class actually finished the semester by presenting three potential applications for their technology. In a separate course we teach called Reimagining Companies Through Innovation, we teach students the fundamentals of how, how to evaluate a company and strategize its growth opportunities. So this is what our project managers do every day as they engage with companies. During the semester, students are led through a process of evaluating a firm, exploring its market environment, interviewing its leaders, um, and presenting recommendations for business improvements. The course really provides an unmatched perspective on the complexity of businesses that sometimes don't, students don't always see in their academic careers. So that's the Economic Growth Institute um, and, and the ways in which we contribute uh, to the innovation ecosystem in particular as a non-traditional academic unit at the university. For questions, yeah, here is my contact information. Please feel free to contact me if I can provide any further detail um, about the, the Institute or how we engage. And next up, I'll turn over the floor or maybe the screen, I guess, now today for to Mr. Ali Malakai, CEO and founder of Traction, here to, today to speak with you and tell you about his experiences um, in particular with the FIRST Customer Program and other university innovation resources his company has learned to utilize here recently. 
Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, so I wonder if we could move over now then to Ali. Um, I believe you're here. And, uh, I am here. Yeah, thanks. Uh, perhaps you could lead us straight on. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ashley. And good morning. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Let me just um, start sharing my screen. Does everyone see my screen? Yes, thank you. All right. Um, my name is Ali Malaki. I'm the founder and CEO of Traxon. It's a pleasure to be with you all this morning. Uh, today, first, I'll sp speak with you a little bit about Traxon and what we do and how we came to be. And then I speak a bit about entre the entrepreneurial ecosystem in southeastern Michigan and our experience as a startup here. And it's sort of a, it bridges the conversation with what Ashley just presented to you. I do have to level set your expectations. This is early morning for us and I'm only on my second cup of coffee here. So um, we'll see how that goes. Um, we were founded in 2018 with the audacious goal of increasing the trucking industry's profit margins by 50%. We're doing this using our AI enabled advanced driver assistance system, which we call IQ Cruise. As a bit of background on me, I've spent the last 25 years in the auto and trucking industry uh, in leading electric and driverless vehicle development efforts. And I've de delivered proof of concept and uh, platooning self-driving vehicles, both on the trucking side and the passenger car side. And all along somewhat foolishly believed that, you know, fully driverless vehicles were just around the corner by 2015 and then 2017 and 2020. Um, and now we all know that this is a longer road to go and we have more work to do. And uh, in 2018, I found the Traxon with a single-minded goal of using all of the breakthrough technologies and the AI that we had developed for full autonomous driving, but to bring a driver assistance product to market today, a product that wasn't hindered by regulatory and societal barriers and had an immediate return on investment for both customers and investors. So we focused on a business to business market, an industry that focuses on return on investment and payback period. And that is the heavy trucking industry in the United States and globally. This industry has lots of pains. They have very razor thin profit margins. The fuel cost is by far one of their top issues. A few pennies per mile can make the difference between thriving or going out of business. And additionally, there is driver shortages that is a chronic problem and a growing problem for the trucking fleets. Experienced drivers are getting older and new drivers have a significant learning curve to become safe and fuel efficient. So a well thought out and immediately available driver assist solution built upon the advanced driving technologies can address many of these pains. Our solution, as I mentioned, IQ Cruise, it utilizes artificial intelligence, advanced optimization technologies, and big data learning. And we take adaptive cruise control to a completely new level of cruise control, which is IQ Cruise. So the system works by using sensors and high definition maps, and they run on a pro proprietary high performance compute platform. We sense the surrounding environment and we plan accelerations and we fully control the speed of the vehicle while the driver steers. Of course, the driver has full control of the vehicle and they can override the system if needed. The system works by optimizing over three different time horizons or distance horizon rather. On a short distance horizon, we observe and understand the driving scenarios and we provide a smooth human-like driving style. For instance, in response to a merging versus a passing scenario, if you're on an on-ramp or an off-ramp, we understand these scenarios and we handle many of these scenarios the way a human driver would. On the medium horizon, the system has a detailed road information for up to the next three miles ahead. We call that the electronic horizon. And it responds optimally to upcoming grades and curves and speed limit changes and weather and upcoming traffic. And that's yet another level of optimization. And on a over the long distance horizon from end to end, IQ Cruise plans the overall speeds for each road segment that the vehicle is on. For example, if the driver has remaining hours of service, 
and the arrival depot is busy and backed up, we utilize the additional time by slowing down the vehicle to minimize fuel consumption, right? And by reducing the idling and backup at the arrival depot. So this type of end-to-end -end automated speed management has never been done before. And it's, it's truly novel. So that, that is how we utilize the advanced AI to apply it to a solution that we can launch today. And as the late Steve Jobs would say, there is more. First, by driving more fuel efficiently, IQ Cruise reduces brake and tire wear. Second, it has an inherent driver coaching and training benefit by showing a better driving style to the driver. And if the driver doesn't engage our system, we can still evaluate the driving performance and create gen generate training reports for the fleet managers. Um, we track the vehicle location, its performance, the state of health and road conditions all in real time. And lastly, the systems can learn from each other on how to drive different drive segments. So this is kind of a crowd learning that the systems get smarter over time. So I'm sure you're wondering uh, what does the system's performance look like outside of PowerPoint in real world? Well, over the last two years, we have logged over a million and a half miles of data from our customers trucks. And we use this data to train and tune our algorithms and to baseline our customers' drive cycles and driving behaviors. And we've been also driving our own small fleet of trucks on the customer loads, on, on the customer routes and hauling their loads. So once we were confident in the results, we ran a field trial in partnership with a leading authority in the US called on freight efficiency. They're called North American Council for Freight Efficiency also known as NACFI, and we completed this in the late July. This was a 6,000 mile route, roughly 10,000 kilometers, uh, from Michigan to North Carolina to Las Vegas and back. We ran this field test with identical trucks and loads. So we took all other variables out that affect fuel efficiency, other than the driver against IQ crews. And then we turned the IQ crews on on one truck, and off driver on the other and switched back and forth and ran the entire test. So the various percentages, percentage points on the map, they indicate IQ cruise fuel efficiency improvement on that segment over the manual driving improvement. Our average fuel saving for this route as certified by NACP was 7%, which in and of itself is unprecedented and industry first achievement. And our customers are extremely excited by that number. However, as the system continues to learn and retrain, we've been able to achieve the 10% target average that we have aimed for on our customer routes. And so far, in terms of where we are, uh, we've completed our hardware and software development to production readiness. We have all of our supply chain and sourcing agreements and manufacturing plans in place. We have partnerships in progress with major tier ones. We have protected our intellectual property by filing patents, and we hold a significant amount of trade secrets software as well. And we've been working with many fleets to collect data, and we have run our cross-country test and validated our performance. We've signed letters of intent with customers, and we're launching pilots with them. And um, this has all obviously been possible because we've had uh, a uh, an incredibly talented team in, in this area. Uh, our team of 20 engineers, we have more than 200 years of automotive and truck industry experience, specifically in the automated vehicle development systems. And what sets us apart from our competitors is that being in this area, in the greater Detroit area, we have deep industry experience. At, at the same time, the theoretical AI and advanced controls backgrounds to be able to safely develop and validate and launch an actual automotive product like this. Our CTO has 15 years of self-driving experience with Magna, Denso, General Motors. Our COO has two decades of full vehicle launch experience, including EV startups. And as the CEO, I have led business divisions and business units of several large auto and truck tier ones in self-driving and advanced technology areas. And I've also been doing a uh, startup uh, and incub corporate incubator work as well. And we do have a highly seasoned board of directors and advisory board and the ecosystem that we will mention in, a, uh, in the upcoming, which is a topic of the, the talk. Um, 
So we had, at the founding stage, we had the choice of setting up shop in the company in Silicon Valley or any other location of our, our choosing. And we, and we chose Southeastern Michigan specifically for its mobility ecosystem. Uh, the mitten, as Ashley showed, that's where we are in uh, uh, 15 minutes uh, east of Ann Arbor. Um, and as a lot of the speakers have shown today, a startup needs infrastructure amenable to its field of operation. It needs investment, it needs a talent pool of employees and advisors, it needs technology services, it needs suppliers, and most importantly, paying customers. And Southeast Michigan provides ample amounts of these resources for the mobility startups. Um, there are large universities with specific automotive curriculums in the uh, in this area and they fuel research and they attract and educate a great talent pool. Uh, the area is also literally a map of who's who in the automotive OEMs and tier one suppliers from all, all corners of the world. If you make cars or auto parts, you're likely to have a facility within a hundred kilometer radius of where we are. Um, at, at tracks that we have drawn upon the resources in this area. Um, since the very beginning, we utilized Ashley's Michigan Economic Growth Institute first customer program and small customer, customer innovation programs in, in terms of developing our, our sales and marketing material. We engaged another group within the University of Michigan called MI Lead. This is a group of postdoc students who, do, who did two rounds of market research and customer discovery for us. We put Traxon through the rigors of the Center for Venture Capital and Private Equity one full semester of a finan finance course uh, 629 VC practicum, uh, where the university MBA students helped us develop and improve our business plan. And we draw on the, upon resources in, uh, from Ann Arbor Spark and Michigan Economic Development Corporation and many other entrepreneurial uh, resources in the area. And needless to say, when it comes to mobility R&D infrastructure, test facilities, and third-party validation comp companies abound in this area. We've been utilizing the American Center for Mobility and Michigan Technical Resource Park test tracks. And there are many test party, third-party testing companies for hardware and software testing and validation in this area as well. And uh, lastly, there are capital sources in this area as well. I'm the first to admit that the, in, in terms of availability and maturity of institutional investors, we're probably not close to Silicon Valley and some other tech hubs, but we're getting there. This ecosystem is growing significantly. Um, and I, ho I hope you found this, this talk informative and useful. My contact info is here. I'll be happy to answer any follow-up questions you may have and stay happy and, and healthy. My best. Thank you, Ali. That uh, was uh, really interesting, and I, I've already got one or two questions lined up for you. Uh, but we, we now move to uh, Carmen Quigg, who's project manager at the Economic Growth Institute at the University of Michigan. She's got uh, many years experience managing public funding projects, both the local, regional and national uh, level. And so, Carmen, uh, over to you, please. Good afternoon, and thank you, Professor Tyler. I'm going to take a minute to share my screen. Oh, um, actually, if the organizers could share my screen, that would be great. I'll, I'll go ahead and do mine from my side. One second. I hope everybody can see that from where they're sitting. Yeah, it's clear. Yes, we got that, thanks. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for having me here with you today for this session on best practices and innovation ecosystem, specifically the university support to the innovation ecosystem. Um, I work with my colleague, Ashley Breitner at the University of Michigan Economic Growth Institute, um, and she did a really good job explaining how our institute 
plays a role within the local, regional, and national ecosystem. I'm going to share a few um, perspectives of how we engage with communities. Um, while you've had a chance to listen to how we engage with companies, um, I'm going to share the perspective of in a, in a, um, integrating and um, uh, effectively working with communities to advance their economic development initiatives. Um, my name is Carmen Wells Quigg. As I mentioned, I'm a project manager at the Economic Growth Institute. Um, I have over two decades of working in community economic development projects and programs, mainly throughout the state of Michigan, but also regionally and nationally. Um, my uh, my main role is to manage publicly funded programs in those areas. Um, I assist communities with strategic planning and project implementation. And I also serve this role of facilitator, data collection, um, project analysis, and report writing as well. One of our main goals is to not only engage uh, work groups within communities and on the larger scale, but also um, engage smaller groups as well for equitable uh, economic development projects. Um, the slide that I have here is one that you saw earlier from my colleague, Ashley Breitner. Um, I won't go into detail here, um, but I will just highlight that, yes, we have um, nearly four decades of experience working through this institute to develop programming and applied research to communities and companies throughout the ecosystem. Um, our work helps to build more resilient businesses and communities and connect university innovations with small and medium-sized enterprises and provide those student learning experiences that we talked about in the previous presentation. Um, we uh, apply all of those factors to community engagement as well. Um, you had a good presentation just a moment ago from Mr. Meleki regarding the engagement with companies. Now I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail about how we uh, foster engagement with communities um, within our region. Um, we have helped over uh, uh, hundreds of local, state, and federal government agencies, nonprofit organizations, and private businesses strengthen their local and regional economies um, through um, uh, uh, facilitation, research and analysis, technical assistance, and implementation. Our institute engages with communities in the Midwest to assist the economic growth, infrastructure development, business strategy to help sustain jobs and invite more businesses to the area. Our institute's definition of community is any city, county, township, or regional area that could benefit from program assistance. The institute's programs interact with each community's local stakeholders to establish areas of assistance and support. So we very much value stakeholder engagement at the beginning of an initiative or a project and work with key stakeholders throughout the whole engagement. So there's local control, local support of any um, investment that we make from our office or as a best practice from a university into the community. Um, historically, we've provided rapid response to economic dislocations. Um, we've provided assistance in a variety of industries, including the automotive industry, the defense industry, um, and now into the power and utilities industries. Um, and we provide a number of um, uh, uh, products and services and programs to address these initiatives. I'm going to go into these in detail in a moment. Um, our community engagement, we have very specific goals when we engage with communities and is to provide solutions for economic development plan projects, um, but also help them strategize for some unplanned projects. And even in times of economic distress, we help them pivot to new solutions um, after they've gone through a planning process. We respond to immediate needs that universities have. We assist and help stabilize local economies, as well as helping to develop longer term engagements. Um, we value equitable engagement. We value organized facilitation and we foster quality engagements of all stakeholders and impart the value of the balance of power. So when we invite stakeholders around the room, our goal as, as facilitator is to not um, um, have a hierarchy of power, but have an equal balance of power. Um, and our goal ultimately, when we engage with leadership and stakeholders in a community is to um, 
um, encourage them to develop their own plan and for us to help them meet their goals. I'm going to go into a few more details now about um, the types of support that we provide. Um, one of the things I mentioned earlier was um, uh, detailed and strategic facilitation. So our team is uh, trained in stru structured facilitation process. Um, and what we do when we start to work with the community is to uh, identify the stakeholders and we facilitate communities to work better, understand their common objectives and develop strategies around achieving these objectives. Our engagement initially is to meet with the stakeholders, provide an equitable um, ar arrangement and engagement with local support to develop a strategic plan that would either be developed or updated to meet their local and regional needs. Um, facilitation is key to our engagement. Uh, we use it quite often and we have a process for engaging with them so that there is a um, uh, uh, a, a, a sense of well-being and community among and trust among the key stakeholders. We also provide deep research and analysis services to our community partners. Um, we apply, we we provide both applied and translational research. We, we, we produce intelligence reports and analysis reports that include market research, feasibility analyses, impact studies, and more. Um, we take the basic research that we conduct in relation to how something works, mostly economic or socioeconomic conditions within a region, and then we conduct the analysis and apply that in a variety of development of solutions. Um, we do provide translational research. I think Ashley spoke to that a little bit earlier, but as it applies to communities, we can not only um, take what we've learned and apply it to companies, but we take what we learned and apply it to communities as well. So the process remains the same um, and we develop solutions for those communities for their current or planned challenges. Our recent work includes work within the areas of workforce development technology, entrepreneurship, um, supply chain mapping and strengthening, commercial corridor development, and more. We also provide technical assistance and implementation of programs. Um, this is when communities need very specific research done to solve a very specific challenge that they're working through at the time. Um, we do this to provide uh, to develop programs, to transform local and regional ecosystems, and to strengthen the local economy. Um, our uh, technical assistance areas um, are similar to some of our research and analysis areas, but they all go a little bit deeper. And we do asset mapping, feasibility and analysis studies. We do benchmarking, strategic planning and management, as well as project implementation. Through thoughtful engagement, um, we feel that universities over time develop frameworks and tools to increase the capacity and success of ongoing regional university engagement and ultimately strengthen the local um, economic ecosystem. The Economic Growth Institute has facilitated technical assistance programs for communities to address disruptions in industries such as automotive, defense, utilities, and power, as I've mentioned. And then lastly, we have a, an, an evaluation component that we employ when we work with communities on their economic development initiatives. Um, this is when we uh, uh, create um, survey tools, we distribute those survey tools, we collect the information not only for to inform our own research, but then sometimes we turn those into reports to inform the community at large. Um, we provide recommendations um, and uh, um, um, information and data in the forms of reports so that other communities would have a roadmap um, for altering their engagement or to develop new programming over time. Again, these reports are used both internally as well as they're published as best practice case studies. So some of the large takeaways um, and the broad impacts that universities uh, and institutes like the Economic Growth Institute um, uh, impacts communities um, and, and that we, we manage programs and grants, but ultimately um, our work is felt within community, within 
uh, a specific distance of the investment. Our goal is to serve a wider region through publishing papers and research and presenting at conferences such as this so that the best practices can be shared um, and replicated by other communities. Ultimately, a strengthened and empowered community and community economic development ecosystems is what um, our goal is and the goal for um, the larger, broader innovation ecosystem. So with that, um, my contact information is, is here. Um, we have a lot of case studies and reports attached uh, at our website URL, which is hyperlinked um, there, as well as I'll be able to answer any questions when we get to the question and answer period. Thank you. Thanks, Carmen. Uh, we now move to uh, Jim Baker, who's Associate Vice President for Research Administration at Mi Michigan Technological University. Jim has a PhD in Environmental Engineering and teaches on IP Law, Technology, Society and Innovation. So Jim, over to you. Thank you, Peter. I will share my slides. And uh, standard check, hopefully you can see that. Uh, so as, as Peter mentioned, uh, I, I work at uh, Michigan Technological University. Um, my title is Associate Vice President for Research Administration, which includes responsibility for technology commercialization, uh, which for us includes a substantial component of startup business development. We are active um, due to some ecosystem issues that I'll talk about briefly. Uh, we are active inside uh, the startups that, that are created around the technologies that we create. Um, and as such, are very integrated with the regional um, and broader extra regional innovation ecosystems. Um, so, you're going to hear across this conference from a whole host of great presenters talking about topics within their organization and across their organizations. Um, and in the context of best practices and the issues that we face, I wanted to spend a few minutes to talk about the ecosystem development practices and what I refer to as a resource constrained environment. Of course, resources are always constrained, but we find um, circumstances where they're sometimes more constrained. And to illustrate, I'll, I'll reference you know, natural ecosystem types. On the top, we have a rainforest ecosystem, which is rich in resources, also a heavy competition for those resources among a diverse um, ecosystem network, a diverse food web. In the middle, we have a, a mountainous tundra region, more limited resources, uh, but still, a vibrant ecosystem with, with many components. And on the bottom, a, a desert ecosystem, which is highly, highly resource constrained, but also has a vibrant ecology, has organisms, has resources, and has um, everyone has a strategy to, to access resources they need for survival. Um, and in an innovation context, we have very highly developed ecosystems, typically in urban settings. Um, we have other settings less developed, but, but still developed and undeveloped settings. Um, in an ecosystem setting, in a uh, just a human habitat setting and an innovation setting, um, we see some parallels. There are strategies to flourish in all, all of those types of ecosystems and to kind of continue with the analogy in a highly developed ecosystem, we may have mechanized farming, very resource intensive, very high output. Um, and then we may have less resource intensive, less output, but still sufficient to meet the needs of the local population. And then in an undeveloped ecosystem, we may have a hunting and gathering strategy, if you will. We go find the resources rather than cultivate the resources. And we have to tend to travel to do that. Um, so to continue from Ashley's geography lesson, um, this is where I'm at in Michigan is in the Upper Peninsula uh, in, the, in a town called Houghton, Michigan. Also the county that we're in is Houghton, Michigan. And we are very distant um, to many major markets. Um, we're in Michigan, so often associated with Detroit and the auto sector. Um, and Mr. Maliki mentioned that, you know, the richness of the ecosystem in Detroit for, for automotive in particular. Well, we are 550 miles, uh, almost 900 kilometers from, from the city of Detroit. 
And so very distant from that rich ecosystem. Our closest large city would be Minneapolis, Minnesota, uh, which is 300, four, almost 400 miles away or a roughly six hour drive uh, for us and very limited air transportation. Specific to Houghton, we're in the upper peninsula of Michigan um, and just wanted to reference some demographics in terms of uh, that are relevant to the resource constraints issues. Uh, the county that we're in has a, a footprint of a hundred or a thousand square miles with roughly 35,000 people or roughly 35 people per square mile. We have a median household income about 70% of the, the state of Michigan average and 65% of the United States average. The entire peninsula that you see on the map here, the, the upper horizontal um, peninsula has uh, 16,000 square miles and only 311,000 people. So 19, 20 people per square mile. And from end to end of that peninsula, it's over 500 miles, um, over 800 kilometers. You can it take a day to go from one end to the other. Um, so that translates into some resource challenges. Um, again, resources are always constrained. Uh, innovation, entrepreneurship, everything requires you know, more resources are always more advantageous, but we have significant resource challenges in terms of talent availability, particularly founders and mentors with experience. Um, but, as, but as well, just we just don't simply have that many human beings. Um, 500 miles, you can drive 500 miles and go through 300,000 people. Uh, very low population density, very low talent density, particularly in the technology startup space. And that generates an additional problem of substantial professional risk associated with moving. If, if we recruit someone to participate in one of our startups, it's highly likely that they're gonna to have to go more than 500 miles to find another startup or find another company in a similar business. And if things don't go well for that startup for various reasons, sometimes they don't, the startup just simply doesn't succeed. The, the market wasn't what they thought it was gonna be. Sometimes there's interpersonal differences with the team. There's all sorts of reasons that people don't work out within any company. And when that happens, they're faced with then moving their family 500 miles. So they, make, they have to make a very serious decision um, when they come into this resource constrained environment. Of course, there isn't a substantial amount of wealth in the region, uh, which then turns into capital challenges. Um, the nearest angel capital source for us is roughly 300 miles away. Uh, the nearest venture capital source for us is roughly 500 miles away, just in terms of travel distance. And we, we then also have infrastructure. We live in, a, in an undeveloped area, an unphysically developed area. So we challenged with, with suitable space for companies who need it for manufacturing or other things. And those who don't need space, we do have challenges because of the lack of population density it translates into return on investment challenges for the infrastructure providers. And we do have IT access. I'm, I'm here um, from my home and I have fiber to my home. Um, so we do have great access in some locations. We also have no access in other locations. So companies can only pick certain areas to be successful in. Um, we also have networking challenges just as a sheer fact of the distance and lack of population density. Um, we also have some cultural challenges based on the tradition of the area and the, the lack of resources turns into a risk aversion um, when we don't have substantial financial resources, don't have substantial talent resources who have previously been successful. Uh, we see a lot of aversion to any type of risk at the community level, at the company level, at the individual level. As I mentioned, we do have some communication infrastructure challenges, which then turns into challenges, particularly, so we have logistical challenges just because of the distance to, to meet people. And then while the uh, COVID in some senses has leveled the playing field for us, you know, very unfortunately for everyone, um, since everyone is meeting remotely, uh, that has helped at least in that we've reduced our travel burden, but we now have infrastructure issues with communication. If you're not on the main line of the fiber, you have limited access. That all turns into challenges for market access, both from a, a contact and engagement standpoint, 
Um, who are the suppliers? Who are the customers? How do we get to know them? How do we become familiar with them at a deeper level than can be done by telephone and video? Um, and then of course it turns into logistical challenges. The distance to transport physical products from here to any market um, is, is a major challenge for all of our companies. So um, there's really nothing here that, you know, no, every startup and every innovation ecosystem, of course, has to exercise these best practices. But for us uh, and for others in resource constrained environments, I would argue they're the difference between survival and death. Um, whereas in resource rich environments, um, they're the difference between success now um, or maybe success lady, later or slow success. Um, of course, you have to leverage these practices, but again, for us, it is a make or break situation. Um, we have to apply creative, flexible, and deliberate approaches. We have to do all of the above. We have to be deliberate, we have to be creative, and we have to be flexible in how we look at engagement of resources. We talk about uh, a geo-smart approach. So in some senses, we can turn the disadvantage of our lack of density of businesses, lack of density of people into an advantage in that we can partner um, with whomever and wherever we think is best. Uh, and best is not measured by the best of the best in terms of the companies and the individuals to interact with, but it's a combination of the distance issues, the familiarity issues, the relatedness issues, but we can pick anyone because it, we're gonna have to be distant from whoever it is. Uh, so we select the features and benefits of the best partners for them and for us, um, and then we partner. Manufacturing is gonna be someplace where um, it needs to be, finance is gonna be somewhere where it needs to be, and we will focus the pieces of the team locally if we can. Uh, sometimes we, we have none of them locally, but if we, if we can have them locally focus the ones that can work despite our disadvantages. Um, we are relentless in networking. Um, and one of the strategies of that, and I'll talk briefly about within when one of the next slides is, to, is we always seek to add value. So when we network and engage with organizations, we try to do so in a way that we are delivering value to that organization. That makes the relationship, since we don't have um, a physical connection, again, in COVID times, that's, that's a challenge regardless. Uh, we try to make a top of mind connection by being very active in, in working closely with organizations rather than just being familiar with organizations and individuals. And we're very aggressive in partnering. We're always seeking individuals with aligned interests, organizations with aligned interests. How can we make the whole greater than the sum of the parts by, again, creative, flexible, deliberate, and even aggressive partnering. How do we do that in a, in a very deliberate way? Because we don't have the resources here to do it. Um, and therefore we won't survive if we don't connect with those resources. Uh, but very briefly, I wanna talk about the local ecosystem. So we've built an ecosystem on campus. We call that Husky Innovate. It is a series of programs and resources that is specifically designed to serve campus uh, constituents, students, faculty, staff. Uh, Michigan, the state of Michigan has a program called the Smart Zone Program, which is a state subsidized business incubator network. And we have a local Smart Zone that we collaborate with very, very closely. Um, we work on the pre-company formation side and they work on the post-company formation side nominally, although we engage them very heavily in our pre-company activities. And, and then they work, us very, work with us very carefully in the post-company activities. We also have a local program of the National U.S. National Science Foundation Innovation Corps program, which is a, a well-established training program um, and a number of other resources. I wanted to make the point that we've engaged both public and private. We're very deliberate about engaging private sector resources, including service providers and capital providers. They are part of the ecosystem and must be deliberately engaged. Externally, we put a lot of time and effort into building and establishing relationships. Um, the Michigan Economic Development Corporation you've heard about from the other presenters is a cornerstone of ours. Um, we do partner with the Economic Growth Institute in terms of the resources that they have. Our other colleagues um, at, at larger technological universities across the state, uh, capital sources, we, uh, we serve on investment review boards, we serve on valuation boards and for 
many regional investment funds and, and, and national investment funds. We engage our uh, Silicon alumni, our Silicon Valley alumni through the, the bottom left, our 14 floors program. We have an active program engaging them. Um, and Global Detroit has come up before. So Detroit again is 900 kilometers from us. We are actively engaged as a board member in Global Detroit because we see talent throughout the region as a resource. Just a quick example of success. We have Orbian Space Technology, which is located in Houghton, Michigan in this small town building satellite thrusters um, and has successfully raised Silicon Valley um, venture capital. We've been able to, they're a good example of integrating the resources under other circumstances, this company would leave the region, but we were able to knit together enough resources to keep them in the region and bring resources to their success while they partner with those outside of the area. Uh, and so this is my contact information. And with that, we can move on to the, the open portion of the panel. Thanks, Jim, uh, very helpful. Uh, so um, I wondered if we, I might go back then and ask my first question to uh, Ashley. Uh, your organization, Ashley, has experienced over many years, I, I think 40 years. Um, I, I was really interested um, how you felt the, the needs of small startups that seeking to move from ideas into business. I wondered how you felt they changed in recent periods. Um, I, obviously, I, perhaps your institute been looking at those sorts of things for 40 years and there may be uh, a view over that but um and, and that thus then how has that been reflected in the development of your small company innovation program that's a great question and obviously here most recently uh with the impacts of covid we've seen their needs change pretty significantly um mainly in the area of connectivity so they can't go to these networking events uh that traditionally we would make them aware of um, and suggest that they, they do to develop their network and expand business opportunities um, in the same traditional way that, that we always have meeting in person. So, um, you know, our programs have really shifted to try to offer them opportunities and make sure that we're making either more direct connections for them or offering online events like the one today uh, for them to engage with others and have that opportunity to really build out that network that is really critical to their success. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ashley. So, um, I mean, the connectivity thing, of course, has been uh, exacerbated by the COVID crisis, but are, are there any more sort of um, ongoing things as well that you feel besides the, the connectivity issue and the access things? Are there particular issues now which are becoming more important, do you think, for that, which the, uh, the, the innovation program you're talking about is focusing more on? Yeah, I mean, the other main one that I can think of off the top of my head is obviously just the advancing technology. Um, you know, when we started the small company innovation program um, and the first customer program, we were focused in the technology sector and helping technology companies. Um, but technology is rap so rapidly changing in order for them to stay up on the latest and greatest of what's coming out there to keep their products really um, up to speed with the, the speed of business. Um, we also have to move at a much more rapid pace than, than sometimes universities are designed to do. So that's why we, we really tap on our industry experienced professional staff uh, to make sure that those companies are moving at that pace and being connected to the advances in technology at a quick rate. Yeah, I mean, one thing which uh, I seem to find is that a lot of businesses are quite concerned that they, they, they don't know what, what they don't know, if you know what I mean, in the sense that with... Um, development of AI and many other things uh, that are pushing the boundaries very quickly, it seems to be ever becoming more and more complex for them to actually access state of the art and know. So it'd be interesting to, to share your experiences on that. So um, thank you for that. Um, You're welcome. Uh, Ali, I, I was fascinated to, to see the way in which you, you, you were using AI to enable fuel efficient driver assistance. Um, and I, in the second part of your talk, you really got into the issues about how the ecosystem uh, could help you translate your ideas into prototypes and uh, into, into a, a, a marketable product. Um, I, I suppose one question which you might expect me to ask, or well, I have two questions, but one question was, uh, which did you feel was 
probably of the most importance to you in your early stage of trying to move into prototype development. So of the ecosystem offer, what did you feel was possibly the most critical to you? Um, the ecosystem of the infrastructure in terms of test facilities and partnership companies in the, in the area that we could develop the product. I spent uh, time in California working on uh, electric vehicle startups uh, years ago. And uh, one of the, the things that we used, we used to call California an automotive desert because we couldn't find the test track in the, in the you know, vicinity that we could drive an EV to and test it. We would have to you know, shuttle it uh, somewhere. So for us, within a three kilometer radius, there are half a dozen test labs that we can do electromagnetic testing and shake and bake testing and environmental testing. And all of these things are very scarce in most other areas. Area. So that was that was one of the you know primary drivers for us, and obviously people this this network of folks and talent in the area who speak the language of automotive. And when you say, okay, have you done your FMEA? They know what that means. But if you said that somewhere else in California, they, they don't know what that means. And that means failure modes and effect analysis. So when something fails in an automotive component, what kind of results would you get? Yeah. I hope that answers your question, Peter. It does very much so because my second part of the second part of the question really was exactly this prototype development aspect, that, and in fact, you've partly answered it for me because it looks like with Michigan in its rich and historical uh, evolution and development in the autos. I mean, fundamentally, that was the ideal place, therefore, for you to be. And I suppose the lesson for colleagues today is that you you play to your well, I suppose what people call the cluster strengths, don't you, in seeking to evolve your programs of support. And, uh, and as you say, I mean, it's, it's fitting it to the, what the place can give the most advantage to, which uh, I think this is an excellent example of that. So uh, I really did find that a great case study for us today. And, and Carmen, I, I, my question for you, um, really, you, you talked very clearly about your, how you engage with communities through your programs. Um, I, and I, I, I really felt it was very well developed now. <laughs> My questions are really sort of quite simple, humble question, I suppose. Um, and one I've experienced myself, um, I can see the value of what you do, but how do you get people to pay for it out there in the communities? Because that always seems to me to be a major issue. How do you actually manage to get folk uh, from the broader communities who haven't got very deep pockets how do they manage to acquire and access your resources? Thank you. Um, we at our office spend a lot of time making uh, and developing relationships with um, state and federal funders um, and sometimes funding from foundations as well. So we take on the role of trying to find funding that we can in turn um, provide the technical assistance to the communities. Sometimes those projects end up being 100% um, funded for a community um, where they wouldn't have to put um, dollars into the project. They would put their time uh, and other resources into the project. And sometimes they're co-funded projects. So we're able to provide them with partial funding for them to accomplish their goals. So that is one of the missions of our institute um, to procure those funds and in turn uh, reinvest them back into the community. Um, that, that's a great question. Um, a lot of times our community partners uh, who have projects have already embarked on um, trying to find funding on their own and then we just guide them through a process based on our resources and network and knowledge um, and then sometimes they already um, have found the funding and they're looking to us for technical assistance so there really is just a variety of ways but yes uh, funding is a huge barrier and um, uh, it's one of the first conversations that will come up uh, when we start an engagement. Um, but again, we're a solutions provider. And so we really look to find the best pathway forward uh, for a, a community partner um, to embark on it. And a lot of times I didn't really go into great detail about this as well. But when I talk about the community stakeholders, again, a lot of times they're uh, members of um, local and regional municipal government uh, and um, uh, uh, nonprofit representatives. But a lot of times we have corporate partners around the table as well 
um, aiding to the solution for the community because of course um, our corporation sponsors small to medium sized businesses as, as Ashley has identified um, they're keenly interested and in, um, helping to make the community where they have uh, decided to um, plant roots just like Mr. Malecki has mentioned you know they're keenly interested in making that a better um, environment as well and reinvesting so we want to make sure that we hear from our corporate sponsors when we talk to stakeholders locally and sometimes they have resources Sources as well to aid a community project. Thank you, Carmen. I, I think this is quite an important takeaway for many of our colleagues, perhaps listening today uh, in, in systems where, <clears throat> where <clears throat> there might be difficulty in communities accessing funds. I mean, you are a broker in that sense. You are helping to help them get the funds. And uh, that, that's so important. And of course, uh, my understanding of the American situation is that you do have a lot of non-profits uh, based organisations who uh, will, will take help to facilitate that process and uh, other countries of course may wish to develop that sort of approach so that that's very helpful so thank mm -hmm. you for that uh, and and Jim now just moving um I, I, it struck me that the, I found your talk actually fascinating I mean you're doing innovation ecosystems in remote landscapes uh, I mean you are very remote in your what you have to deliver and um I, I mean it struck me that um this is a, an interesting topology isn't it with which to characterize innovation ecosystems the degree of remoteness that they have to stand up to and address uh, but I, I i can't resist the question um that you you mentioned that you've got this uh, geo smart approach to deciding how you prioritize where you're going to put resources and I can see that you've got to be very, very clear about that, given the, the, the circumstances you face. But I, I was just dying to try and understand a bit more about how did you decide to prioritise those resources? What was the some of the crucial elements again here? I know this is a very unfair question because I know it's a very difficult thing. But I, I just I was just fascinated by your, um, your, your, your the way you did that and just to understand a bit more about it for our colleagues. Sure, and, and the prioritization is really on a case by case and opportunity by opportunity. So we simplify that by doing it on an opportunity by opportunity basis. Um, and so, I mean, you had talked about clusters earlier. So we have had talked over the years in the, in the regional ecosystem about you know, how do we create clusters? And my bias has become, we can't, we don't have enough density. We don't have enough mass to ever create a cluster. And so when an opportunity comes, we look at the characteristics for that opportunity. Is it is it IT? Is it, is it manufacturing? What is it? And then we look across the globe and where are the pieces where we can connect with? And we look at where do we have relationships? We look at where do we have relatability? So industries that understand and people who understand what we do, where do we have some logistical advantages? But it's, it's really at an opportunity by opportunity and not at the, the ecosystem approach is we will go find what we need when we need it. Um, and from who we need it from. Um, and, and we're just, we're deliberate and, and accepting of that, that we're not gonna create a cluster. We don't have the density, we don't have the mass. And so we will expand the boundaries of every opportunity to enable a cluster to be created without geographic limitations. So thanks, Jim, a very customized approach. Uh, well, uh, we're just w one minute over our time, but uh, can I thank uh, Ashley, Ali, Carmen and Jim for putting together a, a really nice integrated set of discussions today. And I've certainly taken away a lot from it. So I, think, I really hope that we, we're able to talk and carry on our discussions through the usual channels. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everybody. I'm Tom O'Neill. Is there, are you supposed to moderate this session? Hi, Professor Tom, how are you? Good. Uh, where is Larry? I see him on, I see he's on there. I see his name on the list, but he's muted. I guess, Larry. Let me check with Larry. Good morning, everybody. Morning to you, Professor Tom. That's
It's nice to, to having you today. It's our honor to having you as a top figures or think tank in US about uh, innovation ecosystem and entrepreneurial ecosystem. Uh, I don't know, Larry, it's in uh, maybe another call. He's off mute now. I'm more than happy to start my presentation if you'd like. Just in contact with me within a few seconds, but I don't know where it's disappeared. I would, I would you know, take, take this opportunity to say something to Jim Baker. I mean, I congratulate you on your approach. I've been using that same analogy for ecosystems. I did my PhD dissertation in ecosystems in 2005 based on that same uh, discussion topic you have. That, uh, you know, an ecosystem is not a thing. It's kind of, it's the, the sum total of all the things in the community. And sometimes they're rich, sometimes they're slack. They, you know, a desert is, is not, any different of an ecosystem in terms of that than the in the Great Barrier Reef or something like that. But there's different things from the pieces you have to have. And I always encourage people, like you say, if you want to create an ecosystem, figure out what you have and figure out what you don't have and fill your gaps. And we'll talk about that in my presentation in a moment once we get all organized here. But, you know, very good um, understanding of the situation. Larry, are you here? Yeah, I think we have. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that there's some uh, maybe. maybe. Uh, excuse me, Larry. You need to to uh, operate only one thing. If you operate the mobile and the PC, it's a problem because I see your name two time is listed there. Larry? Larry? <laughs> Rarely happens at an in person conference. <laughs> Hi, Pesel. Larry, uh, Tom, and Pesel, it's uh, will organize and. Hello. Yes. There is Larry. You're muted, Larry. So. Do we now have my audio and my video? Yeah, perfect. Uh, accept my apology, uh, Professor Tom. Uh, uh, Tom will starting uh, in the sessions as a 
keynote speaker. Uh, okay, Larry. Larry, are you okay? So, Dr. Hannity, do you yes. have my audio? I, I, yes, you start now. You you can start with Tom. Larry, go ahead. Wonder if he can't hear us. <laughs> It looks like uh, he's doing something, so I don't know. Wait, Tom, please. Apology, Tom. Let me uh, let me give him a call again. I have this new fancy device I created. Um, let me get my thing up. New fancy device I created to, to solve some of these problems. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> So, Larry, Larry, did you hear me? So would you like me to do my presentation while these things get sorted out, Dr. Hannity? Uh, yes, but just give us, um, Professor O'Neill, just give us a few seconds. I'm afraid to start with you and he will uh, depress <laughs> or leaving the session, please. Oh, come on. Hi, Hinkel. Welcome, Hinkel, to joining us. Hi, how are you? Larry? Larry? I I, he Larry, didn't hear you... anybody. We're waiting to introduce Tom. He needs to start the sessions. Anybody can reach Larry? Larry, can you hear us? Nope. I'll send him a chat. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes your voice is okay. Yes. <laughs> Hello. There we go. Hello. Hi, Tom. Hey. Hello. Hello. Larry. Did you hear us? Yes, Larry? Hello. Hello, doctor. I'm having technical difficulties here. I, I, I don't have a video screen um, of, the, of the conference. Okay, well then let me just go ahead.
Okay, so who, who is our first speaker here? Let me go to the program. Yes. So I want to introduce um, Professor Tom O'Neill. Um, I've known Tom for um, probably 20 years from conferences and from um, other interaction that we've had. And I know well the network that he has put together of incubators and his work with the uh, University of Central Florida and uh, in, the, in the medical innovation field um, in, the, in, in that part of the uh, region. Um, so I'd like to introduce him and um, Tom, can you take it over? I will take it over. I'm going to go ahead and try to share my screen, everybody. Is that working? You guys see my screen? Let's see. There yes, it sounds. Which yeah. screen do you see? Yep, works fine, Tom. You see the big screen or the, the one with the. Yeah, yeah, full view? screen. Yeah, okay. best practices for building an innovation ecosystem. Yeah, as Larry said, I'm, I'm Tom Lowe. I've been doing this for a, a long time. It's been my passion. I'm a kind of entrepreneur turned um, uh, academic turned entrepreneur. I've never really given up the, the fixed entrepreneurship stuff. So what I've done is live vicariously through other things I do at a university. I found a way to create incubators, as Larry said. I've also uh, the PI on the i -Corps program here at UCF, uh, created a partnership for innovation. I work with VentureWell. I created an accelerator. Uh, four accelerators now as well. So, you know, some I really enjoy. I'm a professor of industrial engineering and management systems. And under that guise, I've introduced people to, to the, the business model campus into the capstone class and really brought entrepreneurship into the, the realm of the engineering college at UCF, which is one of the largest in the country at 12,000 students. And if you don't know UCF, we actually have 70,000 students now on our campus. Um, well, not on our campus, I should say, because of COVID, but. Uh, you know, it's an interesting uh, university, and when you think about Santa Clara and you think about our land, I'm sure you um, think about tourism and and, and uh, other things. But we are trying to develop a, an ecosystem that's different than just tourism, even though um, it was kind of what made Orlando Orlando, and it's still a very large part of our economy. So, one of the things I like to do, and again, I, I stole this from an economic development friend of mine, and you know what they try to do when they really want to think of how to diversify an economy is think of it in terms of bad money, neutral money, and, and good money. And the bad money is when you spend money outside your area and it never comes back. So you reduce the overall pool of money for a community, which reduces the wealth, reduces the economic benefits for the whole community, not just the people that are sending money out. Then there's a neutral money where, you know, the, the person does your yard, goes and gets your haircut by the person down there, goes to the restaurants, needs stuff, and goes out and buys the yard. So that money circulates. So the way you have economic development in a region that where the money is just going around and around is you increase the velocity of money going around and around. Uh, that's one way to do it. And the, the best way to do it is what I call good money. And that's when you're doing trade with people from all over the world. They're bringing money and, and resources in your community and it stays there. And the people that do well aren't just the people that are bringing that money in. It's, it's you're increasing the pool of money for the whole community so that it increases the velocity, increases the money around the rich money, and it slows down the, the leakage of money in town and through what we call the bad money. And, um, you know, it's an interesting way of thinking about it. And certainly the, the business uh, folks will tell you all about this and how you, how you do this and how you create wealth by increasing the, the number of times that money churns to a community. And in Central Florida, one of our biggest issues is, you know, you think of Disney, you think of KSC and other things like that, and, and, and Disney and uh, Universal and all this place. But really, we're a small town, small company town. 31% um, of the people in Central Florida or Florida General are self-employed. Another 63% work at companies that are really two to nine employees. And 5% more of the establishments they create 30% uh, of the jobs are second stage, or this stage is 10 to 99 employees. But you know, the, 
the, the big companies, the one with more than 100 employees, really represent you know less than one percent. They're kind of a rounding error. Error if you talk about the companies that are over 500 people, they show up as 0.0 because they really are a rounding error. Error. So 99.7 percent of the companies in Florida that create 82 percent of jobs are, are, are consist of 100 employees or less. So, you know, when you think about economic development, maybe you should focus on helping those companies is what I try to do. Um, this is a slide, this is similar in one sense, but, you know, we, we talk about innovation ecosystems and we, we use the biological or agriculture examples all the time and I'm just as guilty as anybody, but I put this together to explain to practitioners what an innovation ecosystem must look like. And one of the things I've really found true, and, you know, I, we, we all do bubble diagrams and, one thing I found in my life is whoever made the bubble diagram gets to be in the middle of the diagram. So not always a good way of looking at it. So I found if you really want to be successful in helping entrepreneurs, you put the entrepreneur or the innovators in the middle of this thing. If you want to keep them there, if you want to support them, if you want to help them have a robust environment, you put them in the center and you build this infrastructure around them. Either again, with your uh, gym, you bring it in, you fill the gap and um, you create it so they don't, really don't have a reason to leave. Um, you start off with intellectual capital, um, that's going to universities or other smart people that aren't in a university, um, bringing them the new IP and the technology and the know-how to, to make things happen. And then you also got to have talent in the community. Uh, that's again the people, not only the people who do the work, but the, the, the young minds that are creative and new ways of doing things. It's the CEOs and the, the CTOs and the CFOs. You know, you need a pool of those kind of folks in the community to help with your innovation ecosystem to support these folks. They need money. Um, sometimes as a bank loan, sometimes it's angel investments, sometimes it's in the treaty partnerships, but you have to have creative ways to get capital into these companies uh, so they don't have to leave for capital. And, you know, a lot of people before uh, we became so telecommutable, well, they always would leave to find, to raise their money because the VCs wanted them within a car, and again, within a car ride. So I think the VCs are actually learning that they don't have to be within a car ride now to invest in different companies. You need uh, what I call advocates and champions. If you don't get the political support you need to, to do uh, the work you need, you're, you're not gonna be able to fund these incubators and accelerators and things like that that, that help companies grow. Um, that comes in the form of your, your chambers and your government people, the economic development organizations within your region. And the trade associations, do, do they support only the big companies, the big check writers, or they, will they support the innovators and entrepreneurship that are smaller? And then the, the, the last thing is, again, how do you help these companies really grow at the grassroots level and down the trenches? Uh, you need, I found really one of the important things is getting savvy service providers in your community. You know, the lawyers and the accountants, they know how to have to know how to do these deals and, and help people grow and, and get acquis acquisition uh, advice and merging advice and, and the things they need to, to exit and create a good, happy day for everybody. You need incubators, accelerators, help come to a certain stage, SPCs and scores, you know, they need to be very good. You need to hold them accountable, make sure they do a great job for your community. Uh, you need a, a big pool of mentors, people that have been there and done that that feel uh, an obligation, if you will, to their communities to go back and give to these companies and help them grow. And that's up here, you can't really see it, but it's called Economic Gardening. And that's a, a program I developed down here just to serve second stage companies. I work with the Everlow Foundation up in Pasopolis, Michigan. So maybe our Michigan friends are, are aware of them. They do a good job of, of help addressing that kind of too small to be big and too big to be small uh, set of companies. If you remember from the previous slide, <clears throat> in four, they represent about 5% of the companies, but create about 30% of the jobs. So it's a good area, not Hello. area to address. Oh, Larry got a call. <laughs> Any questions on that? You know, we can come back to it later, but uh, we're running a little behind, but uh, uh, this is a good way just to depict to someone that doesn't understand what you're talking about when you say an innovation ecosystem. And, uh, and I, I like the analogy here because what you want to do is, uh, you know, set their wagons around this so the entrepreneurs have no reason to leave or keep them captured into your community. That's where you get the most benefit. The worst thing you can do is get a company, really spend three or five years on a company and have them have to leave for some reason because your ecosystem couldn't support them in the local system. And uh, again, I, I use this analogy too. These are what we have. When you think about these little droplets of rain, they're kind of the seeds you plant. A lot of companies you know, will fail as we talked about, but you got to plant those seeds so some will take and grow. 
In our particular community, we have a strong stimulation and optics and modeling. We have photonics, uh, high, high density of that uh, in Orlando. Film and digital media is a big uh, area for us, as well as energy systems. And then strong engineering. Uh, again, our College of Engineering in UCF alone is 12,000 students. Uh, the University of Central Florida, which used to be called Florida Technological University, was really placed there to serve the, the needs of Lockheed Martin and NASA. We're strategically loaded right between the two. So we graduate uh, lots and lots of engineers. We're actually the number one supplier of engineers to Lockheed Martin. Probably didn't know that. So, but then what do you do once you have all these seeds? You know, they have, you can't just throw this stuff up in there over the transom, hope it lands in fertile ground. So you've got to create a fertile place for these uh, new ideas, new discoveries, new ventures, new uh, startups to be able to grow and thrive. And to do that, uh, I find you really have to have a good track of technology transfer offices, ones that will invest in the local startup scene as well as the, in the big companies, not just try to do a, a deal with a big company and it's in another country, but really take a chance on some of these startups by doing creative ways of uh, getting them the IP without you know, you know breaking the bank with, for these small companies. Venture accelerators are very good. We have a thing called the Venture Lab here at UCF which we've created help kind of bet these things, do some market research, help them understand how to hire and, and, and fire and set up the right corporate, corporate structures at the beginning. Um, you know, the market research is good. We have an i site. We are an i site, one of the original 16. We spend a lot of time vetting companies. We do about 50 or 60 of these uh, teams a year. Um, you know, and every once in a while one becomes successful. <laughs> a lot of times you're just kind of doing miss missionary work, if you know what I mean, these things. But, the whole notion is to get these scientists, um, you know, out of the lab into the market with their understanding as well as their actual products. Um, and again, the whole entrepreneurship programs, we created degrees in entrepreneurship working with the College of Engineering and the College of Venice to do these things together. So it's uh, not just one way only. The, when the College of Venice and Engineering work together, things seem to, to go much better in terms of the, the well-rounded teams, the, the teams that include the scientists, discovery, and people to get you know sales marketing and the other stuff you're going to need to get something to market um and again savvy entrepreneurs people will come in um and and team up with these teams uh, as mentors and advisors to help them grow uh we do have business planning competitions um in joust and pitch competitions and demo days and things like that and you know not only do they help the companies they bring awareness to the community that is important that you have not a vibrant entrepreneurial ecosystem that people can, can come out and support volunteers, spend some time, you know, get the energy uh, of your community up as well as that within your university. And then so again, once they, you know, once these things have sprung and have a little bit of momentum, they're still young and fragile. And this is the image I like to use is, you know, like, I mean, one guy walking down the street can crush these things. So, um, what do you do to help them grow? The, you need a good SBDC. Uh, the SCORE chapters are very good. We have tech associations that do events and training and, and, and sessions. Advanced manufacturing, uh, MEP centers here we have actually will help with training and market research to help these companies get better. We have an incubator. Um, we had one of the largest. We had eight different sites uh, around this community, you know, trying to be the resource for where people go. But the incubator, you know, it was where they can stay for the first few years and get the support and the, you know, the camaraderie of working together. Uh, the, the peer learning is always good, the water cooler conversations. But, you know, the, a rigorous program, not just a place, as, as Larry will tell you, an incubator is, a, is more of a method and a process and a place. If you, know, you understand it, you put them through the, you know, a program and, and hold them accountable with their milestones and delivers, they do great. One of the university, one thing you can do is really help team up interns, you know, the, with these small companies, the interns uh, usually will get to do good, valuable work, you know, helps them with their degree, helps them have a more valued education. But they, you know, they, these um, companies get access to high quality talent. A lot of times they'll end up going working for the startup if there's a good match, if you do a good job on the front end of uh, matching the interns with the companies. Uh, that always works well. And again, if it doesn't work out, uh, there's no hard feelings. They, they can go different ways. Um, seed and gap funding, uh, not only for the technology for help these companies, but help the companies get started. Non-diluted funding is always really good if you try to do that. Um, UF and UCF have a, have a seed fund where we, we send this money to folks and it's not, you don't have to pay it back. A lot of these Excel pro programs will have a, an investment along with a short duration program 
um, to get them through to a certain level, uh, Y Combinator and, and things like that, I think you're more familiar with. We have one here, uh, actually some energy companies have that. There's one in South Florida that I work with. They provide $100,000 for, for a 12 month engagement with these companies to help become successful. So seek those folks out, again, non dilutive funding. I like the SBR route, if you're not familiar with that small business innovation research program they have in the US. Companies are seriously tech uh, oriented and have a problem that will solve some agencies' issues. Uh, they can get some funding to do that, uh, and it's non dilutive and it's a good investment for the company. A good way to see the initial few years of the company. And then this is like the second stage, uh, you know, having research parks for these companies to move out of the are going to. Actually, you have to have a place for these companies to go to. One of the things I found, there's a small community here that wanted an incubator real bad. So we, we set one up for them. But when the companies graduated, there was actually no place within the city limits for these companies to move to. So they were, they were moving about a mile down the road, but it was, a, you know, it was on the other side of the city line. So uh, they weren't happy with that. So you got to think that through if you're going to have an incubator where they graduate to, is there places for them so they don't leave your particular communities? Then you got to start working on your, your uh, capital, whether you can connections with some other region that's rich in, in capital and investors, or do you develop your own? I found that we, we created at UCF an angel network and it's worked out pretty well. My advice to that is uh, hire an angel or engage an angel investor to help create your angel investors because they're already in the club. It's easier for them to recruit people uh, if they have money in the game as well. Uh, professional associations, it's very good to have a, a robust uh, association uh, repertoire in your, in your community so these people in optics or modeling simulation or other things can go, they can meet, they can uh, cannibalize each other's uh, employees and staff, but also it's a good place to know there's a critical mass of anything in a region by getting people together, learning from each other. Um, you know, um, sometimes they're, you know, they're comp competition, sometimes they're not. Sometimes they work together, sometimes they don't. Um, we have a lot of that stuff in the space sector here um, where people will cooperate sometimes and sometimes they're competing with each other. Cooperation, I think we is the term used for that now. And then um, again, support the great big companies. Um, you know, uh, keep them here. One of the worst things we did in this region, if I not to share our very laundry, but we, we recruited somebody not gonna you know, spend an economic development technique for a long time. We got them here and we thought we were done because we gave them some money to move here and we didn't do anything else to kind of nurture them while they got here. They stayed here for as long as the money was in the bank and when they ran out of money, they left. So that's not a good way to do it. So if you're going to recruit companies or really attract new, new business into a community, make sure that uh, you can support their needs in terms of workforce, uh, you know, the quality of life. A lot of people will um, leave, a, leave a region just at the, the K through 12 school system. They view it as not being as good enough for their kids to grow up in. So keep that in mind as you, as you grow through this thing. And also, um, you know, work on, uh, have a neutral third party and universities are good for that. They can help you understand, um, you know, what you really are, you know, what your, what your strengths are, whether your economy is growing or subtracting. Give yourself a hard look at, at yourselves once in a while. I found one of the best examples of that is that Institute for uh, Competitive Analysis up in uh, North Carolina. Um, they get together and they have researchers and they really look at their community and they, they close the doors and they give themselves an honest picture of what they are. And it's not the uh, Chamber of Commerce stuff, but it's what you need to know about your community. And um, again, managing talent, you know, most, most folks of a uh, certain size will have these career force and, and uh, the, the workforce development boards and stuff. Good to keep that there. Good to have them well um, connected to your university so that the programs offered the university match uh, really well with the needs of the, of the industry sector are in the community in terms of workforce and graduating people that can work in the local uh, region. This is a, another way of looking at it. This is the pyramid example I like to do. So if you really want to build a strong innovation-based economy, you got to have these pillars and I like say it's top research and faculty. Uh, tech savvy entrepreneurs, uh, industry cluster is good if you can, if you can put one together. You can't, most people can't be everything to all people. So focus on some sector. And here we really put a lot of effort on modeling and simulation. We'll go to Washington every year to defend our, against BRAC and other ways they might take our modeling and simulation sector away from us. Work on your workforce, uh, business services. And once you create this strong platform where you have a, a, a I guess an aggregation of expertise in some area of center of excellence. And then you can do things, uh, again, more research will come in. 
you can attract uh, investors and things, and you can really get good at creating IP that can be used for those seeds that we talked about in the beginning. And then what's your strategy? Think about incubators and commercialization and startups. And then you get economic development. And the worst thing ec economic developers can do in my mind is try to start here and not build. I have an understanding of how important the underlying foundation is to make a strong economy. And um, it does take a village. I think partners is the key. I think that Jim Baker, I like the fact that he has a strategy to develop partnerships outside the region to fill their gaps. I think it's an excellent way to do this. Um, but you need this consistency, consistency of purpose. You all got to be kind of marching in step to get this done. And a lot of regions um, do it out of an act of uh, desperation. You know, Austin, when they all went away, or in Detroit, when you know, the car business was in, in ruins and all these things, you know, they'll put people together. But uh, we have the problem in Florida, but we're not really broke because we always have tourism and we figure it'll come back or won't come back, but we have that. So, you know, that consistency of purpose isn't as easy to develop when you don't have a big tragedy or some trauma to your local system that you got to rally together to fix. So think about in terms of, you know, keeping things marching forward. It's always good to engage your, your engineering and business together. Uh, again, innovation focused economic development. I mean, we, we do that uh, for the simple reason, usually these kind of companies uh, pay more salaries or create more wealth. They bring in the outside capital more. And it's a good type of business to have in your community. Not that the other ones aren't good as well, but this one really helps spur on uh, an economy in a, in a particular region in ways that other companies, and this brings in the good money we talked about at the beginning of this presentation. This is my um, cute little slide I like to end on. Um, so if you do this thing, it becomes sustainable. If you keep creating intellectual capital, and if you keep seeding this, this ground and keeping it fertile, and um, you know, you create new and small, and you, you bring students and it kind of feeds on itself. Um, uh, and one of the reasons I like to do this is, you know, just don't stop supporting any of these sectors. You need them all working together. You need businesses, you need small businesses, you need startups, you need second stage companies. You need a, a constant flow of intellectual capital coming to these people to help them do it. Again, it doesn't need to be science. It could be other kind of things, whatever your particular um, sector is that you're doing it. Keep it growing and again, don't, like I say, don't stop funding, funding an SPDC because you want to start an incubator. Figure out how to do things together, how to make them work together. We'll be much better off. And with that, I think I got nine seconds left. I'll turn it back to Larry or however they're going to work this thing. But thank you for your listening to me. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Many thanks to Professor Tom O'Neill for your uh, great presentation. And we hope so. Professor Larry, they controlled the, prog the problem about uh, uh, the PC. He has some problems in visualize us. I think he's now in contact with the technical support company. You get to be Larry then, I think. Oh, I guess. Very <laughs> good presentation, Professor Tom. I like it so much. You give a very good conclusion about the best practices. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you. I think he is still in um, in our timing is 4.40. Yes, uh, I think we can introduce Professor uh, uh, Passel. He is from the UN. He can uh, present for us uh, today. Uh, best practices in the ecosystem. I'm going to start with Professor Patel because unfortunately, Professor Larry has technical uh, problems. He is now in contact with the company. You can start your presentation to catch up the, uh, the schedule. Okay. Thank you, Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to uh, share my. Okay, now I have it on. Sorry for.
Can you hear me? I'm so sorry, it's that I had to quit Zoom to share the screen. I'm using on a different computer. Can you see? Um, is it okay now? Yeah? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Selçia Paşalı, not yet a professor, hopefully uh, down the line. Um, I hold a PhD on development economics and uh, I'm an uh, economic affairs officer at the United Nations Conference on uh, Trade and Development, particularly at the entrepreneurship section. Uh, it was great to hear the, the previous uh, keynote speech. I'd like to bring a bit um, uh, of, of our experience at the UN from a global perspective and um, uh, basically for, for the support that we're uh, providing to the member states. So at the United Nations on this particular issue, our uh, work is guided by by uh, the resolution of the General Assembly on Entrepreneurship for Sustainable Development, which, which recognizes the important contribution entrepreneurship makes to um, sustainable and inclusive development. So on the economic, social, uh, and environmental uh, side. Uh, I think today this resolution remains uh, valid. It was adopted in 2018. A new resolution is in the making by the member states to be adopted uh, very soon. Um, uh, and uh, in the times of COVID-19, uh, this, this resolution remains uh, highly relevant in terms of guiding a uh, inclusive, resilient and green recovery uh, on the backs of uh, innovative entrepreneurs. Um, we see that uh, uh, there has been a lot of uh, uh, short-term support, but we are more uh, focusing on the longer-term uh, approach. And I'll today share with you a few of our um, uh, findings from our research when we reported back to the General Assembly. So um, we know from several uh, uh, studies that uh, about 15% of adult population are engaged in entrepreneurial activities early stage. Uh, we don't know how COVID-19 will impact this. Uh, there are positive forces and negative forces. But we know that some of the groups uh, in our society are particularly hit hard. Uh, we call them usually the vulnerable groups. So you have women, youth, migrants and refugees, uh, rural dwellers, uh, people with disabilities, uh, uh, who are usually operating in the informal sector and they, they need support, but they're often uh, uh, overseen. Even in the formal sector, we estimate that uh, firms managed by women were 27% more likely uh, to file for bankruptcy at the peak of the pandemic compared to male, um, uh, male managers. And this was something similar for the youth also. Uh, and among firms, we see that the um, MSMEs, micro, small, medium-sized enterprises are always hit much harder than, than large enterprises on, on every account uh, due to various uh, reasons. Of course, uh, having access to finance, access to technology, versatile business plans, um, and, uh, and, and the, uh, the mere fact that they're often in sectors that are too vulnerable to, uh, uh, vulnerable, uh, to lockdowns. So all the uh, work that we've uh, seen among the UN uh, entities, including International Labour Organization, International Trade, um, uh, ITC um, and ILO, uh, we see that there is uh, always this issue of MSMEs being hit uh, much harder and therefore the startups and also entrepreneurs uh, hit very hard by, by the COVID-19. Um, we know we track the, the support uh, measures that uh, member states have, give, have been given, to, have been giving to, uh, to, MS, to, to firms, to entrepreneurs, and they're largely on, on uh, short-term um, uh, you know, debt, debt support through loan guarantees or employment support, or postponing taxes and uh, social security contributions. All these things are working much better in developed countries um, where there is a bit more capacity by member states to, to support uh, their uh, firms. But when you lo look at the developing countries, this is, uh, this is not there. And um, they're really oftentimes left uh, to their own devices. Um, at UNCTAD, we're focusing more on the long term and our entrepreneurship policy framework guides our approach in supporting member states. And our framework is based on six pillars, uh, optim which, which are uh, on the screen. Uh, we basically uh, help member states come up with an entrepreneurship strategy, a national entrepreneurship strategy, 
to boost the ecosystem in an inclusive and sustainable way uh, through uh, policy uh, options, uh, tangible recommendations on all these six pillars. So you have optimizing regulatory environment, uh, enhancing entrepreneurship, education and skills. This is particularly important for, for the fourth industrial revolution and preparing the future, um, future entrepreneurs with a proper mindset. You have facilitation of innovation and technology exchange. Uh, again, in COVID-19, you're seeing there's a lot of demand on this uh, through for, for participating in the digital economy. Then we have improving uh, access to finance, which is critical for all types of entrepreneurs, vulnerable or high impact, high growth startups, which are in need of uh, uh, sizable um, uh, financial uh, assets in the beginning. Uh, to, to kickstart their operations without much return in the short term. Uh, then we have improving access to markets, of course, at uh, local, national. We know that many entrepreneurs are operating at the local level, local markets. So we're trying to give uh, member states ideas and policies on how to improve their access to national, regional and international uh, levels. And finally, raising awareness, uh, ensuring that people choose entrepreneurship as a career path in the future and then uh, having strong networks among entrepreneurs so that they, they support one another and learn from one another and, uh, and um, engage with one another uh, in business. Um, when we reported to the, uh, to the General Assembly on the implementation of the, uh, of the resolution uh, entitled Entrepreneurship for Sustainable Development, we made five um, we captured five cross-cutting issues that should receive urgent attention by by the member states. Um, so I've listed them here uh, and I'm going to take you through them with some examples both during COVID-19 and pre-COVID-19 period because we covered basically 2018-19 uh, period. But these are things that we have been discussing uh, uh, also. There are some promising initiatives which are waiting to be evaluated for, um, to, for, the, for us to consider them a best practice and then, you know, uh, think about how to import it to different contexts. So in, uh, the first one is comprehensive and holistic policy. So here we really uh, promote uh, comprehensive national entrepreneurship uh, uh, strategies, which should um, uh, aim for uh, a, a, a cohesive plan of action. Uh, for example, uh, any, a, a recent example is from Ecuador, where the national entrepreneurship and innovation law was uh, passed. Uh, though we are still waiting for some of the policies uh, to follow from this. So it's a promising initiative for now to be seen. Malaysia in 2019 was the star, I think, in this. They introduced a national entrepreneurship policy, a very good uh, policy document uh, with tangible uh, monitoring and evaluation uh, uh, mechanisms built in. So we're looking forward to their midline uh, review of how their work is um, uh, going on and how they're supporting vulnerable groups, especially the bottom 40% as they call it. Another example was from Ghana. Um, now, at, as UNCTAD, we, we support member states in, with, through the entrepreneurship policy framework to come up with their uh, uh, entrepreneurship strategies so that they can build an inclusive and sustainable entrepreneurship ecosystem or, you know, they usually have the ecosystem, but it's just that it's not uh, sufficiently inclusive and it's not built on the sustainable uh, principles. Um, so we implemented EPF in, in several countries and there are also some others it is listed down for, for um, where, where it's ongoing. It's usually in Africa and in uh, Latin America. Um, I wanted to share one insight on, you know, the importance of inclusion, especially from the perspective of gender. Here you see uh, on the x-axis how gender equal a, a ecosystem is and then on the y-axis uh, the share of uh, enterprises owned by women, for example. So there's a, a positive, the dots are the countries. Uh, so you see a, a, a positive association there, uh, which tells us that um, it's, it's crucial that women are, uh, the biases or the, the gender discriminatory uh, policies are eliminated from the regulations when you're optimizing the regulatory uh, framework, for example, to boost the participation of, uh, of, of women uh, and moving them away from the informal to the formal sector. In digitalization, here our concern is, is that uh, our recent estimates uh, based on global entrepreneurship monitor databases that less than 5% of entrepreneurs are um, can be concerned, can be uh, thought of as uh, innovative 
entrepreneurs using uh, latest technologies. So clearly we need, we need a boost uh, here. And COVID-19 kind of helped uh, to, to reprioritize with many countries, particularly on the upper middle income and high income countries to, to uh, support the startups, uh, use uh, the latest technologies, not only for finding a solution to the outbreak, but also for, for, um, for uh, longer term uh, uh, approach. Start my video. Yeah. And um, then it, it, before the COVID-19, we also recognized that some startup acts happened in, in various countries where they, where you can see that um, uh, yes. Uh, support was provided to innovative startups and there's been some positive impact there which can be replicated in in other countries um, I'll, I'll skip this but this was just to show that small and micro enterprises are often missed in using uh, innovative and digital tools as simple as email and website but also foreign technology and quality certifications at Ankhdat, we believe a lot in uh, building a strong entrepreneurship mindset. We have the Empredict program, a behavioral approach to uh, uh, instilling entrepreneurial competencies uh, in, in people. And we see that uh, uh, some, some interesting um, work uh, has been done in several countries, introducing soft skills, uh, for example, or behavioral, the, the competencies that are required to become a successful entrepreneur. So we support countries in this area also, and the resolution I mentioned uh, actively encourages countries to, to follow similar uh, training programs for, for entrepreneurs. Um, and this could be quite important in recovery from COVID-19 when people are moving away from wage employment to self-employment. Um, and these type of things, you know, there's, we see clear some differences between entrepreneurs and non-entrepreneurs, uh, irrespective of their level of education, these type of soft skills trainings can really help uh, improve uh, the outlook of entrepreneurs about you know how, how confident they are if they fear failure and uh, if, if they're well uh, within the networks um, you know for us to consider uh, uh, any initiative a best practice we, we look at rigorous uh, academic impact evaluations um, and and here there are a few examples that I wanted to share uh, where um, you know uh, entrepreneurship related policies had positive impact on on um, on uh, on uh, several of the sustainable development goals in line with agenda 2030 um, on goal one for example the mpesa the digital finance uh, tool money transfer service uh, helped uh, reduce poverty through entrepreneurial activities particularly by women for example um, entrepreneurship education in Sweden had very long-term impact uh, on, on the students who enrolled in the in before high school even. Um, then you have a few other uh, uh, things like the last one, the, the Startup Act in Italy, which was found uh, very impactful on innovative young startups. And it's currently being repeated in Senegal and in Tunisia. And then we have uh, a few more Startup Acts coming up in um, in Mali and Ghana. Africa is quite uh, uh, convinced with these startup acts and we hope that similar positive impact will be found there. Um, uh, finally, uh, here, I think uh, what we've learned also, not only in terms of, you know, um, member states uh, taking action on, on, uh, on entrepreneurship uh, policies, but also all the, basically all the stakeholders in the ecosystem. Uh, how important it is to have the stronger coordination. Um, for us, promoting and developing entrepreneurship is a major task uh, that no single institution at national level can carry out uh, individually. We see how vibrant the ecosystems are and how many, uh, how dynamic they are uh, with, with stakeholders from different uh, sectors. Uh, 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 but often there is that lack of coordination, unfortunately. So our approach is usually uh, trying to build, bring all those stakeholders together um, through several workshops where we can identify the challenges in the country following our framework and, and um, offer uh, and agree on uh, a set of policy uh, actions. Um, clearly, there should be an institution in any country to be in the front seat to drive the process for the coordination. Uh, but um, uh, we need to have a... Um, 
constant uh, communication and flow of information between this lead institution and the other all the other uh, uh, stakeholders in in the ecosystem on a regular basis and this has been done in some developed uh, countries particularly for recovery from covid-19 um, a, a few european countries have achieved this and it was the, for the first time that they uh, as soon as they introduced a policy they started evaluating monitoring it first and then evaluating it to see if it's working or not because obviously with covid-19 we were in uncharted territory we didn't know what will work if it will work uh, so this was i think a good uh, practice uh, and a, a good lessons learned that uh, we need to constantly monitor the policies uh, and, and evaluate them this this is um, this can also happen through stronger coordination um, we also see uh, how uh, uh, how rich uh, public private partnerships have become uh, in the past couple of years in line in light of the agenda 2030 where there's a huge financing gap particularly for infrastructure investment for example uh, but now we are moving more towards you know this um, green entrepreneurship social entrepreneurship uh, where the public private partnerships can really help uh, deliver inclusive and sustainable uh, development and build resilience uh, in the ecosystem uh, and here for us as international organizations uh, we are also, uh, I think, more than ever coordinating our activities uh, together at different levels, um, uh, led by the country teams. Uh, and when we deliver uh, uh, programs, projects, we are delivering as one, uh, more than ever, uh, that I can say. Uh, and this is also uh, crucial for not to duplicate anything and not to um, uh, leave any stakeholder behind once we come, get together. Uh, it, things work really much better and uh, we can uh, be much more impactful uh, in coordination with, with the national uh, stakeholders and uh, the national governments. So uh, I think in a nutshell, uh, this is, uh, uh, these are the things that we have uh, learned uh, in, in the recent uh, past in, in boosting the uh, entrepreneurship ecosystem. Our work continues, particularly with an emphasis on the vulnerable groups. We are very active on migrant and refugee entrepreneurship. We take note of the recent good news on COVID-19 vaccine coming from uh, the two Turkish couple, uh, partly the BioNTech, their company, uh, a mig uh, a two migrants who arrived and became entrepreneurial in, in Germany. And hopefully uh, it will bring us good news. So we keep focusing on the vulnerable groups uh, uh, and uh, ensuring that they're included uh, in the entrepreneurship ecosystems uh, so that we can uh, attain our, uh, our shared global goals. So with that, I'll um, thank you very much for your kind attention and I look forward to listening uh, and uh, uh, learning from our colleagues. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, your presentation. It was very interesting. Um, I think we'll move along now um, to, uh, to um, Lynn, are you there for us? Sure am. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, um, just a, a, a brief introduction of, of Lynn. Um, I've known Lynn for many years. I, I more won't than, say- More than two. Yeah, <laughs> it will age both of us, but um, I, I visited Lynn and her colleagues in Atlanta, and, and I can see it in the background. Um, they have a, a, an amazing enterprise, uh, um, a lot of public-private uh, partnerships, and um, uh, some very interesting programs that I'm going to uh, let her discuss, and some of the uh, examples of the work that they've done and what have you. But thank you so much for being here, and go ahead and take it away. Great. Thank you very much, Larry. That was a very kind introduction. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to my presentation. Uh, I'm going to share my screen here. Let's see if I can get this done okay. Uh, hopefully that's showing my presentation. That's it. There yeah. we go. Yeah, that? no, it's fine. Yeah, perfect. Is that good? It's full screen. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So um, my focus is going to be uh, a bit more on university connectivity in the ecosystem. I, I, uh, since we are Georgia Tech and 
We are in the middle of downtown Atlanta. Um, I really wanted to address um, all of the partnerships that feed into the ecosystem. I know Tom uh, did a great job of explaining the ecosystem and how, how it all operates. And I'm going to show a little bit more connectivity between the university and the ecosystem. So that's kind of my area of focus. Um, let's see here. Go here. Okay, so um, a little bit about Georgia Tech. I'm gonna try to, I have a lot of uh, uh, charts in my in my presentation. I'm probably going to skip over some of them, but I wanted to have that information to you in case you were very interested in the details. So the details are in there, but I'm going to kind of skip over the details and kind of stick to um, a, a much more a higher level um, explanation. Um, so Georgia Tech was founded back in 1885. Um, that was right after our Civil War. Um, the South was very agricultural and the North was uh, very industrial. So when we went to go rebuild the South, we needed a whole bunch of engineers to rebuild the South. Um, so Georgia Tech was founded to develop engineers to industrialize the South. So our roots are very, very intertwined with industry, which is not the case for most uh, uh, universities. Most universities you know, they're strictly learning places. Uh, Georgia Tech was strictly a working place. And in this picture, we'll show you the students in their work outfits, um, as well as their going to school outfits back in 1885. So they worked a half, they learned a half a day and worked a half a day. A little bit about Atlanta and Georgia Tech, um, you know, 6 million population. It's an enormous city. We have the world's biggest airport. Uh, we have global centers such as CNN and Delta and UPS, and of course, Coca-Cola. Um, we have the third largest concentration of Fortune 500 companies in the United States. Uh, Georgia Tech, the enrollment, we have lots of students. How's that? Um, our rankings, um, we're number one producer of female and minority engineers in the United States. And I'm very, very proud of that. Having been a female engineer coming out of the University of Miami 100 years ago, um, I'm really, really encouraged by uh, Georgia Tech's focus on addressing women and minorities as, a po as populations that need engineering degrees. Um, we were number one for best producing startup talent, which... Um, we have been working at for a long time. Uh, so I'm really happy to hear that. And of course we were number four for undergraduate engineering. So those are our bragging rights. That's my brag page. Um, a little bit about uh, the size of us, uh, $1.8 billion, it's pretty, pretty big. Uh, we have a lot, a, an enormous amount of sponsored research. And only 16% of our funding actually comes from the state of Georgia, even though we are a state university. So I think that's really important because a long time ago, it was a heck of a lot higher number, but we have been able to wean ourselves off of the state funding and get more sponsorship and more research. That's why our research budget has just grown exponentially even in the last five years. Okay, so industry collaboration. Back in 2001, this is what the ecosystem around Georgia Tech and Metro Atlanta looked like. As you can see, it, I mean, three programs. Um, we had our incubator, the Advanced Technology Development Center incubator, which, oh, by the way, was funded and started by the state of Georgia. Um, and then we had research. Of course, everyone has research at their university just about. And then Capstone Design was for undergraduate students, and it was part of their engineering program. Fast forward to today, and this is what we have. An enormous amount of programs addressing all different uh, demographics and different populations. So we, we, everything from faculty to undergrads, to grad students, to the community. Uh, as you notice, our community uh, piece over on the right-hand side is, has grown exponentially um, compared to what it was in 2001. Um, and, and then of course on the, on the y-axis, you'll see we go from education all the way up to scaling your company. So we, we have over time developed these programs because of demand. Uh, we listened to our customers. We, we kept asking the entrepreneurs, what do they need? And then we kept looking at what the entrepreneurs need because what the entrepreneurs say they need and what they really need sometimes are not the same thing. And that's really important to understand. You need to know your community and, and its strengths and weaknesses. Um, 
So um, just a couple of bullet points here about the innovation ecosystem. Uh, we work very hard to instill entrepreneurial confidence in our students and faculty. And um, at first it was sort of um, kind of scary, especially for our faculty. Um, but now with i you know, we were one of the founding uh, universities of i us in uh, University of Michigan, if I'm not mistaken. Um, with i coming on board, it changed the whole mindset of the faculty. It really did. It took, it took a while. I mean, it, it was kind of scary. But once again, we had industrial roots. So I think we got away with a lot because people already un understood that we were training engineers to go out into the field and become a, a, a sustainable workforce. So um, we, we focused on interdisciplinary research. That's the other piece I think is really significant is we cross-pollinated an awful lot of different um, uh, expertises that normally would not have been cross-pollinated. And we are very open to the idea of cross-pollination. Um, once again, it didn't happen overnight. I mean, it, it's, it's been a long time. I've been with Georgia Tech almost 20 years and I've watched it grow significantly in that time frame. Innovation neighborhoods, um, we'll, I'll address that a little bit later on in the presentation, but we're not in a bubble, we're not by ourselves. Um, we all live, work and play in the Metro Atlanta area. So um, it's not just students and faculty that Georgia Tech focuses on, it is our community and they're very dedicated to the community. The organization I'm in uh, is all focused on economic development. We're the only uh, university organization that has all of their economic development initiatives all under the same umbrella. And that's the Enterprise Innovation Institute. And that's where I, that's where I reside. And anything to do with economic development initiatives, they're all under the same umbrella, which really helps with a lot of collaborative uh, efforts with the city and local government and communities and universities and you name it, um, that's the collaborative key point. That's the entry point for the rest of the people to come into the campus. Um, the other thing I, I thought was really important to mention is flexible contracting and intellectual property terms for industry. Once again, you know, we're, we're industrial focused. So we want our technologies to get out into the community and make a better life for everyone. So we had to be really, really realistic about what's gonna happen with our research. We're not a federal lab, or well, we do have some federal lab research, but we're more applied research. We are much more on the applied side. So it has to go somewhere from here. It just doesn't get patented and put on a shelf. I mean, that, that doesn't do anybody any good. Um, moving on to the ecosystem, um, of course, these are some of the components of our ecosystem, incubators and accelerators, of course. We have corporate innovation centers, which came about, oh, about seven years ago, they started popping up. And then if you notice the buildings behind me, um, that is Georgia Tech property there. And let's see, right back there, actually, where my finger is right there. That's where our corporate innovation centers are residing. And right across the street on this side is uh, Georgia Tech's uh, Scheller College of Business. So they're uh, adjacent to campus. They're not on campus. Um, it's a public-private partnership. And if you can see that little building way in the back behind me, that's the old Biltmore Hotel, which they have converted over to uh, businesses uh, that have graduated out of our incubator. And now um, they're tech teens, for a better lack of a description. And now once they move out of our incubator, they have space to move to right close to campus again to keep that community, that the entrepreneurial community close together to be able to support each other. Back to my presentation, um, <clears throat> the corporate innovation centers I just covered. Uh, we have a lot of professional education programs. So corporate and executive education programs. No one, you never stop learning, right? You, you're always learning. So we try to make sure that we have uh, content that's applicable to corporate, our corporate partners and any other corporates who really want to learn more about tech innovation. Um, and neighborhoods, tech square, you know, what you see behind me is tech square. And our interdisciplinary research, I, I touched on that earlier, um, you know, cross pollination is, is extremely important to develop new research and new technologies. Here are some of our corporate innovation centers uh, that are physically located, uh, like I said, behind me or in close in the area. Um, and the reason they're located there is because they want access to our students. So our students can be interns or work after hours uh, in these innovation centers. They're small and all they are is little 
little places where you where the corporations put their problems and they hire people to solve those problems and they purposely keep them away from the large uh, corporate headquarters or corporate uh, manufacturing facilities and things like that because they really really want to just focus on solving problems and once it gets to a point where they think it's an option to solve a problem, then it goes over into the, their big research or manufacturing facilities for prototyping and, and along those lines. But um, it, it's easy to get access to students that way. Okay, so you can see our, our little square, Georgia Tech and our, our, our little bubble and, and where we live in life. Um, but we couldn't be where we are today uh, if we didn't have our partners. And every single one of these components mentioned in my little web here are extremely important to having a healthy and sustainable ecosystem. Everybody plays a very important role. Um, I do wanna call attention to the Georgia Research Alliance. Uh, that is a state funded um, um, entity that encourages um, creative research. Um, we have, that, ha that has provided uh, investment funding. It's also provided incentive funding to draw in uh, professors who are uh, experts in a specific field. And if it's a specific field that we're looking to grow in an industry focus, um, you know, it, it provides funding that the university wouldn't be able to afford uh, to be able to do those things. And also a huge connection point. Um, of course, associations, we have the Technology Association of Georgia, the very healthy, robust entrepreneurial association. And you can see local government, chamber of commerce, entrepreneurs, investors, and industry practitioners, everyone is a part of this ecosystem. And, and that's really what I want you to take from this chart. Um, best practices start with small steps. Um, Share your success stories to influence a culture of change. I think that that to me was one of the most important bullets. I should have highlighted it because um, we do a lot of international uh, incubation assessments or innovation assessments. And uh, being all over the world, everyone has different cultures and different behaviors and different viewpoints. Um, in some cultures, um, industry and universities should never cross and touch each other. They should totally be separate. Um, and, it, and it's it's a detriment to that culture to, to have that opinion, but I understand where it comes from. So you try to work around it and try to figure out what's the best way to make it a win-win for everybody. And the way you do that is to slowly change the culture and see the benefit of the partnership. And you know, a partnership is a partnership. You've got a set of rules and you abide by those rules. So um, you might have to ch get, get local government to be willing to change those rules a little bit in order to change your culture and be more open to innovation. Um, incubation, of course, everyone knows about incubation. I'm, I'm, that can be done to death. Um, start working with the corporate sector uh, through professional education. Um, you know, we have a lot of executives that come through our professional education programs every year. And we squeak our entrepreneurship training in there as best we can. Um, Almost every single one of our colleges at the university right now has a component of entrepreneurship in it. Uh, that was not the case even five years ago, um, but it is a very strong component of a Georgia Tech student's education now. And they're gonna take that with them wherever they go. Uh, they're gonna graduate, they're gonna go on to um, a corporation and they're gonna have entrepreneurship in their head. Even if they are not uh, practicing entrepreneurs themselves, they understand the, the value of entrepreneurship and they can respect it and encourage it. And I think that's, you know, trying to get in the, in the door and understand that. I think this is one of the best ways. Um, we'll skip over here. Overview, okay, just, um, I'm kind of gonna skip through these, but I, these statistics just blew me away and I thought, I, and I hope, hope it'll have some value to you because it frightened me when I saw it. Um, over 70% of global R&D is funded by seven countries. That's it, seven. You can count them on two hands. Thank God we only have two hands. Um, percentage of gross domestic product is a good measure of research funding levels. Um, governments, uh, yeah, and this, is, this is, hold, holds true based on my education as well. Governments handle basic research. They, they start the spark, um, have no idea where it's gonna go. Industry 
and universities pick it up and run with it and develop it and, and do much more of the applied research piece of it. And then the universities on the other hand and hopefully industry is now doing the entrepreneurial thing and saying, okay, well, where does this apply? What problem does it solve? So that's kind of the continuum that it goes through. The other, excuse me, another thing I wanna point out to you here is the talent pool. Uh, you need the talent. Uh, you need to encourage that, that education and the researchers. Um, research, uh, and this is majority of funding is for the researchers time and that is true. Um, but you really have to have talent that stays, not that comes and goes um, in order to have a sustainable, healthy ecosystem. I'm gonna pop this in here and just give you two sentences on this. I thought this was really interesting. It's an example, it's called the MIT dollar, if you're not familiar with it. It basically just shows uh, where a dollar, a US dollar from a percentage standpoint, where the money goes when it goes into uh, government and industry research. Uh, same thing with talent. This is just another explanation, more detail about that, um, that uh, point I was trying to make about talent. And then again, it goes back to those seven countries. Um, and here we go, here's the seven countries um, with innovation and patents. Uh, this is 2018 filings, um, but it's only one measure of innovation. That's the only other thing I want you to take away from this. You can you know, digest this at your leisure. Um, <clears throat> of course, um, circling back around again, our, our industry collaboration. I mean, we've, we've been collaborating with industry since we were born. So it, it's not new to us. Um, it's just part of who we are. Um, and these are just components of it uh, and suggestions if you want to um, advance your industry collaboration. Corporate engagement programs. Um, I don't know how much time I have left, so I don't want to overdo it. Um, I could talk forever. Um, corporate engagement programs. Um, I'm just going to zip through these a little quickly. Um, Near term, these are the things you can do with corporate engagement near term from a university standpoint. So if you're looking to broaden your uh, relationship with, you, with industry and develop more, uh, a more a healthy, robust research program at your university that ends in entrepreneurship and startups, this is kind of the, the roadmap. Uh, near term, you wanna recruit students, uh, you know, students, 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 students. I'm, I know I'm saying that a lot. Uh, you need technical assistance, you need professional and executive education for them to understand the value of entrepreneurs. Advisory boards are always a good idea. And of course, your vendor relationships, you're going to need your raw materials. So you need to have healthy relationships with your vendors. So when you, when you do hit it big, you're able to scale up quite quickly. Long-term uh, innovation sourcing, development office. I'll, I'll cover development office a little more in detail. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Oh, sorry about that. So Lynn, we're running just a little bit long, so. Okay, okay. Let's see, we covered that, covered that. We'll go, we'll go right back to my six bullet points. Um, University research and collaboration between academia and industry has never been more important than it is today. Um, once again, each country has unique characteristics, strengths and opportunities. You need to know what those are. Um, you can't just make believe that you, you think you are. You have to really have uh, an independent knowledge of what your assets and liabilities are in your community. Um, and that gives you the roadmap to start. Um, Investment in public resources is critical for scientific R&D. University, uh, we already covered those long, short, long terms. And any new initiatives must be in alignment with the university's strategic goals. And I think that's it. <laughs> thank you. Good, well, thank you very much, Lynn. Um, I, I learned things that I didn't know um, before you started. So um, that's always a good thing. Um, thank you. So, so um, I'm, I, I have a, a, a couple questions, I guess. Um, one of them would be, um, you mentioned some of the larger companies that you, you uh, uh, have there in the Atlanta area, but mm -hmm. is your interaction um, more with large companies or is it more with small to medium size? And does it, um, does it lean towards manufacturing versus technology? Just what is the profile of, of the 
partnerships that you have with private sector? Uh, great question. Uh, and the answer is all the above. Um, from a research standpoint, it's probably the larger corporations because they have the money to invest. Um, but my uh, EI squared is what we, what we call ourselves, the Enterprise Innovation Institute. We have all of our economic development programs under the same umbrella. So we have the Minority Business Development Center, the Minority Business Manufacturing Center, um, and those are for scale-up companies. We have Venture Lab, which is you know uh, strictly Georgia Tech research. We have the ATDC, which deals with startups. Um, we also have other programs such as an energy program, the Southeast Trade Program. So we can address all levels of companies in whatever stage they're in, um, basically due to our structure. So they come usually, um, they, I'm usually the first point where people come in and based on their characteristics, we point them in the right direction to which program is best for them. Okay, thank you. T Tom O'Neill, are you still with us? Um, I guess not, I, I had a question for Tom. Um, you mentioned um, incubation a little bit. Could, could you talk just a little bit about that and keeping in mind that some of our um, people listening in um, are from countries that are developing um, incubators or incubator networks or innovation networks. Um, mm -hmm. what, are, what are some of the things that you've learned relative to um, incubation and acceleration and, and, and those? Okay. Okay, I'm gonna give you my honest 20 year experience of working with incubation programs. If you build it, they won't come. Um, it's always kind of um, everyone, especially your economic development people, your local government people say, oh, unemployment's up, we need to have an incubator, we need to start companies. That's not how it works. You need to encourage entrepreneurship in your community starting in kindergarten and make sure that your population knows how to do entrepreneurship and be creative and encourage creation. And from that, I mean, people can gather anywhere. We worked with a community where all the entrepreneurs were hanging out in a bike shop because uh, there was no place in town, but that was a good local spot in town. And all the entrepreneurs would gather once a week on Thursday nights at the, at the bike shop. Um, and when we went through and did the assessment and found that out, um, we tried to find a locale where they could um, continue to meet and still end up um, putting in like a, a maker space um, and things like that. So it's, it's kind of grassroots and, um, you know, universities, I think, should have some type of a maker space or we have, we have several of them on campus and actually most of them have been started by student activists. So you, you just never know. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I've experienced that too um, with, um, I, I guess the, the, the uh, precept maybe is not build and they will come, but um, w what is it that you will build to facilitate their coming? Uh, and it may not be a bricks and mortar, especially in the environment we're currently in uh, mm -hmm. with, with the, the pandemic, which has changed the, the nature of entrepreneurship and networking and what have you. And it's, I think, um, uh, raised some opportunities too that we didn't have in the past. So Absolutely. So let me give you a quick analogy. Um, you, you have a sidewalk. You go to your, you know, you have a sidewalk going to your house or someplace. So the local government puts in this, you know, really nice concrete sidewalk, but everybody walks this path and eventually the path becomes this dirt path and everybody uses that and no one uses the sidewalk. Well, if the government did the, the research to begin with and realized that the people wanted to walk this way, not that way, they could have saved themselves money putting in that sidewalk there and put it where it really belonged is where the people needed. So yeah, yeah. discovery and entrepreneurs are your customers. Yeah. That's very um, a very apt uh, analogy. I know that um, having worked with um, with uh, planners and designers and what have you, they um, they call those paths of convenience. And mm -hmm. uh, when you're standing up in a, a building on campus and you can see where the students depart from the sidewalk and take a shortcut, well, that tells you that maybe you should be designing towards what the need is rather than what you think the path is. So right. Well, thank you so much for your insights. I see um, our on-deck circle uh, uh, 
uh, includes uh, Mike Molnar. Um, Dr. Hannity, I don't know if you're on, but um, our, our, um, I have my program um, showing that, uh, that there's a couple people that uh, aren't on deck yet. So um, Ed Morrison was, and Julie uh, Lenzer were, uh, were coming up here. But, Julie's um, here. Oh, okay. Um, so um, Ed, Ed, uh, is Ed there? Ed, yep. okay, well, good. Um, we're, on, we're on track here. Um, well, I'm gonna introduce Ed here. Um, Ed, uh, and I go back a long ways too, that I did um, call on my network of friends and colleagues and, and uh, people that I've worked with in the past. So uh, Ed, uh, I know well from um, his days down at Purdue and uh, the, the program that he put together um, that uh, has uh, evolved and matured and, and improved. And I'm not gonna try to define that, but just say that uh, Ed has been part of the ecosystem for many years and not only is he a practitioner, but he also helps create practitioners. So I, th I thought I'd um, give you that short introduction and let you go ahead and um, move forward with your presentation. Thank, thank you, Larry. I'm going to quickly share my screen, uh, and I would enjoy the opportunity to spend time with you, Larry. And this is in your group. Uh, Larry, as if you know, is a uh, is a major leader in in our work in in uh, ecosystem building and in universities. So uh, I want to provide you an overview of of how we approach uh, ecosystem building from a practitioner and a researcher viewpoint. And I'm gonna to talk to you about strategic doing and I'll give you an introduction to that. But first, uh, let me give you a couple of other introductions. Um, this is Sam White. He's a, he's a professor at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. He came to us at Purdue and said, you know, how do we build a water cluster in Milwaukee? Um, this is a dean of a business school at the University of North Alabama, where we are currently have an agile strategy lab. And he asked us, uh, how do we create a startup ecosystem? Uh, Ernest Andrade is a city employee who works in Charleston, South Carolina. And years ago, he came to me and said, uh, how do I build a digital economy in Charleston, South Carolina? And then here's a, a Ubaldo Cordova, who's a, uh, an impressive guy. He's a, he's a chemical engineer uh, from Caltech. He's at the University of Puerto Rico. And he approached us and came after the Hurricane Maria and said, how can you help us rebuild the Puerto Rican economy? Well, one of the challenges that all of these situations have uh, is, is this, and I'm gonna walk through this graphic for you. On the y-axis or the vertical axis, what we're seeing is that uh, our problems that we have to address are becoming increasingly complex. Uh, these are challenges that, are, that have no simple solution. And indeed, it's hard to define the problem even. Um, and then across the horizontal axis, uh, the x-axis, what we have is the increasing complexity of collaboration. And you saw that today uh, in some of the presentations. How do we get all of these different actors within an ecosystem to work together to collaborate? And in that gray area up in the upper right, that's where our work at Purdue and now at the University of North Alabama has been focused, which is the development of a, of a new open source discipline, which we call strategic doing. And I'm gonna share with you some of the insights of what we've learned over the years that we've developed this, this approach and now that we teach this approach. But the challenge of course is this, that we're facing these complex adaptive systems, these complex systems that continuously move and the, uh, the old approaches to strategy, how do we decide where do we put our resources, those old approaches don't really work any, any, anymore because indeed both the, comp the problems are becoming more complex and the collaborations are becoming more complex. So let me take you into uh, what happened about a month or two after Sam White came to us and we ran a workshop for him. What you see here is within the Milwaukee water cluster, all of these different entities started to connect around four critical focus areas. So you had a conversation where people started to converge around what their shared opportunities were. And indeed now, if you go on the web and look at the Water Council, the Water Council in Milwaukee is a global water hub. 
it's taken about 10 years to build it, but we it's there. Now, about six years ago, I'm going to take you into North Alabama, which is quite a different environment. It's a rural community. Uh, again, here's where the University of North Alabama is. And the question was, how do we build a startup ecosystem in North Alabama? We're not Atlanta. We don't have all these resources, but what do we actually do? How do we do this? And here, what we see is, again, a whole range of different entities starting to work together and uh, new ideas popping up. I want to take you in, into the process by which this ecosystem evolved and to underscore the fact that ecosystems evolve over time. They take time to build, and there are some identifiable stages to the development of ecosystems. First, the conversation has to shift. This is the new narrative. This is where you're going. This is the stories that we were, we were told by the previous prevent the presenters are so important, and they are. You want to start telling these new stories about where the future of your economy is going. A core team starts to form to build the ecosystem. An ecosystem is not drawn, driven by one person. It's even not necessarily driven by one organization, uh, but a core team of people form. And as they learn how to do strategy in open, loosely connected networks, a strategy emerges, an agenda for collaborative investment emerges, and these initial projects launch. And as value is created from these initial projects, which some of them are very small to begin with, as those um, uh, start to pay off, the interest in the ecosystem, the resources of the ecosystem start to grow. So let me take you one step into the detail uh, again. We cannot design ecosystems. Ecosystems are complex systems, but we can design and we can conduct the platforms on which ecosystems grow. So I'll share with you the platforms that we've been using and how we think about a portfolio of collaborations and the logic underneath that portfolio. So first and foremost, as our previous presenter talked about, we need brain power, talent, you need to have the talent in order to compete globally. So talent is critically important. That's why universities are critically important. We need to take that talent and we need to convert that talent into uh, valuable ideas and ideas are created through organizations. These are companies, these are existing companies that innovate, these are new startups. These are universities that uh, become much more adaptive and entrepreneurial in their governmental organizations. But we need to flow resources to promising ideas and that involves networks to support good ideas. Quality places is critically important because both the people and the organizations generally will leave. They'll go other places if they don't have quality connected places. And again, they can be bike shops, or they can be coffee shops, or they can be big incubator facilities. But the mistake is made oftentimes where, you know, the build it, they will come, not necessarily. So you don't necessarily start out with quality places. Where you really start out, I think, in, in building ecosystems is creating a new narrative, creating a new story about where, where your economy is going. And as you do that, and on the right, what we did when in, in uh, North Alabama and in Charleston and in uh, Milwaukee was create these collaborations across this ecosystem. So we have a portfolio of collaborations, each focused in these four areas. But what, why are people using strategic doing? Well, strategic doing is a, a discipline. It's an open source shared discipline that enables people to form action oriented collaborations quickly, move them toward measurable outcomes and make adjustments as they learn by doing. So let me go into that a little bit more detail. But first I wanna emphasize, if you don't have a process, then you don't really know what you're doing. And that's so true. So the, what we focused on in our work at Purdue was developing a, uh, a process that we could teach to teach people how to collaborate. So here's the logic of this process. First, we start out with the idea of what is a strategy in open, loosely connected network in an ecosystem. Well, a strategy is when a group of people are able to answer two questions. Where are we going and how will we get there? These two questions came to the top 
of the work that Kathleen Eisenhart was doing out in Stanford when she looked at very, very um, uh, volatile environments of vibrant communities and, and companies. How did they design their strategy? Well, they designed their strategy around these two questions. In order for us in an ecosystem to answer those two questions, we have to have a strategic conversation. And so we define a strategic conversation around four questions. That's the, if you come into a workshop, you're gonna be focused on these four questions. As you answer these four questions, you actually generate all the components you need for the strategy. Underlying this, why does this work? Underlying this, we see 10 rules. This is where the research and the practice meet because each of these 10 rules is um, uh, developed and has been developed and is uh, supported by research. Now, we have to take all of that and we have to teach people. So this is what the purpose of our book was and our training was we have to teach people how to collaborate. So again, an open source discipline that we share, Purdue was instrumental in, in providing the discipline and the, in the uh, platform for us to develop this. And let me share with you the story of Obaldo. So Obaldo comes to uh, Purdue, asks us what we could do. Ubaldo organized a group within his network of over 40 people from all across the Puerto Rican island. And we went through a two and a half day training. And here's the, here's the training that we went through. And essentially what he was able to do was start to scale this discipline across the island very quickly. So it all started with a conversation between two people, uh, Liz at Purdue and Obaldo at the University of Puerto Rico. Those two recruited six of us to go down to the island to, to train people. We trained 40 people. Uh, discipline right away. So part of the understanding, part of the, what you need to understand about uh, strategy in open networks is that it's very quick. It's very fast. It's not this long laborious process. So where did this come from? I talked to you a little bit about it. The history was 1993 to 2005. I was a private consultant. I developed the model based on open source software development. I came to Purdue and ran some test beds through 2019. We published the book and now we're moving quickly to online education and the University of North Alabama has provided us the platform to do online education. So now we do online education in this discipline and we teach it in Spanish and Dutch and uh, we're teaching it down in, um, in, uh, in Ecuador and we're going to be teaching it in Australia and Canada as well. So but let me bring Ed, you back to the original, yeah. Yeah, Ed, with that, um, we're, we are running our, our, our sessions a little bit late, so I'm gonna um, kind of help, help you wrap up a little bit. But uh, the, the example that you just gave and then the, the list of countries that, uh, that, that you're present in and the work that you've done in the past, I think really lends itself to this conference, um, International uh, Innovation, Creativity and Entrepreneurship. And uh, I know that, that uh, as you've developed your, um, your process, um, it's gained a, a lot of attention and a lot of fans in many places. And I'm certainly one of them. Um, so I want to thank you very much for coming virtually to this conference and um, giving us some exposure. Um, the, I, I think we forget a little bit sometimes when we focus on the entrepreneur, but forget about the community that surrounds and nurtures those entrepreneurs. So thank you for your insights there. And I'm going to move on now uh, with the program uh, to Julie Lenzer. And I, Julie, I believe that you're on board. I am. Okay, hello, and, and it's good to see you. Um, Julie's another uh, longtime associate of mine and colleague. Um, Julie was the first, I believe she, you launched the US Department of Commerce Economic Development Administration Office of Innovation. Um, I, yeah, I didn't launch the office, but I launched our uh, large grant program, the Regional Innovation Strategies. That's right, the yeah. RIS, RIS which, which lives and breathes to this day. Um, so congratulations for that. And I was happy to learn that you were at the University of Maryland in charge of the Office of Innovation uh, and successful there too. So um, 
we'd like to learn from you. So I'm going to turn, turn the uh, screen over to you. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for having me. Uh, it's my pleasure to talk a little bit about my experience as uh, building an ecosystem builder. I'm also a, I, a, an entrepreneur. So I built a company many years ago uh, that uh, provided software for manufacturing companies. So I am not an academic. I am a tried and true entrepreneur. Uh, I also, as, um, as was mentioned, I was a member of the Obama administration as the director of the Office of Innovation and Entrepreneurship and launched a, a grant program across the country where in the two and a half years that I was there, we put out 40 million US dollars into communities across the, the country, including the water cluster in Milwaukee, which I think was just mentioned. And, um, and that program has continued to grow since I left there at the change of the administration and um, has been responsible for creating over 8,000 jobs and spurring over a billion dollars in investment into startups. And so it's something, um, it's much like my child. I'm very proud of it, uh, but it was also put in good hands uh, with the team that I left uh, in charge. So uh, what I'm gonna talk about is my uh, experience. I've had every role in the ecosystem, I think now, but talking about how ecosystems can really accelerate innovation. And I do this from the standpoint of academia as my current role as the chief innovation officer at the University of Maryland. And, um, but, but I can also throw in other aspects as, as I said, I have been involved, I think, in every aspect of the ecosystem. So really what is, let me see if I can, there it is. What is an ecosystem? Why, what does this word mean? Um, and the, uh, the uh, definition that I like to use is that it's a dynamic self-regulating network of many different types of actors. So one of the important points of words in this definition is that it is self-regulating. It is very difficult for any government or other entity to control what happens in an ecosystem. What we do instead is that we are creating the conditions that people and programs and places can come together to support that, the, the startup, the entrepreneurial community. And it is dynamic because it relies on a lot of different pieces. So it is always changing and almost like a living, breathing organism. When I was with the U.S. Department of Commerce, I created what we will call the, um, the hierarchy of needs in um, resilient ecosystems and uh, for economies. And what it really says is from the bottom, you have to have things at the bottom to be able to work your way up to the top. So on the very bottom, you have to have basic infrastructure that supports the businesses. So transportation, access to reliable uh, electricity and utilities, those are really required if you want to build a physical place to support business. On top of that then is the technology infrastructure. So making sure that everybody has access to cellular service, wireless and broadband, because today every business, even if it's a corner bakery, relies on technology in some way. And so, uh, so looking at how your technology infrastructure supports your businesses is really important. Now the business support, which is the next, uh, next level, is uh, around capital. What kind of capital is available to support your businesses? What policies are there? And we'll talk a little bit more about policies later. Uh, what types of um, ex you know, programs are helping to accelerate um, or support these companies? Uh, and we'll talk about that as well. Engines of innovation are also really important because innovation is the driver um, of new businesses in many ways. It's sometimes it's innovating around needs in the community. Um, universities are a great partner for this. Um, it, we also have to have the right kinds of capital and policies to drive innovation. And then at the very top, the, the, the thing that you wanna most strive for is this connected ecosystem. Uh, but in order to, to have all of that, you need everything else uh, underneath it, at least to some degree. It doesn't all have, to, it's not necessarily all serial. It can be done in parallel, but all are required to support the structure of a responsive and resilient ecosystem. There's been a couple of uh, other speakers who've talked about the elements of an ecosystem. There are many drawings that you can find of what are the pieces. This is just one of them, 
But the point is, is that there's a lot of things that are required. Remember the very first slide, I had talked about the diverse and interconnected pieces. And so there's a lot of things that have to come together to make a healthy ecosystem. But the entrepreneur actually is the thing that needs to be at the center of it because that's what we're really trying to support. And many times I see policies or regulatory frameworks or even um, you know, the universities or training programs that don't keep the entrepreneur in the center. And that's a really crucial part of that is you have to understand that's your customer. How are you supporting them? And how are you helping them to be successful? So understanding the domain um, in a typical university, and again, this is uh, a little, some of this is from the university perspective and, and hopefully how you can support your universities. Uh, our typical university state is often decentralized and distributed. So uh, our, our assets that we have for entrepreneurship, um, some of them, we have the Dingman Center for Entrepreneurship that's in the College of Business. We have MTech, which is in the College of Engineering. We have something called a Do Good Accelerator, which is in our College of Public Policy. And then my office is in the uh, Vice Presidents for Research and also dotted line to the uh, president or chancellor of our university. And so these things are very distributed and my job is to make them all work together a little bit better than just having each individual on an island. Uh, many universities are often under-resourced as well. And uh, the assets that we have, they don't, we don't really own them by the university. We're, we're trying to play as part of the community. And there's also a question about what are the incentives for people to collaborate, something to think about. Ideally though, uh, you want things that are completely interconnected. And I, I put the picture of those interconnected nodes on the bottom, it's a little confusing because that's really what it's like, is it's just a web of things that you want all working together organically. Uh, the idea that I have from my university is that we wanna find where the gaps are and try to fill them. So what are the needs of the entrepreneurs and how can we fill those? And um, focusing on what are the win-win, the where can we all benefit, right? It's not a win-lose situation. It's not the ecosystems that, that are successful view it as every, um, you've probably heard the term, in a rising tide, all boats rise. And it's the idea that as we work together, it benefits everyone. And that's why I say that I've seen in so many ecosystems that egos kill ecosystems. And so if you're worried about who gets credit or who's more important or who wins and who loses, you will not be able to support a healthy ecosystem and the entrepreneurs and your economy will suffer as a result. So the keys that I find to accelerating impact from research are people, programs, and policies. And yes, that is me driving that little race car. Um, it was actually really fun. <laughs> I, I highly encourage it. It's a great way to blow off steam. So people, let's talk about people. So first you need partners. You need internal and external partners. Who are the people who are filling the gaps in the resources that you don't have? you should be partnering with those folks to, to provide value all, all around. Um, educators and trainers, there's a lot of things that entrepreneurs need to learn. Um, and I, I make the difference between educators and trainers because educators are generally focused on um, longer term value, especially to students. I think um, Lynn may have mentioned that you know, many of the students might not have a business right away, uh, but you're, you're planting the seed of an entrepreneurial mindset. And the earlier you can do that, the better your outcomes for your general ecosystem and your entrepreneurial activity. Trainers are more focused on specific skills that you need. So getting trained in sales or in accounting specifically for your business. And that's why I make a distinction between the, between the two because both are really important. But I can't stress enough, as Lynn mentioned, Educators should be starting with this entrepreneurial mindset very early and often. Um, mentors and advisors, these are people who are out in the business community who have been in business and who can mentor or advise these uh, startups on very specific, um, very specific tasks like developing a marketing plan or advising them and how do you um, 
you know, how do you go to market? How do you build a team? How do you um, build a good relationship with a co-founder? Those are really important um, different topics that you should lean on your experienced folks in your community to come in and help um, help your entrepreneurs. Funders, I think that that's a, that's a given, being able to have uh, access to capital for your entrepreneurs. But I will say the best, best type of capital for any company is a paying customer. So not every company should get external funding. And so you need to look at that. In the US, and I think this is one of the things we've probably exported is Shark Tank. Um, that I actually don't particularly like Shark Tank because it puts the idea in every entrepreneur's head that they need to go pitch for investors. And that's not necessarily the case. And also Shark Tank tends to undervalue the companies. So that's the other problem that I have with it. But it's getting better. Mark Cuban brought a little bit more to that. But, um, but having customers, many co companies would benefit from just really getting paying customers if they don't need a lot of capital to build their business. And then peers, entrepreneurs are very social people. We like to connect with each other. We like to help each other. So making those opportunities for peers to connect is really important. Now, some of the challenges, how do you get people into your, into your network? First, you have to find them. Going out into your community, looking at a university's alumni is a really rich place. There's an affinity. Many alumni want to give back to their community and to their institution. How do you keep them then? Uh, you have to make sure that there's some strong connection and that there's an alignment with what they're trying to do. Why are they there? Um, and how are you meeting their needs? Um, making it focused on mentors first. And then um, for investors, they really wanna see the deal flow and make sure that their interests um, are aligned or grow your own investors out of your community. For customers, they're looking for innovation, talent, and oftentimes opportunities to train their own staff. Curation, um, transparency, sharing the what and who works. So sharing that across your ecosystem, uh, making sure there's accountability, true assistance, rather than just somebody trying to come and sell your entrepreneurs. And conflict is okay, you just have to manage it. Actually, I say I'm in the conflict creation business because I wanna bring really smart people to help our entrepreneurs and I want them to work together. And then I just have to figure out how to manage that. Um, there's also a translation problem. Researchers and technicians and industries speak different languages. So you have to be able to help to, uh, to translate that role. And you have to convince technologists that maybe they're not the best CEO. Uh, also mitigating various friction points between um, government, um, academia, and uh, the entrepreneurs is really important. For us, conflict of interest or use of university facilities is oftentimes a friction point that we have to help mitigate for our entrepreneurs. Um, programs, leveraging university and, other, uh, and, pro and others providing their strengths in education and training, access to mentor networks, providing context, contests and prizes to highlight role models. That's the real, um, the real, the real purpose of context and contests and prizes is to really show off the, the great ideas in your community and providing for productive collisions so that people have an opportunity that have like, um, like needs to connect with each other. That's what we call productive collisions. Oops, sorry. Um, supporting venture development, I see it in three phases. Exposing people to entrepreneurship, that should be a really big um, group of people. As many people as you can, as early as you can, exposing them to it. Educating them on how to do it. And then curating and supporting those who are actually doing things. And that's how you get successful startups out of that. I wanna talk a little bit about failure just because it is something that culture is very different. And um, Coca-Cola is a well-known brand and they have failed a number of times. And this is just one example. Um, they tried to introduce a new Coke many years ago and they went out and they taste tested it and they, they talked to people and everybody said they'd love it. But then when they launched it, no one actually bought it. And so they had to pull it off the shelf and it was a failure. But if you don't address and you don't embrace failure, then you're not really testing your limits. And so that's one thing that you could think about is that entrepreneurs will fail. How can you help them to fail fast? So do your policies support or thwart 
Um, what's the friction on regula regulations? Is it too hard for people to start businesses? Do they have to pay too much in taxes that they can't put money towards their company? And what are your penalties for failure? In the US, we have pretty robust um, bankruptcy laws, which helps people if they put all of their money into a company and they fail. But in many countries, there's a cultural and a um, and just a, a taxation, a, a, a real economic uh, penalty for failure. What are your incentives for them to, to be successful? And why does this matter? Because the impact of innovation is felt all over the world. Google was started out of a, actually it was a University of Maryland alum, Sergey Brin, started Google. And now we use Google anytime we say, uh, talk about searching. Um, the, uh, the image uh, on the top is a, is a um, that is a pacemaker that was created out of a university. The uh, magnetic resonance imaging, MRI, came out of university. And now I know that, that innovation is going to come for this current COVID um, pandemic that we're in. And the flu, all of these vaccines came out of these innovative ideas. And they needed an ecosystem around to help support them. So that's why this is important. Because if the cure for cancer is sitting in one of our labs somewhere, I want to make sure that it has the opportunity to get out and to see the light of day. And that's why I do what I do. So that's tried to get through that quickly. I hope that was helpful. I think everybody has access to our slides. Thank you very much for letting me share. Well, thank you so much, Julie. I, I've learned a lot about what you're doing now. And it's, uh, it was built on, a, on an amazing foundation. So thank you. Thank you for your, your service when, when you were a public servant. And uh, good luck with, with your new enterprises here. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. So next on the docket, um, not to use a uh, legal term, but uh, I believe Mike Molnar, hopefully you're, you're still with us on deck here. Uh, yes, I am. Good. Um, well, Mike is another uh, longtime colleague. Um, people ask us, um, um, are, you, are you guys related to each other? And the answer is, Maybe, um, maybe we're fifth cousins, <laughs> six times removed, or something like that. But uh, but we're we're friends and colleagues. And um, Mike is in charge of a of an amazing, innovative enterprise that uh, was launched. I'll let I'll, I'll let him, I guess, get into the chronology. But it's a it's a network of innovation institutes that were initially funded. Um, by units of the federal government, some by the Department of Defense, by NIST, by, by other agencies. But then um, they're uh, becoming self-sustaining according to plan. Um, they're an, a, a great example of public-private partnerships. And uh, I'm pretty familiar with um, mo most, if not all of them. And um, I, that's why I brought Mike on board, because I thought that um, they're an example that um, both developed and developing countries can look to and maybe learn from. So uh, go ahead and take it over, Mike. Oh, terrific. Thank you. And uh, I don't know why my camera is not, doesn't look like it's on. I even put a, a tie on for you, Larry. But yes, we, we aren't directly related. But uh, thank you to my friend and colleague, uh, Larry. Um, uh, we've been working together with the University of Michigan for quite some time. So let me try to... Um, flip over to some slides. I apologize because I'm at NIST and we are the keepers of the cybersecurity regs and Zoom doesn't meet the NIST standards. So I can't run the Zoom app. Um, and so I have to go through a browser and sometimes that is a conflict. Firefox can't, okay. It's not letting me do this. Uh, Larry, do you have my, do you have my slides? Um, uh, Dr. Hanadi does, and if she's listening in, yes. maybe. Yes, 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 Larry. Yeah, um, do, do you have uh, Mike Molnar's slides? I think he sent them in to us. Yes, yes, but he, he can share the screen. Why you ask uh, us to I'm, share the I'm screen? I can't, I can't share my screen right now. I don't know, I don't know why. No, 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 uh, the technical support will help you to share screen. Go ahead and I will ask the host to provide you with share screen. So Mike, if you want to go ahead and, oh, good. I, they were up there for a second.
So is that visible? Yes. Yes. Uh, yes, but my camera isn't, but uh, okay. <laughs> uh, terrific. Yes. Hey, I, I, I know we're running a little late and I'm seeing uh, 1018, so I'll try to uh, speed things up. In, in the summary, uh, thank you to Larry to uh, ask me to join. This, the summary of this is really, I wanted to highlight the importance of advanced manufacturing to innovation. I would assert that you can't spell innovation without manufacturing. Um, the fourth manufacturing revolution is real and it will fundamentally change the global economy. Uh, I wanted to share what the US federal government is doing. Uh, our real key approach here in this space is to have industry-led public-private partnerships. And our national strategic plan, uh, we have a quadrennial plan uh, that came out in 2018. Um, I'm part of the White House team that would be refreshing this plan starting uh, next year. But uh, if you look at our plan, it really is about three things, technology, people, and if you do those things right, uh, you get the third, which is building uh, ecosystems. So this is, this is the talk, and it's pretty visual, so don't, don't blink. Uh, um, I do want to go through a number of things, but really those are the key things. Uh, since I saw that uh, the other speakers had a bit of an introduction, uh, we all wear a couple of hats, and I lead the NIST Office of Advanced Manufacturing. NIST is um, a part of the federal government in the Department of Commerce, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, our role is to promote U.S. innovation and industrial competitiveness. Uh, our, our wheelhouse is measurement science, the standards body for the United States, and technology transfer. We are the federal lead for technology transfer. So uh, this is a different view. Um, if you see on the top right, that's a, 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 a picture of part of the NIST main campus in Gaithersburg, Maryland, just, just north of Washington, DC. It's about 600 acres, 60 some uh, laboratory buildings. Uh, that tower in the background, that's, uh, that's where I, uh, uh, my NIST office is at. But this slide is to show you kind of a different view to emphasize how we work uh, with, with collaboration. We have a number of joint institutes and center of excellence. So this is the footprint here. Besides the NIST main campus and the middle one is the, is the NIST Boulder campus. Uh, it's all about centers of excellence. A uh, little fun fact, uh, the one on the bottom right, that is the uh, NIST um, facility at Fort Collins. Uh, uh, we have the Time Lords, so uh, we, we keep the master clocks and uh, that is synchronized. Uh, that's pinged by your computer, your cell phone, the GPS system. 16 billion times a day, um, uh, people uh, use NIST to synchronize it. You probably don't even realize it. It's either directly or indirectly. But the fun fact there is that that is the world's oldest operating radio station. Last year, it celebrated its 100th year of operation. Uh, so if you have one of those things like a clock that says atomic clock, uh, automatically synchronized, it's synchronized to the, to the radio signal that's coming out of that center. So I just, <laughs> uh, I always find it fun to do um, a little fun fact. And if you're thinking about advanced manufacturing, there's really three parts at NIST, the NIST laboratory programs, Manufacturing USA, this is the program that I, I established uh, and I lead today, and the Manufacturing Extension uh, Partnership. So first, a bit about manufacturing and innovation and why I asserted up front that you can't spell innovation without manufacturing it's really not about manufacturing or high tech. Manufacturing is high tech. And so there's two fundamental reasons. One of it is um, even though it's quote only 12% of GDP, it has a huge economic multiplier, the highest economic multiplier effect of any sector. So that's very important for the economy. But this is the, this is the interesting side for innovation. Uh, a third of our economic growth is due to innovation and manufacturing. If you are a scientist or engineer, two thirds of you are employed by manufacturing companies. Two thirds of the R&D spend, 70% of patents. So um, where innovation is happening is manufacturing. So that, that's, that really is part of the key thing. And the other part, emphasizing that manufacturing is not a peanut butter spread, it really is clustered. So two quick slides. Where is manufacturing in the United States? Because it drives home again the, the cluster um, or ecosystem approach. It's really the Great Lakes region, North Carolina, California, and Texas. 
Uh, if you add all of these up and put U.S. manufacturing on, on a boat somewhere, that would be the world's 18th largest economy all by itself. If you look at it from percentage, it, it really highlights that Indiana, Michigan, Wisconsin, and such, those are the high intensity things. And if you drill down, it's because those states have multiple clusters, mul multiple ecosystems. This is the flip side. Jobs are important, and these are the states that have the highest uh, impact related uh, to manufacturing uh, jobs. So it's incredibly important to these particular states. I wanna emphasize here why the rules are changing. And in every revolution, there are winners and losers. The old technologies uh, are getting replaced. They're disrupted by the new technologies. So many people have heard about this Industry 4.0, the man fourth manufacturing revolution. This is a, a little chart to explain really what that is, that even Industry 1.0, it, 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 it had a huge worldwide impact far beyond the, the home of say Birmingham, England, because it fundamentally changed the economies and raised the standards of living. So why is, notice on this, the cycles of innovation are happening faster than ever before. And I mean, Industry 3.0 was really the 70s and, and 80s. Uh, industry 4.0 is about cyber physical system and the internet of things and networking. I'm, I'm grabbing two citations from the World Economic Manufacturing Forum, one about jobs, and this one's about technology. Because if you, you can get uh, wrapped up in the hype, and uh, I like this as an explanation of uh, those people that are involved in, uh, uh, in technology development, uh, a, a standard way to, to approach this is the S-curve of technology maturation. And why this is you know, something beyond marketing is it's a number of these disruptive technologies of computing, of big data, analytics, artificial intelligence, internet of things, uh, quantum. They are reaching the peak or, or uh, near the peak all at the same time. So it's really a con uh, story of convergence and it's good to have convergence, but if you have convergence, but the economics aren't there, you can't form businesses. So the, 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 the mashup on the right is just uh, to show that smart sensors, the decrease in cost over the last decade have dropped by 50%. The decrease in cost of processing have dropped by 60 times, not 60%, 60 times. The cost of bandwidth, 40 times. The cost of storage, 50 times. So this is enormous fuel beyond uh, that are, is dr uh, driving the convergence of these uh, critical technologies. And why is that important? Well, if you're thinking about ecosystems, if you're thinking about uh, jobs of the future, um, this notion that, that many countries have is, well, manufacturing is in, over there. We don't make anything anymore. Uh, we're losing jobs. And in fact, if you're part of the old uh, economy, old technology, yes, the, this came out, uh, 2020 World Economic Forum on the Future of Jobs. There will be 85 million manufacturing jobs lost uh, in, in the coming decade. There's also going to be 97 million new manufacturing jobs in these, in these new areas. So hugely disruptive. And if you're part of these technologies, it's a growth area. If you're not, if you're part of the, the um, uh, technologies getting disrupted, it is um, uh, very, very disruptive and your business will decline or you may go out of business. So that, that's a moral imperative to at least be aware of these things. You're talking about the technologies themselves and why uh, the administration has identified these as part of uh, the industries of tomorrow. These are really uh, uh, these technologies and they are enablers, not only if, if a, an innovator is thinking about doing something related to that technology, but just for how you operate your business or how you launch your business. These are key enablers and they're business opportunities for, for these developing. For existing companies, just unrelated, their, their product or services unrelated to these te technologies, just using these technologies. Uh, this, this recent survey, it had profound effects on reducing labor costs, reducing injuries, uh, growing new revenue streams. So it's a real valid reason why I'm, I'm arguing that everyone should be aware of what's happening here with the fourth manufacturing revolution. So two quick things. Well, if uh, 
how can you get help? Uh, a big part of this is, this is just one example from the NIST laboratory programs. Uh, the gold standard for cybersecurity is the NIST uh, cybersecurity framework. Uh, these are free publicly available document. This 730 page, three page, uh, three volume guide, it's the detailed cybersecurity implementation guide for manufacturers. Why am I emphasizing that? Because uh, as the internet of things, as more and more things get added uh, to, oh, your, your, your machine has all these smart sensors, let's stick it on the network. Wow, it's, it's so much more productive. It's opening up doors for risk. And make no mistake, 99% of manufacturers in the United States are small manufacturers. They don't have full awareness of, of their cybersecurity risk. So this is an important thing. And who can you go to uh, get help in this? Well, we have the National Network of Manufacturing Extension Partnership Centers. Uh, of our prior, um, uh, I think it was Lynn speaking from Georgia Tech. Georgia Tech for, for uh, the state of Georgia is the home of the Georgia MEP. So NIST is the federal sponsor of the MEP network and they have a cybersecurity program, but they are also the place to go for free advice or free, uh, 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 free consulting, or if you want a bespoke solution, they will uh, help you with, with your business. So, and suddenly I'm not moving. I wanna to turn to Manufacturing USA, which, which Larry mentioned, because MEP is about technology transfer of existing technologies. Manufacturing USA is about speeding up and de-risking these new technologies. It's all about this TRL four to seven, the applied research. The federal government invests over 150 billion, B with a B, in uh, funding for, for uh, basic science, basic research. That is a, a, a national good. Uh, what we want to do is to have a return on investment of those taxpayer dollars by speeding up and de-risking and getting it into the private sector. This little stylized chart is really to show that uh, the goal of a manufacturing innovation center is not for the federal government to have the institute do research for the feds. It's really there to set up a neutral convening ground where industry and academia can collaborate effectively on game-changing uh, innovative projects. And so what are those projects? It's industry-led, industry picks them. Uh, it's a neutral collaboration space when, when uh, nearly 30 years in industry, it was hard for me to work with other, other companies. It would be impossible for me to do pre-competitive collaborative research with a competitor. Here, you can do these things because the feds uh, have set up this neutral convening ground. Where we are today, this is very exciting. Two new institutes were just added. Uh, also, the program was reauthorized by Congress. Uh, Larry, in, in update, it's it, uh, the federal government can continue uh, federal support of centers after they've started up, presuming they meet uh, performance, uh, performance goals. So an independent performance review is done and uh, we've already started renewing a number of centers. The two newest ones that just came on online uh, this month is in bioindustrial manufacturing uh, with a location in St. Paul, Minnesota and cybersecurity in manufacturing in Austin, uh, Texas. So there are now 16 manufacturing innovation institutes. And if you take a look at those in total of the 14 active, uh, this is the results from last year. Uh, we now have over 2000 member organizations. So for example, University of Michigan is one member organization. So that, that's one of those um, now over 2000 members. Uh, last year, 561 major collaborative research uh, projects. Uh, I'd love that our two thirds of the members are from industry and manufacturers and more than two thirds of those are small. And really, uh, if you take a look at the snapshot, the 133 million in federal funds, uh, the co-investment of, of uh, non-federal, and most of this is from industry, it's running over a two to one match in, in uh, uh, co-investment. And that's because industry is recognizing real value. I wanna close with the strategic plan in the future. Uh, this again, uh, uh, if you go to the URL or just Google national strategic plan, it's on, on the White House. Uh, this is really three goals, new manufacturing technologies with 15 national objectives and 15 uh, prior, priority topics. 
The second is the manufacturing workforce, the skills. And if you do those two things right, it's all about clusters, about innovation clusters, uh, ecosystems, and that's all about uh, the manufacturing supply chains. So just to add a little bit to this, uh, the administration uh, really put this together into the industries of the future, artificial intelligence, quantum, um, advanced communications, advanced manufacturing. That's what's in the president's budget request and that just got marked. So we're talking about the, uh, what the feds are, will be funding in FY21 and both the House and the Senate have done their markups in the past uh, week. So in terms of investments, these are the uh, priorities going forward. And just to close here, this is such an exciting time for digital manufacturing because um, it's again, the image of manufacturing. This is not the giant factories uh, making that one thing. It's really the democratization of, of tools to design and make it. And I love uh, the growth of commercial maker spaces and innovation centers and it's really changing the rules. So to me, who are the future innovators uh, and manufacturers? These are those people. Uh, if, you can, if you can think it, you can design it. If you can design it, you can make it. And those, that to us is what manufacturing is all about. So with that, uh, Larry, thank you so much. Um, our, our website is uh, manufacturingusa.com. Uh, we also have the federal wide portal, manufacturing.gov. And I'm Mike Molnar from news.gov, unrelated to Larry, but gosh, should uh, uh, we all wish we were. Thank you, Larry. <laughs> well, thank you for that. And thank you for uh, your presentations. Very inspiring. It makes me want to go right out on the shop floor and, and start making things. So, um, you know, I'm glad that you mentioned the MEP program. Um, that's been a longstanding program and I'm very familiar with it. And uh, I think for the first time today, I heard um, the technology readiness level scale. I, I'm glad you brought that up. And I, I'll just add to that, uh, there's the technology readiness scale. Is your technology uh, ready to be manufactured? Uh, and that's a manufacturing readiness scale, um, which needs to run somewhat concurrently with the technology readiness scale. So. And then you also have the investment readiness scale. Is it investment ready? Is it mature enough to attract investment? Um, and so those, those three things are important. And maybe in next year's uh, conference on innovation, creativity, and entrepreneurship, we can talk a little bit more about those. So thank you very much, um, Mike and Ju Julie, Ed, um, and uh, Lynn. Um, and uh, this, this kind of ends this uh, roundtable session. I think I brought us in uh, fairly closely to on time. So I'm gonna tur turn it over to Dr. Hanadi. And uh, thanks again for everyone who presented and thank you all for listening. Thank you so much, Professor Larry. And thanks for all the presenter. Uh, you are really uh, the think tank for our conference. We are honorable to, to have you in this conference. This conference is uh, a largest event um, gathering more than 80 practitioners from around uh, 20 countries. And we are really uh, appreciate your potential and your participations in our conference. Great thanks to Professor Larry to make it in a very good manner and a smoothly sessions. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now we will uh, handling the second uh, sessions. Thank you, Professor Larry. You're welcome. Thank you. Mike. <laughs> Uh, Jeff, I think it's Jeff there. Larry, did you hear me? Um, I can hear you. Yes. Yes, you can. Um, uh, you can invite Jeff. Jeff, it's the next sessions. Would you mind, please, to hold this session just for a moment till Professor Michael Postler is chairing the session? Just we've been in contact with him. I don't see him in the listed there. 
Sure. Um, you can welcoming uh, the Jeff J J and Dr. Mohammed uh, Abdel Latif. It's the first presenter. Dr. Mohammed. So while we're waiting, um, uh, this is uh, this is Larry Molnar again, and uh, um, going back, I guess to the to the the last four or five presenters that we had, I thought there was a good representation uh, about programs that um, that help the uh, entrepreneur and and the the innovator, um, and and although there was a bit of a focus on universities. Um, the, the universities um, that did present um, are, uh, are actually conducting programs um, that have pr practitioners um, on the staff at the universities who then work within the ecosystem. Um, so they're really uh, institutions that are serving the ecosystem. And I, I thought it was interesting from two of them, um, Carmen uh, Quigg from the University of Michigan and Ed Morrison from Strategic Doing um, both talked about um, the communities and how the ecosystem really resides in the community and is uh, a very um, diverse um, eco uh, dynamic, um, or I, I, I guess you, you might be able to use the terminology of, of biology and say organic, um, uh, uh, type of activity and and um, actually if, if, as you put the different components of the ecosystem together it becomes something that takes on a life of its own and it's not uh, any one person or any one institution or organization um, it's it's the sum of its parts and I, I thought that uh, excuse Yes. Uh, yes, Professor Mike, it's on, uh, on uh, online. He need to uh, say hi to you to start the sessions. Good, good. Well, then I'll, I'll turn it over to them and uh, I'm sure that yes, we'll have much more interest. Yes, we hope so. Um, Professor Mike. I don't see him online. Professor Mark. Uh, Dr. Mahmoud Shlonik. Ahlan Biki, Ahlan Biki, Dr. Akbar Hadratke. Professor Mahmoud? Yeah, it's me. I'm here. Yes, yes. More than welcome. I think Professor Mike, it's there. Uh, it's there. Uh, let Professor Mike, it's holding the sessions. Welcome, Professor Mike. Mike? 
Professor Mike? Hi, Professor. Okay, how about now? Yes, okay. Oh, uh, we're all good uh, now? Yes. Okay, um, we're running a few minutes late, so uh, let, let's get started. Uh, the first speaker is uh, Dr. Mahmoud Adel Latif, and he is the uh, director for the Center of Entrepreneurship at Qatar University. So uh, Mahmoud, if you wanna get started, um, you've got 15 minutes. Okay. Thank you, Professor Mike. Thank you, Dr. Hanadi. And uh, it's my pleasure to participate in this conference. I will start sharing uh, my slides so you can see my presentation. So, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for uh, allowing me to speak in this international conference. And it's my pleasure to uh, explain our experience here in Qatar University. Uh, before we starting, I'd like to identify where is the universities in the entrepreneurship ecosystem. We know entrepreneurship ecosystem, as uh, Professor Laren mentioned before, that it has two words, entrepreneurship and ecosystem. Entrepreneurship often mentioned to starting a new business, allocating resources, or taking initiative. When we talk about entrepreneurs, we always talk about the person who took initiative, who is willing to bear the risk. This is the entrepreneurs. And when we talk about ecosystem, this ecosystem is imported from biology, from science, which means there is interconnected elements or factors which interact with each other. So here, when we talk about entrepreneur ecosystem, entrepreneurship ecosystem, we talk about how the entrepreneurs interact working in their environment. So let's have a look here about the ecosystem. If we look here to entrepreneurship ecosystem, we found it, consist, it consists of four pillars, personal enablers, access to finance, business services enablers, government regulation enablers. So entrepreneurs often are the middle and they affected by all those factors. When we talk about personal enablers, we talk about developing skills. We talk about entrepreneurship education, the culture, all those factors affecting personal enablers, affecting entrepreneurs. And this is the key factor for entrepreneurs to take initiative to bear the risk. Then we move to the second enabler. This is access to finance. I'm entrepreneur, I can take, in, I have an idea, I'm willing to take initiative. I'm willing to bear the risk, but I haven't finance. I should think about how to get money, how to finance my idea. And there are different sources starting from equity, government grants, VC, banks, all those there are different uh, sources of funds. And then we move to the third enablers, talk about business services. This is include professional services, include uh, business incubators, other supporting services to enablers. All those enablers couldn't work without government regulation. We, it looks like someone who would like to drive a car. He need knowledge before starting to drive a car. He need money to buy a car. He need services for his car, but he couldn't drive a car without regulation. And this is a similar. We need regulation related to starting a new business, business legislation, IB protection, all those factors affecting entrepreneur ecosystem. So where is universities in this ecosystem? We found here university contribute to the ecosystem in two ways. First way is knowledge accumulation. That is university is a producer of knowledge, is a producer of innovation, is a producer of idea. So here university play an important role in knowledge accumulation. Second part that is university play an important role is education. University prepare entrepreneurs 
universities, they have different programs. Nowadays, a lot of uh, programs, even uh, academic program, executive program, uh, professional program, there are variety of programs which support uh, entrepreneurs. So we can come out here and say that the university contribute to entrepreneurship ecosystem in terms of uh, technology transfer. They transfer technology. Most innovation started in labs and then it start to uh, grow and uh, spin, uh, uh, spin off uh, uh, our uh, universities. And then we have entrepreneurship education, a lot of programs as I mentioned. Okay, let me go to our experience in Qatar University. As we know, all GCC countries rely heavily on oil and gas and uh, all of them looking for economic diversification. We would like to diversify our economy. How we can diversify our economy? There are two ideas here that is entrepreneurship come from. One is necessity, that is, there is unemployment issue and we'd like to create jobs. So uh, entrepreneurship, this is one way to create jobs. This situation is not existing in Qatar, is not existing in most GCC countries because they are labor on uh, There are a lot of expats, then there is no issue for uh, employment. But the issue here of exploring opportunities. Here we'd like to diversify economy. There are a lot of opportunities in terms of uh, uh, for entrepreneurs. We have here like uh, in Qatar, we have national, uh, Qatar National Vision 2030, and it mentioned clearly that achieving sustainable economic development. So achieving sustainable economic development rely heavily on economic diversification. How is the university here contribute to economic diversification? We contribute through human development, and this is our role as a university. And we also support uh, entrepreneurs to produce new idea, to produce new product, new process, uh, new services. So in Qatar University, we have like a strategic plan for entrepreneurship. This is strategic plan started 2017 until 2020. So it's five years strategic plan. The strategic plan here, there are three key players. College of Business, College of Engineering, and Research Office. Those are the key player for entrepreneurship ecosystem within the university. In College of Business, we have academic programs. We have minor in entrepreneurship, which is, uh, uh, is limited, is only for uh, business student, but we are planning to open for all uh, Qatar University student, regardless of their discipline, minor in entrepreneurship. Second, we have here non-academic uh, programs within Center for Entrepreneurship. We deliver a lot of executive programs, a lot of professional training to support uh, entrepreneurs. We have also academic research, which all, uh, is almost uh, empirical research, applied research. We go out and examine what is the issue, what's the challenge to entrepreneurs, and come out by recommendation which can help policy makers. <laughs> then second pillar here, we have College of Engineering. They have a lot of uh, initiative. They have some academic courses to support entrepreneurs and they do research which uh, lead to uh, new, uh, uh, new products or new services. And all those activities need a technology transfer office. We need IB office. We have here IB office which working to support entrepreneurs, innovators, to uh, protect their uh, idea. Uh, then I will give you an idea what we are doing here in Center for Entrepreneurship because uh, the bulk of uh, strategic planning we play, uh, we implement at the bulk. So here, let's have a look here. What we are doing in Center for Entrepreneurship. We, our initial concern here is how to change the student mindset. A student here is different than student in US and student in Western countries. Student here, they have everything. So you need different approach, different mechanism to change their mindset. To draw their attention is not only the job. You need different track here to, do, uh, to discover opportunities. You need to enable them to find opportunities. So we run uh, different programs 
training programs, awareness program to change student mindset. And this is, is important for us because by the end of the day, we found some students who are willing uh, to uh, take the risk, who, are, who have idea and willing to, uh, to, to work in this idea. Then we go to uh, research. We do a lot of academic research, as I, I will explain later, and we have business incubation. So in terms of training, we have different training program. It start like gradual from uh, introductory program like ERADA training program to professional program like hard skills, accounting, finance, legal aspect, IB, and then we also deliver training program to outsiders. So this is a training part. Then we go to here to research. Actually research is important, even like academic research, we don't do much like academic research, but we do research with related to environment. We work in ecosystem, identify where is the issue, Sometimes we find the issue related to uh, finance, related to uh, starting a new business, business regulation, or sometimes the attitude, something related to psychology. As I mentioned, uh, here the environment is totally different than the environment in uh, somewhere else. So we need to uh, find the way to encourage students to uh, uh, entrepreneurs. So we do research related to uh, human behavior, entrepreneurship education, and the challenge here to change the mindset. Uh, for business incubation, actually business incubation is like pre-incubation, is not full-fledged business incubation. The idea here that is there are a lot of uh, outside university business incubation, full-fledged business incubation. So what we are doing here, we start by student idea. We help them to develop their idea and we coach them how to develop your idea further. We give them some consulting. We help them to do business plan or go for market research. Once his idea is ready for pitching and grow, we advise them, okay, you can go to uh, other uh, business incubation available in the country. Like we have a Qatar incubation uh, center, which is the biggest incubation uh, center in uh, the country and they have a lot of facilities. So we work with other uh, external party to support our student, to enable them to be entrepreneurs, to spin off their business idea and to work in the market. Also an important aspect, we do uh, networking. Networking here in terms of events, in terms of matchmaking, we have a regular event for matchmaking. A student, they don't know what is going outside and outside they don't know what is going inside the university. So we run annual event about matchmaking. So student investors uh, and business uh, owners, businessmen or business community, they know what is going inside the university related to entrepreneurship. Let me know where we are on that. Uh, that'd be great. Thanks. So this is roughly uh, what we are doing uh, for supporting entrepreneurship. So to conclude my presentation that universities here have important role, especially in Gulf countries, to change the student mindset, to contribute to economic diversification and to have a new generation of startup business owner, which can uh, play important role in the future. Thank you for uh, your attention. And if you have any question, I'm happy to take, I think I still have two minutes, uh, one question or two questions. Thank you. Uh, Malman, let me, um, if I can, uh, just ask one, one question. Um, I, I see what you're doing in, in helping um, the entrepreneurs get started and the training. I like the idea of uh, uh, changing their mindset because as you yes. know, entrepreneurs think much differently than um, other type, even business people. The biggest problem um, I see entrepreneurs having is um, raising capital. Um, and I, I know you mentioned that uh, you assist with the business plan, which obviously is very important and it can be pitched, but are there adequate sources of uh, capital and other financing available to these young entrepreneurs? 
I think uh, from my experience, capital is not issue because uh, right. Qatar here is a rich country and we have Qatar Development Bank. They have different program. They started by a domain. This is domain like a collateral program to support entrepreneurs. They give them uh, guarantees to access to loans. And this is insured loan. So if there is any case, those, this loan is insured by Qatar Development Bank. So uh, this is, and then they started angel investors and they have programs for seed fund. So uh, to be honest with you, like uh, fund is not a big issue. The challenge here is a changing mindset. Like every student who, when he come to you, he said, oh, I have a job. I, there is a job waiting me. So what is the point to go to and start a new idea or to take a risk. So you like them, okay, even you have a job, think in extra income, think about it, opportunities available in your country. This is what we are, would like to draw out as attention of our student. Yeah. Excellent, I think all that is uh, real good, makes a lot of sense. I think you're very fortunate, um, Qatar being in the position it is that it's able to pr provide uh, capital to, um, startups. I know in, in many other places, raising capital and getting adequate financing has to be the most difficult part. Um, so I guess we want to thank Mahmoud for his paper. Um, we're ready to move on, I think, to the next paper. Uh, let's see, the next one is Jeffrey M Milanet. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, he's president and founder yes, of... I did, thank you. Uh, and he's uh, president <laughs> President and founder of uh, Innovative Partners um, in the USA. Jeff? Uh, are you here, Jeff? Yes, Mike, he's here and texts me. He's ready to start, but I don't know. Okay. Uh, he, uh, he need to have the mic. Uh, I'm trying to unmute him here. Can you unmute him, Hanadi? Uh, Mike's not from me. I speak him with technical support. Moment. Okay. It's not unmuting. Okay, I'm keeping pressing the unmute button by Jeffrey's name and uh, nothing happened. So I'm hoping uh, Hanadi can fix that. Is there some other button I have to push here? Unmute. Uh, uh, Professor Mike, would you mind yeah. please to introduce Mr. Nasser and congratulate for them. Uh, they have a national day yesterday, I think, and today. Okay. So we'll, we'll move on to the third, the third paper. Yes, the third paper. Uh, Jeff is there, but he cannot turn off the uh, mic. He will be uh, continue with the technical support. Go ahead, Nasser. Nasser Al Malki. And yes. He is uh, your director general of the National Business Center in uh, Oman. Yes. Yes. Uh, hi. How are you? I'm doing very well, Nasser. I'm glad we can hear yeah. and see you. It's, uh, it's uh, my pleasure to be uh, with you guys. Um, uh, this is a, a very uh, good work. It's a fantastic job uh, uh, to bring all of these people together. So thank you very much. Um, so I'll start, uh, I think, immediately. Um, I am in charge of National Business Center. This uh, center is, uh, uh, or let us say, belong to Madain. Madain is the authority that looks after industrial zone uh, in the country. And we have also uh, one free zone and uh, uh, the IT park in the country, the only IT park in the country called uh, Knowledge Oasis Muscat, abbreviated COM. We located here in, uh, in COM as well. Um, uh, National Business Center is a mixed uh, use uh, uh, facility. Uh, we are not specialized in uh, specific things. Um, and this incubation center created in 2012, and uh, initially it was launched in 2003 uh, uh, as a knowledge mine uh, specialized in ICT sector. 
But uh, in 2012, uh, uh, our colleagues from uh, the ITA, they are into the ICT sector. So they say they will create an incubation and uh, then we shifted to a mixed incubation. So they have another incubation called uh, SAS uh, uh, in the ICT and they are doing also a uh, very good job. So what we are targeting this, is- we are, a bit of a glitch and- um, okay. uh, We are trying to buddy entrepreneurs and startup ventures uh, either from universities or uh, people who are working or retired. Um, so far, we, I believe we did some very good job. Uh, we look at uh, uh, in this big building on the left of the screen, uh, it's called uh, Comfor. We, are, we have the whole floor, uh, fourth floor, and our vision is to be the best incubation center uh, in the country. Um, our mission is to promote cultures, entrepreneurship culture, among Omanis and also provide support in terms of facilities, uh, spaces, uh, of course, consultancy uh, to ensure a successful uh, creation of new ventures. Uh, also, we are in charge in building networks between entrepreneurs and uh, the business ecosystems. We have uh, 10 specialized events uh, every year where we bring uh, people from the private sector and also from the government sector uh, to meet our entrepreneurs and discuss with them the best way uh, so our entrepreneurs uh, benefits from uh, their services. Uh, from private sectors, so we normally bring the people in charge uh, of contracting and uh, tendering. Uh, uh, but from the government, we bring more into uh, the, the people who are in uh, to authority uh, policies and legislations. So who are our partners? Of course, Madain. Madain is investing uh, as a, a CSR uh, in a national business center. They invest more than a million and a half US dollar every year um, as an operation cost. And uh, we have uh, uh, BDO as Petroleum Development Oman, uh, OMIFCO, OQ, Oman, Tal, uh, Oman Data Park, and also Dalil Petroleum. Uh, Kim Giramdas also. Uh, these people, they sponsor uh, our events, our programs that uh, add values to our uh, uh, entrepreneurs. For example, uh, OMIFCO, uh, they sponsor running a program uh, for more than six months every year. Uh, we call it WASL. Uh, this investment is not uh, directed only for our entrepreneurs, but we uh, conduct this uh, program uh, with the fund from MFCO to uh, selected entrepreneurs around uh, last time it was 12 companies, uh, just uh, uh, as a way of accelerating them. Uh, th some of these companies, they reach to a level where they cannot expand. Uh, they don't have the best way to uh, present their countries for uh, uh, investors. Uh, so we uh, intervene and uh, try to help them through uh, these programs. Uh, we have also I highlighted here uh, uh, SQU Sultan Qaboos University is the only, uh, let us say, government uh, university uh, until last year. Uh, and it's the biggest uh, government uh, university. And we have also a research council, which is now uh, is no more. It's uh, now uh, part of uh, Ministry of Higher Education. By the way, I was also a board member uh, of the research council, uh, Oman. Uh, these two guys, they have, or these two entities, they have facilities within our uh, incubation centers. So uh, we interact directly with them and uh, we have also other ways and means and com committees uh, to deal with, uh, with these entities. Uh, these, of course, are into research and development. Okay, so we are saying, yes, it is a mixed uh, incubation um, uh, center, but so far we are more into energy, oil and gas, uh, health and safety. Uh, we have also some medicine. Um, in medicine, we have two companies. 
um, logistic, uh, we had also Akid, it's uh, similar to Talabat, who peop those people who know Talabat in the GCC, also Talabat uh, was initially started from uh, um, uh, SAS, from uh, here, from Oman. Uh, and also we are into IT and ICT. Uh, in the ICT sector, we have one company now, they are doing some project in Philippines also. Uh, they are not only uh, doing projects uh, in Oman, they are also abroad. Um, and also we have Im Mushrif, but not uh, in our incubation, that is with um, uh, OTF now, they are in Kuwait uh, where uh, Dr. Hanadi uh, is staying. Okay, uh, what is the status, the current status of uh, uh, MBC? We are not running only one incubation, that is MBC one, but we are also in charge, or let us say we are running uh, other incubation, which is under the SME authority. SME authority in 2016, they decided to uh, do an incubation uh, center and uh, they looked into um, uh, the ecosystem who will be better doing this, uh, let us say, running this uh, uh, incubator. Uh, so they choose us because we are here since 2003. In fact, uh, Madain was the first entity who brought uh, uh, the incubation culture to the country when we started in 2003. Uh, and also we have uh, these, uh, these two uh, incubators, they have 40 offices, uh, furnished, ready, uh, will subsidize the uh, rent. Uh, it cost us um, around 15 uh, real so per meter uh, per month, and we are su sub subsidizing them uh, with three reals per meter uh, um, as part of uh, our support also. Um, in uh, So far, we have 46 companies graduated, uh, and also we have an OM Hub. It is a business center. It's a co-working co space uh, center. Um, of course, we have uh, meeting rooms and other uh, uh, facilities available. Uh, examples, we have, for example, Kindos. Kindos started in 2003. Um, they are into security and ICT. Now, uh, now they are building uh, uh, their second uh, building, not office, uh, within uh, the IT park. And uh, also we have NEC, uh, National, uh, National uh, Energy Center. Um, the guy who formed it uh, graduated in 2016. Uh, in four years, now we have more than 900 employees, uh, more than 80% are uh, citizens. Uh, and uh, the company now uh, valued uh, more than 100 million Omani Real, which is around 250 million uh, US dollars. Uh, this company um, uh, depends on uh, modern uh, technologies, uh, on I, uh, IoT, um, let us say, solutions, and also uh, solar energy. In fact, they split the company now. They have a solar uh, energy company by itself, and uh, they are specialized in IoT uh, the solutions. Uh, they didn't, um, let us say, uh, satisfied with the uh, uh, importing uh, these devices, but uh, they have the factory now uh, in one of our industrial states where they are assembling these uh, IoT sensors. So they brought also the technology uh, to the country. Uh, more than 1,500 uh, people, uh, citizens employed within these uh, uh, graduated uh, companies, and we believe thousands of people uh, benefited from our um, events uh, and programs. So if we talk about some uh, numbers, we believe we're still behind, uh, and, uh, but we are progressing. Uh, two days back, Stanford uh, report highlighted that uh, Omani scientists uh, from the uh, Omani uh, universities are among uh, the best 2% uh, 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 worldwide. Uh, this was uh, announced uh, a few days about, uh, back, I think three or four days back. Uh, and also at the beginning of this year, uh, OTF uh, was successful to be uh, ranked as um, uh, one of the best 10, uh, having one of the best 10 deals uh, in uh, uh, investors and accelerator rank. 
OTF is uh, the Oman Technology Fund. It's not part of us, but they are our neighbors. Uh, and here where I am talking about uh, the entrepreneur ecosystem as uh, an ecosystem, uh, not uh, about the MBC. Uh, if we see also about uh, the companies registered here in, uh, in, uh, uh, in the country, uh, we have more than 103,569 uh, uh, companies uh, registered uh, as SMEs, uh, uh, but only 52,000 of Omanis are working uh, uh, within these uh, companies. Um, we have more than 250,000 Omanis working in the private sectors, but uh, uh, only 52,000 are in the SMEs. The rest are in big uh, companies like um, petroleum and oil and gas uh, uh, companies and in uh, a government owned uh, uh, companies. And this is strange. Uh, we need to do a lot uh, to enable our people uh, uh, in the market to, to do more and, uh, let us say, to own our own businesses. Now, um, most of the private sector are run by foreigners who are, uh, unfortunately, they don't add any value. There is no R&D, nothing. Most of them are trading um, and uh, they are benefiting from government, uh, let us say, uh, contracts. And uh, we have unemployed, uh, very high rate of unemployment. Uh, Mr. Dr. Mahmoud from Qatar, he said uh, uh, unemployment is not an issue in the GCC countries. No, it is a big issue uh, in, in Oman. And I think it's also a big issue in Saudi Arabia. Uh, to some extent, it's an, also an issue in Bahrain, and uh, I don't know, I am not sure about Bahrain, about uh, Kuwait, uh, but Qatar, they don't have uh, an issue because uh, they are uh, a small community and uh, the foreigners more than five times uh, the, the locals, the citizens. It's the same in uh, UAE. But in Oman and Saudi Arabia, unemployment rate is a big issue. And here, where we have to uh, do our best uh, uh, to engage our citizens in owning their businesses uh, within the country. Okay, so we have uh, some projects coming. Uh, um, we have uh, uh, 200 SMEs uh, we aim to create every two, 12 and 18 months uh, th through a vocational training and incubation uh, uh, programs uh, in the country. In this, we brought uh, different um, uh, agencies. We have uh, the training uh, institute, uh, and we have also the funding agency and the authority. We all brought them together. And also the training is not uh, from the training facility. It's also funded by the government. So we have the funding uh, on two stages for the training and also uh, uh, later for creating uh, the companies. Uh, we hope we can start this uh, by uh, the beginning of 2021. Also, we are, we are aiming to open a new incubation center uh, in Sohar, Sohar, uh, Sohar Industrial City. Sohar is very advanced now. We have Sohar board there, we have a free zone, and we have, it is the biggest also industrial city in the country. Uh, more than uh, 15 million uh, square meters uh, available in, into that uh, industrial city. We also have uh, another incubation coming uh, in Sur, in the Syria city, and I believe this is maybe in the late uh, 2021. Uh, we have also another project called the Industrial Incubation Center, where since we are uh, part of Madain, and Madain is looking af after uh, industrial zones, uh, we have to do something uh, in, uh, for the industrial, uh, uh, let us say, related uh, entrepreneurs. Um, what we are doing right now, we are doing a survey uh, for the whole industry within uh, Madain and also uh, other industrial zones. Uh, so we can see uh, the opportunities for um, uh, clustering and uh, chain supply within these industrial zones. 
We believe we can uh, create a lot of companies. So I can, we can pinpoint uh, uh, the video. Uh, uh, these ways okay. of, uh, uh, let us say, uh, these opportunities that is now covered. We don't know about it anything. Uh, in this uh, specific um, uh, project, we have uh, um, a lot of stakeholders. We have Innovation Factory Oman, who was also initially graduated from our uh, 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 MBC, and we have the SME Authority Oman Makers. I think um, uh, someone from Oman Makers will be presenting also uh, in this uh, uh, platform. And we have Oman Development Bank um, and others. Uh, so uh, I just highlight Research Council because it is not anymore Research Council. Now it is part of the Ministry of Higher Education. Okay. Uh, uh, Nasser, Nasser we're, we're, running, we're running a little short on time here. Ah, uh, okay, Nasser, okay. So, sorry. Uh, about the ecosystem, yeah, we have a lot of players in the ecosystem, but we are uh, losing, uh, or let us say we are missing uh, streamlining uh, the coordination. We don't have, uh, let us say, uh, a unified platform that can benefit uh, the entrepreneurs. Uh, Oh, each of these, of these agencies, they work like, uh, not let us say alone, but it is manual cooperation. Uh, we don't have um, uh, like um, uh, an IT enabled platform that can benefits directly entrepreneurs from A to Z. Uh, I have one uh, example of a very good example we did. We incubate these people. Uh, this is last mile connectivity. There is a study uh, into telecommunications. Then we found that we can uh, allocate the LMC, the last one, to the Omanis. We start uh, training them. And we have more than uh, 200 people working on this. Uh, the, it's like 20 million US dollar per year, uh, this sector. And uh, what we need to enhance, okay. We need to have a single portal for entrepreneurships where they can do everything uh, from that portal. Uh, uh, the requirement also, that, for example, commitment for the go government, 10% uh, of tenders uh, allocated for uh, uh, SMEs, but this is not uh, uh, well done. It is not governed in a best way. Also diversity of funding, uh, crowdfunding is not uh, there. Uh, and uh, uh, we have also, we are looking for some sort of fencing or let us say protections from the black market where we have foreigners work in the name of a citizen, but everything is going outside the country and we are losing uh, a lot of, uh, of foreign uh, currencies, uh, saying dollars, for example. Uh, so this is all and some pictures from our events and uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Nasser. That was uh, certainly a very good presentation. Um, there are probably some questions here. We're a little short of time, so Please. I'm going to try to move on. And if we have a few minutes at the end, um, we'll ask for some, some questions. Um, we're going to move, uh, Jeff, to the, the end of the uh, session here. So we'll move on with uh, Ali Mubarak. Uh, he's the chairman of the National Incubator in Kuwait. Uh, is Ali here? Ali? Uh, okay, I think Ali is muted. Uh, no. Not, no. There you go. Yeah. All right, now. now. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Ali. Please proceed. Thank you. Good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you for this invitation. I'm just uh, really happy, you know, to hear all these beautiful ideas about, you know, the incubation, especially, you know, when I start talking or hearing about, you know, the incubation and it become, you know, now very common in our GCC. And I'm the chairman of uh, the National Incubator. The National Incubator, we believe that, uh, you know, this time of the, let's say, what is going on between, you know, the education and what is the education is giving us, okay? It's not fulfilling what we need as a community here in Kuwait, especially in the craftsmen. Crafts in Kuwait, 
everybody is saying that Kuwait is based on oil and we have the oil and we have the engineers and we have all these kind of stuff. But in the real life, we really need now the craftsmen. We need people to work with their hand. So our vision is to focus on the craftsmanship, people who know what to do with their hand, people who know to unleash the creativity and understand the meaning of creativity. I think and I believe that education is giving us a limitation in creativity because education, we have to get a certain, let's say information or knowledge, but sometimes it give us, you know, some limitation in term of there is rules in education that we cannot move towards. So we brought a, a study case, you know, especially, you know, with the people, you know, who work, you know, with the payat here in our country, we see the people that those people who work with their hand in the society, they don't have that, uh, let's say, level of that if you work with your hand, you are not like the engineer, for example, because the engineer is someone really big, he knows and he has so much information. But however, however, if you think about it really well, those two people, engineers and people who work with their hand without each other, they cannot do anything, nothing. They cannot do nothing together. But in the real life, the main who people who's doing it by his hand, who's doing it in real life, and the engineer is giving us the design and the science behind any factor that we are doing. So what we did, we created the national incubator to focus on the people who work with their hand, to, to, to tell them that, okay, listen, you know how to do it by your hand, but you don't have how to do it in business way. So we have a big program called the National Incubator Program, TNI program. It takes them, we make them focus on their handwork and understand the fundamental of being an entrepreneur. People who work with their hand, they don't see numbers because they have a passion to do the piece, but they don't have the mindset to do it commercially because doing it commercially means you have to have factories and some of the financial wise, it has to be big. So they just become afraid of taking this initiative initiative to start this. So what we did, we give them all this program to take them step by step until, you know, they reach to the level that they have a belief in their product and it is sellable. There is a marketplace for them. So we bring so much marketplace, you know, for the people who do stuff with their hand in terms of carpentry, plumbers, you name them. So we tell them, okay, whatever you do, we will bring for you all the companies, the mega companies here in Kuwait, we bring them contracts. We have some of the e-commerce business that help to sell their products that has been handmade. And we teach them how to shift it from handmade, which is art, because they think whatever they do, it's an art because it's a handmade. How to shift them to a commercial site and how to use the new technology now worldwide, how to commercialize your products. Not necessary to do it because there is a good says, you know, that we had before. Whomever work, you know, with only with their hand, he's, uh, we call them a foreman. The guy who work with his hand and his heart, sorry, with his mind, we said, we, we, we call him a craftsman. But the guy, you know, who work with his hand and his head, you know, with his brain and his heart, he's an artist. We don't need the artist. Now we need someone to create and he sell. You see what I mean? So that's what we're trying, you know, to push. We're trying, you know, to gather all this community to tell them how important now. Oil is not going to last long. We need people to start working with their hand. We need people to start, you know, being independent for the country because it will help us so much. So, as I said, National Incubator now, we reach to at least now 25 projects from carpentry to oil sector, pump. You know, we have people design pumps, imagine. And we have, you know, a good communication and partnership with some of the international companies like German Tech, we have with ABB, we have one, we are trying to introduce even the artificial intelligence 
and the robotic system for exactly you know for the welding because if we go to all the factories in the car factories manufacturers they using you know the robot the robot for the welding so we have you know in the company robots we are telling them and show them how easy you can use these kind of tools that the craftsman he can develop his skills with the technology we can get the commercial side out of it so so far so good we like you know what is happening now thank you corona for all what happened <laughs> you know corona just now you know messed up everything right but you know it it, it give us a good lesson that now after you know corona and what happened because all the market started to just get crazy now corona taught us that if we don't be dependent in our youth and our craftsmanship this is the time that we develop more and more and we are looking to do so much cooperation with all different kind of companies now you know they are coming you know to our company see what we are having now you know in term of kind of entrepreneurs that we have see these study cases and thanks god now we have so much from the entrepreneurs now we are selling in kuwait with saudi arabia and we are selling in oman for these kind of projects <clears throat> excellent excellent um extremely well done uh ali you, you know i find it interesting um you you've touched you found an area that i think is a problem uh, probably in a lot of countries worldwide i know here in the us too that uh craftsmen people that work with their hands are not looked upon the same way as like the engineers and the designers and you're absolutely right if you don't you can design whatever you want but somebody needs to build it in order to get that done um and uh, another thing you mentioned i thought was very interesting uh, you're trying to show these craftsmen how to use technology rather yes. than th they have a fear that technology is going to take their job away i think what you're going to emphasize is technology is going to make you as a craftsman more productive and that's exactly. going to end up helping you and uh the economy in in general so i think it's a marvelous thing that you're doing there and uh i wish you great success in the future thank you so much thank you so much my pleasure okay um so we'll move on here uh judy mahan i'm hoping she's here she's the ceo of angel gen partners uh in in the us uh judy are you here uh judy your name is here i don't see a picture judy it's here i can see her you you can see her yeah I maybe she went to get some coffee <laughs> that's possible um i just see her name here i guess we could move on and come back to both uh judy and jeff um that would mean I'd have to move on to uh, Tim Wittig. And right now he's muted. Am and I still I muted? Think muted? I think you're not muted anymore, Tim. Oh, good. <laughs> There's a, uh, wait, is Judy, is Judy back? Yes, I am. Uh, oh. My internet went down literally when you called my name. <laughs> uh, the, 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 the timing is always perfect like that. Uh, okay, right. Tim will wait. Tim would be happy to turn away till you're done. So, uh, Judy, um, yeah. fire when ready. Okay, thank hi, you. Hi, Judy. Hi, Dr. Hanadi, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. And you, more than welcome to see you today. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Go ahead and start. Thanks. Okay, so I'm going to uh, share my screen so I can go through my slides. Um, and I'm just going to bring those up real quick. Um, <clears throat> let's see. So just one moment, I'm sharing my screen as we speak. Can everyone go. see my screen? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. So um, the focus here uh, this morning was, let's see, it's uh, presenting automatically. So I'm part of Angel Gen, and what we focus on is helping um, uh, region stakeholders all over the world uh, put together angel conferences. But I also run an incubator program in California 
uh, for tech and innovation startups. And so the presentation today is a combination of um, all the best practices that we've put in place um, as the economic development director from my region uh, to help support economic development. Um, and also I'll touch a little bit on what angel conferences are because that is one of the best practices that we've um, implemented in, to, to support our local economic development. Um, so here's an outline of the best practices. Uh, number one, certainly uh, for our startups, is being able to provide access to capital, uh, making sure that the startups get all the adequate coaching, mentoring, uh, as the prior speakers have outlined, that is such a key factor. Uh, hosting space, uh, you know, that's where you create your entrepreneurship hub. That's where serendipity happens. Co-founders can um, meet each other to, to share uh, ideas, share resources, uh, and maybe even team up. Um, training, of course, a lot of intensive training. Uh, our jobs are is to help accelerate the process um, and to help people achieve their goals in a faster, more diligent way. Uh, a lot of business planning, for sure. Uh, we found that another area of, of a best practice is ties with higher education. Um, so as our first speaker mentioned, very important to be connected with local universities. And of course, a lot of networking. So all these elements um, are, you know, come out of the incubator program as, as people who manage and run these programs, uh, we have to ensure that we can implement all these best practices. But as a result of that, we're building that ecosystem for our entire region uh, from you know, where we're located. Um, so access to capital, of course, there's the traditional access, which is in, you know, equity funding with investors, with angel groups and venture firms. Uh, there's bank lending, there's grant funding, there's factoring, crowdfunding, lots of different pathways. None of them are exclusive, naturally. We support every single one. So we try to build very good relationships with angel groups throughout California and out of state. Um, I work diligently with all our local banks to make sure that the banks are able to jump in and assist and support our companies, even if they're pretty early stage. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about the Angel Conference, because this is what I consult on uh, as, a, as a separate effort. Um, I'm launching our fourth Angel Conference here in uh, Central California. And this is where we encourage, we realize that we're not in Silicon Valley, we're exactly midway between LA and San Francisco, um, but there are a lot of high net worth individuals in our area. So the idea was they've never invested in, in tech startups. They don't know much about investing in startups. How do we encourage them to become part of the entrepreneurship ecosystem and to get involved? Um, so I, I reach out to individuals, encourage them to put a, a very minimal amount of money into a fund. We create a new fund every year. Um, we pull together, you know, 150 to $200,000. So very minimal amount, but we meet every month with these investors to train them in startup investing. Um, and at the end of the six month period, they review startups who apply to be part of the program and they pick their top six startups. We have a big, big event, big showcase event. And again, that's part of that entrepreneurship ecosystem. We invite all of the business community to attend to see the top six pitch, the startups pitch their, um, uh, their business, and then the investor group votes to make their investment into one startup. And then that's it, the fund closes. So the idea here is we've trained these investors and they're gonna go on to make future investments. And what we've seen over the last four years is that they do do significant follow-on investments. Um, and uh, it's generated a lot of activity um, and they, they mentor these startups, they advise them. So it gets them engaged with our programming. Uh, and here's some of the idea and overview of the contents that we provide to the investors as we do these angel conferences. So we teach them how to review the startups, look at financials, um, study the cap tables, term sheets, how, how to negotiate the deal terms for the investment. Uh, and we help them do all the due diligence. Um, so that's just a quick overview, but a lot of fun training for, for about six months. So capital access to capital is key to make sure that you have a thriving ecosystem. 
Uh, the second piece that uh, I focus on very heavily is coaching and mentoring. Uh, all the startups in our incubator program within the first three months, um, they are mandated <laughs> to put together an advisory board. It's a very informal advisory board, but the idea is um, you bring in three to five complete experts in their areas. So maybe you have a brilliant finance guy, uh, you know, a very strong marketing person and someone who just deeply knows the industry that you're in. You meet with them once a month and it, it elevates the conversation that that little think tank that you put in place is going to help you troubleshoot big issues. Um, of course, we do, um, they all are assigned a lead mentor. We do deep dives on a monthly basis with the lead mentor. We offer a lot of open office hours, a lot of experts who come and host office hours and they're available to answer whatever question pops up. And we also, uh, so I also run our regional business development center. Uh, and through that center, we have access to another 34 paid consultants that can meet one-on-one -on -one with our startups. Um, we pay the consultants, not the startups, and, but the startups have free access. Um, so that, that works really well. But a lot of coaching and mentoring, it has to be regular. You have to set um, you know, KPIs, goals, and make sure month to month that they're achieving their, their goals. Um, hosting, hosting, like I said, is a big deal. Um, that's where a lot of exchange of ideas happens. Uh, that's where people can team up and help each other. Um, so we have 20,000 square feet. Our incubator space uh, is located in our downtown. Um, and we're moving forward to launching verticals in four areas. Um, so far, we've been agnostic. We've been uh, open to any startup in any industry. Uh, we're eight years in. So it's, it's been a process, eight years. Uh, but we're now seeing um, demand for specific verticals that we want to tap into. We're located next to uh, Vandenberg. Um, uh, it's a milit military base just a few hours south. Uh, it's the only other base where the, we do space launches here in California. Um, that and, and Cape Canaveral on the, you know, Florida. So we've got the east-west coast. So we're the west coast version of uh, what's going on in Florida. And we're trying to figure out how we can really tap into that. So SpaceX is using uh, that zone to do space launches. Uh, we, want, we want to really explore how we can um, uh, maximize that vertical for, from a tech and innovation perspective. That's just one example I wanted to highlight. And hosting can also mean uh, foreign exchange <laughs> programs. I think that's really, really important. Um, I've negotiated... Um, MOUs with different incubators throughout the throughout Europe mostly, um, but again, it's to give the opportunity for our startups as needed that you know they they have an option out there to to go explore for three months if there's a market they want to tap into. Um, training. So I mentioned our business development center. Most of the training is done through that center. We do at least seventy two to one hundred events each year. Um, you know that's that's a lot. Uh, a lot of, we, we invite a lot of very successful entrepreneurs to come in and tell their story once a month. And that's just more motivational to get people driven. Um, we do some very intensive um, pitch prep practice with our startups so that they get ready to talk to investors and that they're, um, you know, that they're very professional and completely ready to present when it's time to start sharing the slide decks to investors. So that's the other thing. It's, it's all about building very strong relationships. I mentioned earlier, um, you know, I work really hard to have good relationships with angel groups, venture firms. Uh, and I, you know, we really try to make sure that we only present um, uh, good deals. And if I don't have a good deal, that's okay. Uh, I'd rather not present anything than uh, present something that's not Top notch. Um, we encourage our oops, sorry, our founders to. We meet once a month where all the founders get together and and again share uh, where they're at, issues they're having. They help each other out a lot. That's our peer to peer roundtables. Uh, I talked about coaching sessions and all these different types of workshops. This is just a, a you know a small outline of examples of the workshops that we offer: uh, digital marketing, QuickBooks branding. Uh, IP, uh, you know, and then of course the more traditional stuff that we do as well. Um, <clears throat> business planning, we use software, uh, it's on the cloud. So that allows all of our consultants to log on and see where every startup's at in their business planning. Of course, we do use the business model canvas early on and that's great early on, but at some point in time, I, I do believe that 
you know, a more traditional business plan is helpful and useful uh, um, as you grow your business. Uh, I mentioned the monthly advisory board sessions. We ask our startups to plan very diligently as if they were presenting to their board of directors um, to take it very seriously. And that preps them for when they do get investment from investors on how to best present their um, uh, the business on a monthly basis. And I talked about KPIs, setting goals, setting uh, metrics that they can measure their success against. Um, Ties with higher education. Uh, so we're hosted by Cal Poly University. Um, lots of resources on campus. Um, that's, you know, that's definitely key. And networking, 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 networking. So that's how you create opportunity. Uh, we do forums, coffee and conversation, VIP events. Um, and that's how you create that entrepreneurship hub. Um, oops, and oh yes, and this is my partner, Misty Rusk, my business partner. Um, and so the, the services that we offer separately from all of this is just the focus on angel conferences. Uh, so if any, anyone wants to know more about that piece, um, feel free to contact us. And I'm um, happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Excellent, Judy. I think that was uh, very well presented. Um, we're running a little short of time. If there are questions, we'll certainly take them. Um, but just a, a couple points I wanted to make. I noticed in your list of uh, uh, seven uh, functions essentially you provide, the first one and the last one, I thought, while they're all very important, the first one and the last one, access to capital and networking, I think are really the two keys. All those other things, again, are very important too. But if they have the capital and access to um, a, a network that can help them succeed, I think that's um, very, very important. You also said something else. Um, you work to sometimes train angel investors. And I found that to be very interesting too, because I know there are uh, people who would like to be angel investors. Usually these are a little older people and they've been successful and they've accumulated their own capital. Exactly. They just they just don't know how to do this. Uh, so you're showing them that I think is a, a very valuable uh, point. I know a lot of other countries, the government's a little more involved in the financing of the new ventures. In the U.S., it's mostly private. There's some government funding, but it's mostly uh, private. So I think you're serving a very valuable function, training investor uh, uh, yeah. investors how to be angels. So thank you very much for uh, your uh, excellent presentation. I certainly wish you uh, luck in the, in the future. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, we're ready to move on uh, with Tim. Uh, Tim Wittig, are you here, Tim? Uh, let me just see if you're muted or not. Tim, I have you being muted. I'm hoping, Hanadi, can you unmute him? Uh, I can't unmute him. All right, him. how are we doing? Okay, Tim? I'm here. Okay. I've just lost my screen. Okay. Can you hear well, me? We, we see, hear you and see you. So let me just introduce you. You're CEO of... Uh, technology commercialization advisors, and you're in Washington, D.C., which these days I imagine is a very interesting place to be. Isn't that the truth? <laughs> Tim? <laughs> yes, it certainly is. Uh, it's terrible when the Washington Post is your local paper. That's all I can say. I still um, have with you. That's right. I have some kind of a computer glitch, which we have no time to fiddle with. So if it's all right with you, Michael, I'll just begin. Would that be acceptable? That would be perfect. Thank you, Tim. S super. Um, I certainly want to thank you and all of the people involved in inviting me to have a chance to talk with you. Um, for me, uh, economic development, and in specific, the ability to diversify a, 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 a single in, uh, uh, industry environment is extraordinarily interesting. I'm still involved in those activities. And I'd really like to give you one guy's view of entrepreneurial enhancement. Uh, to explain my views, let me say that I've spent 45 years uh, directly involved with business owners and the owners of technology, governmental and academic laboratories, scientists and engineers, cities, states, and nations, all involved in these issues. All of them were focused on ways to help expand and assist business startup and expansion. You have and will hear from a very large group of experts involved in various aspects of entrepreneurial business activity. Each speaker offers really useful advice. 
but I want to talk just for a minute uh, about my general view. I think that the availability uh, of, of capital, the availability and use of accounting systems are probably the two most important parts of entrepreneurial success. Thereafter, I'd say intellectual property and human resources capabilities are the third and they're tied. I'd like to talk about intellectual property. Intellectual property, as we are discussing it, uh, is, a, is the ownership rights to an idea, an idea that's in a fixed and tangible form because you can't just protect an idea. It's a method of recognizing and enforcing ownership of the idea. It involves patents, copyrights, trademarks, and trade secrets, each of, one, each of which covers a different form of protectable idea. Who does what? Well, remember that patents cover uh, a useful thing. It could be a composition of matter or a process. It could be a new device or a new way to use a device. All these things uh, are involved in the world of patents. But we also have to remember that we have another series of international regimes, copyrights, trademarks, and also trade secrets. Copyrights, remember, tend to cover uh, uh, a written expression or a visual expression of an idea, whereas trademarks or service marks cover a mark that identifies a particular uh, uh, product or uh, in, in another situation, uh, a particular service and the source of that product or service. Whereas trade secrets cover secrets that a business holds. So in these situations, each of these different modalities of protecting an idea, okay, uh, support each other. They're a form of protection, a form of recognition of who created that idea or that patent, but each is a very complex statutory and regulatory scheme. They're very difficult to create, they're very difficult to operate, and they have been operating in the international marketplace now uh, in a serious way for about 60 or 70 years. Intellectual property has a really significant value to businesses. When I was a young man, long ago, uh, the value of a business was 70 to 80% contained in build buildings, machinery, uh, equipment, product, and raw materials, or, or of course, work, work in progress. And that's how the nation, bankers, and others, the stock market, valued a business. Today, beyond 70 and almost into 80% of the value of a business in, the, in each of those markets from a banker's perspective or a stockholder's perspective involves intangibles, a big part of which is intellectual property. So the value of patents, the value of copyrights, of trade secrets, and also of marks of each kind become more and more valuable for, from a valuation perspective but they equally become valuable from a competitive perspective. Not only are they a, a, a great way to help a business from a value perspective, but also to fend off those who might be trying to sell into that same market. Intellectual property fits into an internationally recognized enforcement system, strengthens the competitive advantage for those who holds those, uh, the intellectual property, and is a way to defend against others uh, who don't hold that intellectual property. IP ownership is clearly recognized as a business discriminator. The problem, however, is <laughs> it's very time consuming and it's very expensive. Intellectual property protection requires a mastery of both local rules and international rules because they're all founded in national law, then international agreements that cover both law and regulation. So that combination uh, becomes an important, if you will, see in which all businesses swim. The Gulf Cooperating Council provides patent protection for Gulf states, but for market protection beyond that marketplace, a, a, a business in, in the Gulf states must look to the patent cooperation treaty agreements to be able to protect their invention, their copyright, their, their mark or their trade secret in other markets. So a working knowledge of all of these various national, international rules and regulations, and of course, court decisions 
is, a, is very expensive to obtain and very expensive to maintain. It's usually a cost a new business cannot afford to bear. It's too busy using their funds for, other, for the purpose of starting, manufacturing, sales, all those issues. So it's really hard for a new business or an expanding business to be able to use these tools to their advantage. Well, you'd ask, when does a business need intellectual property support? And let's start at the very beginning with a startup. As they're designing a product or a service, a business needs to understand from a competitive analysis perspective, whether they're gonna run right into another problem because intellectual property is held by another, whether they have freedom of oper operation because that patent exists, but it is no longer enforced because its term is run and now it's available to anybody. As a new business starts to develop a, uh, a supply chain, it needs to look at where things can be made and where things cannot be made as they think about patent interference. From a branding perspective, copyrights and trademark issues need to be examined in advance so that once uh, material has been written, uh, branding information, including logos, et cetera, have been created. They never have to be disturbed because of course uh, the work has been done in advance to determine that those uh, uh, marks, those words are available and protected by the business. Last, the business needs this the, the, to look at uh, problems of competitive uh, protection. Am I gonna run into somebody else's product? Is somebody gonna run into mine and I have to think about it? But of course, of giant uh, interest is initial financing. Everybody, whether investors or bankers, really wants to know that the idea uh, is not gonna run into problems and is in fact protected. Those investors and bankers just hate risk. As a business prepares for expansion, it needs again to understand freedom of action for its product or service within a specific geographic area. And so that becomes an, a, a very important uh, way to know where to expand, how to expand, what things need to be changed, if anything, in the product. The business also, as it thinks about expansion, can look at the availability of licensing for their patents, for their copyrights, for their marks. An interesting source of revenue and also an easier way sometimes to expand. And last, in order to avoid infringing products and competition, that intellectual property support is there to help them understand in which way to go. Preparations for an equity infusion, gracious. Intellectual property is critical. Or if you want to sell the business, it's also important from a valuation perspective. IP itself has an intrinsic value. Obviously, intellectual property is woven into the fabric of a successful business. It plays a, a, a role in all of the life of that business. But IP protection is long and it's expensive. It takes a long time and it's expensive. And as much as I believe strongly in intellectual property attorneys, paying an intellectual property attorney can drain the assets needed for both startup and for expansion. Governments could provide either inside their own nation or for example, uh, in a cooperative agreement with the Gulf nations to provide intellectual property uh, by hiring a few very skilled people and then providing that capability uh, to businesses within either the nation or uh, in the entire area. Patents and copyrights, as well as trade and service marks, is, they're really expensive. Skilled people are expensive and hard to find. But if those capabilities were available at a small or, or no cost to starting businesses and expanding businesses, you would find a substantial ability uh, uh, to find business success and to increase the chances for business success. Look at just uh, the slide above. And also preparing general defenses for all the companies within a country, particularly as you consider what, na what patent owners have registered their patents in that particular nation. Because as we all know, if they're not registered, then of course there's an availability issue right there for all the businesses. IPUs provides a competitive advantage for all the businesses in the world marketplace shields nations from outside competition. And it's the principal problem we face in many areas is that a large successful company can very easily sue a small business. And that business has to spend its money responding 
or it receives a default judgment and if that and that can just destroy the business on the spot international interest in ip rights has created also interesting organizational tool for businesses starting it's easy to find technology it's a really interesting way to find partners uh, it's an interesting way uh, for companies to strengthen their own capability. Similarly, a national, uh, a, a, a nation's IP portfolio attracts lenders and investors. It attracts talented uh, employees, and it's a way to help uh, local citizens uh, retain uh, uh, opportunity and keep graduates at home. So consider an area-wide IP assistance or a nationwide IP assistance program to reduce the cost of IP protection, expand its use, and strengthen the entrepreneurial environment within a particular region. Michael, I wanna thank you for the opportunity. I'm sorry that all, all you can do is see my old face, which is of course no help at all, but I'll be happy to take any questions now <laughs> or, or in our round table. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Tim. That's a very, very interesting talk. And you, you know, it's, it, it's true. Uh, entrepreneurs, which are short of resources for every area, typically intellectual property is not at the top of their list. Uh, and eventually, as you say, it could cause problems. Also, they, um, as the, if the entrepreneur expands outside of the US, there are a number of fairly large countries uh, that do not honor our intellectual property rights. And that has caused, uh, I think, some problems too. So uh, this conference um, and many others that I've been to about entrepreneurship and innovation, uh, very little is mentioned in, in this area. Uh, but I think it's something that should be brought to everybody's um, attention. And uh, it could spell the downfall uh, for a successful entrepreneur at some point. Uh, if something was uh, done that wasn't supposed to be done, or if somebody's copying and abusing your intellectual property and uh, you really don't know what to what to do about it. So I think you brought uh, to the table here a very uh, good topic, and um, I hope everybody comes away uh, recognizing how important this intellectual property protection is to um, entrepreneurs. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, and again, I wish you uh, success in the future. And Thank have you. fun in have fun in Washington. I know things are real strange there. <laughs> wow, time. isn't that the truth? <laughs> Take care. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's move on to uh, Menar Rabia, and I hope I pronounced that correctly. It's the uh, SME Development Director, Ministry of Industry, Commerce, and Tourism in Bahrain. Uh, is, let's see, <laughs> Menar, you're here. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Okay. Welcome, I'd like to welcome our uh, speakers, our guests. Um, I'll be sharing my screen. Is it clear? Perfect. So perfect session. Uh, I come from the government. Um, it is very important to uh, uh, make sure that all the elements of the ecosystem works in harmony. So um, I'll go back to the background of, uh, of the um, uh, ecosystem in Bahrain. We're known for being a small island. Everybody knows, uh, everybody, um, business people used to support each other. So um, we have a very long history of uh, ecosystem, but later on when it uh, became formal, um, I'd like to... Um, Okay. Uh, it became formal with our uh, economic vision 2030, which focused on the uh, support of SMEs and entrepreneurs in order to shift uh, from uh, an oil uh, economy to a more diversified um, uh, economy, which will, um, and looking for uh, increasing the contribution of uh, SMEs and the GDP, which will create, of course, more jobs um, and support the economy overall. Uh, later on, the uh, Small and Medium Enterprise Development Directorate was uh, initiated um, in um, 2017. Uh, the main role was to actually um, um, collect all the efforts of the ecosystem, uh, highlight the main players, um, and create a board, uh, which is the SME's Development Board, uh, board 
Um, it is actually uh, consists of uh, five uh, entities. Um, yeah, it's um, five entities uh, chaired by His Excellency, the Minister of uh, uh, Industry, Commerce and Tourism. Um, those five uh, uh, partners are um, our uh, main stakeholders of the ecosystem. Um, each has its uh, main role, like um, uh, the Ministry of Youth um, and uh, Sports Affairs is responsible for enabling uh, youth. Uh, EDB Bahrain is uh, looking for the for, uh, um, indirect investments, uh, foreign investments. Uh, Tamkeen means enabling, um, it injects programs to the uh, private sector um, um, in terms of uh, training and so. Um, the fifth one is um, it's, it's, uh, it's hidden. Uh, the fifth one is the um, the government. Uh, did we lose her? Please, you just need to unmute, yeah. We're fine, we're back. Okay, we're back, we're back. That's okay. <laughs> we're good. Okay. Let's move. Um, the, the board uh, focused on... Um, I just need to um, move this, okay. Uh, the board focused on five uh, important pillars that every entrepreneur in SME is, is keen about access to finance, access to markets, streamlining business environment, uh, foster skill development and foster innovation. Collectively, they came up with 21 initiatives um, uh, to be implemented over five years up to tw uh, 2022, hopefully. Uh, we have reached so far 60% um, um, of that, which is considered uh, very good. I'll be just... Um, uh, showing you how we um, um, streamline between those um, pillars and the ecosystem players. So um, as we had today, some of our colleagues from uh, Business Incubators Accelerators. So eventually in Bahrain, it was um, only um, a sector uh, uh, owned by the government. We had industrial government incubator, uh, but later on in 2017, um, out of the um, SDB um, uh, board, we had the, uh, the licensing of the commercial activity of the incubator accelerators, which actually um, more engaged the uh, private sector um, to invest in, in such an uh, important um, um, sector. Uh, raise, uh, currently, we have 24 licensed uh, business incubators and accelerators. Um, it is the role of the SME's directorate to license uh, those. Um, we, we, we try to promote sector-specific incubators, accelerators, because we have seen um, how um, good are the outputs. We have in Bahrain um, different sectors of incubators uh, like fintech, uh, youth, media, e-commerce, technology, medical, um, and so on. Of course, all of them uh, provide um, uh, support and services for the uh, startups and entrepreneurs in their early stages of, uh, in their early stages of uh, the business. Um, another, um, um, another part of our ecosystem is the uh, Export Bahrain. Um, exactly uh, November 2018, it was launched back then, it's exactly two years. Um, um, it is hitting um, um, high numbers. The value of exports uh, is a total of 46.4 um, uh, million US dollars. Um, a lot of tools there, it's uh, free um, for SMEs to uh, utilize the services. We have been seeing increasing numbers of um, national um, 
SMEs exporting for the first time. Um, another um, initiative that was uh, involving um, a number of uh, our um, ecosystem, like again, Tamkin, Exports Bahrain, the Ministry of Industry, Commerce and Tourism, um, the uh, UNIDO and uh, some of the hypermarkets was the initiative uh, to access the markets by the uh, national uh, um, SMEs uh, made in Bahrain, make it uh, more easy to, to those to access the internal markets and uh, be able to also um, strengthen their position globally. And of course, that is by enhancing the, the quality of the national product. Um, and also it's being um, a successful um, uh, uh, initiative. Moving to the next slide. A recent, um, a recent uh, project um, actually was, we wanted to make sure that everybody is, is uh, getting the benefits from all the initiatives of all the ecosystem um, entities. So uh, we have created uh, a portal uh, for SMEs to register as SMEs and be certified according to their size. That will, allows, uh, that will allow them to um, actually benefit from all the, um, the initiatives, the 21 um, initiatives gradually being achieved. Um, right, uh, right now, the, the great success is being the, uh, the, the uh, allocation of 20% shares of SME, for SMEs and the uh, government uh, tenders. Uh, it gives them a great opportunity to, to engage in, in government uh, uh, in government tenders. Okay. Um, so uh, the community is in Bahrain is, is um, quite um, large. Just um, a glance, uh, we can get we can never get enough of uh, of um, community members. We have a number of societies. Um, we have launched uh, quite a few um, large events uh, in, the, in the past years. Um, starting next Sunday, we'll be having the GEW Bahrain, uh, which is um, uh, the week of uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, uh, it is organized by Tamkin. It's being a success year after year. So uh, collectively, um, all of those really um, bring together uh, like-minded startups. Um, access to finance is, is a major uh, um, is a major uh, challenge for um, entrepreneurs. So in Bahrain, we try to have as much as uh, funding tools. Um, so we have the uh, accelerators, incubators themselves uh, investing in, in these startups. We have um, the angels. Uh, we have let, um, let me go by sequence, the, uh, the grants, the bank loans from the development banks, as we said. We have the, fees, the VC investments, the initial public offering uh, from the Bahrain Boards. We have uh, the private sector funds, which is al Waha Fund of Funds. Um, it's a fund that um, equals $100 million uh, for tech startups. Uh, we have the engine investor um, one of the oldest is Tenmo. It's been launched in 2011. Uh, and the crowdfunding regulations is also available in Bahrain. I'll try to go faster. Um, as we had a few uh, people, um, our colleagues talking from universities, it is also a great uh, uh, role of universities. Our universities, our schools, all of them teach entrepreneurs, uh, entrepreneurship curriculums. We have an incubator in the National University of Bahrain Coming soon is, is a technology transfer um, center as well. Um, we have the EDIP, which is the uh, Bahrain Arab model uh, to train entrepreneurs with UNIDO. It's been there for several years and um, uh, hundreds of graduates uh, of entrepreneurs. Uh, this is the last uh, slide. I, I just brought up a number of our policies uh, through the years. Um, I'd like you to go over them. Uh, I just have, I believe, um, less than two minutes. 
So I'll just pick a few. We have 100% um, uh, foreign ownership for most of our uh, striving sectors. Uh, everything is being, is being done online in Bahrain. We have the FinTech regulatory sandboxes, sandbox, uh, and we have, as I said, the crowdfunding, um, um, the, the, um, uh, the other uh, policy. Um, of course, you can have um, a look after. Um, I'll just wrap it up. I'd like to thank you all again for giving me this opportunity and wish you all the best. Thank you. Well, thank you, Manor. That was certainly very interesting. We see a lot of things that uh, Bahrain is doing to uh, encourage entrepreneurship. I was particularly uh, interested, uh, you emphasized uh, access to, to markets. And in the slide you had there, you were showing it's not just domestic markets, but international markets that uh, the companies need to succeed. And you had that in there as one of your points, which I thought was very, very interesting. So again, I wanna thank you for a, a very good presentation. Uh, and Thank I you. wish you uh, well in, in the future. Thank you, you're welcome. Okay, um, we're down to our last uh, speaker. Um, uh, and that's Jeffrey Millanet. I hope I said that right. He's the president and founder of Innovative Partners uh, in the US. Uh, Jeff? Uh, <clears throat> good morning, I'd, uh, I'd love to speak. I can't seem to be getting the uh, slides here yet. Um, uh, I think Manar has to stop sharing her screen. Okay, I'll do it. Thank you, Manar. There you go. There you go. Well, hi, okay. everyone. I'm Jeff Milanetti, and I'm uh, I'm president of Innovative Partners, as uh, the professor mentioned just now. Um, we are a small firm that is uh, specializing in developing incubation and entrepreneurship programs and ecosystems. Uh, focused on the blue economy. And I take a little different approach to this in that I've been involved in many incubation programs and run several organizations that were there for the specific purpose of supporting uh, the entrepreneur ecosystem. And so what I'm really talking about is more lessons that I've uh, learned or things that I've observed over the time that uh, I've been doing this. Uh, first of all, you know, I think this won't be news to anyone, but uh, just like incubation programs, just like small businesses, uh, no two ecosystems, in my observation, are the same. They're, they always have common um, uh, practices. They always have uh, programs that, are, that may be very similar, but they're often driven by different motivations. The people who are the leaders of them have different things they're trying to, uh, to accomplish. And... Uh, my job and the job of the people that I work with uh, as developers is to identify the gaps in the, uh, in the ecosystem and see what we can do to fill those gaps. Um, often that's without resources. We tend to work in less developed countries, uh, which very often means that uh, there may be an ecosystem, but you have to identify what it is, and then you can start worrying about uh, filling some of the gaps. Uh, and as we found in a couple of places, if no ecosystem is there, you have to build it. Uh, but that's the fun of being in this, uh, in this business. And I hope that you can understand uh, my passion in trying to uh, express to you uh, how important this is for the entrepreneurs that we work with. Um, this one uh, as well, we all know that communications have gotten a lot better. We're going to be talking uh, working remotely, talking a lot on Zoom and other uh, forms of communication. And uh, for those of you in the same uh, line of work that I'm in, uh, obtaining technical assistance at 3 a.m. is now common if you're working overseas uh, in, in any event. And so uh, uh, we just have to get used to it and, in, and enjoy the, uh, the ride while we can uh, be on it. Uh, third, I'd like to talk about uh, the fact that champions are such an important part of uh, developing ecosystems, um, similar again to businesses, similar to ecos um, to uh, incubators and accelerators, the people who take on this work, who decide that they are going to step up and make the communication happen, the people who are going to help clarify what the dialogue is so that uh, actions can occur, programs can be developed and so forth, 
are what I call the champions of, uh, of this business. And they really uh, play an important role because they make all the other things come together and uh, make it possible for us to have these successful programs. Um, and one of the most important things they do is make introductions of one set of members in the uh, ecosystem to the others. Uh, fourth, I like to tell stories when I uh, explain some of the things that I've done in the past. Um, and one of them uh, is about gatekeepers. Um, many years ago, we started an incubation program in Southern California. The city uh, there was uh, very interested in what we were doing. Uh, but a gatekeeper at a local university told me that we weren't going to do it if he didn't say so. Um, well, we took that on as kind of a challenge and uh, formed a nonprofit. We did the feasibility study. We wrote the business plan, recruited the mentors and so forth. And it, it took us about three years to put it together. And the city built us a building. How are you? I need some help. But... When we opened oh, well, the doors well, well. of this program, uh, three years later, we brought to bear um, commercial, down here. commercial banking. Did you lose me? Um, we have you. I think somebody else is speaking, but we have you still. Okay. All right. Uh, we, brought, we brought commercial banking into an area of the city that was in dire need of that uh, kind of uh, service. Uh, it was one of their first um, access to finance activities. And uh, what we learned from that is that gatekeepers frequently do not have as much power as they think they do. But more importantly, that in persistence is something that you really have to uh, uh, take okay, seriously so if I you're going to build successful <laughs> ecosystems. We have a formula for the programs that we've run in the past and at least the three last, the last three incubators I've been involved with, uh, we made it a point to um, establish uh, programs, we call them entrepreneurs forums. Uh, I ran one for 15 years in New Jersey, ran another one at the Port of Los Angeles for another three and a half years, ran a third one in uh, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. They were all different, but they all had the same basic formula, which was giving entrepreneurs a chance to talk about their, their um, program, a chance to do a practice pitch if they wanted to do a financing pitch, a chance to learn something and, and this was true at every single meeting, uh, a chance to learn something about running uh, a successful business, and the most important part, a chance to network with all the other entrepreneurs, service providers, and capital providers that were there, and uh, have a chance to learn what they do and how they can work together. And that kind of comity, I think, is, is particularly important uh, when you're forming an ecosystem. And I should mention, uh, the last uh, secret ingredient to successful meetings of that type, have food, have good food. Because when people have a chance to break bread together and get a chance to meet each other at the same time, I think you'll find that uh, your, your ecosystem uh, events uh, will be much more successful. And bear in mind that visitors who come for the first time, if they come back are now repeat visitors and repeat visitors often become presenters and presenters often become sponsors and donors. So cultivating the uh, uh, interactions that you have with all the people at these meetings will give a success, uh, an, an ecosystem, I think, a leg up. Um, I might also say that I've found in emerging uh, countries that uh, diaspora members are often uh, big supporters. They can be investors. Um, they love to come back to their home country, uh, their, at least their country of, of origin, and invest in uh, businesses there. And so if you're forming an ecosystem and you are going to, uh, it's worth it for you to take advantage of uh, an opportunity to meet with any of the diaspora members that attend. Another uh, little story I'll tell in the uh, about random introductions. Uh, in the late 90s, uh, shortly after the fall of the Soviet Union and the beginnings of the Russian Federation, uh, I, I had a, through a random phone call with actually someone on the other coast, um, I had an opportunity to meet an incubator manager from St. Petersburg. Um, he was visiting in New York. I live in, lived at that time in New Jersey. We got together the next day. We spent the next two days talking about how to form a venture capital industry in Russia. 
it was very exciting. We started working together. We put together a plan to establish a venture fair. Uh, the next year when I was over in Russia again, we visited the head of a Russian government investment fund. Uh, he became very excited. The year after that, we had our first Russian venture fair in the parking garage of a new incubator in Moscow, and it was 20 degrees. After five years, the Russian venture fair, uh, through a survey that we took, had created about uh, $65 million in startup financing. So this idea of creating the ecosystem yourself really is true. Sometimes uh, you just have to take matters in your own hands. And again, this was totally random. It just happened and it worked. Um, so there's always an element of luck in there, but we were very uh, happy with the results. Uh, finally, I would just like to make a, a, a quick pitch on the blue economy, because I think if you are forming uh, entrepreneurial ecosystems, this is the most uh, diverse that I've seen, certainly the largest. And uh, you can see all the industry sectors that are there. And you may be asking yourself, why is this guy talking about the blue economy? Well, consider this, 90% of world trade carriage is by sea. In other words, 90% of what we trade goes by ship. 17% of global protein intake comes from the sea and 90% of plant life sustaining habitats lie under the sea. Our future is tied to all that water out there on our, that you go to, the, uh, go to the beach to look at. And we must take, uh, take it seriously because this represents to uh, people who want to develop new ecosystems, a true um, opportunity in just about, well, you can see there are eight or seven different, um, six different uh, sectors there. And of course, the technology one the last. New technologies will support every single one of them. In uh, any one of those industries, you can, you can find technology. So I urge you to uh, give that some consideration and uh, think about how you might participate in it in some way. So what did we learn? Well, we learned that ecosystems need and respond to leaders and champions, uh, that if you don't have an ecosystem, you should think about starting one, that gatekeepers don't always have the last word, that random meetings can lead to successful outcomes and you just cannot underestimate the numbers of opportunities that await in building blue economy entrepreneurial ecosystems. So I hope that this is useful to you. I'm glad to talk to any of you at any time uh, about this because if you share my passion for entrepreneurship and also for preserving life in, you know, under the sea, uh, we're the folks to talk to. And there's my contact information. If you have a question or two, I'd be happy to uh, answer it. Very well done, Jeff. Um, we're, we're just about out of time, uh, as far as I can see. If there's a, a question or two uh, we have for Jeff, I'll, I'll leave a minute here if anybody has a question. Okay, having heard none, um, let me just say three quick things. Number one, uh, Jeff, I want to apologize for mispronouncing your last name. <laughs> uh, number two, I thought this was a very interesting paper. Um, and particularly at the end, I, I enjoyed some of your stories too. These real world experiences really, I think, add to what we do in academia. So um, I think it's extremely valuable. And um, I, like maybe other people, uh, have never really thought about this blue economy, and you're pointing out that it's uh, a really a, a source of tremendous growth and, and opportunity, and I think that's uh, extremely interesting. Third thing, and I know I'm out of time, I think we should all thank uh, Dr. Hanadi Almubaraki for putting this uh, conference together. I think she's done a marvelous job, um, and I want to thank her for everything and uh, thank her for my opportunity to participate. Um, so with that, I think this session is done um, and we're ready to move on to the next session. Um, I don't have all my paperwork in front of me. Uh, Hanadi, are you here? Okay, I'm not sure who's next here. Let me just see if I can find it. Uh, uh. Oh, somebody here? Yes, uh, Mike. Okay, Hanani, are you here to take over? Uh, yes, but uh, 
Jeff, it's finalized. I think uh, as Jeff finalized the presentation. Okay. Uh, Jeff, it's done now. This is time for handover for Tim. Tim will take in next session. Thank you so much, Mike. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mike. Thank you for having me. Okay, take care, everybody. I'm uh, not in charge Thank anymore. You. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mike. Thank you. Hi, Tim. You take. Good morning. I Good morning. I've managed... to you. Good afternoon to... in our countries. I, I, I'm pleased to report that I've actually managed to find the uh, find a way back to the main screen. It was not at all simple, and I'm still sweating bullets about the whole thing. But there we go. Um, in, in our next session, uh, we have four speakers. Uh, and if it's acceptable to all of you, I would like to take you in order if I can. Um, but first, I'm looking for faces in front of me, and I'm not seeing them. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, um, da -da -da -da, uh, Al Asamal, are you about? Uh, Dr. Ali, it's there. Um, uh, Tim, Dr. Ali is there, and Dr. Amjad is there, and Eric's. I'm here. And Grace, uh, she's apologized. Uh, she will take care uh, about Grace's presentation. Now the three presenters, there, you can take it in order, and you can start with them to present them. Thank you so much, Tim. The mic with you. Yes, uh, thank you. I'm sorry that I that uh, uh, doctor, I cannot see your face in front of me anywhere, but I'm going to presume that you're here. Um, uh, you see yes, my I'm name, here. Tim. Tim, my name is there. Of it. <laughs> and there you are. <laughs> Super. Yes, I'm, I'm, as behind. A, I'm behind. <laughs> I, yep, and I see you. And, and as a, uh, uh, a, a continual operative of OECD, I've got to say I'm awfully impressed with, your, with what you do and with your life. Uh, congratulations. I'm really looking forward to <laughs> So now I want to see if I can unmask your mic because so far I have not been able to do that. Okay, Doctor, we thank are you. ready. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Tim, for the introduction. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hanadi, for the, inviting me to present uh, my work and this uh, great uh, conference. Uh, I, I think, can I, I'm able to share my screen? Yes, because now we have you clearly before us and now yeah. you're sharing, has started the screen sharing. and it has been effective. Okay, thank you. So thank you so much again. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning to all of you, uh, where you are. Um, my presentation today is a bit different to, and it took like a different approach to what is already presented uh, because I will take like a different angle. I will talk about like the entrepreneurship and the global value chain. Um, First, uh, I just want to highlight the, the issues that, that, that entrepreneurs, that are, are people that notice that the opportunity and take initiatives to mobilize the resources and to make good new goods and services. They are like the entrepreneurs, creative innovation, create, create new products, create new processes and create a new delivery and so on. So the, from this, like uh, the things that, like they need to create a new thing. They need to be innovative in their work. Uh, from this perspective, I also like wanted to link this to with the global value chain. So they need to know their, the countries, the circumstances, like what, what they need, what, they, what opportunity they have in, your, in their countries. Like, and from there, I, I just want to highlight also for people that don't know about the global value chain. So you know that the growing economic integration worldwide and the speed of glo global value chain increase sensitivity to employment. And you know that uh, in order to create uh, a new innovative work, to create a startup, create things. So these are the things like need to understand the, the situation in your country and the situ what, what kind of uh, product that you need to produce, what kind of, in, in which industry that you need to invest like all of these things that need to be understand in advance to in order to produce to that to create startup or to do a job or to do a work so these are the things that 
in the OECD, like we are producing uh, like evidence-based assessments that can help uh, countries and, and like companies within countries to understand their circumstances. Um, also, like they need to, in order for countries, they need, uh, like especially the GCC countries. So they 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 are more relying on oil like for their revenue. So they need to diversify their economy. So what kind of like industry they need to diversify? Like what's, what their capabilities? You know that some countries they are, they think that they have a capability and they work with a, such a country and then they, they, they like end up with a bankruptcy in that, in that uh, industry. So they like for inter entrepreneurs, they need, they need also to know, to know what kind of like products they need to produce, what kind of like the industry they need to invest in. Um, so I, I will give like an like a, an overview of, on the like the situation. The like unfortunately we don't have the Kuwait and our mo model, but I think some of the the, the uh, MENA countries that already exist in our model. Um, also, like this is like the smile cave. I think most of you know about it. Like they need to know like in which like area they want they wanted to work on they wanted to work on the on the r and d like the, the the first steps of the like production the r and d r and d design of the product or the like manufacturing product or the last step the distribution product and each in each step there are different value added on different revenue they can get like entrepreneurs that they can get so these are they need to understand it in advance like before starting to like to do with their job or to invest on some products. And I just wanted to give like an example of like what the, the situation in a country, like imagine that we have three countries, like country A, country B, country C. So then like country A exporting uh, products to country B and uh, like worth hundred. Country B like using like investing in, the, in, the, in this product, uh, like, like country A exporting intermediate product to country B, country B use this product to produce another product and it's exporting to country C with 150 uh, amount. So there are like value added generated in country A from the export to country B worth 100. And then there is a value added generated from country B to country C. So these like other things that in this example, you can see that there are like from country B exporting products to country C worth 150 of which like there are 33% domestic value added and 67% is foreign value added uh, originated from A to B. That, these are the things that we need to understand in advance. So like the things that are like, we, we don't need to work like we need to to think like about innovative, innovative uh, approach. We need to go away pro from traditional statistics that's already there. Um, we need to think about this. So even like when we will think about like trade and export, like what kind of the products that you need to invest in or what kind of to need, to need we need to innovate in that products. The, we need not only to think about the domestic market, but also to the foreign market. But even the foreign market, when you look at the like the products uh, that the export and the trade partner, sometimes these are like misleading. So you need to also to, to have like innovative in, in your statistics as well. So these are the things that if, I think it's important to know in advance to in order to like invest in any industry. Here an example of the like the what, what kind of output that you can get. Like here we discuss the the, the domestic value added that you generate from, from the industries. And uh, like the direct and indirect. Direct mean that the direct like uh, value added generated from the exports and indirect that like, you know, that from the upstream industries, you know, that like in order to, to export food products that you need to get an agricultural product from the domestic market. And this, you purchase an agricultural product from the domestic market and then you manufacture it and they export it. So there is like from the, your export to, to other countries, you also like generate not only direct value added, but also direct revenue, direct money, but also indirect money that you generate from like from the, 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 the from your export. So like for entrepreneurs also like they need to think 
probably like what what kind of industries what kind of like which industries they need to think about it which which industry that they have they have high value added high revenue so these are the things that they need they need to take it into account when they wanted to invest in any uh, uh, products or industries so this is an example of morocco because we have morocco in our model for the case in 2015 um also, they need to think, think about the uh, role of services in the, in the manufacturing and in the export. Here, the, like, the example of the Saudi Arabia, like, like, what, how, like the amount of services embedded in the export of manufacturing sectors. So this is like the domestic value added. Also, like they think like how much foreign services in, embedded in the uh, manufacturing exports. So these are also the things that uh, when they wanted to generate, like to maximize their value added. For also, like, you know, the, the, new, the new generations, they have a, like a very, uh, like they need to think about like innovative approach that, that can generate, like that can um, maximize the revenues to their uh, countries. Um, also, this is another example of Tunisia. Um, this is for 2015 as well. So we, in, in our model, we have uh, three countries from MENA, MENA and um, countries. Uh, we have um, Morocco, Tunisia, and Saudi Arabia. Um, as well, like it is possible to know like the uh, original value added and uh, domestic final demand. Uh, this is also an example of what can be done and what like what's the amount of value added generated, whether it's from which country is generated, from the domestic market, from the foreign market, and which foreign market that contribute to your uh, consumption, domestic consumption. So you also, you have from these like uh, statistics, from these uh, uh, information, you will have a better understanding about the whole picture. So like, because if you look at the trade, like, if you look at the traditional way, you will miss some information that is, I think is important for your uh, work in, in, in the future. Um, just for an information, like we, in our model, we have uh, 64 countries uh, that covered uh, more than 95% of the world GDP. And as I mentioned, like the, we have uh, three countries from MENA, Morocco, Tunisia, and Saudi Arabia. And we are wo working with uh, Egypt. We will include Egypt in the uh, next year. Um, we have the 36 industries, uh, out of which uh, uh, 15 manufacturing and I think 10 services. And, and this uh, like, um, at, uh, this uh, uh, indicators are from uh, uh, spanning from 2005 to 2015, and we are working on the update uh, to 2018. Um, uh, yes, just also, this is another thing that I think, uh, like in order to diversify the economy, um, you need to have an idea, like you know, most of the uh, GCC countries and MENA countries are now open and they they work hard to open for like improving their tourism sectors. So, but in, the, in order to, to improve that and for like uh, entrepreneurs to invest in the hospitality sector or hotel and restaurants or transportation or other, other they need to have an idea about like their, the, their, the, the, the social circumstances of, of, the, of their countries. And here you can see like there the are a huge increase in terms of value added, in terms of the revenue in some countries uh, like Kuwait still like comparing to other uh, Arab countries is still very small, very tiny, the contribution of uh, uh, value added to the, the export because like it's mainly like uh, or, um, oil uh, oriented uh, export. Um, but I think it's, it's increased a bit, but I think it's the, 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 as, you, as you can see it from United Arab Emirates, like from 2005 to 2015, increased like I think three times um, the, their revenue they, they generate from tourism uh, analysis. And in our model, like we also like have the, the, the exports, uh, uh, this separately we have it and we can, uh, we also 
uh, generate indicators related to tourism. So here you can see like the direct, indirect as well, and the foreign value added generated from tourism activities uh, as a percentage of total exports. Uh, so for example, Greece, 25% of, tot of their total export uh, coming from uh, tourism. And you know that here that the, the as I said, like the, the, there is a direct domestic value added that generated for exactly like when you go to countries and you spend money. So this is like direct contribution, like when you go to hotels, uh, you spend some money like this direct contribution, but when you eat some, like when you eat the lunch and this, like, like there is an indirect uh, value added generated from your consumption because like they know that the, the hotel and restaurant company that purchased products from the farmers, agricultural products from farmers, so, those, so they, those, those farmers, they generate money as from your consumption. So these are the things that I think like it's, it's very important when you wanted to work on like a specific sectors, so a specific uh, like industry. So these are the things that you need to, to have it in advance to have a better idea, to have a comprehensive picture about the whole like industry. You don't, you don't need to I think it's, it's, it will save you a lot of money. It will save you a lot of uh, time to, and it will generate like it will, it will generate more revenue out of this. Uh, so this is like totally different perspective, but I think it's, it's important to have this in, in advance. And here, as I like in the Morocco, Tunisia, as I mentioned, and Saudi Arabia, that we have it in the model um, the, for your information. Thank you so much. And uh, please, if you have any question, any things about this uh, work, uh, keep in touch, send me an email. I'm happy to answer any question. Doctor, thank you very much. We all have an awful lot to learn from those who study these issues carefully. Uh, the data helps everybody make really serious uh, decisions uh, more effectively and end up with better use. So as, as a person who's uh, published everywhere and is advising uh, uh, both countries and universities in many places, thank you very much. Super. Um, we'll, we'll move now, uh, if we may, uh, to our next speaker. Uh, um, Dr. Shak Shaki, I'm just okay. failing dreadfully here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> here we are. Let me bring you up. Come on. So uh, let me. Yeah. Uh, yes. My name is uh, Amjad Sheikh. Uh, yeah. I'm based in the. I'm based in Grenoble in France. Uh, uh, practicing practicing as a technology transfer consulting. So uh, let me share my screen now. Please. Okay, so uh, let me maximize that. Okay. Yeah, uh, you can see my screen and you can hear me? Yes. Okay. So uh, my topic today is on the technology commercialization and transfer in a dynamic ecosystem. And I know uh, I'm just a student I mean, uh, as compared to other experts who have already spoken a great amount of uh, knowledge on this topic. So to start with the technology commercialization and transfer, I know how important uh, uh, the concept of the ecosystem is. So let me uh, introduce you the French uh, innovation ecosystem. Uh, just like any mature and the dynamic ecosystem, uh, the French inno innovation ecosystem has various actors uh, involved, which are uh, interacting connecting with each other in a very dynamic and non-linear fashion. And uh, so uh, all these uh, actors and are uh, the key driver behind uh, the innovation in France is uh, the, one of the drivers is the government, uh, the technology competence uh, of these technologies in the developed in the research labs, universities, R&D centers, large and uh, small and medium enterprises. Uh, the government providing the push, the, the technology push and pull uh, in terms of uh, research tax credits, uh, innovation providing innovation grant, semi loans, and obviously admin support for building research and innovation projects. Then there, we, there is a pull from the market uh, access to the wide EU market. 
uh, it has its own national brand and, and obviously the local, national, regional and international competition. Uh, 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 I would not say much about the ecosystem uh, as, as I will going to explain about this now. Uh, so in the ecosystem, the drivers uh, are the clusters, uh, the equity funding and uh, the growing uh, the world of startups. Now, uh, having said about the innovation driver and where the actors are, let's see where the innovation stands on globally. So what are the various elements of the uh, French innovation ecosystem is uh, the CNRS is the French uh, Research Institute, which ranks number three globally as per the nature index. Uh, European, uh, as per the European uh, Patent Office, the France ranked fifth globally in European patent applications. Paris Startup Ecosystem ranks 13th as per the startup genome. And it ranks 14th among 136 economics, economies featured in Global Entrepreneurship Index, and 16th among the 129 economies featured in Global Innovation Index. So there is a thriving uh, uh, activity going, going around the various regions of France. And technology transfer consulting where I belong, I come from uh, one of the region of France, which is uh, called Rhone Alps. Rhone Alps is at the border of uh, Swiss and Italian uh, Italy. It is uh, sixth GDP in Europe and second in France. And located uh, in, I mean, in middle of the called what you call the golden triangle of industrial activity between Lyon. NSC and Grenoble. And there are several clusters uh, within this region, such as uh, chemical, nanotech, plastic, software, and machining. So uh, what we do actually is connecting dots, connecting dots by providing uh, or developing strategic technology, commercial collaborations, uh, technology venture support, uh, uh, doing the technology scouting, and support IP management. So uh, more focus between connecting between the R&D experts, SMEs, and industry leader. So when I talk about industry leader, the industry leader could be an end user on a specific market, or it could be material or equipment manufacturer. Uh, innovative SMEs could be technology providers, material converters, equipment users, or product manufacturers, or OEMs. And high-level experts are the R&D experts of uh, public and private research labs and technical centers. So there is a great deal of uh, technology transfer opportunities uh, in connecting these dots. Now we talk about technology transfer. Uh, let's start with the beginning. So the beginning starts from the R&D. Uh, what you see here are the two figures. Uh, one is on the left side showing the various uh, stages of the technology commercialization. And on the right side is the graph, which shows a typical graph which has been widely used in the literature and the practice, which is a typical life cycle of a startup. So the early stage, there are several stages in the startup, which is uh, scaled as per the sales, uh, number of sales, amount of sales uh, as it evolved around with time. So the first stage is called the seed or capital early stage. Then the early growth and the later growth and then there is various levels of funding involved. And then it can go to the IPO and public market. Now, uh, when we start we talk about the first or uh, seed early stage, the various stages in the commercialization involve uh, IP identification, uh, then having a proof of concept of your uh, IP, then developing a functional prototype, and then taking scaling up uh, to pre-production and the production level. Then uh, this is uh, mostly characterized uh, by uh, a very low uh, technology readiness scale. So around TRL level six, I expect that is a functional prototype exists. So our uh, technology transfer uh, interest arises from anywhere above TRL six and seven and above. So. Uh, now, uh, from TRL 1 to TRL 9, uh, this, uh, the, there are several levels of the technology uh, uh, commercialization stage exists in the value of that. And the TRL 6 onwards, it is very close towards the 
having this formation of the startup company. So why there is why is, is why the first or early stage is called the value of death. Now value of death concept is widely known and because of the various barriers to commercialization, such as lack of information, lack of skills, lack of capital, lack of understanding of local needs, high transaction costs involved, trade and policy barriers, institutional structure barriers, regulations, environmental codes, standards, and obviously the technological uh, challenges as well. Now, uh, because of uh, all these barriers, it's very difficult to actually evaluate the, the technology and various uh, scales are used, none other, other than technology readiness scales. There's also regulatory uh, readiness level. There is a uh, system readiness level and the commercial readiness level. So all these uh, various tools can be used to characterize whether the technology can be commercialized and whether to assess how risky it is to commercialize. Now, there are various tools available, such uh, evaluation mechanisms we can do. Uh, one of the challenges is because at this stage, the technology is neither visible nor tangible. It is difficult to identify exact contents and scope and the economic value cannot be rightly estimated. But then uh, what are the evaluation methods we use is a variety of methods, sort analysis, market opportunity analysis, business plan, strategic technical evaluation program. Uh, you, you use examples of assessment tools to characterize where the technology belongs, whether it's an emerging technology, whether it's high potential, is it niche, and where it scales on financial technique, market and management risks. And then various, uh, various questions and various evaluations can be done and each evaluation can be scaled. And then a, a global scale can be developed to get the complete overview of uh, where the technology uh, is and what are the risks involved. Now the key success factors for technology commercialization is that involve key stakeholders, uh, stick, uh, stakeholders both in, in, in the field of technology and commercial at very early stage. Conduct an IP audit, intellectual property audit early to identify any IP issues, for example, ownership, freedom to operate, landscaping, secure uh, early stage finance, financing from grants, tax credits, et cetera. And most important, develop a stage gate process with milestone defined and according to various readiness levels. So TRL is not the only one. You can use the manufacturing readiness level uh, uh, as a system readiness level integration readiness level and regu uh, regulation readiness level. So several uh, uh, metrics can be used. And obviously last but not least to network and, and get everyone on board. Now uh, going from the technology commercialization, there comes the part where you need to ask for the technology. Now there is some confusion always uh, in terms of what, how you define technology means. So technology as per the UN uh, definition is systematic knowledge for the manufacture of product for the application of process or for rendering a service. And the transfer also has a very vague and very large definition. Uh, transfer can be related to uh, exchange of information, exchange of knowledge, uh, attending conferences, or it can be related to uh, actual uh, transfer of, of products, for example, IP in terms of licensing or margin and mergers and acquisitions. Uh, so there is a very broad definition of technology, but the, for sake of our uh, commercial operation, we define the two, two different uh, 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 identification. Uh, anything which relate, doesn't relate, I have a monetary uh, transfer is considered as a knowledge transfer and the one which have any, some monetary exchange is considered as a technology transfer. So the, the ones which involve monetary transfer could be direct investment, joint venture, licensing, uh, the assignment of uh, sale and license of various industrial properties, uh, such as, uh, so as, as I said, there's a knowledge transfer involved as well in, in this case, such as exchange of diagrams, model instructions, provision of technological knowledge necessary to acquire or install a small machinery, equipment, intermediate goods, all those, uh, provisions are part of the technology transfer. Now, uh, there are practical challenges and opportunities uh, as, a, uh, as a, someone who will want to transfer the technology. 
one of the challenges is to find a suitable partner finding demonstration possibilities uh, how to product the protect your product in the inter, uh, international market for example ipr issues what are the local component and what are the business development cases similarly uh, the key drivers for uh, transfer is the product itself uh, the environment uh, the recipient and the donor so the recipient must have the absorb capabilities of the recipient firm the transfer environment and donor recipient organizations also affects the the transfer of technology uh, obviously the product complexity makes a big, big factor and the transfer capabilities and maximize profit maximization strategy of the donor itself will be one of the factor in a successful technology transfer other than that there are uh, if the transfer is on international level then global trade policies come into picture uh, national government policies for an exchange uh, local adaptation of technology availability of funding and identification of partners and most importantly the trust and cross cultural issues now for the key points for the technology uh, recipient uh, that needs to be identified and take care about the uh, what technology adoption capabilities it has uh, whether whether the technology able to adapt in the in its, in its processes uh, what is the intellectual property issue how technology can be upgraded further what amount of uh, man uh, skill manpower skill is required in order to use and and uh, maintain the technology and what are other uh, sourcing components and sub sub assemblies are required for this purpose so i'd like to give some uh, practical examples uh, there is a uh, one swiss uh, swedish company uh, which has provided innovative solution with online detection of microorganisms there are several ma management and technical issues well technical issues could be solved but management issues are al almost always uh, some kind of a surprise where uh, in this case establishing a pilot project together with the partner and end user having commercial activity in focus one of the issue for that site surveys uh, education of product hygienic aspects as whether the technology is user friendly whether the non technical users were able to use it in in a wider uh, commercial scale so uh, so both the technology and manage management issues can uh, hamper or could be a uh, factor leading to success of the transfer another example is a german company is seeking to enter into developing market for its distillation technology through developing local supply chain what are the uh, key management issues were identifying suitable partner and suppliers in in the uh, in the developing market uh, obviously site surveys training of suppliers on international code and standard technical issues could arise where uh, software development remote access to cloud configuration availability of the raw material and technical feasibility gaps and clearances so i can give you uh, further more examples such, such as a french company developing partnership in india for motor manufacturing ipr issues are one of the most uh, important as one uh, one of our earlier uh, speaker has pointed out challenging of focusing on sourcing partner again is another challenge uh, technical feasibility that is another challenge and finally again uh, another example is of an inventor approaching uh, to develop a patent strategy and commercialization of pat partners so uh, the management issues in for the inventor is whether to decide whether it has to be going through the incubator or accelerator uh, what type of r and d partners it should be, uh, bring in what type of ip contractual issues it should uh, uh, have what are the equity sharing versus funding pot issues technical issues where whether to file the ip uh, which uh, in which uh, jurisdiction whether uspto epo or wipo whether it should be a provisional patent or utility patent or what should be the the claim landscaping be so uh having said that the technology commercialization uh, commercialization and technology transfer is a very dynamic or uh, and a non linear uh, <coughs> field and 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 every day there is everything something new comes up 
So uh, giving these examples, I would uh, finish my uh, brief talk. And as you see, I'm based in Nancy Lake, which looks very serene and calm. Good for you. What's <laughs> happening below the surface? Super. Doctor, thank you very much. I particularly like how much of the material you presented helped me to hang some of the ideas I've already heard today to think better and a good deal more clearly about what they were. So I really look forward to seeing it again uh, because I think it was, again, a very valuable presentation. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much. Thank you. I, I, le I learned a lot today. So I'm, I'm really thankful for uh, uh, Professor Hanadi, and I'm very thankful for uh, Technology Ecosystem Consulting to provide me an opportunity to share my experience. Thank you. I'm going to stop the share now. Please. So if you have any questions, uh, please uh, you can ask me or if it's a sufficient time. Eric? Yes, uh, I'm. hopefully my screen is showing up now. Is it there? It, it is. It is. Perfect timing. And I want to well, mention that you and I had the opportunity to uh, share a nice campus in a place called uh, Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Yes. I was at the law school while you were at the college. There uh, we I go. doubt that we overlapped only because I'm so silly old. But other than that, <laughs> I'm really looking uh, yes. forward to a presentation. Uh -huh. Yes, Tim, excuse me. Just let me welcome in with Eric. Eric, hi, how are you? Hello. Yes, how are you? I'm well, thank you. Uh, it is our honor to have you today to presenting your presentation and Grace's presentation. And if you feel you are cannot extend your presentation, I'm ready to deliver the presentation of Grace. Oh, I'm, I'm uh, going to just take the time. Uh, that was suggested by Larry. I'm not going to actually do Grace's presentation, if you're okay with that. Uh, no problem. If you want to extend more than welcome, we need to learn from your experience. Yes, so please, our... please feel feel free to uh, to provide to ask questions. So we're going to move in a slightly different direction here. Uh, let me quickly introduce myself. My name is Eric Pages. I run an uh, economic development consulting firm based in Arlington, Virginia, in the D.C. area. Uh, we work all around the United States and all around the world with a lot of experience in rural communities. I'm also a member of the board of Global Entrepreneurship Week and have been from the beginning. So I'm ecstatic to be participating in a global event during Global Entrepreneurship Week. So thank you uh, to everyone for including me and, and for holding this event. So here's what we're going to do here over the next uh, 15 minutes or so. So these are the topics we're going to be talking about. Uh, why rural? What do we know about rural entrepreneurs in the United States? What's their impact and uh, what is different about rural entrepreneurship strategies? So just to set the stage, um, in the United States, of course, we'll talk about this in just a moment, but we have a significant, as you know, a significant political divide between rural and urban parts of the United States, but we also have a significant economic divide. And one of the challenges is that uh, many of our rural communities in the United States are being left behind from an, ec in an economic standpoint. And one of the strategies that rural communities in the United States are actively beginning to embrace, and this is really a new, new, um, new uh, concept, is to be much more um, uh, directive and focused on building uh, ecosystems in rural communities. But as we'll see in the presentation, that's a little bit challenging, and it's uh, you can't simply take Silicon Valley and move it to Iowa, or take Silicon Valley and move it to West Virginia. Uh, you need to think about doing things slightly different. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. So why are um, uh, rural communities in the United States embracing uh, entrepreneurship? Well, first is that grows companies and creates jobs, but also many rural communities, uh, like uh, many of our colleagues in the Middle East, are focused on building a more diverse regional economy. Many parts of the rural United States have relied in the past on manufacturing and agriculture, and both of those industries may not necessarily be in decline, but they're providing less jobs than they did in the past. So diversifying the local economy is another reason why communities are doing it. And then last but not least, we have a large issue in the United States, as we do around the world, of brain drain, where young people um, leave their communities and go into the city. And entrepreneurship is viewed as a strategy to help them stay in the community and, and help build the community. So that's really the primary reason why this has become so prominent in, in American economic development circles. And it's becoming even more so now, of course, because of COVID-19. And what we know, or what we at least we are projecting uh, in rural America over the coming, say, three to five years is we're going to see a big jump in what uh, necessity entrepreneurship, where people are starting businesses because of lack of other options. And we're already starting to see lots of evidence of this. 
expansion of remote work, which again is um, very common now because of COVID-19, increase of outsourcing to rural areas. And we're also beginning to see some preliminary signs of movement of population from, uh, from more urban regions to more rural parts of the region. This creates challenges for rural areas, but it also creates a lot of opportunities. Um, really, this slide, I, I really just wanted you to be able to see the, the figure there on this slide, but um, what we're seeing in rural America and really across the United States and urban areas as well is uh, sort of a shift in economic development. Previously, economic development strategies were almost exclusively focused on providing tax cuts to businesses and tax incentives. And as you can see on that slide, these are really some of the most expensive ways that we can create jobs from an economic development standpoint. These strategies of customized job training, manufacturing, extension, neighborhood development, these are all strategies that we might call business retention and expansion. We even use the term BRE in, uh, in economic development circles in the United States. But really over the next probably three to five years in the United States and in, in economic development, particularly focused on entrepreneurship, we're gonna be in a business triage mode where we're trying to um, provide a soft landing for companies that uh, may be going bankrupt or out of business. We've got to heal the wounded where we help the ailing firms. And then we've got to nurture the survivors. One thing we do know uh, from history of pandemics and from history of economic downturns, lots of interesting and exciting businesses can be started uh, in these kinds of situations. So there's, uh, there's, there's challenges, but there's also significant opportunities. And the opportunities are most pronounced in rural communities. So this slide shows uh, job growth in the United States from uh, 20, 2008 to 2017. So in the aftermath of the Great Recession, pre-COVID-19. But as you can see, almost all of the population growth and almost all of the job growth in the United States is in our large metro areas and very little of it is occurring in rural communities. We also know from other statistics that have been developed, the assessment that the Brookings Institution did of innovation sectors, we know that only five communities in the United States accounted for 90% of all job growth and in innovation sectors uh, over the last decade. So that's Seattle, San Diego, California, Silicon Valley, Boston, and um, I'm sorry, I'm not remembering the last community, but only five communities accounted for 90% of all job growth in innovation sectors. None of that growth is occurring in rural communities, hence the interest in, in ecosystem building. Let me put, give you another way to think about this. So this is, you know, 98% of the job growth is in metropolitan areas. Another way to look at it, I talked earlier about the political divide. We know that about 70 to 75% of, of America's ec economy, our gross national product, um, comes from communities that voted for uh, Joe, President-elect Biden, uh, and the remainder were, were in communities, largely rural communities, that voted for former President Trump. So we have a big challenge in rural, in rural development and, and re-boosting re the engine of prosperity and job growth. So we're interested in entrepreneurship in rural communities. We're interested in building ecosystems, but of course there's a lot of structural gaps that make it a little bit more challenging for us in these types of communities. We have a longer distance to markets, of course. The local markets are smaller. The networks for entrepreneurs are weaker and smaller. There's fewer resources. Access to talent is significant. And we also have significant infrastructure issues. We have a big problem in the United States with broadband in rural communities. We've had a situation in COVID-19 where many schools have had to close because the broadband is so poor that they cannot provide distance learning opportunities to youth. So it is really is a big problem. And uh, you know, if you're in a community that has poor broadband infrastructure, it's very difficult to be a successful entrepreneur in the American economy. But um, you know, we, we do know a few things based on our research and what, what we know about um, rural startups and entrepreneurs in the United States. If you look at an urban startup and you look at a startup in rural and they're, they're in the same business, say they're IT company or they're a restaurant or they're a manufacturer, at the start, the companies look very similar. They might have the same amount of resources. They might have the same number of employees. Um, and when the company achieves high growth, a rural firm really doesn't look that different from an urban firm. But in between, we know that rural firms tend to grow slower and they create fewer jobs. But at the same time, they're less likely to fail. So again, we know from, from significant economic research that most firms in the United States start small and stay small. But the firms, a firm is more likely to grow quickly and to get big if it's located in an urban area than if it's located in a rural area. 
So these are, um, again, our firm has worked in almost every state of the United States and done a lot of work uh, overseas. Um, and, you know, these are, if we, you said to me, what's your menu? What are the things that you need to do uh, to support rural networks, to build more successful startups in rural America? These would be the eight things I'm going to talk about. I'm really going to talk only about the bolded ones because of time constraints, but let me uh, at least walk through each of these. Engage all means to, to bring in all types of entrepreneurs, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. Leverage diversity. Uh, one, one thing we don't do a very good job of in, in rural communities, in particular in the United States, is bringing in um, supporting entrepreneurs from minority communities, from different walks of life, new immigrants coming into the United States. Local customization, which I'll talk about in just a moment. Entrepreneur leadership. So again, the local networks need to be, be led and managed by local entrepreneurs, not by economic developers or even consultants like myself. Youth entrepreneurship, teaching young people about uh, how to start and grow businesses is a very important strategy for rural communities, particularly in defeating brain drain. Uh, space matters, which is really about uh, the power of community meeting places. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, streamlining permitting and licensing and providing specialized resources. Basically, what we know from the U.S. experience is that, you know, public funds can be provided to support some technical assistance and some access to capital support. But in most cases, the most important thing that government can do is get out of the way because a lot of the licensing, zoning and planning rules are the things that really impact entrepreneurs. So let me talk about the three that I've got bolded here and then we can open it up for conversation and, and questions. So engage all. One of the things uh, we know in the United States is that many, there's often a um, conflation of um, technology and entrepreneurship. And what we know in the United States is that um, while most businesses stay small, high growth ventures come in every kind of business, car repair, haircutting, making pizza, running restaurants, designing websites, uh, you name it. But oftentimes, many of these firms that are not in tech, tech, uh, tech related industries are not actively encouraged to participate in networks. Again, what that does in rural communities is it reduces the number of people in networks, reduces the number of ideas in the network. What we know in rural community is that every person that has an interest in an entrepreneur, even a person that's just an advocate for entrepreneurs as opposed to an entrepreneur, must and should be involved in uh, local networks and local ecosystem building. And we need to meet entrepreneurs where they are. Instead of saying, this is what you must do, you must follow this, this um, uh, you know, this seven step plan to be a successful business. We need to customize and design programs that help entrepreneurs at every walk of life, whether they're a technology firm, whether they just wanna be a one person operation, whether they wanna be a gig economy worker, whatever it is. That's, and that's especially important in rural communities because there aren't enough entrepreneurs there and we need to get more entrepreneurs engaged in starting and growing businesses. Second thing we, second one of these strategies is local com customization. So again, instead of trying to be the next Silicon Valley, rural communities need to think about what do they, what assets they have already. And these pictures give you two, two great examples. And I've, I've been involved with both of these as a consultant. First is in Southwest Virginia. This is a very poor part of the country. This is Appalachia. Um, it's a coal mining region. Uh, so it's been very challenged. They have designed their entrepreneurship programming around the fact that this is the place where American country music started and was invented. So if you know your country music, which you may or you may not, the Carter family, Bill Monroe, these are very famous early country music people in the United States. They came from this area. And so what they've done is tried to focus on building uh, music related industries, arts and crafts related industries, tourism related industries around this concept of the crooked road the heritage music trail. The other picture comes from Vermont. Vermont is a, a state, a very, very uh, small and rural state in, in New England, in the Northeast part of the United States. And they are very excellent at making food. And so they have designed most of their, much of their entrepreneurship work around food, whether that's food distribution, uh, food invention. So things like distilleries, breweries, cheese making, maple syrup, these are all things that in the United States that uh, Vermont is very much known for. Another example would be the region of Appalachia, which again is one of the poorest parts of the United States. They've decided to build their entrepreneurship around these four pillars that you see on the slide. Recreation and tourism, agriculture, 
alternative energy and culture of health, which is really about um, helping your workforce and your community to become more healthy. Last set of strategies is to create a physical home for entrepreneurship. So these pictures you see here, these are all um, co-working and meeting spaces that our firm has been involved in developing. Uh, the one on the, the left uh, the, with the sky, that's in um, Vincennes, Indiana. The indoor picture is from Culpeper, Virginia. And the bottom, which is an old school that's been repurposed into a co-working space and an incubator is in Honesdale, Pennsylvania. It's called the Sturbridge Project. These types of sites are especially important in rural communities because entrepreneurs are isolated because they're far from, from other people. This is a place where entrepreneurs come together. So these are not necessarily incubators. These are what the sociologists would call a third place. So in, in the sociological literature, we speak of the first place is your home, second place is where you work, and the third place is your community. This could be your church or your mosque. It could be a social club you're in. It could be a bar or a restaurant that you hang out in. But um, smart rural communities build third places where entrepreneurs can come together and meet and do business with one another. And it's becoming a very, very important part of rural entrepreneurship ecosystem building. And I would argue after COVID, it's going to become even more so. Um, you know, we have been locked down for, for six to seven months and people are hungry to physically connect. And, uh, you know, hopefully once we get past uh, COVID-19, these kinds of places will become even more important. So um, if I want to give you an example, I'm going to give you an example of one place that I would say is probably the best place in the United States in terms of supporting rural entrepreneurs. It would be the state of Kansas, which is smack in the middle of the United States. Uh, very rural, very, it's ranching and farming. And this program, Network Kansas, is just uh, really a very highly successful and effective program. It has a referral center so people can get connected to business service providers. It has an economic gardening program that coaches new businesses. It has a youth entrepreneurship program. And they also provide tax credits and angel investor tax credits for people that want to invest in startup businesses. So this would be a great example if you wanted to look at uh, a best practice from the United States. Um, we're, um, hopefully we're going to share these slides. I wanted to just put these are other excellent programs that are operating in the United States. You see Kansas, Tennessee, North Carolina, Kentucky, and Arkansas. These are the, the U.S. states where these programs are based. And then these are organizations that advocate for um, entrepreneurship. And I'm, I'm involved with several of these in, in a, a volunteer basis. Uh, but again, these are great programs around the United States that are focused on building healthy, robust, and resilient rural entrepreneurship networks. So this is my contact information. I uh, welcome any questions or comments or feedback. I'll just leave this up for just a second, but then I'm going to stop my screen share so that uh, I can see you and uh, see if there's questions in the chat box. And uh, again, I want to thank you for the opportunity, and I look forward to hanging out with people during the rest of the conference. So thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to share this information. Doctor, super presentation. Very impressed with uh, some of some of the places that you've worked. We're very close to the town of a thousand people where I grew up, and uh, so and, and have seen um, the same kinds of problems that you are solving. Um, Trying to solve, it, I think we should yeah. say. I think it's important also from a, a looking at an election map in the United States to see the blue and the and the red and to see that we have a lot to do uh, perhaps to in this urban uh, rural uh, division that is so much economically driven. So, yes, very much so. Wow, thank you. Do we have questions? Uh, uh, excuse me, uh, Tim. Uh, there, is, there are yes, uh, there are um, a protocol for the roundtable. There are two main discussion points. Would you mind, please, to start with the first point and asking uh, the presenter or the practitioners uh, about their opinion? Shall I push the uh, questions, or you will start? Oh, go ahead. I just um, have too many papers in my hand here. Go ahead, please. Uh, okay. Everybody having too much paper. Yes, <laughs> yes, uh, yes, Ali. Specifically, you are from OECD. 
who is focusing in economic development in Europe or through the world. Uh, in develop and developing countries, the importance of innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem leading for economic diversification. And most of the vision of 2030 focusing in economic diversification. From your opinion, what is your shortcut pathway for successful implementation? We're looking for the shortcut. Yeah, I think like the shortcut, you need to look for the new opportunities. You need to look for the diversify the economy, not relying on like uh, export oriented sectors, like especially in like GCC countries, you need to look for new opportunities, new industries, new sectors that can like bring uh, more opportunities for the young generations for like, like, like tell them that like, and create new innovative ways that that can help these generation into like diversify the economy. So this is like the, the main thing I think. Uh, okay, Eric, what is your opinion? Yes, um, so again, uh, our, our firms, we work, for example, very much with communities that are dependent on coal in the United States. So they are really in the identical situation as uh, many of our compatriots in the Middle East are in the sense that they are very dependent on resource extraction as a driver of, of uh, the economy and they're trying to, to reduce that. Um, I would say, first off, I, I you know, sadly, I, I'm sort of like the skunk at the party here to say that <laughs> there really are no shortcuts in an entrepreneurship strategy. I mean, you really need to be thinking about this. This is a 10 to 20 to 30 year strategy that you put in place um, because it's you know taken hundreds of years for us to become dependent on coal or to become dependent, you know, dependent on oil extraction or whatever sort of resource extraction. You can't just turn that ship so quickly. And so it really is about creating one at a time, two at a time, 10 at a time, 12 jobs, 50 jobs at a time. And so, um, you know, that's one of the challenges we face because there, there are no easy shortcuts. Uh, but politicians, you know, here in the United States, we, we elect new politicians every two or every four years. And, you know, we're, we're presenting a strategy that is on a 10 to 20 year cycle. So we have this clash between the business cycle and the political cycle. But again, it's very important to say that we're in this for the long haul and we need to avoid promising shortcuts, I believe. I wish I had a shortcut. I'd be a much more successful consultant if I had that shortcut, but I can't promise that. Yes, I need to clarify about the shortcut. Uh, we, everybody know there are no sh shortcuts, but everything they have shortcut to leverage uh, the outcomes, okay? And with respect to the entrepreneurship and innovation um, uh, ecosystem or which lead to economic diversification, everybody starting uh, their vision uh, from 20, uh, from the first vision, for example, uh, to 2010 and then 2020, and now everybody jumping to 2030, then we know there are no shortcuts. Then based on the previous year, the infrastructures, the skills, uh, the uh, tools already implemented, specifically for us as from the GCC point of view, we are a so rich, uh, rich countries, then we don't, um, with regarding to the funds, uh, we have a lot of investors and most of our government uh, in the GCC, it's investing uh, in this part to divert to diverse the economy then i'm asking you what is your opinion after 2020 i mean what is the shortcut for 2030 this is the reason why i'm asking uh, if there are any shortcuts for the implementations successful implementations i mean based on your knowledge and experience in the previous year uh well again i the, the strategy that uh, we typically advocate is um to avoid uh, sort of sectoral targeting um, and to encourage everybody to be to consider entrepreneurship that can be from a youth in the community to to anyone successful entrepreneurship depends on passion and people are not going to be successful entrepreneurs unless they're passionate about whatever they're doing so if you're passionate about cooking start a business that's cook about cooking if you're passionate about information technology start an information technology company if you're passionate about manufacturing start a manufacturing company but all of those are equally valid pathways and so what we need to get is many people interested and in wanting to start businesses and hopefully a small section of those who actually go out and start businesses that's the strategy that uh, we typically try to advocate for in rural communities in the united states yes what is your opinion professor Arjet, from france perspective 
Uh, thank you, Dr. Hanadi. And I think I agree with my co-presenters that there's no shortcut, but what we can do is make it more efficient and reduce the risk. Just I uh, have an observation, you know, I've been uh, to uh, the GCC countries and I've been like uh, going around the, 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 the big cities and I see the huge palm trees. And I was wondering how come the, the palm trees has grown here. And, uh, and then I just asked someone, you know, how, did, how long it took, took to grow this one? And someone told me that they haven't been grown. They've been taken, they've been brought from somewhere and they've been planted and then and, and they, and, and they just flourish. I think this could be a best example injected, of... Uh, injected, not planted. <laughs> <laughs> so so okay. bring, bring, the, bring the current technologies uh, which are in the stage of, 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 not early stage, like, you know, in, in, in the commercialization stage and make them flourish in, in, in with, with the collaboration with the local financing support and everything. And that could be, I think, a solution. Doctor, one of the things that I've had a chance to see in the southwestern United States oil districts is much of the same problem you face of a very rural uh, uh, environment with a substantial amount of money, but not much of a plan to try to diversify the oil industry that they have. They've been looking hard at using cluster analysis to be able to find groups of businesses and then talk to them about technologies, uh, about uh, uh, universal problems. All the businesses within this cluster having a specific problem and then, or two or three, and then looking for technologies that might solve those problems because you have uh, a, a, a known um, uh, 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 locus of need and some, although a lot of technologies are, are, are discarded, a few are found, analyzed by the uh, those members of the cluster, and then tried out to find out whether they will, in fact, benefit the cluster. And that process has been successful, sometimes with targeted technologies, things they thought of, uh, and sometimes wild cards. But it was a way to find a way to bring un, unexpected technology growth in different areas to a a, a community that had uh, completely dominated by the oil and gas industry. Uh, it might be an interesting thing to think about because it seems to have worked uh, in a, an environment uh, very similar to a number of your member countries. Yeah, again, I think that that's a, that's a very inter interesting set of strategies. Another strategy we're starting to see quite a bit in the United States is a big focus on talent. Uh, you know, if you're building a community if you have smart people, good things will start to happen. So a lot of communities are starting to go out and instead of recruiting companies, they're trying to recruit people into the community. So again, I spoke of this, this state of Vermont earlier. Well, now Vermont, the state of Vermont will pay people $10,000, give them a grant for $10,000 if they move there. They have technology skills and they move there. They'll just give them a cash grant. Uh, as part of a strategy to attract uh, innovators and entrepreneurs. So we're starting to see those kinds of strategies as well. So the cluster strategy, but now we're also seeing people try to focus on the talent development and talent attraction strategies as well. I would add uh, one point on this is I think uh, one of the strategy could be of knowledge transfers rather than like a mature technology transfer. So you can have an exchange of like, you know, the young, uh, young capital, uh, the knowledge capital you have, the students and the new entrepreneurs have some kind of an exchange program with uh, uh, mature uh, ecosystems where they can learn uh, in, in, in terms of a short accelerator program and, and, and then develop it uh, back home. Additional comment I just want to add, like in, in terms of diversification. So I just, I'll just give you an example of the, like uh, India, like um, um, India, they wanted to diversify their economy and they just wanted to uh, uh, build the shipbuilding, like in, in, diversify to increase the shipbuilding industries. And then they start this, uh, but they don't have the domestic capability to do that, like the, the, the advanced shipbuilding. Then they imported a lot of components in this, in, into, from the, to build these ships. And then at the end, the, the price of the, like the new ship is uh, higher than that what's already in the market. So they, they, there is 
in terms of competitiveness, like the, 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 they cannot compete other countries like uh, production. So this kind of things also like need to be taken into, into account. Like they need to, you need to know like the domestic capability that you have in the country in order to diversify the economy. You need to have which industry that you need to diversify in. Like this is like really important. So whether that you have the domestic capability to do that, like the, uh, the, the, and in order to do that, like you need to build the human capital for your country. Thank you so much, Hadi. Thank you so much for all the presenter team. You can closing, uh, you can closing the sessions, please, and transfer uh, the chairing to uh, Mr. Nasser. Yes. Uh, hi again, uh, everybody. Uh, now we will um, uh, be shifting to the session four. Uh, we have uh, uh, Mrs. Agnes. Uh, I believe she's a lady, Agnes. Uh, okay. She is. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and we have also Sheikh Al Akhzami, Mr. Al Rashid, uh, Joel Swan Swanson. I think I pronounced it uh, well. So uh, let us start with uh, uh, Agnes, please. Thank you. I'll go right ahead and start sharing my screen. Hi, Agnes, how are you? Just fine, thank you. <laughs> We're waiting your presentation. Yes, it should be okay, here shortly. Ahead. Thank you. So I hope you all see my screen now. Yeah, it's fine. Uh, so I'm Agnes Sevenstedt, uh, and I'm joining you from Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, so we just had our first snow today. Uh, and which puts me in a pretty childish mode, but I'm going to try to come back to my management consultancy uh, persona here today to give you a pretty uh, slide heavy numbers heavy presentation on, on the learnings from Innovation 360 group. And I'm uh, one of the co-founders of Innovation 360. Uh, we started the company in 2015 in the spurge of optimism. Uh, when we were uh, looking at what exponential technology could actually do from coming from a kind of pessimistic standpoint, being worried about uh, increasing poverty, increasing polarization in society and um, uh, yeah, lack of resources for a lot of, peop uh, a lot of people. We saw that uh, the uh, uh, exponential, exponential technologies could really help us solve some of humanity's grand challenges. Uh, and that's uh, why we founded Innovation 360 Group to, uh, to sort of like leverage uh, on those uh, technologies. Uh, because none of us uh, co-founders uh, of Innovation 360 are the brainiacs or the inventors that are kind of come up with the little thingy that everybody can have in their pocket to desalinate seawater so that everybody has access to fresh water or invent the, um, the um, uh, battery that can make us uh, save all the energy that the sun uh, sends down to earth every day. But what we are experts in is to help those innovators turn their innovations into, uh, their inventions into innovation. So actually making uh, and implement their idea and make them uh, profitable and to create proper change. Uh, and therefore, since uh, our uh, mission is to help others uh, improve their innovation capability, we everything we do is available for free online because that uh, superstar uh, might not be somebody that can afford to use us as consultants. Uh, and then uh, everything we do can be access for free online. So I'm going to talk to you about assessing innovation capability, because that's how we know uh, what kind of help uh, a certain organization needs. And that assessment is available for free online also. Uh, and so why would we even uh, want to innovate then? Uh, well, uh, a lot of growth comes from uh, innovation, of course, and the customers uh, are much uh, more uh, interested in buying from companies that they perceive as innovative. 
but it's really, really hard. And 84% uh, of executives uh, in the McKinsey Global Innovation Study say that innovation is actually critical for the growth of their company. Uh, but only 6% of the same group say that they are satisfied with the outcomes of their uh, innovation efforts. So it's, it's a, a great huge gap. It's critical, but they're not happy with the success of it. So how do you become uh, successful? Well, uh, from our uh, research, we found that there are three things uh, that you need in place among others, of course, but simplified. Uh, you need uh, something that we call a coherent innovation strategy. And I'm gonna talk to you about the in uh, coherent innovation strategy shortly. And the second thing you need is an uh, uh, innovation strategy that's based on the right capabilities of, and uh, that you have chosen that they are, uh, that you actually have and an um, innovation management system that can execute on the innovation strategy. And what is a coherent innovation strategy uh, except for a extremely management consultancy work? Uh, it's um, when you actually align your organization's capabilities to your strategy uh, and to make sure that anything that you do uh, in, within your innovation is aligned with your corporate strategy because that's how you have both higher growth and higher profits. Uh, and uh, in a study by PricewaterhouseCooper and Boost and Company, uh, a company they would call the companies coherent. If they had identified their strongest capabilities, they performed those capabilities well and they aligned their innovation strategy with their overall corporate strategy. And uh, those companies uh, that were found coherent actually enjoyed 22% 22, 22 higher margins uh, than their less coherent industry peers. Uh, and as you can see below, they also, uh, um, they, the difference wasn't that big uh, between, it, it wasn't spending that helped them. Uh, so it was being an innovator and being coherent is much more successful uh, uh, in, in when you're, you have to choose uh, where you put your innovation efforts rather than just spend a lot of money. Therefore, the first thing uh, you want to do when you start considering what kind of innovation you should start be, be starting with as an organization to consider what is coherent with our capabilities and our strategy. And then you can spend much less money than uh, if you start right away. Uh, without knowing that. Uh, and how do you uh, put together a coherent in, uh, strategy, innovation strategy then? Well, uh, I'm going to walk you through this little graph uh, about finding your opportunity space. Because the first thing you do is, uh, of course, is look for, uh, do an external outlook. Because when you want to do something, uh, when you want to grow, uh, then it's much easier to find new customers and increase what you're doing with customers and clients uh, if something is changing. Because if you're just doing the same old thing, uh, then it's uh, a lot of commoditization within that uh, sector. Uh, and once, whenever change happens, uh, it's much easier to change the habits of the, the organizations. It's much easier to come in as a, as a, with a new uh, innovation. And uh, so make sure that you know what's happening in the outside world and how that will affect your business. And this you can, of course, do by pestlet analysis, doing scenarios based on the pestlet analysis to make sure that you have some kind of idea of several possible futures uh, that you can start tracking to see which one seems most likely to happen or to understand which direction you're heading in. And when you know what's going to ha happening in the outside world, then you need to consider what's my strengths and weaknesses? Uh, what's our strengths and weaknesses in our uh, organization? 
And uh, we do that as an assessment of innovation capability. And we have a framework that's, let's see, uh, the Innovation 360 framework that our uh, group CEO, Magnus Penker, developed when he uh, was doing his MBA. Uh, and it's basically a run through of 100 year of management literature, uh, published management literature to see what uh, all the companies in the world that keep uh, succeeding in redesigning themselves, what do they do? And we basically look at why are they innovating and what are they innovating? So that's the aspiration for innovation. And then we look at their ability, how do they innovate? And we have a, a survey of 96 questions that we ask to understand uh, the organization and how they, uh, to map them uh, to the framework, basically. And when you found your strengths and weaknesses uh, within, uh, uh, from the assessment, or if you do it some other way, uh, then you have to start deciding on how will I use that? And uh, you can either say that, um, okay, let's do, uh, I'm going to start from the bottom here. So it can either be a resource-based view uh, where you say that, okay, this is what we're good at. Uh, and then basically say that, okay, we're going to do what we're already good at. And, or you can have a best in class approach where you benchmark yourself to uh, the best of the best in that field where you want to enter and you uh, look at what capabilities do they have and how can I, and you start building those capabilities. Or you can do a best fit, which is sort of like a combination where we look at what um, uh, capabilities do we already have uh, and how can we sort of like tweak our strategy uh, based on the capabilities we have and also uh, make sure that we remove some uh, essential blockers uh, from, based on capabilities we don't have and build those. So then you know what's happening in the outside world and you know change is gonna happen and you know what your you as an organization is good at uh, and what you can build. Uh, then you look at, okay, so, but what's the purpose, vision and mission of organization? Uh, what do we wanna do? What is it that we actually wanna achieve? Like Innovation 360, we wanna make sure that our BHAG is actually that by 2030, uh, you're going to be able to trace back uh, one of the agenda 2030 goals and see how that has been met uh, and how we helped uh, in that. Uh, so that's what we're trying to achieve. Uh, but you look at you, your organization and you, what you want to achieve. And then you look at your corporate strategy uh, and uh, basically decide on um, how do you want to uh, distinguish yourself uh, from the competition. And also uh, in the uh, strategic direction, you know the opportunity space and you know what kind of, you know what, what you're good at and you look at the, the uh, what it is that you do as an organization and uh, where the, what, where the corporate, corporate strategy says that you're supposed to go. And then you set uh, some uh, goals for innovation. Uh, and this is basically when you decide, okay, what is it I want to accomplish with my uh, innovation? We know what our corporate strategy says, says what you do, uh, but what part of that strategy should be performed with our innovation efforts? And the first exercise uh, we suggest that you do there is to calculate your growth gap. In your growth gap, it's basically the lower curve, the straight line, is if you say that, okay, if we keep doing what we're doing today and we do it better and better every day, uh, where is that gonna take us in five years? And then you consider your aspirations. Where do we wanna be in five years? And you check, and that would be sort of like the upper curve. And uh, that uh, is your growth gap. Uh, so that's, where you that's what you have to fill with your innovation efforts. So your innovation goals should make sure that that growth gap is uh, closed. Uh, and if it's uh, 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 a really uh, big difference uh, uh, between the lower curve and the uh, upper curve, then you have to go radical. And if it's a small one, you can probably uh, keep doing incremental innovation. But having done that, uh, the 
external outlook, the uh, assessment of your capabilities and your what you want to be as a company and setting those goals, then you have basically a lot of a very long to-do list with change initiatives from how you want to change your organization and uh, also from the uh, you have goals that you want to achieve and you know how the world is going to change. You have a long list of strategic initiatives and those strategic initiatives tell you how you're going to uh, reach uh, your innovation goals. And that is a coherent innovation strategy. And uh, as a final uh, point, uh, then of course you have to uh, get that, uh, make something happen. And you put all your strategic initiatives in an innovation portfolio and you establish an innovation man management system to uh, implement all those initiatives. And how you design that uh, innovation management system, that is your innovation operational model. And that's when you look at what, how will I leverage uh, the ecosystem? Uh, where will I use innovation centers? And what will we do centralized or integrated within the organization. And by establishing that, you have closed the gap between being the 84% who think innovation is important and the 6% who uh, are satisfied with their innovation uh, opportunities or what they actually do with their efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Agnes. And uh, you are on time. Uh, we have, I think, two, two minutes uh, remaining. I'll take this uh, advantage to, to ask you about uh, uh, one question. Uh, normally, inventions uh, comes from the academia uh, and um, no, um, not necessarily from the academia, but sometimes we have it from the academia and a single person is doing some sort of researches and come with this idea then uh, this uh, idea should be harvested into uh, an innovative uh, enterprise. I think your presentation is mainly about having an existing enterprise, doing some innovation and converted uh, uh, it to um, uh, a working, uh, let us say, and beneficial uh, uh, example. Uh, what do you think about when there is a single person uh, trying to do something. Have you um, come with the, uh, or let us say, have you faced uh, uh, such uh, situations where you are dealing with persons, not organizations? And what was the uh, in initiative, or let us say, the steps taken uh, to take this uh, um, invention into an innovation? The, I mean, uh, the, um... I mean, like when, when they, uh, in the discussion after, uh, before the, uh, after the first session, the last round table session, this talked about, okay, how we could like, implement uh, a palm tree rather than try to uh, sow yeah. the seed. And um, I mean, that's, that's something that uh, is, is usually a good thing. So uh, tr trying to find some kind of platform where we can incubate that one person and make sure that person uh, finds uh, an ecosystem. And I'm, I'm uh, giving a keynote tomorrow uh, uh, and that's gonna be about uh, how we built uh, that ecosystem uh, for a media company in Sweden. Oh, okay. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and what you, as I mean, being on the other side, uh, what it is you should be, what kind of platform you should try to give to that person who has the brilliant idea to help uh, the person uh, grow. Thank you very much. I'm, I'll be looking forward to, uh, uh, to listen to your uh, tomorrow, let us say, speech. Thank, Thank you very you. much, uh, Agnes. Thank you. Uh, now we have uh, Sheikh al uh, from Sultan Qaboos University. So please, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I will share my screen. Yeah. Um, hope everything is okay now. You can see it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I will talk about technology transfer at research institutions. 
Um, and I'm taking the case of Sultan Qaboos University, uh, which I work actually for now almost 20 years. Uh, so I'm the Director of Innovation and Technology Transfer Center at uh, Sultan Qaboos University, which call it SQU. So you will hear this SQU later. Um, um, actually, uh, I want to give a brief about SQU. Uh, the university is the national university for Oman, and it's it's actually um, the house of expertise because uh, of uh, um, having uh, graduates as alumni or even uh, some expertise for the government sector, for the industry sector. And it's the only actually national university and until maybe two months back, we have another national university. Uh, so it was started and established, 19, uh, opened in 1986. It's a young university. Um, and I will give actually about the content of this presentation. Uh, I will talk about the innovation ecosystem map. Um, then I will jump into the tech transfer definition uh, very briefly. Uh, then I will talk about uh, the center that I work and, um, um, and we established in the university. It's the Innovation Technology Transfer Center. What is our process? What is the services we are providing? And other things, actually, I will, I will move forward. So because of the time, um, um, I will introduce maybe something called um, the, uh, the categories of um, uh, the support institution for research and technology transfer or innovation and technology transfer so they are actually because they are mixed uh, together when we deal with different institutions uh, on a national level level so we should actually identify um, the category of which institution so there is a role for knowledge generator there is a specific role for knowledge diffuser and there is the knowledge regulator so we have to actually have uh, everyone responsibility and you know not to mix it mixing it together or having you know um because this happened actually of uh, a duplication and conflict of interest so that's what we actually notice in the country when we uh, make this map so the innovation ecosystem that i um, this i made it actually based on the um analysis that uh, um and the exp uh, experience several years now um so inside actually maybe this is it can happen maybe for any country <laughs> it's a standard but um uh, mainly actually we we did it as uh, locally for for oman so uh, we can see here that it is actually as academia so the knowledge generator, and there is the government and there is the industry. So we have the government body as knowledge gener regulator should be. It can be the diffuser of knowledge uh, also. Um, and there, there is the knowledge users. Uh, it can be the industry mainly. We are talking about actually business, but it can be also community. Um, so there is a lot of actually weakness linkages that happening in Oman. And there is the straight lines. And depending on the thickness also of these lines that... Um, um, we have actually to, uh, we have strong uh, or weak actually um, linkages, or there is missing actually linkages. Uh, so this is actually the map that we are having. Uh, so we are here as a TTO. So we are the Office of Technology Transfer inside the university. Uh, we link with all the community inside the university and outside the university, as you know. Uh, so um, um, other speakers, they talk about the tech transfer definition, but this is the definition that I or, you know, I use for from Autumn, uh, the process of trans transferring scientific findings from one organization to another for the purpose of further development and commercialization. So this process of tech transfer, it include identifying the new tech and protecting uh, the technologies through the IPRs um, and then forming development and commercialization strategies like licensing to existing companies or creating uh, new uh, startups. I like this actually um, uh, traditional saying by, um, um, uh, by Irish, uh, um, um, Irish, I think, cultural uh, saying that um, uh, the fourth element and they call it actually the four leaf clover. Um, so you can find this actually plant Usually you find it in three, uh, three clovers. So that's the meaning actually, when you find the fourth in Irish, it means it's a luck. So uh, the fourth element we, we actually identify here is the TTO. So whenever you see the TTO in a university or in an industry, it means that there is actually um, successful uh, stories will happen from that university. So you know about the triple helix, which is the university's government and industry. But in addition to the three elements, we have the fourth element. 
The model we are talking about, it's known actually, it's uh, the technology generators, usually research institutions, universities, large companies. Um, and then the um, technology transfer mechanism uh, through science parks, um, uh, TTOs, innovation centers, it can happen inside academia or it can be supported by government units and the technology seekers, SMEs, startups, and some um, large corporations. Um, this is the tech transfer process that we are actually um, implementing, which is known actually for, uh, for any tech transfer office. Uh, so we do the IP filing through patent or designs or whatever type of, uh, um, type of protection. Um, uh, we do the incubations for these inventions. We do the market also assessment, industry partnership, venture uh, venture capital fundings um, through linking uh, to the um, uh, to the funding um, bodies and uh, all these actually uh, through these stages it means that we enhance also the technology readiness level um, in order to have a startup or licensing to an existing company so what are the services that we are providing as a center uh, inventors they are actually the same either he is student or researcher we deal with him in the actually this the same um, um, uh, um, same criteria we don't distinguish between them and they actually apply directly to the center without going to the hierarchy in the college to for the confidentiality and the trust between us and them so once the they come uh, to the to the center we have many services providing and all linked together so there is the IP uh, intellectual property, there is incubation, um, industrial linkage, commercialization, we do consultancy and mentorship and providing it as outsourcing from outside or doing it ourselves, or actually um, uh, taking the advantage of a lot of expertise inside the labs and uh, um, creative minds inside the university, the prototyping development of the uh, technology. And we do actually this year, we started the technology landscape and all this, um, it built up to a capacity building. And we will mention what um, um, some of these main uh, activities, what we mean by them. When we talk about uh, research institutions, so this is SQ, this is our, our, uh, our data in 2019. Um, we, have, um, we have a lot of, um, uh, compared to a small university with 17,000 uh, students, and um, you can say 4,000, um, minds inside the university and we have uh, nine colleges and more than 12 centers research centers um, we we have actually um, a lot of uh, research and high citation research in applied science so you notice here that the medicine it has many of it it's applied science engineering agriculture environmental science computer science uh, biochem and genetics so we are we are str uh, st strong in some of these research uh, areas um, for the economic impact, we notice that, um, that we, we find that there are patents that are citing uh, our, our publication. So the publication is uh, for us, uh, if we didn't evaluate it from the beginning, um, it will be free for others to uh, patent and commercialize. So since 2016, we have actually increased the number of publications. So the, the publication is good, but it's our enemy <laughs> for uh, TTO. <laughs> Academic industry linkages, um, uh, we did um, some of these and we, the coming year also we will do more even virtually. Uh, we did technology transfer days, uh, technology days in oil and gas. We did another one in fintech and another one in food technology. We gather uh, the experts in that area from all academics, not only from SQU, and um, from industry and also from the government who are regulating these type of um, uh, uh, laws and regulations concerned with that uh, technology. So you can see that the discussion happening here, they are really very uh, enthusiastic when they talk to, to their peers in the industry and what's happening, the, uh, happening what's the challenges and the industry, they will understand what is the capability of the universities. Um, this uh, year we start implementing the technology analysis Maybe it's new for universities, more known for companies, but we actually, we know that there is um, um, a need to uh, align um, the priority of national priority as a national university and also uh, see what is the strength of our uh, research teams and how we can direct the researcher when he starts 
thinking about the topic of research proposal when he applied for his um, research funding, uh, or, or also to uh, guide his PhD students, what is the what are the topics that they will, uh, so from, from the beginning of um, um, in, uh, deciding what is the idea. So this will guide them, this type of analysis reports. Um, we choose five topics in, two th in 2020. Um, uh, based on what? The criteria is that we choose the active research groups with high citation uh, areas. And it has economic impact, so there is patent uh, coming from those, uh, but it's patented by others, and based on national priorities. Uh, we choose the artificial intelligence as a, a report, it's in, in process, uh, the algae, biotech, medicinal plants, wastewater treatment, and water desalination. We have other topics in the also coming year, like nanotech, um, uh, nanotechnology, and we have very strong team in that. So we are actually helping these teams to uh, know what are the gaps in technology, what are the emerging technologies worldwide, who are actually the key players, how they can actually know their, um, you know, how they can connect also and know that um, uh, who are actually playing very you know um, important role in in changing the map of the technology worldwide where are the gaps that they can do research and own um, uh, ips in them instead of doing you know in the same topic that everybody already having you know saturated of patents in that area so we have to move to an area of um, um, for decision makers actually and making strategy for the university in that area. So this will help not only the researchers but the research committee on a, on a university um, level to, um, to give them priority of topics in that specific technologies. The science incubation also we implemented in 2019 and um, this it means the pre-incubation stage and also incubating the science and technology-based inventions, uh, which need um, the support from the labs and support from the, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the technical expertise in the university. Um, and that's actually um, happening maybe to, um, to have, uh, um, um, there is a gap of the incubation inside the country. We have business incubation and we have a lot of also ITC incubation and also business incubation. But when it comes to having strong SME maybe or strong uh, um, uh, um, high tech uh, startup or spin off, um, the problem coming from the, um, you know, there is no pre incubation stage for that. So that's why we actually have this initiative to have science incubation inside the university. Um, so they, uh, this is the process, um, and we provide uh, also business and market study for them, innovation development, and all this actually science incubation, it links to all the sectors we are having in the sections inside the center. So it has, an, they, they will move through the IP protection, evaluation, and uh, uh, capacity building, all this, they will actually um, go through them. Um, we are proud to say that we, um, we, we are implementing three programs with the WIPO, uh, which is the World Intellectual Property Organization. Um, one of them is the, uh, is the WIPO Oman Summer School on IP. We started in 2018 and the coming will be virtual in 2021. Uh, it will be announced soon. Uh, also another project that we started in, in late 2019 um, for four years, it will continue uh, choosing Oman for this project as a pilot project beside uh, other four countries. Uh, the countries are uh, uh, US, Mexico, Pakistan, and uh, um, um, I forgot the African country, um, Uganda, I think, increasing the role of women in innovation and entrepreneurship. So this is the project. It's serious, you know, a uh, problem happening of gender equity when it comes to um, impact of women scientists in the number of patents. So th there are a lot of uh, women who are scientists, but uh, it doesn't reflect on the number of patents. They don't actually file uh, their inventions and on the number also of trademarks and others. Uh, another also um, project that we are handling is to um, introduce the Master of Innovation and IP with the WIPO. Um, it, uh, in 2022, hopefully, we will succeed in actually reaching that target. We start the drafting and then it will go to the Academic Council and other process. 
Um, we established also in 2013 the Innovation and Entrepreneurship Society. It's a student society gathering uh, um, all the universities from all the societies. We have all the inventors, all the, you know, um, um, to, to create like business minds for engineers and for uh, science. Sheikha, sorry, um, your time is uh, out. Uh, uh, please close as soon as possible. We'll finish it soon, yeah. So yeah. these are activities that we are handling. Um, I will maybe uh, just move into the patent filing that that's are the challenges we're fi um, facing in Oman um, because of the IP uh, IP office. We filed in the USPT in the begin PTO in the beginning, but then we moved to file in Oman when the Oman office is receiving for the international PCT uh, applications. Um, it's actually a complicated situation, but to overcome this challenge, we had to actually find a way of uh, filing um, in PCT and also uh, choosing Oman and then um, um, uh, to, uh, go to file in the national phase. Uh, so the IP policy, the last point, uh, general rule for the university, the university claim the ownership of all IPs, but there are exceptions. Uh, if, if you do it, actually, if the inventor, um, uh, during the inventor own time, if he's uh, staff, if he use also um, uh, use um, uh, not not utilizing uh, significant resources of the university and labs, um, but there is also exception for the traditional academic work. So the author he actually have the ownership of his authorship um, unless he use also significant resources. He, if he producing during the course of sponsored research or collaborative activity, it's case by case, and originally also developed as part of any of the academic courses. Um, and the commercialization, we do um, uh, cover thank all the you. Thank you, Sheikh. I have to stop you here. Um, yeah, yeah, the last yeah, thank please. You. Uh, thank you for that. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Sheikh. Uh, now we have uh, Mr. Misfer. Uh, I believe he is from Saudi Arabia. Uh, please, uh, we will come you. Tfadal Saudi Misfer. Uh, the voice is yeah, yeah. yeah, good evening for everybody. And I'm really glad to be one of this uh, conference speaker, inshallah. Let me just uh, try to share my screen. I don't know what's happening here. Just, just a moment. معلش استاذ ناصر شكله في في إشكالية شوية. إلس بس دقيقة بس لعلي. ما شيء إشكال. بس أفتح ال. هو في فقط شير سكرين بالأخضر تحت. أيوة أيوة. أنا أنا I have to I have to open the file first. آه أوكي. So yeah. Yes, it's coming. Yes. Is it okay now? Yeah, please start. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. I'm from the Arab Union, so I'm going to talk in the Arabic language. Of course, all of them are in English. But the Arabic language will be easier for me. It will be easier for me. It will be easier for me. It will be easier for me. <تصفيق> طبعا انا متشرف وسعيد جدا بالحضور وبالمشاركه في كسبيكر في هذا الاجتماع وشكرا صراحه للدكتوره هنادي والقائمين على هذا المؤتمر ومؤتمرات نحتاج مثلها كثير. في هذه في في هذا الجزء ساتكلم في ثلاث نقاط مهمه اللي هو في التخطيط الاستراتيجي وستأكلم أيضا في التخطيط الاستراتيجي فيما قبل جائحة كورونا وثم فيما بعد جائحة كورونا النقطة الثالثة فيما بعد جائحة كورونا طبعا التخطيط الاستراتيجي هو مجموعة من العمليات التي يقوم على إعدادها أو توثيقها لكي توجه المنشأة إلى الطريق الصحيح أيضا تحدد المكان الذي توجد فيه المنشأة وإلى أين متجهة ايضا انها تعطي مساحه او تعطي فرصه لان المؤسسه تضع سياساتها او اجراءاتها او رؤيتها 
ورسالتها والقيم تبعها والاهداف الاستراتيجيه التي ترغب في الوصول اليها وبناء على الخطط المرسومه لها. طبعا الاستراتيجيك بلاننج او الخطط الاستراتيجيه، الخطه الاستراتيجيه لها موقع مهم جدا في اداره المشاريع، اداره المشاريع من العلم في الاداره الذي نحرص عليه في الاونه الاخيره او تحرص عليها المؤسسات لكي تصل الى النجاح بطريقه سهله وطريقه منظمه. فاداره المشاريع فيها خمس اعمده او خمس اشياء او خطوات رئيسيه من اهمها واولها اللي هو التخطيط. لذلك هذا يعني ان التخطيط هو شيء مهم في قيام المؤسسه او في قيام الاعمال للوصول الى الرياده او لتضمن تسهيل عمليات وصول عملياتها الى الرياده كما هو مخطط له. طبعا في فوائد كبيره للتخطيط الاستراتيجي اللي خمس فوائد فيما حاولنا ان نحصل عليه اللي هو انها تعطي المؤسسه انها تكون عندها الخطوات الاستباقيه وليس خطوات ردات الفعل او الرياكشنز قبل ما يحدث اي شيء يكون في خطوات استباقيه هذا ما حصل مثل في جائحه كورونا بعض الشركات الكبيره بعض الشركات المتقدمه بعض الشركات التي اعتمدت على على التقنيه في اعداد خططها وفي اعداد اعمالها من قبل ما تاثرت كثير بجائحه كورونا بينما الذي اللي باقي على على النظام القديم تاثرت بشكل كبير وتاثرت باللي بعضها وصل الى درجه الخساره او درجه انها خرجت من السوق. الخطوه الثانيه انها تعطي احساس او تعطي الشعور او التوجه او الطريق الصحيح التي توجه فيه المؤسسه او البزنس ان تو انكريز اوبريشنال افشنسي تزيد من فعاليه العمليات او عمليات الاعمال ايضا تساعد في الحصول على حصه كبيره من السوق او زياده الانتاجيه او زياده الارباح ايضا ان فرصه ل الحفاظ على ديمومة العمل في الأسواق ما يجي لفترة معينة وبعدها يختفي أو ينتهي طبعا إذا تكلمنا عن ما قبل كوفيد 19 أو ما قبل جائحة كورونا كانت التخطيط الاستراتيجي أو كان البزنس موديل تقريبا محدود أو بشكل أو له نماذج محدودة ومعروفة ومتعارف عليها اللي هو ان صاحب العمل يهتم في خطط الاستراتيجيه في الحصول على طريقه رسم خطه كيف ان العمل يكون جاذب للزبون او للعميل كيف ان المباني إن كيف يحافظ على البناء باقل تكلفه كيف يحافظ على طريقه الترشيد كيف يكون اتراكتف او جاذب للعملاء يكون في مكان ظاهر لهم ايضا يهتم في طريقة بناء الأسواق أو بناء المجمعات أو صالات العرض اللي تكون تساعد أن تكون كإعلان أو كسهلة الوصول بالنسبة بالنسبة للعميل. إن كان في أيضا مشاكل من ضمن المشاكل هذه أن أن في مشاكل في كثرة الأصول اللي يحتاجها العمل أيضا أن الترشيد كان قليل جدا. ما تساعد في عمليه الترشيد سواء على مستوى اللوجستيك ولا على مستوى المان باورز او المصاريف الماليه، ايضا ان في اشكاليه في طريقه التواصل فيما بين اصحاب الاعمال او العميل حتى حتى في طريقه توثيق عمليات البيع والشراء في طريقه التنقل من مكان الى مكان اخر للحصول على السلع. وهذا على نقيض مما حصل عندما فعلت التقنيه بشكل كبير في 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 الاوضاع الحاليه وكان ذلك قسرا ورب ضاره نافعه. ايضا كان الاعتماد على التقنيه كان ضعيف جدا بما ان كان يؤثر على الاعلانات فكانت الاعلانات فقط تعد في اماكن معينه او طريقه توصيل البضاعه من مكان الى مكان صعبه جدا. على النقيض مما احنا فيه الان في بعد في الوضع الحالي في بعض يعني بعض ظهور المنصات الافتراضيه 
اصبح ذلك سهل الاعلانات توصل الى كل عميل على جواله عن طريق السناب شات عن طريق وسائل التواصل الاجتماعي عن طريق الويب سايت التابعه للاسواق او المحلات البيع سهل جدا ان توصل الاعلان حتى وكل شخص موجود في بيته يعني ما في صعوبه لل... ايضا في توصيل البضاعه فيما بعد الشراء سهل جدا يستطيع المشتري ان توصل بضاعته من الصين وهو او من امريكا او من اي دوله اخرى وهو في اي مكان من اي جزء من اجزاء العالم اذا تحدثنا عن ما بعد ال ما بعد الجائحة كورونا طبعا الحمد لله على كل حال ولكن رب ضارة نافعة لكن هذه الجائحة صراحة أثرت على العديد من الشركات لكن أجبرت وأجبرت العديد من الشركات أن يصير في تغيير في الخطط الاستراتيجية بما يتواكب مع ما حدث في الجائحة الغالب من الشركات يعني تقريبا ما تكون شركات معدودة هي اللي نجحت في الجائحة لأن عندهم خطوات استباقية أو عندهم خطة استراتيجية أو أنهم ممكنين للتقنية من قبل من خلال المنصات الافتراضية من خلال منافذ البيع الإلكترونية من خلال هذه الأشياء فما تضرروا بحجم ما تضررت الأجهزة أو الشركات الأخرى أما بعض الشركات الآن التي تسعى إلى أن تحاول نتعوض وذلك مما أجبر أن الكتاب أو المفكرين أو المخططين لا يجب أن يكون في تغيير جذري في التخطيط الاستراتيجي للبزنس فيما سبق لذلك لكي يتحول ظهرت أمامنا سلبيات وإيجابيات الوقت الحالي المتغيرات اللي حصلت في 2020 لذلك والآن اتضحت في صورة واضحة توجه العالم إلى أين؟ ارتباط التقنية بنجاح أي بزنس أو أي عمل أيضا صار فيه فرضت هذه الجائحة على أصحاب الأعمال أنهم يسألون أنفسهم خمسة أسئلة من ضمنها أن وين وصلت إنجازاتنا في خلال جائحة كورونا إيش عملنا في جائحة كورونا أرض أيضا أن ما هي الخطة التي ممكن نعملها لتعويض ما خسرناه أو للخروج من المشاكل اللي دخلنا فيها خلال جائحة كورونا أيضا أن كيف ستتغير هوية أو ستتغير آلية أو طريقة العمل في كيف كيف أن جائحة كورونا أثرت على تغيير هوية تغيير التنظيم في في المؤسسات أو في الكيانات أيضا إذا السؤال الرابع تقريبا أن يسأل المستثمر أو يسأل صاحب العمل المشروع القادم كيف كيف حيطلق المشروع كيف حيعمل على تسيير المشروع أو أيضا كيف يعمل على التنسيق له والتخطيط له السؤال الخامس أن كيف نسعى how we will prepare كيف عفوا ان كيف نسعى للاعداد لخطه ناجحه للمشروع القادم بكي لكي ما يصير فيها اي سقط او اي تعارضات في المستقبل. نعم طبعا فيما بعد جائحه كورونا اصبح في تغيرات كبيره لاحظنا كثير ان في تمكين للتقنيه بشكل كبير جدا هذا اصبح ضروره يعني بما لاحظنا في ايام الحظر باذن الله ان شاء الله ايام الحظر صراحه لولا الله سبحانه وتعالى ثم لولا وجود منصات افتراضيه على سبيل المثال في المملكه العربيه السعوديه في منصات افتراضيه في وزاره في جميع الوزارات خدمت الناس بشكل كبير ساعدت الناس في التمكن في الجلوس في البيوت ايضا منصات الافتراضيه في يعني من ناحيه في الاغذيه في توصيل طلبات الغذاء توصيل طلبات الادويه وهكذا آه هذه من ضمن المتغيرات اللي ملاحظه في بـ في بـ كورونا آه ايضا ان آه اصحاب الاعمال صار عندهم تنبؤ بان آه المنصات الافتراضيه يجب ان 
عفوا ان اصحاب الاعمال اللي كان عندهم تنبؤات من قبل لم يتضرروا من ضمن من خلال الجائحه كل وكل غالبا ما ترتكز كل النقاط على ان تمكين التقنيه والعمل على تغيير الاستراتيجيات التي تواكب مع ما حدث وتفعيل الايجابيات التي حدثت ضمن خلال خلال جائحه كورونا طبعا بالنسبه للتخطيط المستقبلي لابد انه يكون مرن للتواكب مع ثوره الثوره التقنيه في الاعمال ايضا لابد انه يكون لابد انه يكون في مراجعه للخطط الاستراتيجيه السابقه وتحويلها الى ان تتواكب مع المتطلبات الحاليه ايضا يجب ان نحافظ على اكتساب خبره الخبره التي اكتسبناها من خلال ظروف الحظر خلال ظروف جائحة كورونا لنتقدم بها إلى الأفضل أنا سعيد جدا بالانضمام إليكم الليلة والحوصة أسف أني تجاوزت الوقت طبعا إذا في أسئلة لكن أتوقع الأسئلة أنها بتكون في النهاية شكرا لكم مسفر It's very interesting to see how businesses are changing now and how the technology Uh, solved a lot of problems that uh, we were supposed to face uh, during the uh, pandemic uh, uh, period. Uh, yes, uh, I agree with you that uh, strategy planning uh, is one essential uh, tool that uh, help uh, organization to prepare well for uh, such uh, situation. Thank you very much. Now we are going to uh, move to uh, uh, Joel. Joel Swanson, yeah. Do we have jo Joel? He should be there. He said he texted me and told me I'm. Joel, yeah, I'm good there. Joel. Yeah, okay. <laughs> We are waiting. So while we are waiting, um, just to talk about a little bit about uh, what. Uh, Mr. Misfer have uh, presented, uh, we saw a lot of technology is uh, emerging uh, also in Oman. Uh, a lot of, uh, let us say, um, platforms that enable uh, people to work uh, from home. And it was interesting. We, uh, we uh, saw uh, some people who were uh, literally not needed to, for them to come to office. Uh, so they can work uh, at all the time from home. Uh, only few people, they were supposed to go to office because they have to interact with the people face to face. But with the COVID uh, issue, this uh, requirement even is not uh, anymore there. So working from home uh, is not a dream uh, anymore in our developing countries. It's a reality now. Uh, thank you very much for highlighting this uh, misfer. Uh, still, uh, Joel is not here. Dr. Uh, Hanadi? Uh, yeah, hello, uh, يا هلا فيك آه تقدر تكمل الاوبن ديسكشن عندنا على ما جاول از موجود يعني بس ما ندري وينه يعني مع الاتندي يعني يديت لي بالتاكسي يقول لي ام هير وين ما ادري وين ام هير ام هير ام ذير ما ادري عنه اه اوكي سو يا ال جو باك تو شيخه يس 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 اي هاف ليتل كومنتس اباوت شيخه شيخه بريزنتينج ذا بيست براكتسز اوف توب اكاديميان يونيفرستي اند اول ذس يونيفرستي ان ذا جي سي سي اولسو اباوت كابوس يونيفرستي ذي هاف ا بلنتي اوف اتشيفمنت اب تو ديت سبيسيفيكلي ان تكنولوجي ترانسفير اي ميت هير تو ييرز اجو for preparing uh, my uh, book regarding for university technology transfer in the GCC and I select Kabus University presenting Oman and they have plenty of uh, achievement and plenty of program and this is, is a really add, added value uh, to the achievement of the GCC. Uh, okay, you. go ahead Sheikha and present uh, more if you have a uh, few slides till Joel is joining us, if you yes. have more points. Go I, ahead. Yes, sir, please. Yes. Yeah, Thank you. Uh, I, I will do it very quickly. 
think exactly we have exactly the challenges. Just yeah. uh, maybe maybe one minute. So uh, because the challenges, yeah, the challenge is actually that faced in in our universities that uh, the national universities need to align the national laws and bylaws of the government research institutions to the tech transfer needs. Uh, we cannot, as university, to uh, commercialize, and we have actually obligation to do only research and community service without business. So we have to adapt actually um, and uh, modify our uh, laws. The innovation and tech transfer policy should be independent from the research policy, and they are mixing it together. In any university, uh, they put academics and researchers who will um, draft the policies, and they actually mix, mix it together. It should be independent because technology transfer and innovation they think about business, but research they think about um, publishing. Uh, another thing is the lack of incentives for researchers to do research and the lack of incentives for researchers to patent their inventions. Um, another thing is the, um, the lack of research pri priorities based on industrial needs. And also um, because they are, this is common in every universities that the academic promotion uh, policies that it need to actually um, uh, be modified to uh, award the system and in incentivize the researchers to um, uh, to patent also in addition to publishing. Um, not having also appli uh, provisional application for an Omani office, uh, the IP office I mean for the filing procedure. And that actually uh, make us, um, uh, our role is difficult as a TTO to uh, convince our researchers to patent because there is no grace period, there is no provisional application. Um, so they have to wait for the duration, you know, for 18 months, so uh, in order to publish. Um, uh, the weak link is, uh, as I said, and there is also, we need to uh, strengthen the PPP, uh, which is the private and public partnership. These are the main actual challenges uh, I would like to raise. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Sheikha. I want to disclose uh, one secret that me and Sheikha, we have, we are in one committee uh, between uh, Madain and uh, uh, SQU. Uh, Madain have um, uh, funded a, a research chair in uh, Sultan Qaboos University. And uh, one initiative is uh, uh, to build a platform that will link um, uh, researchers from uh, SQU with the uh, industrial uh, states, uh, with the, uh, require, what the, uh, the, the industry require, what are the problems that they are facing, so they can just directly uh, talk with the uh, inventors, with yeah. the innovators, yeah. with the researchers uh, mm -hmm. to solve these problems. Also, they can uh, look at what uh, uh, researchers, what IB uh, SQ you have, mm -hmm. so it will be benefiting uh, uh, two ways. I think we have Joel now. Uh, oh, yes, finally. Yeah, thank you. Finally, so please, please go start, start. All right. Let yep. me share my screen here. Yep. Ah, we have 10 minutes. Okay, please. Okay, there we go. Sorry about that. So what we are here today to talk about is uh, what's called the entrepreneurial operating system. And lots of you um, are wrapped up in entre entrepreneurial businesses. And the big idea here is really that a lot of business leaders find themselves uh, feeling like they're running after their company and they're not really in control of the organization. And so what do we do in order to get a grip, like we say, on, on an entrepreneurial company. And so, geez. I am really sorry. Oh. 
Okay. Yeah. And so EOS or the entrepreneurial operating system is really about three different things that we call vision, traction, and healthy. So vision meaning getting the leaders of the business 100% on the same page with where the organization is going and how it's going to get there. And then the traction component is about the discipline and accountability side of a business. So really teaching leaders to be people who can master execution. And then healthy is about saying, how do we build healthy teams in an organization? So all the work that we're putting in, so all of the effort that we're putting into the business is actually sustainable over the long term. And so the founder of uh, EOS, Gina Wickman, uh, likes to say that strategic planning is often too complex and an organization's vis vision is seldom clear and concise. And you guys have probably seen this in businesses where it's very easy to make a plan complex, but when we make a plan complex, several things happen. One, it's difficult to remember, and two, most of our people don't understand what we're trying to do and don't understand where we're trying to take the company. And so what does it look like to really simplify everything that we're doing here? So the EOS model has six components, and I'm going to go through them at a very high level, and then we're just going to look at one of the tools. So the first of the components is vision, and vision is about getting all of your people 100% on the same page. Where are we going? How are we going to get there? Then the second part is people, and this is about saying how do we get the right people in the right seats, and how do we define who the right people are for the organization? And then the data component is about saying, how do we run the organization based on metrics rather than on somebody's intuition? And then fourth is issues. So every organization has issues. Uh, how do we figure out what they are and how do we solve them? And then process is how do we make sure that the most important things in any organization are happening the same way every time. And then traction is about bringing all that down to accountability. And so the idea is to strengthen your organization in these six key components. And we have tools that go in, go in with all of them. I'm going to share with you uh, one of the tools that's under vision, and it's called Answering the Eight Questions. And the big idea here is that you can create a strategic plan that is big and bold and has lots of data, but the more you put into it, the harder it is for everyone in your organization to align behind it. The problem in most companies that are entrepreneurial and growing isn't that there's not a vision, it's that people don't agree on the specifics of the vision. And so we need to be able to create that vision and plan in a way that's very, very simple. And so there's eight components to the VTO, we call it the Vision Traction Organizer. And I'm going to go through uh, them at a high level here. So there's first page is about core values, core focus, 10-year target, marketing strategy, three-year picture. And by the way, this document, I mean, I've got a link at the end for where you can get it. So it's, a, it's free on our website, so you don't have to worry about trying to write everything down frantically if you're interested. Uh, three-year picture. And then the second page is about the execution side. So what is our one-year plan? What's our rocks? What are, what's our issues list? So first is core values, and core values, the problem, or the, the mistake that lots of companies make is they try to create core values when really what we need to do is discover what they already are. And so we don't do core values because we want something pretty to put on the wall. We do core values because this is how we define who the right people are in your organization. So we've got to discover them, define them, and make sure that we live and breathe what those core values are, because this is how we surround ourselves with the right people. Second is core focus. And core focus is really about saying, what is the sweet spot of our organization? So as entrepreneurs and people who are leading growing organizations, it's very typical for us to think that we can be the best in the world at everything. So I've been there. And I'm sure a lot of you have too. So that's great until you start getting spread out so thin that you lose control of what's happening in the organization and things start to fall apart. So how do we remain really condensed in this? And so the core focus is a combination of your why and your what. So why do we do what we do? Your purpose, cause, or passion, and your what, which is your niche. 
And so keeping those things as really the filter that we use to, to determine what do we need to do as a company and what do we need to say no to. Uh, next is the 10 year target. And that's just, what do you want from the business? And the rule of thumb is five to 30 years. What's the one big number one goal out there that we want everybody in the organization moving us toward? Uh, next is marketing strategy. So this is not marketing tactics. This is just about the high level strategy. How do we define what your target market is? And especially as an entrepreneurial growing company, we tend to say, well, our, our target market is everybody. Uh, but how do we really dial that back to say, these are the exact people, demographic, psychographic, geographic, that we want to talk to. Once we know that, the three uniques, how do we present our message in a way that resonates the strongest with our target market? Proven process is the way that you execute in your business and can reassure people that they're in the good hands of a process that you execute over and over. And then the guarantee is a pledge or a promise that you make in your industry. And so once we know what this is, then everything we do from a sales and marketing standpoint needs to drive uh, this marketing strategy. Next is three-year picture. Three-year picture is really about creating a picture in your head that you can share with the people in your organization. Most of the people in your organization, and if it's a growing or growing company, don't understand finances and you can share numbers with them and it means almost nothing. So we need to paint a picture, help them understand what's it gonna look like, what's it gonna feel like, what's in it for me as we continue to push this organization forward. Once we know what the three-year picture is, that lines us up for the next part, which is the execution part. So first is the one-year plan. And this is simple. Like I told you guys earlier, the idea here is to create simple strategic planning focused on execution that doesn't kill the entrepreneurial spirit and, and really the, the nimbleness of what an entrepreneurial organization needs. So most companies try to do 26 things every single year and they get almost none of them done. And so we take a very simplified approach and say, all right, what are the top things that we need to execute this year? Not just the things that we'd like to do, but what are the absolutely critical things that we must do this year to stay on track for that three-year picture? And once we know what those are, those are the things that the company executes. Now, one year is too long for humans to focus. Our strategic attention span seems to be about 90 days. And so then we break this down one more level into what we call rocks. So in a quarterly rock, we're saying, all right, these are the things that we all agreed we must get done this year to stay on track. All right, well, now what do we need to do this quarter in order to stay on track for the one-year plan? And so your company operates then in that 90-day cycle over and over and over again of figuring out what do we need to prioritize and how do we execute it? And then last is issues list. The biggest discipline here is, first of all, just admitting that you have issues. So your company has issues, my company has issues, and we just need to be okay with that. But especially for you as the leader, especially for you as the entrepreneur, what tends to happen is you get an idea or you see a problem and you wanna fix it right now. And that's, that's great, except if you disrupt everything that's happening in the organization. So the issues list is a way that we can capture those things that either great ideas that we want to do, problems, and that are, uh, that we're dealing with, maybe challenges that we see coming down the road, and get them all in a place so that we can keep track of them and then solve them in their order of priority. So that's, that's the idea of the VTO. And going back to the first page, core values, core focus, 10-year target, marketing strategy, three-year picture. And then second, the one-year plan, rocks, and issues list. And in your organization, if you just take, like knowing only the little bit that I've told you about EOS and the little bit that I've explained about the VTO, if you take this document and you fill it out and you go over it once a quarter with your team, you will be way far ahead and much more ready to, to uh, operate successfully 
in the marketplace and outlive Thank your competitors you. than, than most of your competitors are competitors are doing. Uh, uh, Thank you, Joel. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. So, Thank you. Um, so just to recap, I will start from Joel. Um, normally, uh, management models or let us say strategic models uh, fit companies that will consist of, let us say, a few persons like five, six, ten. But some of these, uh, especially micro micro companies who start with one or two, where do you see uh, the EOS model uh, is fitting? Well, the uh, the short version is everywhere. Um, the longer version okay. is that the you know my biggest client has seven hundred people and my smallest has two, so it works okay. in a very broad spectrum. It seems to be about when you get to ten people your company stops being able to function like a startup anymore. And you, and when you were five people, we could all do it based on our relationship with each other. Once we get to yep. about 10, that's where we need the overlying structure. So it's certainly helpful for smaller than 10, but you really get the, the most critical uh, kind of advantage of using EOS is when you get to about 10 people. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I'll go back to Sheikha also. Uh, Sheikha, uh, you mentioned that you have um, uh, uh, the TT where you are spinning off these uh, uh, IPs or, or these, uh, let us say, startups uh, to the investors and uh, getting some, some funding from other agencies. Mm -hmm. Now there is a trend in, uh, uh, let us say, uh, old university, well-known universities like Harvard, uh, Cambridge and others where they have their own uh, uh, innovation fund uh, in which uh, the, the university is sharing the IPs and the patents and the investors have the money. So uh, how do you see that SQU can go and uh, adopt such, uh, let us say, uh, model or let us say, uh, su such uh, practice uh, to the country, uh, please? Yes. Um, actually, uh, looking into the culture and uh, the system in Oman as an ecosystem for innovation, um, our, our industry is not that strong. And um, our core business, actually, or core uh, task as university is also, of course, to do the tech transfer. But we have to have find to, to find a way that can fit our goal, achieve our goals, but with the less hassle. So what we actually do, we connect to the ecosystem that we are having in Oman. So we will outsource it to our um, uh, to some companies who will actually help us in doing the pitch presentation through their system. So our invention, our IP, will be actually um, within another program by uh, we have the SME fund we have different also um, yep. uh, you know companies who are doing it and they get the trust from the investor when we call the investor to come they will not come to the university or they will not you know take it seriously for the presentation but our invention will go within another actually another another, another link so we will focus on our main you know um gap that is not um done actually anywhere so we'll we'll do the ip and transfer of technology through uh, okay. through prototype development and others also uh, the prototype development we don't do it we don't have the fab lab we will not actually duplicate because we are not a big population in oman so we'll outsource it also on our, our other partner who have another presentation which is makers oman so uh, this yeah. is Thank you, thank you, Sheikha. It's it's your opinion, but um, uh, I believe also uh, this international practice have its own uh, benefits, and it can also speed up uh, uh, some innovative uh, uh, company creations and enterprises. But it's it's, it's an argument that uh, the the SQU uh, should look at it. Uh, um, uh, Agnes, uh, yeah, uh, what do you think the best way uh, to handle such uh, issues with our developing countries? You are more into uh, creating inventions into innovative uh, enterprises. So how do you see uh, the developing world, uh, especially now we start to be recognized as uh, part of the 2%, uh, let us say, uh, best scientist by Stanford uh, uh, last uh, few days, for example. Uh, so how do you see how we can proceed? 
I uh, would say first uh, that it's super important that whenever you're trying to cooperate between, uh, I mean, one region and another region, or one country and another country, it's to be to have mutual respect and uh, be humble, uh, because the the only I mean, there's so many things that the developing countries do so much better than the uh, the old developed countries. Uh, and I mean, it's it's like when you're trying to get a startup and and um, uh, incubant to work together, you have to make sure that they are interested in understanding the other part and and not trying to just tell the other part how to act, but yep. that mutual understanding. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hanadi. Uh, I think we have uh, our time uh, finished, so we will hand over. Uh, yeah, thank yeah, you very much. Thank, thank, you. thank you guys. See you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you Nasser, for thank, thank you, you for your thanks for all. Uh, it is our honor to have you in our uh, sessions. Uh, this is most critical sessions. It's about innovative tool, uh, specifically the GCC looking for the latest innovative tool. And now we will uh, transfer to the last session about how we implement the innovations in the educations, we can call it. Okay, and who would running this session is Judy. I hope Judy it's there. Nasser, you can speak with them till I uh, identify Judy. I know the Tim and Tim groups is there, but let me identify where is the Judy. Okay. Uh, so what else we can talk about? Uh, now I am in, uh, you, in, in trouble. Yes, <laughs> yes, I told you you can talk. Uh, Agnes, would you mind please to present your uh, type of belt? Uh, because I'm accredited from 30, uh, 360 degree innovation. Would you mind okay. please to introduce uh, the, your type of belt and how it's uh, uh, the innovation implemented in through the world? And in many countries, even though in GCC, the, how they implement your ideation stage and using your platform in a very successful way. Uh, till I, I till I catch Judy. Okay. Yes, thank you. Yeah, we we uh, we're only a tech company. Uh, I mean, the people are actually employed in Innovation Three Hundred and Sixty Group, and we um, we have something that we call licensed practitioners. So we train and license uh, innovation experts across the world. And we have just over 250 right now, I think. And uh, Dr. Hanadi is uh, one of our licensed practitioners. So basically uh, we have, I mean, in every um, part of the world, we have people who use our methodology to assess innovation capability and, and help uh, organizations there. And by that way, we also become so much stronger because Dr. Hanadi is uh, in, in her profession and doing her learnings in her region and feeding back to the rest of us in, in the ecosystem. So that's how we're building an uh, ecosystem of, of knowledge that we share. And the, the um, um, belt grading uh, is, is very much similar to uh, how you have belts in for example, Six Sigma. So I'm an innovation black belt, uh, which basically means that I am part of the group who, who develop our methodology. And I start by being basic and then you're yellow, green, and black, very basic you, you, learnings along the way. Uh, but uh, it's wonderful to have this kind of uh, global network where you can share uh, knowledge. Yeah. It's, it's great also. Yeah. And it also makes our, I mean, since we assess innovation capabilities, we have just over 5,000 companies uh, in the uh, database right now. Uh, and we could never do that. Just a few people uh, that are the company, but it's, it's the ecosystem and all the uh, innovation uh, professionals around the world to do the assessments. So it's quite an achievement to have uh, 5,000 uh, companies in your uh, database. Uh, con congratulations. Thank for that. you. Uh, yes, and I have some comments about their um, AMBI credit from the program of 360 degree innovation. Uh, they have a plenty of capab innovation capability and this capability help uh, the companies and help the countries to be leveraging and uh, stepping 
and getting some profit. Uh, their uh, software or their platform, it's very pla practical platform. This is the reason why we need Agnes to be um, honorable in our conference presenting their platform. Uh, I advise um, most of the people to implement uh, their platform 360 innovation, we call it. And they're looking for really from different perspective for the innovation capabilities. Okay. And we're interesting on that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Doctor. May, may I suggest that uh, Tim uh, uh, start um, uh, until Go the... Ahead. Yeah. Go yeah. ahead. Judy will, will join in soon. I, th I think, Tim, you can start, Tim, and yeah. introducing your friend. Yeah. Thank you, That Nasser. sounds good. Yeah. Please. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks for having us here. And uh, uh, like Dr. Hannity said, uh, we have some colleagues that will be passing back and forth. Uh, my name is Tim Hines. I'm the executive director of the University Economic Development Association. Uh, we're an association based in the United States, but we're an international association uh, that is focused on uh, university-based economic development. And I'd like to share a little bit about that with you uh, before we introduce the colleagues. Uh, the UEDA, the University Economic Development Association, connects our members, uh, which are higher education institutions, private sector businesses, and economic development organizations, to resources that facilitate economic growth within their communities. UEDA members represent those who are on the cutting edge of modern economic development. And as we all know, the 21st century economy has evolved into an entity that behaves much differently than its predecessors attracting and establishing industry into your region is no longer a reliable route to prosperity. We need to create it ourselves, which is why we're here today. So success in our modern economy is about innovation and entrepreneurship. It's about fostering talent in young people from preschool through life to embolden them and to think creatively outside the box and traditional academic and professional requirements. Uh, and it's Excuse also about creating me. environments. Yes. I'm so sorry. Judy is joining us. Judy, he will running the session. Just we need to say hi for her. And uh, Judy, uh, Tim, and uh, the groups will, uh, Tim will be a representative for all. And then later they will make it an open discussion. The four team will backward and forward discussion. Just this is for your notification. Hi, Judy. Judy, we're running the session. Thank you very much. And my sincere apologies for the for the lag in time. Sorry about no that. No problem. No problem. More than more. Go ahead, Tim, and continue. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, you know, in addition, uh, you know, economic development and, and what we focus on is thinking about new ways to retain that talent that I was speaking about uh, to really uh, start the process all over again with the next generation. So never before has academia, the private sector, and economic development stakeholders been so reliant on one another to create opportunity. And our members, the University Economic Development Association members, work together to expand economic opportunity in their communities and regions by leveraging talent innovation in place and recognizing the interconnectedness of each of these elements. I'm going to get into that uh, here briefly. So uh, I mentioned about uh, this 21st century uh, being much different and in working with institutions of higher education, our goal is to have them think increasingly more comprehensively about how economic development uh, and engagement activities connect to each other in an institution's core mission. So for years, uh, our sector, meaning those that are in higher education economic development, did not have a clear and consistent definition of what economic development and engagement meant. Uh, the definition differed depending upon the person, the institution, and the institution type. So whether it was a research institution, private college, community college, uh, and therefore our partners, with our partners at the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities, APLU, uh, we launched a deep research project and a scan of economic development through all of higher education. And in doing so, we published this document, uh, which you see on your screen, uh, which is uh, called the Foundations for Strategy and Practice. Uh, and this is really at the core of all that we do. Uh, this document provides uh, first a definition of what university economic development and engagement means. And that definition's on the screen there. Second, it also provides a common set of principles for uh, institutions uh, to model economic development in their principles of practice, uh, uh, whether that's from a strategic standpoint or regular business operations. And third, it also creates a taxonomy of programs uh, to assist institutions in communicating uh, and classifying how they 
actually conduct economic development. So on the screen, I've highlighted uh, that definition of what economic development uh, means to, to our world and how it broadly uh, creates those ca uh, conditions for, for economic prosperity. And I mentioned uh, talent and innovation of place, uh, and this is really the taxonomy of how our institutions begin to classify their work within the lens of economic development. Colleges and universities enhance the competitiveness of their communities and regions and also serve a global society society uh, through many diverse programs, services, and activities that span these realms of talent innovation in place. Uh, economic development isn't a fourth mission, but it's a lens through which all of these are accomplished. Um, and our institutions, our higher education institutions, succeed in economic development, uh, broadly defined that, that I shared, uh, and communities and regions that they serve realize sustained advances in economic prosperity because they become increasingly attractive to entrepreneurs, uh, innovators, business investors, and highly skilled job seekers uh, and even students. So these three components of talent innovation in place are autonomous uh, and linked efforts within higher education's economic development environment, as we've illustrated in this graphic. So the taxonomy is designed for those who plan, lead, prioritize, uh, and carry out economic development engagement activities. Importantly, many of the most vibrant and effective programs and services fall at the intersections of each of these uh, because everything is, is, is not uh, holistic within these silos. So these three elements also build on the traditional uh, university mission formulations of teaching, research, and service, or learning, discovery, and engagement, uh, and can serve to extend interpretations of the mission across the institution. And when an institution has active and effective programs within all three of these realms and, and their intersections, then we consider that institution to be achieving uh, something that we call high impact economic engagement. Uh, but of course, universities don't do this alone. They rely on ecosystems to help support the work of their regions and make them stronger and more resilient. Uh, and that's what we're here to talk a little bit more about today. Um, so they rely on these partners uh, uh, and the partners rely on them uh, to strengthen the overall system. So today we're gonna explore the three parts of the ecosystem as we've defined those uh, and, and how those parts can be strengthened. So those parts include the ecosystem itself. So the overall system, uh, the higher education institution, and then the institution has uh, initiatives, and we're going to look at and explore those initiatives. So to help us uh, reflect on these parts of the ecosystem, I've invited three colleagues of mine to join us today who are all much more forward thinkers at this than I am uh, and can relate uh, their own experiences in innovation ecosystems and higher education economic engagement uh, and their strong commitment to innovation ecosystems. Uh, and um, I will uh, introduce each of them uh, here. Uh, we have uh, Rachel Burnett, who is a program officer for the Lemelson Foundation. Uh, we have Margo Fliss, who is the manager of strategic engagement at the University of Alaska Center for Economic Development, and Rebecca Robinson, who is chief corporate engagement and economic development officer at Kansas State University. And Rachel is going to be giving us the ecosystem perspective, so the entire ecosystem. Uh, Rebecca is going to look at the university itself and the, the role that that plays, and then Margo is going to look at the uh, the initiative perspective. Uh, and uh, we're going to get into a dialogue. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and uh, actually uh, relay some questions to each of them and ask them to, to respond. Um, and the first is going to go to Rachel in talking about the system itself. Uh, the Lemelson Foundation has really uh, been forward thinking in its uh, exploration of ecosystems and have, has created an ecosystem 2.0 framework uh, over the past uh, two years. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, that work and uh, what that's told you about ecosystem structures? Sure, thanks Tim and thanks for the introduction. Um, as Tim mentioned, Lemelson Foundation, which is a family foundation based in the US in Portland, Oregon, focused on um, cultivating the next generation of inventors and entrepreneurs has started looking in depth at the systems that both enable the individuals who become those inventors and entrepreneurs and the companies that they create that drive economic development. Um, and as to mention, we have developed what we're roughly calling ecosystems 2.0, um, in part because entrepreneurial ecosystem models are often illustrated as connections between organizations 
that support entrepreneurs and innovators, but they often don't necessarily um, assign a value or a role to those connections. And so the ecosystem model that Lemelson has been developing around regional ecosystems has a couple of fundamental differences. One is that we look at organizations that support the entire pathway for entrepreneurs and innovators from inspiring and educating those who've not yet self-identified as innovators and entrepreneurs to those who are already building and scaling companies and everything in between. Um, entrepreneurship and innovation can follow many different pathways, but there's a common thread of inspiration, building mindsets, education, building skills, and then support, incubation support um, and support for scaling companies. Um, we also consider all organizations that enable entrepreneurs and innovators, particularly those who aren't always recognized as part of the ecosystem as key contributors. Um, aside from the educational institutions that cultivate the next generation of entrepreneurs, that I'll talk a bit more about in a second, um, there are also uh, K-12 educational systems and um, social safety net support structures that enable those who don't necessarily have the personal capacity to um, launch a business on their own. Um, for example, we I sat in on a roundtable discussion of women entrepreneurs in the US um, last year, and they actually identified resources like childcare and healthcare as being most critical to their company's progress, not just access to capital, um, which is typically what we hear. There isn't necessarily deep connectivity between all of the players in this ecosystem, um, but there are interdependencies. Early stage funds, for example, need a steady stream of new companies to invest in. And those companies don't appear out of nowhere. Rather, the founders are coming out of high quality K-12 and higher education institutions. And so the effectiveness of those institutions is critically important to investors. Similarly, young people coming out of education are more likely to be successful if they have mentors and role models, and the entrepreneurs who succeed because of those early stage investments can be those mentors and role models. So rather than talking about the connections between players, we talk about the roles that those players fill. Tim, do you mind popping up that slide that just briefly includes the roles? So, um, well, we have been looking at ecosystems and working with experts in entrepreneurship and innovation. We've built off some important work coming from groups like the Aspen Network of Development Entrepreneurs to create a list of the roles that must be filled in any ecosystem to support a productive innovation economy while integrating diversity, equity, and inclusion at every point. Um, I'd be happy to share the full document that's summarized here on the screen um, with anyone who's interested. So different organizations fill roles depending on the region, um, but universities almost always fill a number of the roles and are critical parts of almost every single innovation ecosystem. Universities carry out research and development, educate the next generation of innovators, and provide physical infrastructure for innovators. But the roles that universities play typically go beyond the research and academic enterprise particularly when institutions make an intentional effort to engage deeply with their surrounding communities. Universities provide mentors, social safety net structures for students and others. They create markets by supporting local entrepreneurs or creating investment funds, and they can act as thought leaders and policy advocates to support innovation, invention, and entrepreneurship. Universities are going to be critical for our economic recovery in the U.S. and around the world. Engaging with communities in the way that you'll hear from Margot and Rebecca is necessary to drive the quick and inclusive economic growth that the world economy needs for resilient and sustained recovery. Thanks, Rachel. I appreciate that perspective. And, you know, I, I asked uh, Rebecca to join us from a, a university perspective here in the U.S. because of uh, knowing the Kansas State University and, and how they've have such a, a, an actively engaged ecosystem uh, through some of the work that we've been doing with them. So uh, Rebecca, can you describe uh, uh, Kansas State's role uh, in your in own innovation ecosystem in Kansas? Absolutely. And thanks, Tim, and uh, the group for having me and um, our team here today to share with you a little bit more. Um, 
And thanks, Rachel, for really providing a great overview of the sort of the ecosystem um, vision and component and real, a really great structure for what I'm going to describe to you as um, sort of an example, maybe, of how we have um, exemplified some of that uh, university role in an innovation ecosystem to provide some context for that. Um, Kansas State University, the university that I am associated with, is in the middle of the United States, um, in one of the less populated parts of the country. And the community actually that um, I live in and that our university in has about 55,000 people in it. And we have about 22,000 students. So you can imagine in terms of the context of the role that the university plays in the community. It's a heavy role, uh, both of the population base, the economic base, and the driving force for, for an innovation ecosystem. So you can imagine because of that highly educated populace and, the, um, and just the, the dynamic of having a university in a community that is relatively rural, the impact that that has on the community dynamic. But in addition to just existing in a community, um, our university has made a real and strong and, um, and vocal and visual, uh, visible um, commitment to advancing the economy and the innovation ecosystem of our community. And Rachel listed off some of those that I might give some specific examples. The first and most obvious one and role that a university plays and we play is on the talent development side. So on that inspiration and building knowledge component. So of course, um, our main function as an institution is to educate students, um, but we also take that further in terms of developing training programs or initiatives or activities that um, that help to um, support uh, entrepreneurs, inventors, help companies to advance their own efforts through that talent pipeline development. Um, but other roles that we play, of course, uh, in the innovation ecosystem, one is both a source of innovation. So, you know, whether it's technologies or inventions that are a product of the research that our faculty, staff, and students perform, um, but also a source of opportunity and a magnet for opportunity. So sometimes collaborations come to us be through um, the activities that are happening on our campus being um, something that uh, whether it's other universities or other companies around the world are interested in and then reach out to us and then we become then a source for economic opportunity in our own community, whether that is additional research that funds additional employees at the university that then um, ultimately grow our economy uh, and the innovation happening in our community or they become such um, deep and close collaborations that those companies make sense. It makes sense for those companies to have a physical presence in our community to have a collaboration, or it makes sense to start a new company based on those collaborations. The next, as Rachel noted, was facilities. Of course, um, uh, as having a, um, a campus in our community that has a sizable footprint in the community, we have the most sophisticated uh, innovation and invention facilities in the community and oftentimes becomes a challenge for private enterprise to think about having innovation or invention facilities. And usually then those have to become a collaborative endeavor when it comes to private sector space, whether that is um, you know, joint investment in things like incubator space or startup space, maker spaces, um, whether those are donation-based or public-private partnerships to make them a reality to then support the innovation ecosystem. The last two, I would say, are both a convener and a culture development role. So one of the ways that we, um, because we've made a commitment to um, economic development and innovation in our community, we are often trying to bring together both the public and private sector. So both our faculty, staff and students with, with the private sector and the public sector. So governments to talk about specific issues in specific industries. So as an example, next month, our university, which has a strength in pet food of all things um, and the development of things like pet food uh, because of our strong background in agriculture and food. And so we'll bring together 
um, industry partners from around the world virtually, of course, these days, um, to talk about how our institution can help uh, advance that industry. Uh, both and and what that would likely lead to is collaboration that ultimately can create new enterprise and create new invention, both in our ecosystem and around the world. And the last is culture. So because we convene uh, that mixture of both community and university um, partners, it creates then a, a culture and an expectation that the way that our community and our ecosystem will advance is through innovation. Um, so that is different than some of our traditional, say, economic development activities, where we might just be focusing on anything and everything that can generate um, resources, that there is a shared sense of um, forward thinking, uh, a forward thinking mentality about innovation and leveraging that for economic growth. So that's what I would say in terms of how K-State is playing in our innovation ecosystem. Thanks, Rebecca. And uh, you know, you mentioned a couple uh, of the actual tactics of what an institution does, and I'd like to call on Margo now to talk about some of the programs and initiatives. And, and Margo, I, I, I see Margo as, as uniquely uh, positioned as an expert in this area because Margo, uh, not only uh, in her role at the University of Alaska, Anchorage, but also uh, as the uh, chair of our awards committee that uh, scans and reviews best practices from institutions all across uh, North America right now. But, uh, uh, you know, you, you explore these initiatives and you see these initiatives all the time. So can you talk about the importance of programs and initiatives that institutions have, um, perhaps both academic and non-traditional, uh, and uh, how that contributes to the overall sustainability of the innovation ecosystem? Absolutely. Uh, thanks for having me here today. Uh, really excited to be joining everybody. Uh, well, it's, it's morning for us. I believe it's afternoon for most of you. Um, one thing that I have really enjoyed, this is my third year chairing the Awards of Excellence Committee, as Tim mentioned, was the breadth and the depth of initiatives and projects that I get to see uh, as part of the Awards Committee. What I find is that many universities are doing absolutely fantastic work. Uh, I still remember actually when Rebecca uh, presented, this is a couple of years ago, uh, she had an image that has stuck with me literally for the last four or five years about silo busting and how as a university, in order to bring um, people together from across the community to create change, you have to break down silos. And she had this great little graphic of people walking up and out of their silos and kind of joining together. And I feel that that's what the Awards of Excellence often is able to do. Up in Alaska, obviously, we are a large state, a, a much smaller community than many other uh, probably joining us here today. And we still have trouble often with people knowing about the great work that's happening at the university. And I find that the universities, both Rachel and Rebecca have mentioned, brings a lot to the table. We're often a convener. Uh, we bring a lot of great research. And I say one of our greatest assets is student and, and talent and uh, workforce development. So through the Awards of Excellence, what we find is they're an excellent way to not only showcase the great work that often universities or community colleges are doing, but it also is an opportunity to really highlight great collaboration that's going on. Um, so I'm sure as many of you find, and uh, right now we, we are doing everything virtually, um, we have had to really come together as a community uh, due to necessity, right? And um, being able to highlight and really celebrate when communities can collaborate to have economic development initiatives and really push innovation forward in their community, that's something we wanna celebrate. That's one great thing that comes out of the awards. Um, another great thing is we have developed a community of practitioners. One thing that I have really enjoyed seeing are projects that have come over the years that will reference uh, just like I did with Rebecca's project and say, you know, we saw their project four years ago. We have continued to model our, you know, particular project after that. We found that their project was amazing and we've been able to tailor it for our community. So we spend a lot less time and effort recreating the wheel and instead are able to share and really thought partner and collaborate with practitioners from across North America. Um, I appreciate that being up in Alaska. I love my community. I've lived here most of my life. But as many of you can imagine, implementing projects is, looks a little different up here. We have a lot of rural communities. 
And so through the awards, I'm able to find great work being done across North America in terms of uh, talent, innovation in place. And I'm able to really speak to those uh, communities and to those practitioners and say, you know, how are you doing that? What does that look like? Uh, how could I maybe do that in my community? Um, that's really valuable to me and uh, something that I really, really enjoy about uh, the awards program. And over the last few years, I would say there's actually been an increase in programs coming forward that are working uh, to do economic development, particularly with underserved communities. Um, I know that equity is, is a big topic of discussion up here in Alaska, and I'm sure in many different communities across the globe. And finding and celebrating programs that work with female entrepreneurs, for example, today is actually Women's Entrepreneurship Day. Um, finding and celebrating programs like that and helping to drive forward innovation and entrepreneurship um, in their communities and really celebrating what that looks like is I would say a, a large part of what makes the Awards of Excellence not only exciting, but it's incredibly educational and it helps us continue to all move forward together uh, by, by really working um, across community. Thanks, Margo. And, you know, I wanna turn it back to Rachel and look systemically now uh, at the ecosystem. You know, you have these little, uh, these initiatives and these projects that institutions are working on. Um, what what impact do they have on the greater ecosystem? You know, how does that how does that actually uh, uh, roll up into the, the broader uh, initiatives, sustainability, um, uh, resilience, uh, you know, overall diversity of, of that ecosystem? Yeah, I think there's a couple of different ways of looking at it. One, if you go back to the different roles that need to be filled for a successful ecosystem universities actually have a lot of capacity to take on um, efforts that other places don't, particularly I think in the types of communities that Rebecca and Margo are in where maybe you know there aren't as many different types of organizations around. Because these universities have a commitment and a mission around um, community engagement, I think that gives them both the motivation and the capacity to do things that aren't necessarily focused on more traditional academic enterprise work or research enterprise work, um, but really are geared towards growth in the community itself that doesn't necessarily um, impact the university. And so I think as universities see themselves as part of these ecosystems, they're able to take on um, more of these roles as they see gaps in their region. And that can be anything from hosting a um, early stage investment fund or an accelerator or creating a low cost fee for service access to equipment or simply going out and doing um, community engagement activities to make clear that the university is contributing to a culture of innovation and values that in the community. Um, looking at it from the DEI lens, you know, we really try to center the people in a lot of our sense of what the ecosystem is and understand what people need in order to be successful inventors and innovators. Um, and a lot of people need things that happen before they self-identify in that space. So, you know, they need um, someone when they're young to show them that this mm -hmm. is a legitimate pathway for them or to be a role model or to encourage them or to provide higher education level classes around both entrepreneurship and engineering design and things like that. And the, the people who need those the most are the ones who are coming from backgrounds where they don't see it in their communities. Um, you know, There's a big report that came out a couple of years ago in the US um, from which one of the conclusions was the biggest predictor of someone becoming an inventor and having patents was having someone in their neighborhood um, who similarly had patents and was an inventor. Mm -hmm. And so the people mm -hmm. who aren't in that situation get left behind. And that's where universities and other organizations can step in and provide those extra resources um, that make it possible for everyone, you know, dependent, independent of how rich they are, or what color their skin is to be successful in that space. Thank you. And um, universities actually have a designation uh, that uh, Kansas State University, I know, is, is, a, is a designated institution, uh, mm -hmm. and it's called the Innovation and Economic Prosperity designation. Um, so I was hoping that, uh, Rebecca, since since 
uh, K-State is a, uh, a IEP designated institution. Could you talk a little bit about what that means and maybe what that process is? Absolutely. So the innovation and economic prosperity designation, which is one that you can, an institution can achieve through uh, the University Economic Development yeah. Association um, is a, um, it's really a commitment first and foremost to a rigorous self-study process. So for us, that meant looking both internally and externally at our stakeholders and asking them both what we did well uh, in terms of economic engagement, how we were helping to grow our region, and um, and then also where we needed to grow, where we weren't so strong, and what the what the gaps were. And through that rigorous self study, then um, the institution is is um, asked to develop both um, an overview of what those really areas of achievement have been, and then also where uh, a growth and improvement plan that identifies a pretty specific path forward in terms of the institution's commitment to economic engagement. For, um, for our institution, um, this was led at the highest level. So it was a commitment from our university president um, who said, you know, we want to, we want to make this commitment and we want to go through the process. And we then pulled together a committee of I don't know, probably 20 stakeholders from around campus, leaders from around uh, campus uh, and in the community who um, looked at, who helped us to both identify other stakeholders internally and externally that we then surveyed, had town hall meetings with over probably an eight month time period for us. Some institutions take two or three years to go through this process. Um, we ultimately, surveyed over 900 stakeholders through that process um, to understand those strengths and gaps and um, and then uh, submitted much of that sort of the product the work product of that analysis and now it is what guides our institution as a strategy going forward on how we engage in innovation economic engagement and how we support the communities both really locally um, but also regionally and across our state. So this is this is really a uh, sort of a, a seal, uh, mm -hmm. an award almost that that sh that shows your commitment uh, as an institution mm -hmm. to innovation and, and economic prosperity. And um, you know that's that's a big step. And and you know as you said uh, that it, that is something that any uh, university can participate in through the University Economic Development Association through our organization. So if you'd like more information, uh, you know, our website is up there and you can get in contact with me. Um, and I want to pass it back to Margo, um, who, who looks at, uh, you know, we talked about, you know, from Rebecca's standpoint, the excellence of the institution itself. I want to talk a little bit more about the excellence of the initiatives that, that occur at institutions, Margo, and uh, see if you can, uh, connect us with some common tr uh, trends that you're seeing in uh, those initiatives uh, across uh, the spectrum of, of, of what you've reviewed uh, relative to the awards of excellence uh, and perhaps uh, connect that to how they've uh, impacted the, the uh, innovation ecosystems in which they're engaged. Absolutely. Um, so as Tim mentioned a little bit about the awards of excellence, uh, we have um, UEDA members and also non-UEDA members apply. Um, they submit a project or initiative and uh, they're looking at a couple of different categories. So talent, innovation, and place, as Tim mentioned earlier, and then actually the intersection of those as well. What I really enjoy about the Awards of Excellence is that we find innovation and great things happening in a number of different ways, right? We're not all doing the exact same thing in the exact same way. Something that I have found to be really exciting over the last few years that I've been chairing the awards committee is actually has a lot to do with something Rachel brought up earlier. Oftentimes in entrepreneurship and innovation spaces, we find that young people, uh, they don't know what they don't know, right? That's true for all of us. If you've never seen somebody be an entrepreneur or um, be part of a startup, uh, often they have no idea what that looks like. They don't know what that means for them. And so that might be a potential fantastic career path, but if they don't even know about it, it's not going to be normalized as a potential pathway for them. 
So there's been an increasing number of universities and community colleges that have been submitting awards of excellence for fantastic accelerator programs, especially student-based accelerator programs. Um, sometimes they're pre-accelerator programs. Uh, I think there's a lot of in, um, people think of an accelerator as something that you might already have a business that you're going through. Um, Pre-accelerators, I actually co-lead an accelerator, a student accelerator at my university um, that's called Upstart Alpha. And we have students who are often in the very, very idea stage, right? So that might be even considered a pre-accelerator. But to Rachel's point, if they haven't seen um, what a career in entrepreneurship uh, could look like for them, uh, part of going through a program like that really introduces them to the idea of what does it mean to, to, to run your own startup? A number of um, universities also have, um, in addition to accelerator programs, they have incubators, they have co-working spaces. What I love about a lot of those initiatives is it's not just the university doing it, right? They often bring in venture capital, they bring in angel investors, they bring in startups um, from the community. They may have uh, traditional firms that are coming together to work with students and researchers, and sometimes it's on campus, sometimes it's off. But again, they're bringing together a network to really help grow the innovation ecosystem. It's not the university saying we're doing it all by ourselves, right? They're bringing people together. They're acting as that convener. Sometimes that's a physical location, and sometimes it's connecting the network so that students or researchers and staff at the university can connect with entrepreneurs in the community doing a lot of great work. So I would say that increasingly there are a number of initiatives that not only focus on the accelerators and incubators, but also workforce development programs that have to look a little bit different. Um, this past year, there were a number of people talking about how do we help those in our community who've been laid off due to COVID, reskill. Um, particularly if it's not safe to work in person right now, what does that look like for our community? How do we help people have good um, paying jobs so that they can stay in our community? Um, what is retooling or reskilling? What does that look like moving forward? So that we have a number of initiatives. That maybe wasn't what talent or workforce development looked like a couple of years ago, but it's what it looks like now. That's what's great about the awards. You see people who've been doing fantastic work and often you're like, oh, wow, I was just thinking about that. I was just talking about that. Now somebody's out there doing it. I want to hear more. So increasingly we find that in addition to kind of innovation and talent, we also find communities who have done a lot to really re-invest uh, in communities that maybe have been um, left behind by other great economic development advances in the area. Uh, we call it placemaking in economic development, right? And I particularly enjoy seeing those because they're often in communities that maybe were left behind when other cities around them continue to grow and boom. And so reinvesting in communities through placemaking, we also have a number of initiatives that are doing that in a really different way. Again, um, this year in particular with COVID, um, people are doing economic development and engagement ac activities in a very different way. And it's wonderful to get to see how they are innovative in um, continuing to help grow um, their community. Can't find my mute on mute button. Sorry. Uh, so, uh, and I think that you know it is encouraging to see so many student programs uh, increase uh, in our in our spectrum in our world of best practices that that, that we host and. If anyone would like to get some more information on uh, the best practices uh, for uh, that, that we uh, showcase as part of our awards program, uh, please feel free to visit our website. Again, that's at universityeda.org. Uh, and there's a knowledge uh, network there that uh, has uh, programs and initiatives uh, that are uh, engaging students, that are engaging community, uh, that are advancing innovation. And uh, we encourage you to check those out and uh, take advantage of that. Uh, as well as uh, the IEP designation. If you'd like more information about that, I'd be happy to provide you more information about how uh, any universities out there can become uh, uh, innovation and economic prosperity designated. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a rigorous process. Uh, and we are uh, working with the Lemelson Foundation as well to uh, conduct some uh, deeper dives into ecosystem work and what that means and the connectivity and the roles of those, uh, the roles that, that, that uh, Rachel mentioned, but also the connectivity of those roles. So uh, we have more information that's coming on our website about that as well. So with that, uh, I'll turn it over to uh, either 
Judy or Dr. Hannity, yes? Yes, yes, uh, Judy. Uh, okay. Uh, yes, uh, Tom, thank you so much for your participations with your team. Um, I will start um, uh, the discussions for the round table uh, for all the presenter, uh, specifically with you. Uh, Judy? Excuse me, Judy. Yes, I'm back. Sorry, my internet uh, completely went down. <laughs> no problem. No problem. Excuse me, Judy. I will take from your time because I need to ask the presenter uh, the discussion point for the roundtable as I presented in the protocol. Um, through the collaboration between developed and developing countries, um, from your opinion, what is the best practices of the practitioner uh, to be taken for fostering integration process? between the countries, specifically working in uh, EDA. What is your opinion? Start, Tom. Oh, sorry, I thought that was for Judy. Um, I think that's actually best uh, answered by Rebecca, right? <laughs> uh, no, I need, yes, I need to, uh, 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 to, to know your opinion. This is, it's not only for one person rather than others. This is, is your opinion, why specifically you're working in EDA, right? Then um, from your opinion, what is the best practices of the practitioner to be taking for fostering integration process between the countries? Should be there are a, a collaboration and can, uh, integration process between the countries, right? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, I mean Today we are a gathering and overlapping between uh, developed and developing country, and there are participants through the world. Then we need to learn from each others and get the best practices. What is your opinion? Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So, and and that's why I think that you know uh, we we can learn from each other. Uh, we have a a, a wealth of uh, resources that Margot mentioned uh, that are some of our best practices, things that we've identified that have worked in communities throughout North America, uh, and those are open and available and free on our website that you can check out and uh, and learn from uh, and connect with those people. If you need help connecting with them, I'm happy to connect you with specific, uh, uh, whether it's an accelerator program, whether it's a student-run program, uh, whatever those programs are. Uh, we have direct connections. We are so, we are that source of, of information uh, and, and want to share that with everyone. So if you do have uh, you know more questions or or want to be connected with specific programs or specific people at those programs, uh, we are more than happy to collaborate with you and and and, uh, and engage you with with who is doing great work here uh, with the University Economic Development Association. Okay. Yes, if go I can jump in. Is, is that okay? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, so to answer that question, to add to, to the answer to, to the question, I just wanted to share. Uh, so I was you know, invited to share on this session, but um, something we discussed earlier this morning was uh, we have uh, memorandums of understandings with universities uh, throughout Europe. So we're based in, uh, I run an incubator program for a university in Central California. Uh, but we have half a dozen memorandums of understandings with uh, uh, university-based incubator programs uh, in Munich, Belgium, France. Um, and the idea here is, is very specific at the start uh, to answer the question that's here today. So best practice is to create these um, memorandum of understandings where it becomes an exchange program. So we can send a startup over there for three months and they get mentored by their consultants and, and given access to all of their university resources and all the resources that they would give to their own startups and vice versa. We will host one of their startups at our incubator for three to six months. Um, so that's one of our best practices. Um, and uh, what I wanted to share also was the impetus for starting that was we had a med tech company um, that was ISO certified. So they were able to commercialize and start selling their product in Europe, but they hadn't gone through all of the FDA approvals in the US. And that takes often a much longer period of time. But the idea was, why don't you go to Europe, go to Belgium, uh, there's a incubator that was focused on med tech type clients, try to figure out your sales and marketing plan there, Get start generating some revenue to support all the, the R&D, well, not R&D, but the 
FDA process that was still happening in the US. Uh, so that's just a, an anecdotal example of the reason why we connected with that one incubator. And, and then that led to more and more connections and interactions. So um, Dr. Hanadi, I hope that is, you know, gives you uh, a nice anecdotal um, example of some reasons or some ways to, to integrate with other countries and to share resources at that larger scale. Yeah. Great, Judy. Great. That's very uh, a great idea. Um, uh, the other uh, points of discussions in develop and developing country, the importance of innovation and entrepreneurship uh, ecosystem leading for economic diversification. Now, most of the countries searching about economic diversification and focusing in economic diversification. From your opinion, what is the shortcut pathway for successful implementation? based on the previous years uh, of implementations of innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem? Um, I don't, I can't remember uh, what uh, famous person said it, but the, the um, there's this saying that uh, if you wanna build a diverse economy, open a university there and wait 50 years. I can't remember who said that. <laughs> um, uh, so one th I think uh, those of us on the call associated with uh, higher education would say, right, that that um, as a hub of, of an innovation ecosystem is one way to ensure that you will have, right, uh, uh, an appreciation of knowledge and of innovation in, uh, in an ecosystem. I don't know that there's a shortcut um, to getting there, but I would say there, um, because of uh, you know technology advancements that have happened that you know that have occurred uh, throughout the world, there is more connectivity and there is more. There's an opportunity to leverage technology that say didn't exist in the United States 50 years ago. That you see um, you know adoption in um, in underdeveloped countries. The cell phone is obviously a great example of that, where you didn't necessarily um, we didn't put. Uh, um, phone lines across the country to start uh, because there's an opportunity to go to things like satellite and other technologies for, um, and I think um, digital connectivity will all have some of the same opportunities relative to, to broadband. Um, in my own state, uh, there are many parts of our state that don't have high speed internet. And so it's very difficult for um, some of those areas to advance. I think over time, it will be less likely that we're putting um, wires in the ground to, to have internet in those places that we are doing things, we're advancing via things like satellite technology that will allow um, innovation and certain activities to happen in places across the world that won't have to do uh, the same level of infrastructure investment that um, other parts of the country have had to do over the last 50 or 100 years. One thing I would say um, that is uh, an opportunity that we have taken advantage of is um, in, in partnerships with um, underdeveloped and developing countries is through USAID, through their Feed the Future Innovation Lab. So K-State is actually home to four Feed the Future Innovation Labs um, funded by USAID which um, have allowed us to have um, labs in partnership with um, multiple countries around the world, Ethiopia, Bangladesh, Cambodia, Senegal, Niger, Burkina Faso, Tanzania, India, Pakistan, Ghana, and Guatemala. Um, all of those labs um, have different functions, whether that is helping to advance agricultural practices, to help build um, you know, diverse economies, um, improving um, things like nutrition and food security in some of these countries. And some of those kinds of programs around the world allow us, at least from the food and agriculture side, which is where our strengths are, to help um, move from, um, you know, basic technologies or su substance, substantive agriculture to much more, um, to, to jump past phases of innovation and adopt things like new, um, new seed uh, genetics or new uh, irrigation practices that will allow those economies to evolve and develop much quicker than they would um, if they started, you know, where say the United States or Europe started um, 150 years ago. 
Thank you so much, Rebecca, for your um, uh, detailed answer. Um, my concern is if, if we're talking, first of all, about the infrastructure, if we put in our consideration, the infrastructures of the ecosystem is already done, okay, whether in the the lab, developing a program, developing accelerators, and also the skills people, it's there. Now, we're looking for what is next. If the, and also with regarding to the fund, uh, specifically for uh, some countries, as a rich country, same as the GCC, we have a plenty of fund. Then the money is there, the skilled people is there, the infrastructures is there. Now, what is the next? What we're looking for, for uh, uh, to having more successful implementation. What is the opinion, Rochelle? So unfortunately, you know, I don't think that there is one magical way to get past some of these structural problems um, that some countries are facing, you know, even if kind of the will and the individuals are there. Um, I know that there's been a lot of energy in the international development community around entrepreneurship because it's seen as a way of sparking um, fast growth. We've observed here in the U.S. and places where there is minimal infrastructure is the um, a sectoral focus that leverages the particular competitive advantage of certain regions. And so, you know, if there's not, for example, um, strong air transportation infrastructure, an area might look at agricultural innovations that they can use, you know, they can just ship from where they are, or if they're um, near the ocean, we see a lot of blue economy innovations um, getting started. And we've seen that um, entrepreneurship support in particular sectors is actually an important component of helping people launch and scale companies. When you have um, sector agnostic resources, they often aren't that helpful for companies that are ready to scale. Um, and so I think those are kind of the key components, but also just leveraging um, what international communities can bring in, um, but with a focus on keeping the development in the, the country that's under consideration. Uh, Judy, thank you so much, Rochelle. Uh, Judy, if you have anything, if you want to conclude the sessions, thank you so much for your presentation. Any opinion, Tom? You are only the man with respect to ladies. <laughs> <laughs> Tim, I'll, I'll, is it Tim, I'll let you jump in. Go ahead and give him push. <laughs> I, I, I leave it to the experts. I, I know better. We were pulling your headset. <laughs> Um, now, th this is, uh, I, you know, I've learned a lot, actually. I, I hadn't heard about the UEDA, so that's a, a great resource. I'm excited to explore that uh, for our university. Um, you know, one thing I wanted to add, Dr. Hanania, is another option, what we're seeing, and we didn't wait 50 years, but uh, it did take eight years. Um, where we're starting, you do see starting, you know, certain trends bubble up. Um, so we were definitely agnostic at the start. We worked with all startups in all industries. And now we've picked two se sectors that we're focusing on just based on the, um, on the resources and infrastructure that we do have in place, such as the, um, the air base just down south from us. Um, that is being used by SpaceX. And so there's an opportunity to create a vertical uh, in aerospace and focus our incubator, an incubator program vertical, just focus on aerospace technology. Um, and up north, we have, you know, uh, 300 wineries. Um, and so there's definitely a lot of potential for ag tech. So we're selecting uh, that vertical and we're seeing a lot of things trending there. So I, I think it's being aware of the region you're in and what are the trends that you're seeing bubbling up uh, and then leveraging that uh, as quickly as possible with the resources you already, you already have in place. Um, so it's going to be very regionally specific, yeah.
Um, yes, perfect. Uh, did you realize that in the U.S., even though in the Europe, European uh, commissions and in the U.S., um, they spreading uh, the economic development councils or economic development offices or small business uh, centers is spreading here or there in the U.S. while they focusing and they uh, realize that the, the outcomes of those uh, centers uh, focusing in an economy and uh, all the program uh, regarding for the innovation ecosystem, entrepreneurial ecosystem, technology transfer, commercialization, all this is helping our economy, helping our society to get to coming to the next generation as a smart generation. Uh, as Ripika said, in some area, if it's low internet, then no reason they cannot connect, they cannot improve. Um, uh, then based on that, um, the economic development is important or a vital tools in, 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 in developed country and also in developing countries. And this is the reason why uh, most of the countries is focusing uh, to develop their um, uh, to develop their programs and to develop their economy, to be smart, uh, inclusive and also uh, sustainable. Exactly. Yeah. Any uh, more I, points or discussions? Yeah, okay, go ahead. Uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to add to that. I mean, I think that that's a good point. And I think that, you know, when we're looking at, uh, you know, I, I shared with you talent, innovation in place, those three three aspects of, of how higher education uh, impacts economic engagement. Uh, if you focus on one too heavily, uh, that's not sustainable. You have to focus on all of them and you have to focus on them somewhat equally in order to, to rise the ecosystem and, and the efforts together. Uh, so you can't create a strong talent base and then not have a, an attractive place for them to live. And you can't have innovation and jobs for them to participate in. So you have to look at all of them somewhat equally and spend equal amounts of time uh, working to impact and and cultivate those those pieces of engagement. Uh, otherwise, it it will it won't it won't work. It will fail. Thanks a lot. I think uh, uh, Judy, you can conclude the sessions. <laughs> uh, no, thank you. I mean, I think at the bottom line, uh, you know, our jobs each and every one of us is we're, we're connectors and it's all about connecting those dots. So you can call it, you know, uh, breaking out of the silos or, or connecting the dots, but it, it is about relationship building. And Dr. Hanada, you, you, you pointed out that really well. It's about um, um, uh, opportunities within countries, connecting opportunities within regions. Uh, and it's, this is a phenomenal platform to be able to do that uh, even more. So. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you so much for all of you. Really, we are appreciate your potential. And I think also most of the GCC welcoming you and um, uh, um, uh, let's say listening to your best practices to learn from you and sharing, learn and share, and also for connections and developing, we bridging between developed and developing countries. Thank you so much for, um, and looking forward for you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye-bye.